This hour of the Greg Hill Show is brought to you by the Ketchis Law Group. New England construction workers, if you're injured on the job, Ketchis has your back at KetchisLaw.com. And now, be curious, not judgmental. Broadcasting from beautiful and safe Brighton, Massachusetts. May not even be safe, probably not for your workers even. Streaming on WEI.com and everywhere on the Odyssey app. I have to invest in a snow thrower. I guess you can't. I blow is canceled nowadays. Oh, where do you hear these things? I mean, the, the, listen, what, what the streets you, are always talking, man. I, I feel like that, blower is canceled. Why would blower be canceled? Yeah. Because I think you're, it's a derogatory statement Barely for do. sex workers. What? <laughs> this is the Greg Hill Show. The Greg Hill Morning Show. What's up, G-Man? How you doing? Hilly. We're happy to have the Hill Man. I love the show, by the way. It's great. Starring Greg Hill. We're going to do it a- AMSR style. So that Mac, like, uh... What was that? ASMR. Mac. I think you can try to throw less picks. Featuring the original spark of the Pats dynasty. They jealous of us. Wiggy. You got like my grandfather used to say, I got one foot in the grave and the other one on a banana peel, and I'm like, I'm going to enjoy life. Joined by the relationship alpha. I mean, Courtney, I'm not really sure I understand that. Courtney Cox. It's just another game. Mm-hmm. They gave no billboard material, but right. couldn't you use the same Listen, analogy that you use for blower? Plowing and blowing. And accompanied by. Hi. Two big brains behind the glass. David Ortiz. Curtis. And Shime. Why do you bring up things that are not going to happen? Because Patrick Mahomes is going to be the MVP of the NFL, and you poo pooed that big time. You want to play this game? Like, you will get annihilated. Oh, freaking oh, Curtis. Now. But we've got to be role models. Right. Oh, God. It's time for the Greg Hill Morning Show. You asshole. Gave them a lot of what for. You just have no idea what you're talking about. On Boston Sports Original. Cheers. Crushing beers. I'm watching the past. W E E I. When I say Greg Hill and you say show, Greg Hill. Greg Hill. Go, Greg Hill, show. All right. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Winners this weekend, but that Cowboys pick is that on you or is that on Wiggy or is that on Mattress Mac? Who who do I blame for that? <laughs> Dak I think, Prescott. I'm I think t- in power rankings order, it would go Wiggy, Mattress Mac, then me. Okay, all right. Wow, that coach still have his job this morning? Yeah, what a joke. Yeah, Mike I believe McCoppy. actually Jerry Jones even said he's completely safe. Wow. Jerry Jones them? loves to do that, though. Hey, if someone screws up or somebody has a bad game, he's the first one out there to just be like, hey, he's safe, Pro- proved himself, everybody's fine, coach, I will player, never doesn't matter. pick America's team again. No, uh, yeah, that's again. it. Oh, you're one and done. That's it. One that is the it. Cowboys. The Cowboys, they absolutely blow. <laughs> How can you Prescott. be America's team when you haven't made a conference championship game in 30 years? Yeah, they uh, they. Blow. I thought this was their year, and they blow. Dak blows. If I was uh, Jerry Jones, I'd get rid of everybody you would i would pick up the phone and call sean payton and brady and said hey you guys want to come here to <laughs> dallas <laughs> well uh welcome to your show it is a monday and lots going on this morning and um i right off the bat this morning on the subaru of new england text line a request that the bills fan who called the show last week and said he felt sorry for us here in new england mm-hmm. would he be able to call in at some point this morning curtis i hope i, I have never had more schadenfreude than watching that game and thinking of puds like luke russert what a total drain that guy is on society and bills fans across the country who have been dunking on patriots fans for regular season accomplishments And you know what? I was rooting for them. I I fell for the DeMar Hamlin story. I thought he was going to be the inspirational thing that brought them to their championship. But they came up so small. And Joe Burrow, in the middle of the Mahomes-Allen mania, Mm -hmm. may be the heir to the throne of Brady, after all. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. He's so good. Joe I thought he cool. got hurt at one point, though. He lo- he took a bit to get up at one point. I also I, I got invited to watch the game at a Bills fan's house, uh-huh. and nobody else was Bills fans that were there but him, and he's a big-time Bills fan. At the end of the game, when it was like, this is not going to end well for you, I was wondering, do you leave or do you stay to the end? Oh, Because I, don't you think they uh, maybe want to suffer alone at the end? <laughs> yeah. But we're all there having like side conversations watching yeah. the game, and yeah. I'm like, ah. <laughs> 
Very difficult. John handled it swimmingly, though. Yeah. I don't, I mean, you look at Joe Burrow, it seems like he's not in the conversation a lot when it comes to quarterbacks. He like, should be. Uh, yeah. Like, he is clearly the, in my opinion, the second best quarterback in all of football. I think he is in the conversation. It's just you not. Ne- you never talk about it. He's him. not. No, no. He's not as, like, his name isn't as loud. Yes, as, it is. flashy. As, oh. No, no. I'm saying when we talk about the quarterbacks, we yell and scream about Allen and Mahomes. It, but we do on this show. I'm saying nationally. If you are on social media, if you are looking anywhere else but this show, Joe Burrow's name is loud and proud. Well, Everybody th- th- is talking this about game Joe Burrow. Definitely, but before this game, this he game is... definitely helped him out because everybody would always say it, he's, you know, obviously Mahomes suffered that ankle injury and can't kind of gutted it out. Mm. But you know, Joe Cool, they, I mean, Cincinnati's been able to turn this thing around. Uh, helps to have a guy like Jamar yeah. Chase. But yeah, Joe Burrow, man, he's he's definitely up there. He's definitely up there with Mahomes. It's Mahomes, Allen, Joe Burrow, and I don't. Even, I can't even think of anybody in the NFC. Do you know who he, what reminds me most about the early Patriots with Burrow and the Bengals? How they use everything as a slight to put on their shoulder to overcome. 100%. The way they used that benign release saying that they had sold 50,000 seats for the game, mm-hmm. for the potential Chief, uh, Chiefs-Bills game. Right. After the game, the first thing Joe Burrow says, oh, they'll have to get those refunds. Yeah. I mean, they really do remind me of those Patriots teams in terms of overcoming odds. When the Patriots started winning, the Patriots were like the Bengals. Yeah. They never won anything. But the problem with the Bengals and those early Patriots teams, and I think this is why Joe Burrow's name is not as loud as the other two, is because they always start off slow. Right, so at the beginning of the season, we were like, "Ah, the Bengals are not good." When you looked at those early Patriots teams or those championship Patriots teams, they were rolling from Jump Street, you know. And I think that's the only difference when people kind of put, you know, Cincinnati and go, "Oh, you, we we have Boomer on all the time." And at the beginning of the year, I was like, "What's up with Cincinnati?" Oh, yeah. they'll be fine. No, I just don't think in, in the in, and I would disagree with you a little bit nationally. Like mm-hmm. when the conversation happens, right about the top five quarterbacks in the NFL, you don't hear Joe Burrow as much as you should hear Joe Burrow in that conversation. He is the best of Peyton Manning with that little mix of, like, Tom Brady coolness. And it is... It is a remarkable thing to watch because everybody is so hyped up with the backyard style of quarterback in Mahomes and Allen that they kind of overlook just how actually good Joe Burrow is at playing football. Now, do you su- suppose that those Bills fans will just go to Atlanta this weekend anyway? Yeah. Like, I mean, <laughs> wouldn't you get out of Buffalo with this time of year? <laughs> yeah, I would think yeah. so. I mean, could they do some kind of uh, like a Bills carnival or mm. something down there? Fest. Welcome to, uh, yeah, Welcome to Loserville. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, the other thing with Burrow, just the last point, Point on him, I look at what he did with Ed Ogeron, basically the coach and water boy, <laughs> in winning a national championship at LSU, and look at what LSU was before and after him. But Versus- I would say this about Joe Burrow, though. I mean, I I wouldn't like Ed Ogeron. They he's always had like extreme talent around him. They were loaded. That LSU team, you know, some people say that might be the best college football team ever. Um, the talent that he had on that team. And he he has great talent around on the offensive side of the football. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not knocking him for any of that. I mean, is Hayden Hurst one of the top tight ends in football? No, 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 but come on, Jamar Chase? No, but I'm just saying, the guy... T. You, Higgins? Look at what... Joe Mixon? Alabama hasn't skipped a beat, whether it was Jalen Hurts, Mac Jones, mm-hmm. Tua. They're still one of the top three teams in the country. Mm-hmm. Joe Burrow, and to a lesser extent, Patrick Mahomes at Texas Tech, they were the programs when they were there. They haven't won before or since. And so LSU's a good team. Brian Kelly's a good coach. Right. But I'm just saying Ed Ogeron is probably somewhere at a, at a Y in Tuscaloosa right now. <laughs> well, I mean, I, he doesn't get the attention nationally because right. he's not the flashy run quarterback that Wiggy and Shime, that style quarterback that right. Wiggy and Shime love. That's right. why. Trevor it, Lawrence looked pretty good on Saturday, though. And his team... But, Greg, I think a lot of it is to do with his team starting slow, right? So we talk about Joe Burrow and the Cincinnati Bengals. They tend to start slow early in the season where Mahomes and Allen got out the gate, right? And I think that's the biggest thing. And when you think of the two top quarterbacks in the NFL, you instantly think about Mahomes and Allen because of the way they start, the way they play. Now, the biggest problem for Josh Allen, he's now getting into, is 
can he get over the hump and get Buffalo to well, a Super Bowl? I'll tell you what, with the Mahomes injury, they got a pretty good chance of winning that football game. Are you hammering, be good to go. Are you hammering that, Shime? Oh, absolutely. I am I, I mean, I was I would be on the Bengals anyway. Even if Mahomes is 100% healthy. This team is Burrow it just be, he dominates yeah. against every top tier quarterback. He doesn't lose. And then on top of that, his defensive coordinator might be one of the best game planners again against the best quarterbacks in football every single time. He held uh, Mahomes, Allen, Lamar Jackson to a negative EPA per play, which is just a nerd way of saying that they were not good at all in any of the games that they faced the Cincinnati Bengals. And Cincinnati's beaten Kansas City the last three times that they played. So could you imagine they have their number? Mahomes loses consecutive AFC title games at home to a guy that was drafted after him. <laughs> and you have the potential that Mahomes falls to one in six in his last seven games against Josh Allen and Joe Burrow. Mm. Wow. All right. Well, lots to get to this morning. I believe that there is a banger of an Alberta Clipper headed our way, Curtis. Is that noon when that starts today? Yeah, well, it's right now you've got some rain, and let me just tell you, the roads suck, so it takes some extra time, but I've got six different models. My forecast will be percolating all morning. Okay, we're not going to give it away now. Well, we're why would I? We have Courtney's trend, and okay. then I'll give it right at the end of that. <laughs> okay. That is but, true. But right. I need your weather spotting all day, at Curtis WEI on Instagram. Send me the photos of rain, snow, sleet, whatever you okay. have. Okay, all right, fantastic. Coming up in about 10 or 15 minutes, we will get to today's leads at 625. And then they set it at 720, which is a brief back and forth on what they said in sports. And we were going to include Heim Bloom, but you can't hear anything he says because everybody's booing. Um, was, uh, <laughs> what a weekend in Springfield, let me tell you. The Sox fans are uh, unhappy, but my lead is all about how it was a beautiful day for oh, Boston. really? Yeah, uh, spectacular weekend for Red Sox fans. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, were you able to do the show while everybody was booing? Or yeah. was, uh, well, Ken, Ken's accustomed to it. <laughs> uh, uh, no, it was a I, – I was, in all honesty – surprised by the amount of Red Sox fans that were just everywhere. Springfield became the home of Red Sox Nation. There was thousands of people there for Red Sox Winter Weekend, and the fact that they were given an opportunity to tell the decision makers how they feel was good for everyone. We talked to Sam Kennedy on Saturday. He seemed to take it in stride. Uh -huh. He admitted that their messaging was off on Bogarts, that they were too open about their love for him. And that had they just signed Devers and not said those things, that it might have been a more more um, happy reception that they would have gotten in Springfield. My dad called me after that interview, and he was like, hey, the guys did a great job with Sam Kennedy, but, I mean, that guy's just lying through his teeth. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, I, yeah, I, I get it. I get it. Xander this, Xander that. But, like, God almighty. Was John Henry staying at the Best Western? or where, where does he, When he goes to Springfield, where does he stay? I wouldn't know. I was staying in Holyoke at some random guy's house that Ken paid five bucks for. <laughs> Did you guys do dinner out there? Nope. He got in too late, so I went to bed. Oh. <laughs> it was a wild. But I did win $49. There you go. Yeah. Nice. Um, that's more than Mattress Mac made this weekend. Yep. I'm a new Mattress Mac. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So they said it coming up at 720. News with Courtney at 730. And congratulations, Boston. You are home to the second ugliest building in the United States of America. So we'll get to that news and everything else with Courtney at 7.30 on this morning's show. If you want to be on, the number to call is 617-779-7937. Or if it's easier to text, you can text on the Subaru of New England text line, which is 37937. Find your authorized Subaru retailer at SubaruofNewEngland.com. And... I will share with you the information that there are many ways in which you can enjoy this program today and every day, even if you cannot listen on the radio. You can stream it at weei.com every single morning. You can also download the Odyssey app. That's Odyssey, A-U-D-A-C-Y. And the Y stands for why isn't this app working? That's A-U-D-A-C-Y, Odyssey. Download it, and then you can listen to us from anywhere. And... You can also ask your smart speaker to play 93.7 WEEI. And here is Courtney with what is trending this morning. Now, here's what's trending on WEEI. 
Well, the Bruins shut out the Sharks last night at the TD Garden. Four goals coming from Lindholm, Pasta, Charlie McAvoy, who had folks' jaws on the ground, uh, and Nick Foligno. Linus Olmark and Jeremy Swayman combined for an 18-save shutout. A nice stat from Razor after the game. Olmark becomes the fastest goalie to 25 wins in the history of the NHL. Wow. Uh, and back to McAvoy for a second. He talked after the game about, you know, coming back from injury and if he feels like he's fully back to playing at the level he's been at in the past. Yeah, I feel like I'm really getting there. Kind of you know, a little bit like this, sorry. Uh, coming back and trying to find it. And I um, feel like I've been round and, round and into it. And, you know, that's everything. That's legs, that's confidence, that's, you know, that's, that's brain, that's all of it. So it's nice to... Uh, to feel like yourself out there and, and feel like you can contribute what the team needs from you. Yeah, this Bruins team is off tonight. They take on the Canadians on the road tomorrow. On to football. The NFC and AFC championship games are set. Sunday at 3, we have 49ers and Eagles in Philadelphia. And I think when it comes to tight ends, everybody immediately goes Travis Kelsey, Travis Kelsey. Uh-huh. George Kittle. Oh, yeah, he's a George cool Kittle is unbelievable. That catch been, yesterday. Yeah, was. And did you hear him after the game? He was like, oh, I was just doing it for TV. It was all just a show for TV. I love <laughs> He's him. been good for a long time. Yep. 6.30, Bengals and Chiefs. No neutral site needed there. This one is going through KC. And a reminder that all these games can be heard right here on WEEI. So tune in on 93.7 or listen for free on the Odyssey app. Patrick Mahomes did suffer a high ankle sprain in the Chiefs' win over the Jags. He's been cleared. He says that he is going to be good to go next Shoot, weekend. Whatever. I mean, he's going to play, but that's what he says. You could you you could see the difference in that game, yeah. um, the Kansas City game. The way he was playing before he got hurt, you're like, man, this dude makes things happen out of nowhere. And yeah. then once he got hurt, it was like the offense changed and everything. But you know, against Cincinnati, if he can't do those things that he was doing pre-injury. Yeah, he was mad on the sideline, too. Oh, yeah, it's going to be hard, man. Yep. Speaking of quarterbacks, Tom Brady has been fined a reported 16000 for that slide tackle. We have also heard from a lot of his teammates over the weekend anonymously. Mm-hmm. They're all just, you know, one teammate, another teammate said this, all saying that it did feel like a final goodbye uh, when they said they're, you know, have a nice off-seasons huh. uh, in the locker room. Yeah, for the Bucks. Yep. So did Alex Guerrero come and clean the locker out for him? Is that how that works? <laughs> I think they ship him his stuff. <laughs> do they do? They yeah. pack it up for him? Yeah, and, and I think it's yeah. like, you know, first class overnight, whatever mm-hmm. you okay. need. We'll package that thing up. <laughs> Two guys in a truck make sure it's really <laughs> nice. And Celtics are in action tonight, taking on the Magic in Orlando. A banged-up crew. The injury report has grown a bit. Robert Williams is listed as questionable. Malcolm Brogdon is out for personal reasons. And Marcus Smart is out with a right ankle sprain. That's what's trending. Here's Curtis with your weather. All right, Courtney. We have a real storm. Low low pressure off the coast of Nantucket right now, traveling east-northeast at 17 miles an hour. There's 7- to 10-foot swells off of Orleans and Rock Harbor. So, you know, small craft advisory. Head on in. <laughs> We're expecting two to four inches in Boston. And uh, the real jackpot zone, Greg. Yeah. Jaffrey, New Hampshire. Uh Uh-oh. Ten inches of snow coming your way. Wow. And and this is the kind of snow I love when the weather does this. It's going to be a wet snow, so really bend your knees when you're shoveling. Otherwise, that lower back might be barking later today. Do you think they'll close the Kankamangas Highway down, Curtis? (laughs) I think that's what you got this week. Okay. (laughs) And that's the weather. W-E-E-I, Boston Sports.
Download the Odyssey app and listen on demand anytime. Just waking up in the morning, gotta thank God. I don't know, but today seems kinda odd. No barking from the dog, no small. And mama cooked the breakfast with no hug. I got my grub on, but didn't dig out. Finally got a call from a girl I wanna dig out. Hooked it up for later as I hit the dope. Thinking, will I live another 24? I gotta go, cause I got me a drop top. And if I hit the switch, I can make the ass drop. Had to stop at a red light. Looking in my mirror, not a jacker in sight. And everything is alright. I got a beat from Kim. And she could do it all night. Called up the home. Not to pile on the Bills and Mafia when they're down, but what do you make of Steph Diggs violently cleaning his locker out after that game and leaving before some of the coaches had even returned mm. from the field? Not yeah, good. he was hot. Not good. What a dink. He was hot. Honestly, I thought he had sort of morphed into the whole Bills culture and all that, but. The one game Josh Allen doesn't play otherworldly, and you're showing him up on the sideline? Well, yeah, and even before that one particular play where he's in the end zone and he wanted the football, mm -hmm. he, he was throwing his arms up yeah. every other play. There was a low get, pass he caught. If he didn't get the football. Mm -hmm. It's like, I mean, I, I mean, I. so what would you guess? He wants out of there? Uh, <laughs> no, I think the frustration of – like with the Bills, they it, before every season here, it seems like for the past couple of years, they're instantly on a national level. Oh, this is they 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 they're a Super Bowl contender. Their team was going to be in the Super Bowl. Their team yeah. was. So I think the frustration of so he's the only one that's frustrated. No, no, no. But I, I'm not saying he's not the only one. But I think it's almost where it seems like these players are really starting to see that they don't have many kicks at the can at this thing, and they're not that it's running out on them, but. Until they get over that hump, this is what they're going to deal with every single year. And it doesn't get easy because we've already talked about Cincinnati. You know, they would have had to play Kansas City. So the AFC is unbelievably difficult mm. to get through. Yeah. What about the, I think on Friday, Shime, you told us who the best quarterback left in the playoffs was. How did he do over the weekend? Oh, uh, no, in the NFC, uh, Daniel Jones, yeah, he was really bad. Uh, I got to tell you, the one thing I was yikes. completely duped by Vanilla was Michael ever Vick? believing that the Giants were any good. No. I was, I was, I'll, I will be as frank about this as I can. I effed up. I, I got, I was just Well, it was duped. a close one. It was I mean, bad. It was a nail biter. Yeah, you know, I was, I bought into Oof. the idea that Jalen Hurts was, was hurt. He's not. He's no, fine. He's healthy. No. Uh, and the Giants just straight up stink. I don't know what I was thinking. I have to say, I love seeing Giants fans just cry on Twitter. They're all, before the game, everybody in Giants world, whatever they're called, hardos, would say like, oh, 
don't let us win tonight. And then they lose. They're like, it was a great year. I didn't even think we'd be here. <laughs> the Brady list keeps on growing and growing and growing for teams. I know there was four front-running teams out there, but that list is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Do you think Giants would be a good spot for them? I think, yeah, there are a lot yeah. of teams. The 49ers, by the way, Wiggy, you might be right. Purdy was mediocre at best yesterday. Oh, you're going to love my lead, then. <laughs> oh, good. You got, But you start to look at these teams, Greg. These teams know... And we just talked about with the Bills, like the window is the window don't stay open forever, right? And so if you have an opportunity where you feel like, oh, we have a good team, but maybe we're just missing, like the, the last last night's game, 49ers and Dallas, Dallas had so many opportunities offensively to put themselves in position and control that football game because their D was actually playing good, but Dak Prescott could not get the job that no it, and it was he, so I, bad but he and he went back to throwing picks i mean yeah. I, you know i it's i i he's oh i think he's overrated if, if wherever he ends up he's not I, he's has his decision nothing. making he's it's what his decision making was bad he was staring down receivers like he he was telling himself okay i'm gonna go here with the ball before i even snap the ball and then he'd go there and the defender's already there like just it, it, it was so it was such a poor performance, especially after seeing what he did against Tampa Bay. It was like, oh, maybe Dak is is finally ascending. He's going to win some playoff games, might actually compete. Nope, nope, just going to go back to throwing picks and making bad And bad Dallas's games. defense was, I mean, they played good. You know, when you have a defense play the way that they played and you had opportunities from the, the you know, that game and you're looking at it like, oh, if Dallas can just capitalize because their offense in San Francisco's offense didn't look any better, but – you just felt like Dallas had opportunities that they could not control. You could give Brock Purdy a little bit of credit, though. No. When it comes, he, he can improvise. You game. said Matt can't improvise. Yeah, That's a, a guy who plays. can improvise. And, and all of the guys around him, all of the guys That's on the offense thing. are constantly helping him out. People that are not right. even part but of the Courtney, play. It's when you have a top three tight end mm-hmm. and you have a top three wide receiver, or let's say a top eight wide receiver, you have a top five running back it is super easy like the george kettle uh kittle i had it's kind of crazy because i had two leads but i'm gonna go with the brady one the other point was if you don't have a playmaker it don't matter you need a playmaker yeah okay but to say that he's just a a glorified game manager he's done really well Uh, first uh, first go at it playoffs i disagreed with you last week i mean i agreed with you last week greg but watching that game Purdy is, I mean, the system, he's driving a Rolls Royce. So you That's can look it. good in a Rolls Royce. Right. Do, but you, you'd look better if you had a professional driver behind the wheel. Don't you think he could have screwed that game up way more, though? Don't he you tried think to there was, before the half? No, I know, but there were certain ball points, hands. like the, the Kittle, that one Kittle play, he could have tried to force something and screwed that over so much, but he took his time, he figured it out, Kittle got himself open and, and made that, he, Kittle was the guy. I, I understand that. But that was that. a horrible pass. Kittle, uh, who, he was wide open, he needed a one-handed. Yeah, oh, I, you listened to Kittle. He said he didn't need to do that. That was yeah. just for TVs. <laughs> yeah, no, no. no. It, it, it helps when you have a guy like George Kittle who's one of the – Of course. Of course it does. But if that team th- – that was a game where I think both both offenses looked pathetic. So right? you think that they lose? I, I Who? who the 49ers? Think? If what? In, in the championship? I, the way Philly plays, Philly yeah, runs I the football. I think Philly, Philly's going to win that football game. The, mm. I, I think it's going to be Philly Bengals. You, I, I, I think you might be right. Yeah, you might be right on that one. I, I will do whatever it takes. I'm manifesting my ass off so Mahomes goes home. That's all I care about. <laughs> all right. Well, lots to get to when it comes to football and other things on today's show. Right now, though, time for this. This is the Greg Hill Show. Time now for The Lead. Time that lead is easy top sharp dressed man. No. What? No? What? Uh give me all your love. Oh, give me all your love. Let it breathe for a second.
Leads this morning brought to you by Catches Law Group. Catches has had the backs of New England's construction workers since 1986. You pay nothing unless they win, and they oftentimes do. So if you've been injured, get a free evaluation when you call 508-321-7000 or when you just visit CatchesLaw.com. Hey, Shine. Hey, Gregory. I got to tell you, we've been talking football all morning. I'm going to continue that for a moment because I think – If you are the NFL, this is exactly the four teams you wanted in the championship games. I think right now you're looking at the two best quarterbacks in football in the AFC, even if one is hobbled. And on top of that, you get the storyline of Patrick Mahomes is dealing with a high ankle sprain and he's going up a team uh, against a team he simply has not been able to overcome. So if he's able to overcome both of those things and win, it's a win for the NFL because the storyline is great. And if the Bengals go back to the Super Bowl, it's a win for the NFL because Joe Burrow is freaking awesome. Mm. And then you look at the NFC and it is, in my opinion, the two best rosters top to bottom in the in the entire NFL. Mm. Uh, I think the Eagles and the 49ers have the most talent across the board, defense and offense, uh, that you can see in the NFL, and we're really eventually going to get kind of a battle of theories in the Super Bowl between the best roster in football against one of the best quarterbacks in football. Shine, thank you. Curtis, good morning. Hey, Greg. Looking good, my friend. Thank How are you, you, Curtis. Thank you. Any 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 area in particular, uh, or just the overall the whole the whole picture? I would say your midsection is really oh. looking quite <laughs> svelte. Oh, thank you, thank you, yeah. thanks. I really appreciate that. Well, it's good to see you. Dan and I have been working on that particular area, you know, the <laughs> lower core. Well, I hope it's not like the trainer in White Lotus. <laughs> 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 so anyway, uh, over the weekend, I spent some time in in Springfield, Mass. Lovely place, great time, and. I would put this night as a top 10 night in recent Boston sports history because of what the fans did and the importance of that. Here's what it sounded like Friday night at Red Sox Winter Weekend. I think the, the, the most uh, informed thing I can say is that it's expensive to have baseball players. To have the best. <laughs> so... <laughs> so the As I said to Sam Kennedy, the enemy is not booze or anger. The enemy is indifference and apathy. And what the Red Sox fans did, they spent the money, they went to Springfield, they're diehard fans, and the Red Sox brass should be credited for having a forum. I don't think the Jacobs would ever do this. I don't know if the Patriots or Celtics ever doing something like this. So credit to, to Henry et al. Mm-hmm. for being on the stage. And a huge stick tap in honor of Dale Arnold for the fans that were there that told the boss how they felt. Mm. And it's a good sign because you can't escape that. I believe that moment, Friday night, will be something we cite for years to come that the Red Sox got back to spending the way they used to, or they sell the team, one of the two. But there will be ramifications for that. And as I said to Sam Kennedy, they should be thrilled that people still care enough to go to Springfield in the middle of January for the right to tell the boss how they feel. I I did see a note this morning that the town hall forum portion for next year's uh, winter weekend has been canceled. You know what's amazing is that that everybody came up to me. First, they love the show, Springfield. They love the Greg Hill show. It's huge out there. A lot of questions about grinders. Uh, Honestly, I told Wiggy, at least 15. Everybody said, look, Red Rose has grinders. He bought lunch there. I told you. Well, I said that's Western Mass. It's a Western Mass thing. But the the truth is, they all said, can you believe he seemed surprised? He had to know that that was out there. Mm. And I kept saying, the richer you are, the less aware you you become. It's like the most yeah. straight line. That's yeah. why Greg, you're kind of off. But <laughs> it, it, he that he was not anticipating that. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been there. Right. But the fact that he was there and heard it. I think speaks well for the fans and what's going to happen in the future. Thank you, Curtis. Courtney, good morning. Good morning, everybody. If you haven't taken up pickleball from me preaching about the sport of the uh, future or the fact that Dante Scarnecchia plays every single morning, Major League Pickleball founder Steve Kuhn says that 11 billion eyes have joined the sport. People have joined the sport. They've seen it. They want in 11 billion in the last year. Huh. Four billion of those people came from LeBron James himself and his investment into the sport. So I'm just here to tell you, if you have not tried it, Mm. taken it up with friends, taken it up with family, maybe your parents, it's a good way to even the playing field Mm. and some type of activity. Pick it up now because you're going to be left in the dust very soon. I got to find out what it's all about. 
It's a bigger version of ping pong. You ain't got to move as far. Or you could say a smaller version of tennis. Yeah, you ain't got to move as far. I, I like that part. It's, yep. it's for old people. But it's you not... sweat during it. Like, it is yeah. a, it gets the heart rate going. I'm telling you, to stay in shape, if you want to figure out a way to hang out with your parents and their friends and, you know, keep the family together, this is the go-to thing. And I think that the Greg Hill Foundation should be having a pickleball uh, event very soon. Well, I want to do, not only do I want to do an event, but I want to try to do a show. Like, mm-hmm. I want to do a show with Dante and play pickleball who do you think would be the best pickleball player on the program staff wise wiggy he's uh, a pro athlete or, mm, yeah. yeah that's true well he's so, although he i mean when it comes to the athletic competition yeah i'm see, not he I, hasn't really done too well you lately. don't have to move as far in that so i don't you know that are you the, a good lateral mover yeah but that's I don't, the key yeah i don't have to move as far like i saw like we saw play racquetball and things of that nature pickleball you don't have to move as far like courtney like you said it's a smaller version of tennis yeah so, or right. paddle. I, I'm I'm not bad at paddle. I think I would be pretty good at, at, in a type of tournament in pickleball. Uh-huh. Um, I'm not very good at, at at ping pong though. That's what worries me. Terrible at ping pong. Well, like I said, it's a bigger version of ping pong. Right. So no, the paddles are bigger. So, yeah. You know. All right. Uh, thank you very much, You're Courtney. Welcome. Wiggy, hello. All right. Good morning. So you know, I was gonna go in a different direction of just watching all of the games yesterday and going. Man, I tell you what, you need a playmaker on offense, so Patriots, you better find one. Mm-hmm. And then I started to look at the San Francisco, and there was a lot being talked about Jimmy G. And then there was this old Brady thing out there of teams that could be front runners for him. And Courtney, I know a lot of guys are like, all right, Brady's done here in Tampa Bay. Mm-hmm. But if the 49ers do not win a Super Bowl with Brock Purdy, I'll tell you what. Brady to San Francisco is going to be a real thing mm. because when you look at their when you look at their core players, Nick Bosa is going to be a free agent, so they're going to have to pay that man a ton of money. Kittle's got three years on his deal. McCaffrey's got three years on his deal. Debo Samuel got three years on his deal. Mm. So these guys don't have a ton of time. But once you do Bosa, some of these guys might have to restructure. And so if you're the San Francisco 49ers, you got to be looking at it like. Our window is between now and the next two to three years with the guys that we do have. Uh huh. Kyle Shanahan looks at it. It's not the quarterback. It's my offense. I need a guy that I can put there that I know understands what I want to do. Because if you look at it, Jimmy Garoppolo took him to a, a Super Bowl. They were ready to move on from him. They really want to Trey Lance. And then I think they figured, well, if we put Trey Lance in this offense with his athletic ability, we could really do some things. Brock Purdy is now playing well. They're probably – it's all about the guy that – it's the, the offense. And if you could get a guy like Brady who plays with 90% mental mm-hmm. and from the neck up with all that talent, mm-hmm. because it's decision-making. Mm-hmm. You, if you are the San Francisco 49ers, you got to be thinking he could be the guy that wins us a Super Bowl if you're not able to somehow pull it and win a Super Bowl with okay. Brock Purdy. So if they don't win it, then they're in the market. You think that uh, that they are a favorite when it comes to landing spot for Tom? Right, Brady. because remember Kyle Shanahan, it's his offense. Yep. My offense makes quarterbacks really good, mm-hmm. but if I get the greatest of all time, can you imagine what I could do with him in my offense? Okay, all right, thank you, Wiggy. You got it. Several questions on the Subaru of New England text line about your math skills. There's only seven, uh, seven, maybe eight, eight, eight billion people in the world. In the entire said 11 world. billion how eyes. Are, I how, read the whole, I read the how whole are interview. They, how are they, get, how, where are the 11, are, are there alien eyes? No, 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 those are, those are the future kids. No. That are coming. <laughs> this year, <laughs> stories about Major League Pickleball hit 11 billion eyeballs. Oh, okay. okay. Right. So maybe okay. It hits, And the LeBron okay. announcement alone brought in 4 billion. Okay. So maybe okay. it hits some eyeballs twice. Okay. Or maybe they're saying it's a set. Okay. Well, there's right. two eyeballs to every person. That right. is right. true. Right. I mean, not every, but mo- most every. Okay. I mean, I, you know, there are some people who have, like, a glass eye or such. True. Uh, One hundred eye patch. billion dollars. <laughs> yes. um, but okay. All right. We're talking about football, guys. Yeah, Let's no. leave my lead alone. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, okay. She's so dumb. Okay. Okay. Talking about my math okay. while, you know, Wiggy's giving you a really good lead about yeah. Tom Brady okay. potentially going to San Francisco. Um, you know, okay. It is a pretty good 
good. Yeah, yeah it is. Go uh, burn a bagel. I think even if they win the Super Bowl, that is that that's his landing spot. I mean, if, if it were, like if they were, if if you're including uh, aliens, mm. uh, maybe some of them have like you know 40, 50 eyeballs themselves. So mm. it'd be way less aliens that need oh. to watch. You know what I mean? All right. Um, <laughs> I uh, heard a piece of I heard a piece of audio over the weekend. Uh, that I thought uh, it would be fun to share with you and and uh, get a quick opinion. Uh, we talked last week on the show about uh, actor Alec Baldwin mm-hmm. uh, being charged with involuntary manslaughter. Mm-hmm. Uh, over the weekend, his wife, Alaria Baldwin, uh, oh, who is from Newton, uh, Newton Massachusetts, yeah. grew up here. Correct. Lived her entire life here correct uh she spoke to reporters and asked reporters to uh, to leave her and her family alone and i thought uh, it was interesting just to listen to the way in which she said it and to perhaps break that down on the show this morning as my lead so here's the audio please leave my family in peace and let this all play out okay so let my kids come home and you stay away from them because they asked me, mommy, what like, what are these people doing? And it's a very hard thing as a mom to try to explain. So please, go home. Because I'm not going to say anything. And Alec is not going to say anything. I have friends that grew up their first five, ten years in a different country and have less of an accent than this woman. Why is she still, Where's she from? Why is she still, she's from, she's from Newton. Newton, Massachusetts. She's a asshole. But is she like why is Latino? She still, why is she? Her name's she, Hillary. Why, why, no. Why is she still talking with that accent? Like years later when everybody, she's been exposed as being a fraud. The only thing I can come up with, and this happened to the offense office, Pam thought Michael was stuck in character. Mm-hmm. I think she's just stuck in character <laughs> because this is the single biggest fraud <laughs> in the history of Hollywood, which is saying something. And you know what? If I'm Alec Baldwin, I'm praying to God I get jail time <laughs> to get away from this chick. <laughs> Holy cow. Oh, wow. That's unbelievable. Please leave my family in peace and let this all play out. Okay? So let my kids come home and you stay away from them. Because they ask me, Mommy, oh. what like what are these people doing? And it's a very hard thing as a mom to try to explain. Yeah. So please. Go home, because I'm not going to say anything, and Alec is not going to say anything. What's the hard thing to explain? Your husband's in Hollywood. He's charged with manslaughter. No, no, Curtis is hard. She's probably regretting she's having like 15 uh, uh, kids. It's almost like she's bouncing in and out of the accent a little bit. Yes. Know. This is muy difficile for my she, familia. Uh, Wasn't she? She once on like a interview, she was cooking, and she was like, uh, what's the name of that? About a no cucumber. <laughs> how she's you from say, New in Massachusetts. <laughs> it's unbelievable. She said, how you say cucumber. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did she uh, live? So like, he said, it's, cucumber. Uh, it's like Wiggy, where every accent he does is Jamaican. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bouncing in and out of whatever. Is she, did she live like abroad? No, she somewhere? said like she used to visit. <laughs> yeah, like people go study abroad. They don't come back with an accent. Okay. All right. Well, those, <laughs> those are this morning's leads. Coming up at 720, they said it on today's Craig Hill Show here at WEI. One storm knocked out power to over eight.
It's the football postseason winner go home, and Boston Sports Original has all the news, all the takes, and all the games. WEEI's coverage of the NFL playoffs is brought to you by Wise Snacks. Go to wisegameday.com for your chance to win one of 100 authentic pro football jerseys. And by the way, are they canceling school again already? I was in the Twitch chat just moments ago, and pins5187, who is a teacher, Mm -hmm. was pointing out that they were working remote again. It was a remote learning day, and it was the fourth snow day of the year so far. We've had no snow. Right. Yeah, Yeah, they canceled. My kid's school got canceled. It did? Because it's going to snow at noon. So I, they don't want it. They don't want them there. And then, okay. Couldn't they just have like an early dismissal? Uh, Some I, schools are doing that too. I'm I'm seeing behind on the news, like no evening classes, no uh, late okay. classes. But then a lot of places are just closed fully. Should closed we have fully. Jackson read the school closing? <laughs> <laughs> um, Curtis, you have uh, when it comes to the Weei Weather Center. What is it, 2 to 4 in Boston? Yeah, 2 to 4 in Boston. As you head north and west of town, you're going to see those numbers steadily incline. Jaffrey, New Hampshire looks to be the jackpot zone. So congrats to Jaffrey. 10 inches of snow potential. So I have to ask, Lowell, am I on the borderline of the jackpot zone or am I more towards the uh, the, the Boston number? Well, if you're close to Lowell, you've had a tough go of it, but I'm expecting the day to improve. Question uh, for the room. The New Hampshire discussion reminds me. Roadshow. Do you, do you want do you want to give throw Wiggy a bone and do the New Hampshire road show this spring in the uh in Hampton? Yeah. yeah. It, you Can't do it? do it in the spring though. That's where you it's got to be in the June. <laughs> well, don't we do road shows in June? Uh The we, last one was the first weekend the yeah, first we did week the of, June. of June I think. It was, right. Yeah, so one. I think like you got to in order to do it Hampton because the purpose of doing it there is at the Hampton Beach you want to be able to capitalize on being at the beach. So you it, want that to be I like, don't, toward listen, the end? Yeah, I, look, go where you want to go. I've thrown some of my ideas out, th- you know, okay. some of my recommendations, P-Town and um, obviously Magic uh, City. Hampton Beach. Well, uh-huh. I would love to do a Magic yeah. City road show, but <laughs> uh-huh. unfortunately we won't be getting to Atlanta. <laughs> and, and by the way, we've been talking a little bit about the games this weekend. I just saw this. Aaron Rodgers throwing passive-aggressive shade at Mike McCarthy. Matt Flynn, the former quarterback, tweeted, I just laughed out loud watching the final play of the Cowboys game. Woke up my daughter on the couch. Aaron Rodgers liked it. <laughs> so uh, a little a little shade being thrown in the direction. There's no way Mike McCarthy survives, Wiggy. I, I agree with you, but they, oh, 100% he they survived. already said that he was coming. That- Jerry Jones likes to keep these guys yeah. around because oh. it's a different version of Roger Goodell as their head coach. It's a guy, they he can put all the blame on them, mm-hmm. and they just take all of the bullets for all of the bad press, and he gets none of it. This is Sylvester from Atlanta. Hello, Sylvester. Uh, good morning. Hey. Um, sad for sad for Buffalo, obviously. Um, that's kind of what you get for uh, buying all those tickets and talking all week. Uh, you know, writing the check before you cash them. Uh-huh. But uh, <laughs> it actually reminds me of 04 when the Colts bought those tickets to Pittsburgh before uh, they came to New England to mm-hmm. beat kick their ass, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, um, Nick Sirianni, I think he's the perfect Philly guy. He just got that attitude. I don't know if you guys remember seeing that quote. He's like, I know what the, you know, F I'm doing, mm-hmm. or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah. I got an easy uh, solution for the Bills. What? Easy solution. And this, if the Bills fans really want to see them have a chance to win a Super Bowl, it's very simple. Build a damn dome because Buffalo yep. is not built to play outdoors. Josh Allen is not that dude. Build a dome so they never have to play in well, inclement I, weather. I, I, I thought, and I think you said it last week on the, on Friday when we were talking about the neutral site, I thought weather was an advantage for the New England Patriots. For, for the, the last, Patriots. For the last 20 years. Yeah, the Patriots. Okay, well, then you got to build a football team. You're in Buffalo. Yeah, every time it snows, you get four feet. You got to build a yeah, team. Yeah, where, where Josh weather... Allen's not good. Yeah, we've done out this there. before. I even had a lead going back to when Josh Allen was at Wyoming. He's not a good cold weather quarterback. They and so if you know the quarterback that you have, then you need to build a dome if you really want to see this team get over the hump. Because it yeah. takes like ten years to build a dome. By the time they build it, he'll be gone. Right, and it, uh, you can turn it around pretty quickly. <laughs> throw those things up quick, but that's the problem with the Bills. When the weather is bad, maybe, maybe they should build a temporary dome. Something like I mean, biodome. They, they, they could the do great, oh, the great, great movie. Great Polly Shore movie. Oh yeah. Um, 
But that's the only way when you watch the Buffalo Bills play is in the and the Atlanta. And I, I think it was uh, Costos was saying this, and I completely agree with him, is that if the AFC championship game in Buffalo would have made it was in Atlanta, it's an advantage for them because – Josh Allen is much better when he's not playing okay, in cold weather. Okay, but they didn't weather. lose that football game because of the weather. No, no, I didn't say that. But when the weather's bad, they don't play as good. Especially that pass. Their defense game. also straight up stinks. It was the most overrated defense in football. Yep. Like, they're ranked all, number one in all these nerd numbers. And yet, uh, Joe Burrow and other guys, I mean, Skyler Effing Thompson was able to score against them. Granted, he got some turnover help, but still. Like, I... They that defense was not good yesterday. And Cincinnati is good, man. And to, and maybe we would have gave Cincinnati more credit if that game would have finished the uh, the uh, unfortunate Demar Ham- Hamlin game, yeah. because we really didn't know what Cincinnati was, yeah. right? Because yeah. we 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 knew that they were good, but we yeah. didn't see them. And that Buffalo game, we're like, all right, let's see what Cincinnati is. Why isn't this a neutral game with Cincinnati and the Chiefs? Because what's different? I, I think the only thing that it was different and based on this is Cincinnati had four losses and Buffalo had three. Yeah, I mean, I, because that that the outcome of that game with Buffalo would not have made a difference when it comes to head-to-head with the Chiefs, record-wise. I guess, but they beat the Chiefs head-to-head this yes. year. Yeah, that, mean, that, game, that game that didn't happen would have been big for uh, everybody. It would have favored Cincinnati, but Cincinnati, you know, they were able to go to – they were able to go to Buffalo and beat them. It would have helped Cincinnati in the sense that if they would have won that game, I believe Cincinnati. No, because uh, Kansas still Kansas City still had three losses, right. so Cincinnati well, still would have been yeah. there. Nonetheless, uh, I'm defending seed. the wall of the Bengals. <laughs> yeah. I, I am the biggest Bengals fan on the planet this week. <laughs> Coming up at 7.20, they said it, which is a quick back and forth on what they said yesterday in sports. And then Courtney has the news at 7.30, and congratulations, Boston. You are home to the second ugliest building in the United States and the fourth ugliest building in the world. So congratulations are in order. We'll get to that during the news coming up at 7.30. Gresh and Fourier. I know that.
This hour of the Greg Hill Show is brought to you by East Coast Metal Roofing. Don't be left out. The Greg Hill Show on WEEI. Boston Sports Original. shoulder everyone talking about a neutral AFC championship game not even thinking about you guys how much did that motivate you coming into this you better send those refunds <laughs> the oil down the desert way have to shake it to the top how can you not love Joe Burrow Joe cool. cool. He yep. is so cool. I mean I would I would ride him all the way shime ride him all the way ride him every single day um I, I mean, it is I, crazy to me that you guys think that people aren't talking about him as not. much as they are. It, it, they I don't talk about him on a normal cycle. They do not talk about him right. nearly I, as much as Mahomes and Allen. Yeah. Yes. If you want to talk about ESPN, if you want to talk about NFL Network, if you want to look at the actual people out there in that's, the world. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. I know, and I'm telling you from the common fan point of view, when you look at who people are talking about, who people want to see in the Super Bowl, people want to see Joe Burrow. People are talking about Joe Burrow more than they're talking about any of these other quarterbacks on social media. That's not what I was – I don't know. uh, You've been arguing this all morning. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not arguing. I'm just saying that I – What I said was that Joe Burrow Mm -hmm. is not in the conversation enough when it comes to talking heads – about the great quarterbacks currently playing in the NFL. It's all Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen. What do you think is going to be talked about more? Mm -hmm. The fact that Joe Burrow took Cincinnati to another AFC championship game or how Josh Allen and the Buffalo Bills blew their chances of you know, getting to a Super Bowl. It's going to be the latter. Right. And that's, and that's what I'm talking about. It, you, you nailed it in a nutshell. It's, I mean, I, all we talked about, and rightly so, was how much momentum the Bills would have based on what happened to them this season, what right. they had to overcome. Right. And they are just, uh, they're done again. They're finished. And the biggest disrespect for my side is, that Mahomes is above everybody else. It's not that Mahomes is better than Allen or Burrow. It's just assumed it's Mahomes versus Brady, which is laughable because he is one in five against Allen and Burrows in his last six games. Could you imagine the conversation nationally if Brady couldn't beat his peers? It would no longer be about Montana. It'd be about Manning. Yet Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs, if they lose this game Sunday, which I pray to God they do, they will be he Patrick Mahomes will be 0 and 4 against Joe Burrow, and at that point, and he will have lost consecutive AFC Championship games at home. Yeah, I guy. think we just need to all like Brady. It, it it is what it is. Brady's on his own island by himself. Mm-hmm. No one should even be brought up in that conversation. I agree with you, Curtis. It should. It, Mahomes is the clear cut best of the bunch right now. Brady's over here. We don't. You you can't compare Mahomes to Brady. It's not even in the same stratosphere. Correct. But when we think about Mahomes, prior to him getting hurt, the way he plays and what he's able to do, because and I'm comparing him to the other guys, he's done something that Josh Allen hasn't been able to do. Got over that hump. So it's like Mahomes. Okay, but but Curtis is just telling you he's been unable to be successful against Joe Burrow. He that is true. And Wiggy, as a guy that played on that Patriots team that's consumed the NFL more than anybody else, if Brady 
were 0-3 against Manning entering an AFC championship game, would there be any other topic nationally? No. So why is it not the case with Mahomes? Why because, am I the only person saying because this? Because I, I, I don't know. Like, I don't – I just think it's Mahomes' play when you compare – yes, he's lost to those guys – but it's neither, not those guys. It's the guy. But you, neither, you but just, neither one just, of those guys have won a Super Bowl. You don't like the Joe Burrow style quarterback. No, you I like Joe Burrow. No, I would no, say no, we, you don't. No, you no, don't, no. Don't, I've always give, been on Joe Burrow. No, you don't. You 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 like the Lamar Jackson style quarterback. You, you don't. can get me Joe Burrow. I'll take Joe Burrow over. I won't take him over Mahomes. I take him over Josh Allen. Would you take him over Lamar? Yep, don't yeah. even have to think. Yeah, about I it. would no. take him over Lamar. Zappy? I would, Zappy? I would no, I, <laughs> Zappy all day. I like Zappy. But Joe Burrow, in my opinion, is he's 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 a step down as far as when we talk about the two. Like Josh Allen, I think Josh Allen is a, a tremendous quarterback. I just think that there are things that are, he hasn't proven that he can get over that hump, and I think some of these big games play into his mind a little bit, and now it's starting to look like. The more pressure that you put on Josh Allen, and when I say pressure, I mean the more we talk about how this is the Buffalo Bills year, this is the Buffalo, yeah. he, that's it, when he starts to, in the it, biggest it, games. It doesn't get to Joe Burrow. I mean, they, no. they he went out there in their stadium, first drive, goes down and scores. I mean, right. it, it's doesn't. But he has to win. He has to win on Sunday because if, it, if, if Joe Burrow can't beat Kansas City on Sunday and Kansas City advances to another Super Bowl, it's a moot point because Joe Burrow – He's gotten to a Super Bowl, but he wasn't able to win. So it doesn't matter that he seemed to have Kansas City's number in the past. Doesn't as matter. long as it, it has to happen on this Sunday. It has to, yeah, because if if they don't win, now we're talking about yeah, Patrick Mahomes fair. and can he win another Super Bowl? And the the Kansas City Chiefs have been to what four of the uh, last five AFC Championship games, and they hosted them this, that, and the other. Joe Burrow is in the conversation, but he's another one until he gets over the hump. What what do we went to a Super Bowl last and lost. year? I know. Right. So he's still one of the, the team that beat him isn't even in it. Right, but he's still a one I mean, of the, the elite quarterbacks, and I think he's he's and, he is absolutely one of the elite right, quarterbacks. But but just like Josh you can argue that he's the best quarterback in the league right but now. But just like Josh Allen and Did you hear me? You can argue that he is the best quarterback in the league right no, now. No, you can't. He's not better than Mahomes. Stop but here's it. the situation, Wiggy, where you're being and I hate to steal a word fraudulent. Mm -hmm. I would never dispute that as a talent of throwing the football, I think Peyton Manning had more tools in his shed. Yes. And he is a massive tool, but he had more tools in his shed than Tom Brady. Yeah. But nobody would dispute that Brady right. had a better career. You, I will never say that Mahomes is not the most talented quarterback in the NFL. Definitely. But if he loses and he's 0-4 against Burrow, yeah, if he Burrow's loses. a better quarterback. But yeah. if he loses, but if he doesn't lose. Well, right now he isn't because he's 0-3 against oh, no, 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 been He's been in the league longer. Yeah, but the conversation is about Joe Burrow. The conversation is about one guy has won a Super Bowl. One guy hasn't. So how what, what are we even having a discussion about this for? The guy who's won a Super Bowl and Patrick Mahomes has proven hmm. that he's able to get his team there and win. Joe Burrow's got his team there and lost. No. All right. Um, they said it coming up in just about 10 minutes or thereabouts, and then the news with Courtney. And speaking of Courtney, here is what is trending right this moment. Your home of the Sox. Now, here's what's trending on WEEI. The Bruins shut out the Sharks last night at the TD Garden. The four goals came from Lindholm, Pasta, Charlie McAvoy, who had folks jaw jaws on the ground, and Nick Foligno. Linus Allmark and Jeremy Swayman combined for 18 saves. A nice stat from Razor after the game. Allmark becomes the fastest goalie to 25 wins in the history of the NHL. And back to McAvoy for a second. He did talk after the game about if he's feeling like he's fully back to playing at the level he's been at in the past after the injury. Yeah, I feel like I'm really getting there, kind of, you know, a little bit like this, sorry, uh, coming back and trying to find it, and um, I feel like I've been round and, round and into it, and, you know, that's everything, that's legs, that's confidence, that's, you know, that's, that's brain, that's all of it, so it's nice to, uh, to feel like yourself out there and, and feel like you can contribute what the team needs from you.
the confidence is there too. He goes on to say that you know every night you come to play at home and you feel like it's a game you're going to win. To have that confidence going into every single game is what's making this Bruins team different, in my opinion. And the guys are off tonight. They take on the Canadians on the road tomorrow. On to football. The NFC and AFC championship games are set Sunday at three. We have 49ers and Eagles in Philly, and at 6:30, Bengals and Chiefs. No neutral site needed here. This one is going through KC. Reminder that all these games can be heard right here on WEEI. So listen on 93.7 or uh, for free on the Odyssey app. Patrick Mahomes did suffer a high ankle sprain in the Chiefs win over the Jags over the weekend. He has been clear that he will be good to go next weekend, but I think that this is going to be what everybody's looking at going into this game. Well, mm. if if Mahomes wasn't hurt, and this goes kind of goes back to this Joe Burrow conversation, I think that we're talking about can Mahomes win hit, hit another championship? Joe Burrow, this is his year. You're going to have a hobbled uh, uh, Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes. Mm-hmm. This is your year. You're going to, if you do the make this. The excuses have begun. No, this is his year. If he doesn't get over the hump, we're now saying he's Peyton Manning. Very talented, but when you going to win a Super Bowl, bro? What? <laughs> what? But how many years has, has Joe Burrow been in the league? Was it fourth like, year? Yeah, that's. And he was uh, injured for one. Peyton Manning didn't win a playoff game until his, like, sixth year in the league. No, he didn't. It was third year in that. The yeah. So, but my point is, is that he has the talent. But what we're saying, you when think you, this Bengals team is as talented as those Colts teams were? No, 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 no. We're saying that he's an elite quarterback. He has the talent. But I'm saying that Mahomes is the guy. Until you beat the guy, you can't beat the guy. He beat the guy, the guy beat last year. At no. his house. In the Super Bowl, when it counts, until you can say. He's not going <laughs> to ever play the guy no. in the Super until Bowl. until you can match rings. <laughs> until you can match he rings. He beat the guy at his own no. Arrowhead Stadium. Until or whatever, can, they, whatever until, the, the new name of it is. No, it's Greg, still Arrowhead. Greg, Greg until, and, why don't they change? That needs to be changed I started a petition to change <laughs> okay. Until Joe Burrow can match rings with Mahomes, that's just going to the nature of the beast. Wait, so Peyton Manning was drafted in 98. 98, yep. 99, 2000, 2001, 2002. He won his first playoff right, game so four six years, years in. into the league. Until you can match rings. God, I hate when I'm right. Until you can match rings. And how long has Mahomes been in the league? What, five or six years? Five, I think. Until you can match rings. 17, you, 18, 19, 20, 21, You can't 22. compare the two. Mm-hmm. One's got a ring, one don't. Yep. That's all I'm saying. I, listen, ain't nobody knocking Joe Burrow, but it, it's facts is facts. So if the Bengals lose Sunday and yep. they fall to one and one against Mahomes at his house in yep. AFC Championship games, yep. he's now beneath him? Yeah, because one got a ring and one don't. Oh, my Atlanta. Isn't this Joe Burrow, isn't this his third season? Uh, I think it's I'm his not third, sure. Is it third or fourth? I think it's Maybe his it's third, third season. And Curtis pointed out that he was hurt his first season. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you're so talking Mahomes about- won a Super Bowl his second season. <laughs> what are we gonna do this? Are we gonna jerk but each other? No, it was his third, third season. season. Then that would go- be Burrow went to the Super Bowl in a second. Yeah, he lost. Right, but but now all of a sudden, wait, Mahomes went to the Super Bowl in his third season. He sat behind Alex Smith in 2017. Yeah, and then his next year he won the MVP. Oh, he won the MVP and lost. He lost a home playoff. Game. Right, he won the a- MVP and lost as a favorite to a 43 year old. Right, he lost in the guy. AFC Championship, and then the year after that he won the Super Bowl. And then he lost again to a 44 year old. But he won one. He lost to a guy like he an octogenarian. One. Bottom line, that's it. It's about winning. Mm-hmm. One guy got one. The same way with so Josh Allen. So is Trent Allen. Dilfer a better quarterback than Dan Marino? No, but we're talking about guys right now. We're, we're talking about the elite well, of the Trent elite. Trent won one. Dan no, didn't. No, but you're, now you're changing the whole conversation. <laughs> How is it changing the conversation? We're talking about the elite of the elite, Curtis. You sound stupid right well, now. That's you're comparing place. Trent Dilfer and well, Dan you're Marino. Calling. Well, if t- you sound stupid, I'm going to call you stupid. I won't right. stand. I don't care how many butter cakes you had Saturday night. You don't. You're not calling people stupid. Well, when you sound stupid and you say stupid stuff, you're called stupid. Ken, I hope you're listening. We have a meeting today. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, the Celtics are in action tonight, taking on the Magic in Orlando. A banged-up crew. The injury report has grown. Robert Williams listed as questionable. Malcolm Brogdon is out for personal reasons. And Marcus Smart is out with a right ankle sprain. That is what's trending. Here's Curtis. Curtis, I don't think you're stupid. And uh, here he is with your weapon. Oh, thank you, Courtney. And I think that was a lovely update. Got some uh, nice nice little conversation, a little witty banter back and forth. (laughs) Uh, it's raining in Boston, 36 degrees, and uh, this afternoon, expect the snow to start around 1 o'clock. It's going to be heavy out there, so I would strongly recommend you get what you need to get done this morning and then batten down the hatches with some bread and milk this afternoon. Any photos from your weather watchers? We do. Let's go up to uh, Gray, Maine, oh, where okay. A-Dubs on Instagram sent this. Heading to work with his dad looks mm. like an ugly scene oh, out there. Sure. What's that? Gray, Maine? Yep. 
Wow. wow. What the hell is that? Uh, that's, I don't know, but it looks very scary. So as an old lights. friend once said, be careful out there. What are they doing out of their vehicles? I think this was for the show. They were getting oh. out there doing Taking a... Taking a picture. That's dangerous. I didn't yeah. know if they were rescuing an owl or something like that. Oh, I mean, it is Maine. They, they are mean, endangered. <laughs> yeah. All right, Curtis. Uh, it, please join the Curtis Weather Watching yeah. Club. At uh, Curtis W-E-E-I on Instagram. I need to have all the sights and sounds because we can't look out a window. We need to see where you are and what the weather is. All right. They said it. A quick back and forth on what they said yesterday in sports. Coming up next. The Rich Keith Show. If map-
Tuesday, that means Ty Law will join us at 8.20 on this show. Curtis says, uh, a real banger of an Alberta clipper, uh, clip, clipper <laughs> arriving. <laughs> uh, what, uh, noon or so, Curtis? From, this weather from, isn't that easy, huh, Greg? I mean, uh, in Boston, yeah. noon is when it's going to start to snow in two to four inches. Yeah. But uh, everywhere else, getting walloped. So... Uh, more on that during the award-winning weather forecast from Chris Curtis coming up at 8.10 or 8.12 or something like that. Right now, though, this. It's time for... Larry Bird's not walking through that door, fans. Would not say that I'm Mona Lisa Vito of the football world. They... They want you to cook the dinner. At least they ought to let you shop for some of the groceries. Said it. Wake up to Del Bambino and have me face him. Maybe I'll grill him in the eye. They said it. I'm just going to say it. All right, time for They Said It. A quick back and forth on what they said over the weekend in sports. And where do we start this morning, Shine? Well, we start uh, post-Cincinnati-Buffalo because uh, the Cincinnati guys were popping off left and right. We already heard Joe Burrow talk about getting your refunds. Well, here's what Zach Taylor said uh, about, you know, uh, having to not not being able to play the game at the neutral site. Yeah, we, we just we had our mindset to go play in Kansas City, and and uh, it it, I, it is it is tough because they they have to formulate the plans for coin tosses, and they got to formulate the plans for neutral site games, and we just keep screwing it up for everybody, and I hate that for for people that have to endure all those logistical issues, and then uh, we just keep screwing it up. So I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I love the pettiness. Yeah, I mean, I well, you played the game, so are I mean, how much of a factor is being able to use stuff like that? Oh, you hear it? We we heard it with um the Pittsburgh Steelers when they planned the trip mm-hmm. to the Super Bowl, and AFC then we heard championship it championship game, and then we heard it with the Rams when they started out at like seventeen and a half point favorites or something like that. So you definitely hear it as a player, and and when you heard Burrow say it after the game, or you hear Zach Taylor say it, they know, and they kind of know right now. They know that they're like the little brothers when you talk about the Kansas City Chiefs and the Buffalo Bills. It's Kansas City, Buffalo, then Cincinnati. Now Mahomes is tweeting away with a like an alarm clock, and I he's I assume he's going to play, right? Yeah. I mean, I, there, yeah. there, uh, there, uh, there's, there's some saying it's going to be really difficult for him to play, but I assume he's playing. Yeah, he's, I believe Romo said on the post game that it it will be challenging for Mahomes to play in this game. But I think, I mean, he's if he played in that game, he's going to play in this game, which is you know, 
they'll shoot it up. He's not going to be the same Mahomes that you saw before the injury because nope. oh, he relies on his third. mobility. <laughs> but he'll he'll play. Yeah. Do you think this now changes the fact that we all thought that the neutral site, well, not all of us, Wiggy didn't, the neutral site thing was going to become just the norm for the NFL now that they don't have an excuse to have one this season moving forward? Or do you think they're still going to try to push that? No, I think yesterday put a pretty big damper on any thoughts that they would do that soon. I think it's something they could do in the future, but the fact that they don't have the game with everybody going and having it be a success, I think it's a difficult thing to shoehorn in next year without having a precedent. I couldn't believe Saturday, too, before the uh, Jags-Chiefs game, Mm -hmm. the way that the the folks calling the game were talking about how terrible it was for the sport to do a neutral site. Like, they were speaking so openly about it during a game that it didn't matter the outcome of that for Mm -hmm. the neutral site. That's what was on everybody's mind this weekend. I wonder, uh, could those Buffalo people who bought, like, the airfare in the hotels, can they just enjoy a nice weekend down in Atlanta? Or, you like, can. The, I mean, I mean they, Centennial it's... Park and Magic City sounds like a good yeah, time to be. The league can. should hire Wiggy to do some type of, like, tour of Atlanta for mm-hmm. all the fans that already bought some tickets. lemon pepper wings. Just don't wear no jewelry when you're down there. Don't, <laughs> yeah. don't drive in no nice let, car. Let me tell you, if you go to Magic City, the Pat Town is no joke. I'm still <laughs> haunted by it. <laughs> all right, what's next, Sean? Uh, well, the next one we got for you is there was a bit of an altercation uh, at a basketball game this weekend involving NFL great Shannon Sharp uh, and uh, uh, Dylan Brooks. This is what Dylan Brooks had to say after the game uh, about Shannon Sharp. I ain't talking about that. You can ask him. Cool. He's the, the blogger or whatever he is. Uh, I don't really care about all that. Next question. I know you said earlier you didn't want to talk about what Shannon said, but there was a report that he said he started to talk with you, saying that you're too small to guard LeBron, and then you swore back at him. Is that what happened? What no, was I told him he missed the shot. That's all. Do you think I, it's appropriate for a fan to kind of go back and forth with you guys like that? A regular pedestrian like him? No. He shouldn't have never came back in the game. <laughs> Well, what a flex. He called him a blogger or something like that. <laughs> and then a regular pedestrian. Yeah, pedestrian. <laughs> you know, it's part of it. Uh, it's trash talking. Uh, we have audio of Shannon Sharp months ago <laughs> when LeBron James started the, the crusade against fans thinking they were a part of the game. Uh-huh. This is a 50-second cut. Bear with me. Enjoy the skip. Mm-hmm. As Shannon Sharp decries the fan behavior at sporting events. The fans somehow skip, and these look. You know where these seats call skip sitting courtside. So these are some. This is you know well uh-huh. well to do. They know right from wrong. Yeah. But somehow, you think because you had an absorbent amount of money, what? And the and the athlete are there to entertain you. Mm. You can say you can do whatever, mm. and it's well within my right because I paid five thousand or I paid an absorbent amount of money for mm. this ticket. Mm. You cannot. You should not. And I agree with LeBron. Skip boo me. It's a badge of honor if I'm in a visit an arena and I get booed. Mm. But you cannot <laughs> say certain things like what they be saying and think that it's okay. Huh? And what has transpired is that America has become more comfortable <laughs> with saying things to people and then using the term snowflake. Oh, you soft. Mm. Nah, bruh. Give me my respect. <laughs> <laughs> Just let that live, Shannon. Oh. What a jerk. Oh, God. You can talk Absolute, trash. Huh? I don't mind fans talking trash. Just don't cross the line. Well, I mean, it's you, like what oh, you're oh, there oh. to watch a game. Or, it, like, Not why, if you spend what? all that money. Like, I, I always loved Spike Lee as a fan. Like, your Jack, is it Nicholas? Mm-hmm. Jack Nicholas? Like, no, I always, Jack no. Nicholson. Nicholson. Jack all right. Nicholson. Nick, Jack Nicholas, Nicholas though, is a courtside a lot, too. No, the one what? that's the actor. Jack Nicholas. Oh. <laughs> The one from the um, Acton, the yeah. Departed. It, that's about, Jack about, Nicholas is the Departed actor, right? No, no, that's he's the Nicholson? golfer. Jack Nicholson, yeah, one of them. Uh, I always, I always a, get them confused. Me too. <laughs> I thought Nicholson was the golfer and Nicholas was the actor. <laughs> no, I don't know. Um. I always get them confused. But I don't mind if you're spending that much money and you know you're keeping it clean. He said you're too small. But I don't mind a player barking back and telling him to go, hey, man, F yourself. Wait, but the whole premise of that was LeBron James whining about fan behavior. And now LeBron says he sides with Shannon 365 and 366 mm-hmm. if it's a leap year for doing what he was just condemning. Uh-huh. Uh, by the way, Jack Nicholas, great in The Shining. Probably his best work, I would say. <laughs> I um, love the golden bear. It's courtside. <laughs> 
<laughs> I do court. I always yeah, get them confused. Yeah, I mean, come on, that's so an easy mean, mistake. Nicholas the court side of the game started at three p.m. I mean, that's a little late. A little late. For <laughs> he was court side at winter weekend. <laughs> so Nicholas is the actor. No, Nicholson's no, the actor. Holy the actor no. Nicholson's the actor. I always get them too. Me too. One the, he's one of the greatest actors of a generation. Well, I know when I see his I, face, Jack Nicholas is what pops in my yeah. head. Just is what it is. The problem is the golfer is, isn't he like a, one of the greatest golfers of his generation? <laughs> so that's he's the, the greatest problem. golfer of all time. He has the most majors in the history right, of Right, so golf. the problem is you got two guys that mm-hmm. are great at what they do, yep. uh, and their names, you know, basically are almost the same. All right. Uh, what's next, Shy? That's, that's what we got today. Oh, that's all we so. have? I thought, you had, I thought you had three. All right. Well, they're very good. There we go. Thank you very much. And time for this. It's time for... Down here in Sitchwood, we get that saying, you know... The news. Still waters run deep. Amen. So if it's still on the top, it's, it, it's still on the bottom. With your host, Courtney Cox. What's her name? Courtney, Coco, whatever. The news is sponsored by Northeast Men's Health. The experts in men's sexual health with four locations, including their newest in Woburn, with appointments as early as 7 a.m. Visit northeastmenshealth.com for more. Pure panty dropper. On WEEI. All right, it's time now for the news with Courtney. Where do you want to start this morning? Well, the daughter of a Massachusetts congresswoman, Catherine Clark, her daughter Riley, was arrested during a protest on Boston Common and later charged with assault after a police officer was injured uh, on Saturday. Hmm. Um, So officers responded to a report that uh, Parkman Bandstand Monument, which is located in the Boston Common, was being... um, spray painted by mm-hmm. a group of people uh-huh. uh they arrested riley so of course her mom is getting the backlash from this she is uh-huh. a congresswoman in massachusetts she tweeted i love riley and this is a very difficult time in the cycle of joy and pain and parenting mm. this will be evaluated by the legal system and i am confident in that process huh. now is it a bad thing if you're a member of congress from this state, mm-hmm. and this is the only time uh, anybody's ever heard of you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's I also. Just to, I, <laughs> she I'm was just, doing like anti police uh, uh, like spray painting. So this is really yeah. bad for her mom. Uh huh. Well, it's probably not because her. I'm guessing her mom may be a defund the police type of person. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think regardless, having your daughter spray paint stuff like that. They're on probably it. having the mm-hmm. conversation at the crib. That's, so that's probably why she's oh, doing yeah. it. You know? Okay. Bad right. luck. And residents of Soma at the T apartment complex in Mattapan held a rally on Saturday after the rise of rent and eviction notices have pushed them overboard. We mm. can hear from 72-year-old Annie Gordon. She's lived there for 48 years, and she said in this past year, she has noticed her rent going up $300 a month. Jesus. 300 a month? Yep. A month? Yep. This is what she has that to say. That seems ridiculous. But yeah, and that's why people, they're they're rallying. Okay. They started raising the rents. A lot of people did move out, but I decided after 48 years, I've been here that long, I don't want to leave. This is my home. I raised my son here, so I don't want to leave a community that I love and uh, have been in for a long time. Mm. Yeah, that's a rather three hundred a month. Yeah, rather precipitous rise. She said she was paying like eighteen hundred bucks for a really long time, and then they rent they raise it a little bit. But she said in the last year, uh, three hundred a month. Oh, yeah. that's all. That's okay. what all these um, high rises and when you start to change the city and what it looks like, the the rent goes up, goes up and up and up. Well, what do you, what do you mean? Well, you put all these luxury apartments in yep. that cost more money. Right, so people want to live in a nice area with luxury apartments, and then guess what? Now they price people out, and you come in and you tear down the stuff that used to be a little bit more affordable, and you put in more luxury apartments. Oh, I mean, that's just the way it is. You're not you're not a gentrification person. Uh listen, I I, I want a city that is safe and nice, and sometimes the cost of those cities cost more. Well, I see all you do is spend time, uh, any off moment that you have, you're in the seaport. Yeah, I don't have an I issue saw, with I it. ran into Mr. and Mrs. Wiggins at Ocean mm-hmm. Prime on Saturday you, night. You, you, what are the odds? You, <laughs> you know the saying. You, 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 I you, can't believe what Mrs. Wiggins is about to do for work. Well, you pay what you get. Are we allowed to talk about that? I'm not sure. you got to oh. ask her that. You're asking the wrong person. Did you her, walk new, in? Her, her new job. Well, I mean, she has a lot of jobs. Brand manager? No, no I mean, she... I think we could. I mean, oh, you her 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 sex advice stuff? Yeah, she's gonna oh. be a sex therapist. Yeah, she's gonna oh. start giving some advice. <laughs> she's uh, you know, she knows. I would it. go to Mrs. Wiggins if well, I needed it. Well, there are a lot of people that yeah. I found out need help in a lot of things. 
Some people are paying life coaches, what, $6,000 I mean, a month. So, I mean, there is an opportunity out there. Mm-hmm. That's what makes it such a great place to live, America. I mean, and, yeah. Wiggy, can I just point this out? This is why Greg Hill is the GOAT. He totally deflected the high cost of rent and the impact of the seaport within 30 seconds by putting it right back on you and the news he got from your wife. So well done, Greg. The seaport's nice. Uh-huh. I mean, a lot of nice high rises now. Did you man. walk in and sit at the bar and they said, no, sir, that saved from, from no, Mr. No, no, Hill? no, no. We, we, uh, we had dinner in the back and then we made our way to the bar and we, uh, G. Hill was, I, he was a little disappointed that I didn't check in. You know, I'm coming yeah. to his hood. Right. When well, he I, goes, he doesn't, it's uh, it's a weird thing. He goes to the, to the restaurant I go to, and he doesn't tell me he's going. Yeah, I got to check in. I so. think he's trying to avoid me. No, I dropped the ball. Now. I, I caught them as they were leaving. Everybody knows that, hey, if you want to go someplace that's not your neighborhood, it's not your, you should check in with the mm-hmm. people that run it. Do you have so, a tab? Like, if I came for lunch, can I say put it on Greg's tab? I, Curtis, I would buy you lunch. Oh, what a nice time. Any, whatever you want. Oh, what a guy. You are a Marconi winner, I, after Hey, all. I mean, the, the crowds were a little too big for me in Springfield, but I got used to <laughs> Did you bring the Marconi? You should have brought the Marconi with you to Springfield. No, but I mean this sincerely. This show is freaking banging out there. Really? Mm. Everybody talking about the show. Everybody was, it was all about Grinders. That yep. was, <laughs> I, I got asked about Grinders 72 times, but everybody was very nice. Well, and they I'm going to have to go I, get a Grinder out mm-hmm. there. Weren't they bringing, didn't they bring you receipts? Like, weren't they, weren't people bringing you menus that said grinders and the, such? They and, did. And the sweetest people, they were literally, because MGM is right next to Red Rose Pizzeria. And so they'd come in from Red Rose and be like, there's grinder on the menu. Wiggy was there. He <laughs> ate it. I did go to that place, but we got pizza there. Everybody yeah. said, get the pizza there. No one said, get the subs there or mm-hmm. the grinders. Yeah. But we did get the pizza there, which All is right. really good. Another win for me. Uh, what else? <laughs> <laughs> this is not a good story for Elon. A uh, guy in Wakefield hit some black eyes on I-95 Thursday night. He lost control of his car, hit the guardrail. Mm. Now, he, he felt safe. He, he was okay. The car hit the guardrail, was a little banged up, but he walked out, got himself out of the car, walked away. It was mm-hmm. a Tesla? Tesla. Okay. He gets home. Tesla explodes, bursts into flames, took 20,000 gallons of water to Jesus. put this thing out. Because oh, it's and, an electric vehicle. Yes, people are wondering, <laughs> wait, so this was the, the, the accident happened, you know, hours ago. Yeah. Why mm-hmm. is it just bursting into flames now? Oh, my gosh. You can see the thing on the Twitch feed right now. Yep. And so it was very difficult for firefighters to put it out because it's an electric car. Correct. Oh. We can hear from Wakefield Fire Chief Tom Purcell. The stuff that's coming out of that smoke and the flame temperatures can exceed, you know, 2,500 degrees as opposed to a normal vehicle fire. So there's a lot of stuff going on. And they just don't go out. You can shut your lines down after five minutes. You put the fire out in the battery and it reignites within uh, a minute or two. Jeez. Wow. So it seems, though, no like idea. Teslas are really safe if you are to get into an accident. It's just the after effect yeah. of said accident. you got to well, get yeah. out of that How car. How long after do I get, right. to get out of it the burn, Tesla? It burns for five years. But it's good for the, it's good for the environment. Yeah. What, 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 what do battery burnings do for the atmosphere? Probably not good. Mm. Could you imagine if a Tesla went on fire and started a wildfire in California? Uh, <laughs> How good is it for the environment? If you need to use 20,000 gallons of right. water to put out every electric car fire, asking for a friend. Mm. Can't you just sit there and let it burn and burn itself out eventually? <laughs> Could you imagine if an actual car required that, the number of stories on what would, you know, how many kids are, you know, don't have water in third world countries? Unbelievable. <clears throat> I'm sure they talked about that in Davos. <laughs> I'm sure they did. All right. We're going to take a quick break, but the rest of the news coming up with Courtney, including Florida, not like the rest of us. Apparently, Florida is not anything goes. I always call it the anything goes state, but it's not anything goes when it comes to a new bar concept that they have decided is too much, mm. even for Florida. So, <laughs> Wait till you see the photos. Oh, uh, their photos with yep. us? All right. We'll get to that. Make sure you go to Twitch and follow WEEI so you can see that. That's all coming up next on The Greg Hill Show here at WEEI. One storm knocked out power.
Where you go. Tomorrow on this show, Thai Tuesday, Thai Law at 8.20, coming up this morning at 8.30. What are we doing with Chris Curtis? But right now... Back to Courtney and the rest of today's news. And we're going to go to Florida for the next story. Okay. And now. It's one of those only in Florida type of stories. <laughs> Another edition of. Come to Miami. Florida. Florida. Not like the rest of us. The people of Polk County like guns. They have guns. I encourage them to own guns. On WEEI. Oh, so they don't close Florida. The community of Lakeland, Florida, is up in arms uh, after a developer came into their community, said that this old chapel that they had, he wanted to turn into a bar. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. All right. They were not happy with what he wanted their staff to wear. Okay. He was proposing to have the staff dress as nuns. Ooh. Ethan has a photo. These are not your regular nuns. These are the nun costumes you would buy at one like Spencer's. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so oh. that was the... Well, you're telling me uh, if you go to some kind of a monastery or something, the nuns aren't normally dressed like that? Usually not. Okay. Maybe they sleep in that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, they have rejected the proposal. And I don't know oh. if this is a setup, uh -huh. but we can hear from one resident whose name is Mildred Pagan. Okay. Please don't turn the chapel, that church, into a den of thieves. Because God said, Jesus said this one time when he turned the tables over. You have turned my house into a den of thieves when this is a house that people came in and prayed to be set free. I mean, it's a theme restaurant. Right. It's like, it's like Hooters. So I mean, he's, but he's actually it, has the bar there, right? It, 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 he it, wants to, no, this this chapel, he wants to turn it in. He was proposing turning the the chapel into a bar. Well, they let him turn into a regular bar. They That's... have rejected the proposal. So yeah. that is the full proposal, bar and the staff. Was well, it like obviously. a burger place, Nuns and Buns? Or like, oh, that's, that's a good oh, name. Like and buns. It's a good it? name. <laughs> but I guess a bit sacrilegious inside of a uh -huh. former chapel. Oh, if you but if you believe it. Yep. But if you don't believe in it, he's just trying to have, you know, or, a good theme. Or it could be the holiest place on the planet to have right. a beer. Who right. Knows? Yeah. No meat on Fridays, though. No. Nope. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Especially during Lent. Uh, Gotta give something up. <laughs> um, that's a pretty good concept. Yeah. I mean, somebody should do that. So, I mean, but if Florida's not going to take it, just no yeah. other, there's no yeah. other place you can yeah, do it. Yeah, if you can't get that thing in like, Florida, yeah. there is Forget no state it. that's going to yeah. agree to yeah. that. Okay. Uh, Pam Anderson has a new book coming out. 
uh, oh. called Love Pamela. Mm-hmm. A lot coming out of that. He, she said, like, Tommy Lee was the only man she ever loved. Oh, she goes really? on and on about things like that. Huh. She talks about the sex tape release, mm-hmm. um, everything. That I did see. She also, <laughs> <laughs> we all did. She also talks about Tim Allen because she was in an episode of Home Improvement in the she 90s. She was on it for a while, yeah. Yeah, when she was 23. Mm-hmm. And she says in one of the episodes, he exposed himself. He was wearing mm-hmm. a robe and exposed, opened the robe and exposed himself oh, to geez. her. Uh, Tim Allen has denied the allegations. He told Variety, no, it never happened. I would never do such a thing. Hmm. Huh. Okay. So I guess it's a he said, she said. Uh-huh. But uh, that would be a bit disturbing if we found out that Tim Allen was going around okay. exposing himself to young she women. She laughed at him. Right. She, you know Tommy Lee. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, Buzz Aldrin married his longtime love on his 93rd birthday on Friday. Oh. Yep, the former astronaut. He announced it on Twitter. There's a photo that Ethan has. Yep, there it is on mm-hmm. Twitch. Oh, how old is she? She's 63. Wow, wow. a spring chicken. Yeah, wow. she looks great. <laughs> oh, she should go to 80 for Brady with Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> she's too oh. young to go to that yeah. one. Yeah, she's too vivacious. Yeah. Why yeah. would you get married at 93? Can I can I just ask that question? You Long need somebody to change the diaper. I mean, what? Oh. At that point, is somebody's got to change the diaper, right? Is that what it is? Yeah, I mean, aren't you at the point now you don't really want to do much? So it's like having an in-home, you know, nurse that will take care of you. Yeah. Unless, unless they've been dating for a long time too, I believe. He, uh, maybe he's still, you know, he maybe he's still getting, you know, he's still his rocket ship still flies. Oh, can we, um, just because we're talking about Buzz Aldrin and I love it, can we play the uh, audio, the famous Buzz Aldrin audio when he is confronted? by a moon landing conspiracy theorist who doesn't believe that he actually landed on the moon. You're the one who said you walked on the moon when you didn't. Calling the kettle black if I ever thought of it. Saying Will I you misrepresented get myself. away from me. You're a coward and a liar and a thief. <laughs> a knuckle sandwich. Wasn't his Shut boy that ups- guy up, didn't he? Go wasn't on. his boy upset because which one got all the credit? Neil was Armstrong? It, was it Neil or Buzz? It was actually Neil. Jack Nicholson. <laughs> uh, One but, of them was upset that they didn't get as much credit. Well, for Neil, t- Neil Armstrong got all the credit because he was the first man to walk on the moon. Okay. I know one of them was upset, so Jack maybe Nichol- Buzz was upset. Uh, Jack Nicholson played an astronaut in that great film. Um, nobody, uh, nobody here knows movies. I, I'm always on an island. Uh, what was the movie where he was the astronaut, dated the mom... And the daughter, uh, daughter was di- oh, terms of endearment was In, the name of that. Oh, I film. thought it was Encino Man. No, okay, <laughs> great film. Anybody seen it? Probably no. not. No, Courtney. No. Yeah, Wait, it speaks know. very highly of the film. <laughs> But I've seen a lot of Jack Nicholson movies. I actually really enjoy him in movies. Really? Like what? The Shining. Uh-huh. The Departed. Anger okay. Management. Something's Gotta Give. Oh, Unbelievable good movie. I mm-hmm. love that movie. It's very good. Uh, am I the only one who watched episode two of the greatest television program of all time last night? Gregory, I go to bed a little earlier than you. Yes. That's my that's my chore for today. Is that the my last Monday of us? Routine? Yep. Yep. Yeah, I didn't. T- last I didn't of catch- Us episode two. Mm-mm. So get a little bit more, you know, get a little bit more juice flowing in the second episode. Well, you know more about the little girl. Okay, I bet. And what her uh, what her thing is. Mm-hmm. You know what my favorite Jack Nicholson movie that's not that well known? As good as it gets. Spectacular. That's flick. a great movie. Great movie. Yeah. Uh, in episode two of The Last of Us, another, I think, another shocking death. Mm. Uh, one one thing about this show is, and I don't know if it, if, if it was this way in the video game or whatever, Shine, mm-hmm. but they they don't mind offing legit uh, characters, characters early. I think that's a uh, a good calling card of a good television show in general, like Game of Thrones. Yeah. I mean, you know, friggin' Eddard Stark dies in the first I bet season. you like, I know I want is. Gianta 2428 thrown out of Twitch right now for saying that show sucks. I, I oh. bet I know who you're talking no, about. You cannot, that show is the, it's fantastic. No, it's I, abandoned. Don't the more worry, I Greg. think about it, though, the more I think that they are going to go rogue against the video game and mm-hmm. Daughter Who Dies in Episode 1, spoiler alert, mm-hmm. uh, is still alive. Yeah, you got this thing she's coming back is because one of the i think there's too much that's around it for if they want to make a good show she goes into the city the one time to get the the watch then it all comes out that the zombie virus is from the city and she's all stressed in the back seat saying oh well you can't get it if you just go oh, once so maybe she's uh, was infected was infected and it's good but she wouldn't have the weird yeah it's so freaky where the the mushroom fungus thing grows out of their their Ugh. mouth oh it comes out yeah, yeah. It's, I bet I know who gets killed in the second episode when you're saying this, because really? I could see them going in that direction. Okay. All right. Mm.
Anyway, uh, go ahead. A new survey was done by Build World, and they found that Boston City Hall is the second ugliest in the U.S., fourth in the world. And it's true. It is a hideous building, and it's depressing to walk into. Um, just structure. It's just shaped different. Right. It's just oh, ugly. In such a beautiful city, it's disgusting. Yeah. I mean, I don't, but what are you going to do? Like, we're, we're spending all of our money on bike lanes. We don't have any money to build a new city hall. Ugh. Fun like, fact. Look at that. Do people really look at that and go, that's ugly? Yes. Yeah. Do you not have that? What are you doing with your life that you walk by a building and go, that's ugly? I guess it's just more so every time I've had to go in there. I never it's even to, noticed the it, building. Re- really? Yeah. I know. Like, I never noticed the structure and go, oh, that's an ugly building. Uh, I'm no architect. I just feel depressed every time I'm in there because it's like to go get your parking sticker for selfie and they're all miserable inside. Now, if you said it's a confusing building once you get in there, okay, I can see that. No, it's just it's an eyesore. Um, Fun fun fact, I got married inside City Hall. Really? Yeah, we Mm. did it. Nobody didn't tell anybody. Just got married 10 years after we started dating in City Hall. Okay. And then we had a wedding. How cheap of you? Oh, believe me, it was uh, nothing's been cheap. (laughs) (laughs) All right, anything else? Uh, Quickly, just uh, I wish that I had known this sooner because I would have made the trip to Disney World. Disney World shut down Splash Mountain forever yesterday. The best ride. I know. Yeah, they're gonna. I think it's a rebranding. Well, it's a rebranding, but I don't know if it's gonna have the same drops and everything else. It's gonna be Tiana's Bayou Adventure, a ride based on Princess and the Frog. People were complaining about it, Curtis, that it was. Patch? Yeah, it was Why? offensive. To who? Well, I'm, uh, I I feel like... I, I, I literally, I went on Splash Mountain 15 times. I didn't yeah. even notice there was anything, like, it's just a bunch of, like, random music, and then you're waiting to go down the, the flume thing. I mean, nothing was better in the early days of the internet than Flash Mountain, the site where you could go and look at people who took those uh, Polaroid pictures that they give you flashing uh, at Disney. Okay. Disney oh. was all up in arms about that. They tried to cancel it for years. It didn't never happen. All right. I do hope that Tiana's Bayou Adventure, though, does still have the drop, because that's a good drop. Splash Mountain. That's what that was my favorite ride there. So doesn't Tiana's Bayou Adventure sound more offensive than Splash Mountain? (laughs) Well, they're based on Princess and the Frog. Is that what it is? Yeah. Was it based? Was the the Princess and the Frog? Was that done in New Orleans? Yeah. Did the writer of that ever do anything mean to someone? Because if so, we'll have to cancel it. (laughs) All right. Uh, But yet. Alaria Baldwin can still talk with a <laughs> fake accent, and nobody uh, nobody wants her canceled, Curtis. Did anybody with their six-year-old child going down Splash Mountain think for a second about the history of the people around them? Mm-hmm. No. God. All right. uh, that is the news with Courtney. Quick reminder that if you cannot listen to this show or this station on the radio, you can stream it every day at weei.com. That's easy to do from the confines of your home. Or your office or whatever you're doing during the the, uh, forthcoming total and utter whiteout conditions today. You can also download the Odyssey app, A-U-D-A-C-Y, and then you can listen to us from everywhere. The Red Sox Station. Red Sox win it! 93.7.
This hour of the Greg Hill Show is brought to you by Subaru of New England. It's the Greg Hill Show with Greg Hill. You got to get up pretty early in the morning to get one by this catcher. You think? On WEEI. there ken and curtis show at the winter weekend red sox winter weekend in springfield and john henry mm. met with some uh, boo birds over the weekend as did heim bloom i thought curtis uh in listening to and watching what heim said uh that he did a pretty good job of turning that crowd around a little bit during during that uh, town hall that they had uh yeah i mean no i, I... It was a tough night, and it, it was. But in the end, the best thing for anybody is to know how someone feels honestly. Otherwise, you're just you have nothing in the relationship. So in this situation, it was cathartic for the fans to have the opportunity to share their displeasure with the people that make the decisions for the team they love, mm-hmm. and it was a great opportunity provided to them in a way that it isn't for the other three teams in this market. So to have John Henry, Heim Bloom, Sam Kennedy all on a stage, don't forget Brian O'Halloran, all there, to be able to be asked and grilled and then booed was in the end good because it's going – we all think Sam Kennedy with Ken and I on Saturday poo-pooed this, that the fan reaction at the Winter Classic did anything to accelerate the Devers deal. However, it can't hurt. They don't like that. You, if you make a billion dollars, you're rarely told you're wrong. It's even rarer that people boo you. So for John Henry to witness that, to hear that, you can't act like everything is awesome anymore. Best interview for you on Saturday? What was your favorite? Oh, Sam Kennedy. I It was great. We spoke with him for about 15, 20 minutes, and, you know, it was, of course, Ken at the beginning threw me under the bus. He's like, oh, well, how's the Kennedy-Curtis relationship these days? <laughs> anyway, but no, I asked him about the messaging that the team had done regarding Xander Bogarts and how self-inflicted the wound was because the fan reaction, I feel – was in large part due to the mixed messaging between what they said and what they did. And he admitted that he allowed their love of the guy, Xander Bogarts, to come through in a way that came back to haunt them because what he got with the Padres, Sam Kennedy told us, was galaxies apart from what they were offering. Right. No, I can't. And Ken was right. I think Ken Bossman was – I think he is right where when I hear the uh, John Henry, maybe he is trying to sell this team. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it, he is, and I know you had mentioned that, Courtney. That's I, what I was going to say. Like, I don't think the booing really affects him. I understand he's a billionaire, and billionaires don't love that, but he's surrounded by so many yes men and women constantly that I mm-hmm. think whether it's he leaving Fenway and, and people are yelling, you know, pay anybody, or it's getting booed at winter weekend, I, I think that he's on his way out. I don't think that he cares about if the fan base likes him or and not. And maybe get as much of the Red Sox cost down in his pocket, so then when he does sell them, they're going to be, I mean, can you imagine what they would sell for? He makes more money. Mm. And then in a smart business move. If he's selling the team, I don't think there's a shot in hell he gets on a dais in Springfield. No. Why would he do that? Why would he do what? Why would he go out there and, and be a part of the town hall meeting? Well, Because I think this is something that he's doing that's not going to happen tomorrow, but this is eventually coming down the pipe. Because when have you ever heard the Red Sox go – it's expensive to have baseball players. For the past 10, 12 years, they've been top five spending. But now all of a sudden it's expensive. And and he was he was, you know, putting on a show when it came to Liverpool before they put them on the market. Yeah. They, you, nobody saw that coming. So I never heard I, him but, complain but about players and money. But that was it was a response to a question about having the highest ticket prices in baseball. Mm-hmm. And so he said it's expensive to pay for the highest, you know, their whatever. You always say it, we either top five okay. in payroll. So he that wasn't something that he broached himself. He okay. was asked about 
why they finished in last place in the division, yet still had the highest ticket prices in baseball. Okay. And that's why he replied. All right, so then maybe that – see, now that I know that was the question that was asked, okay, leads me in a different direction. Basically, he's telling the fans, so then my approach is, hey, the reason why – um, the ticket prices are so high because you want me to go out and you want me to pay these guys thirty five million a year. You want I, you don't want the ticket prices to be high. Guess what? I'll go out and get you some eighteen, nineteen million dollar players, and you. I don't want to hear no complaining. So I could see that uh, now, knowing that the whole full context of what he was answering the question towards makes me say, okay, well, you know what? I'll pay higher ticket prices as if I know you're going to go out there and spend the money. I mean, isn't that what fans want? Yeah. And the other thing I thought of hearing this, and the Red Sox and most teams in this town do it, growing up in Boston, we used to have these organic moments, whether it was the Mariano Rivera tipping the cap after the Red Sox won their first World Series, or chants from the stands, or just moments that were not pre-scripted. And it feels like everybody now has been trying to script those, but that was an organic moment out of passion from the fans, and that's why it was so awesome to see. Because the Red Sox fan has been kind of poo-pooed. People rip the team a lot. They don't like Heim, whatever. But the passion that existed in Springfield was still pretty good. Curtis, you've been to to Winter Weekend before, though. Did you feel like there was a drop-off in fan attendance at all? This was my first. I had never been. Oh, okay. Because from looking at the the social media and the things that you guys were posting, it didn't seem like there was any drop-off. It almost looked like the fans were out loud and proud for this one. And I think that Henry uh, Kennedy... Werner even like everybody looks at that and says okay we had a not great team this season and look at the fan base they're still coming out they're still spending money they well, still they want to be a part to, of they, everything they want to come out and boo that's what that's but they also doing. wanted to come that's out and see wanted. the players like when you guys had you guys had Ortiz right uh yeah and, and the amount of people that were there following around Ortiz to just get a glimpse of oh, him Ortiz I know but that's the Red Sox are always going to have that flash value even though their team isn't that great well the frustrating part of that Courtney I'm glad you brought it up I didn't know who the crowd was for because Bradford came on stage at the same time. So it could have been for Rob. That's fair. Baseball is not boring. Well, I think the fan um, engagement, Courtney, I I think the reason why you see the fans the way they are is because the Red Sox have proven to us in the past that they could suck one year and then the next year win a World Series. So you're never, like, until there's, like, years of sucking back to back to back to back, Fans are not going to jump off this ship because they look at it and they'll bitch and complain. Mm-hmm. But then the next year they'll be right back in the mix. They'll, you know, be one of the better teams in baseball. They'll be a World Series content, or they even win a World Series. That I think that's what the Red Sox front ownership, I mean ownership group, has done. They know that as long as we could put a team out there consistently, that's good. Yeah, they'll bitch and complain, but they'll come back. All right, tomorrow Tie Tuesday with Ty Law talking uh, championship games in the NFL. 8.20 tomorrow with Ty Law. Right now, here is Courtney and what is trending. Gresh and Fourier. Weekdays 10 to 2. Now, here's what's trending on WEEI. The Bruins shut out the Sharks last night at the TD Garden. This is trending brought to you by Subaru of New England. Four goals came from Lindholm, Pasta, Charlie McAvoy, who had people's jaws on the ground watching this one and Nick Felino, Linus Olmark and Jeremy Swayman combined for 18 saves a nice stat from Razor after the game Olmark becomes the fastest goalie to win 25 game or 25 wins in the history of the NHL the guys are off tonight they take on the Canadians on the road tomorrow on to football the NFC and AFC championship games are set Sunday at three we have 49ers and Eagles in Philly 630 Bengals and Chiefs no neutral site needed this one is going through Kansas City reminder that all these games can be heard right here on double W-E-E-I. So tune in to 93.7 or listen for free on the Odyssey app. Patrick Mahomes suffered a high ankle sprain over the weekend. He said he'll be good to go next week. Celtics are in action tonight, taking on the Magic in Orlando. Are we going to bet anything on this one, Chime? You know, Courtney, looking at this spread tonight, the Celtics are favored by 7.5. Last time they played the Magic, if, if memory serves, they lost back-to-back games to this Magic team. At the time, the Magic were pretty hot. However, Celtics on a nine-game winning streak. I'm riding with the Seas. Let's lay the seven and a half points tonight. Seas get it ten in a row. Mm. All right. Well, it is a banged-up Celtics crew. The injury report has grown. Robert Williams listed as questionable. Malcolm Brogdon is out for personal reasons. And Marcus Smart is out with a right ankle sprain. Does the Robert Williams concern you at all because it's another knee injury? Is it the same knee? I believe it's the same knee. And, I mean, this is just – they're saying that it's uh, – what do they call it when it's not – Contusion? No, it's like the um, – 
where he's getting therapy and stuff on it. Uh, maintenance. Oh, okay. Like okay. a maintenance. Load management. Load management. We got some load management going on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's why Tatum was out the other night, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, why I take flex time, Greg. Uh, load <laughs> management. Yeah. Who was it that said it? I think it was uh, some player in the NBA, a uh, uh, big name player. It's, it's, it's too many games. They want to reduce the amount of games. I know they want more games. And then we hear from hockey players that it's too many games that they're playing to reduce the schedule. Mm-hmm. We'll go outside and play in a brand new all-wheel drive 2023 Subaru. Find your authorized Subaru retailer at SubaruofNewEngland.com. That's what's trending. Here's Curtis with your weather. Thank you, Corny. It is 36 degrees, drizzling outside. We have a bunch of weather spotters. We'll circle through those here, but we're running out of time. The snow's going to start around 1 o'clock. I heard from a family friend of your husband, Courtney, who mm. sent a uh, photo of his uh, Santos place in Vermont. Vermont. So we have a live look at all these different photos. So oh, so it snow- must be Wes. Very s- snow north and west of town, uh, mm-hmm. all over the place. Get your errands done by one. The Rich Keep Show. If Matt Patricia gets pushed into a front office role, does he sit there during the interview process? and be like, no offense. I-
Part of the booing from my perspective last night was related to the messaging that the fans have been getting and a how can you fix that and b how can you do more to ensure guys like xander or mookie or lester remain where they have performed in one champion if you look back and say what you know what mistakes did we make maybe we were just too over the top about our desire uh, to extend him but those feelings were truthful we really did want to extend him um and you know in the end we didn't so that's on us uh That is Sam Kennedy on the award-winning Ken and Curtis show on Saturday. I don't, uh, I don't understand. I love Sam Kennedy. You know that, Curtis. Yeah. Thick, thick as thieves. You too. He, he texts you all the time. Yeah, but I don't understand that. How if you're over the top in your desire to sign a player like Xander Bogarts, then why aren't you doing whatever it takes to sign a player like Xander Bogarts? Does, uh, does he mean? We shouldn't have expressed publicly that we were going to do everything in our power to try to sign Sander Pogo. Yeah, but isn't he just being honest, though? No, and then I, the no Curtis, he's not. He's, I don't think he Curtis is. brought up the point where the honesty was the they were light years ahead of away, away of money, but they really felt the way they felt about Xander, and they really, really wanted to sign him, but. Not at the price he you wanted. You can't have it both ways. No, you can't. You could be honest. I really want this guy, but he's he's way too expensive. But, for but me. you can't say that it was your feelings towards him, how much you liked him, that maybe got in the way, and that's why you were telling everybody that you were doing everything it would take to get it done. You're not doing everything that it takes because you're light years away from the money that other teams are offering him. So here is where I stand today. In May, I was at re-education camp for the weekend. You can say I was at you know I was brainwashed. But this is how I view it. They know Xander as a person. He's been in the organization since he was 17 years old. They know he's fiercely loyal. And they were playing on his heartstrings saying, you know, we love you. Stay here where it all began as a means of bridging the financial gap, which ultimately didn't work. And so what they ended up with was looking silly because of the Padres offer. If you look at it as a macro situation, you go away 30,000 feet, as Wiggy likes to say, if you could only have one, everybody would have taken Devers over Bogarts. 
Right. It's the messaging that they did that damaged the fan reaction or aided the fan reaction to make them unhappy. That's what happened. Because the whole time it didn't make sense because they weren't going to give the money to him. And if you had to pick one, nobody would have given the money to Bogarts over Devers. They were never going to give him the money that he was going to get on the open market, and they and they and they missed an opportunity at trade deadline time to get value for him. Correct, that is a mistake. Well, the problem with okay, that but, was but, but, is but again, you were but, you were pushing the narrative. What? You were one of those people out there. You can't tra- uh, trade Xander. He's such a locker room guy. Blah 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 blah. He people love him. Then I what's said that do fifty it? times on this show. If you know now, you're not going to be able to sign him. Trade him. I was the only one. Maybe me and you Sean. Were the only, here we Sean go. and I might have been the what, only what, two what, that what were, were pushing. You the only one that was saying pushing what? trade Xander. That is not true. In yes, the, it in is the, in the least. Sean, you remember those days? No, I doesn't. know for a fact I was saying trade Xander, yep. but I'm not. I I can't speculate on exactly what Greg was saying. <laughs> because everybody was like, "Well, he's such a you know, he's beloved in that locker." Yeah, I was I was on that page, right? But at that point in time, I I felt like you weren't gonna the money he wanted wasn't what you were gonna want. You did you weren't gonna give him. You were oh, happy I, with we, Story, who's twenty three million. You weren't gonna pay Xander twenty eight, twenty nine, twenty twenty seven million dollars. We talked about and and I remember it like it was yesterday, and I don't remember very few things. I we, we talked about the fact that they were gonna spin it on Xander, as they they absolutely wanted the guy, they loved the guy, and that's what they're doing now. Like you can't sit there and say that. We may have been a little overblown in our desire to keep the guy. If you're overblown in your desire to keep a guy, you pay the guy. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Like, it, it didn't make any sense because you're saying all this, but the, the offers were so far apart. They were literally light years apart from what the Padres offered and what you offered. So it doesn't make any sense to me. We want him so bad, but we don't want him that bad. Right. But here's the situation in where I think Sam is being honest. They love Xander Bogarts. They don't love him enough to pay him to damage what they believe their future investment in the organization, but they're grateful to who he is, that they know what he meant in that locker room, in the clubhouse, but $280 million is not a place they were willing to go. So I I think it just because a player leaves doesn't mean they despise him. Right. It means no. they don't agree on the value that other teams placed on him. Belichick does it all the time, or the New England – Patriots organization does it all the time with guys. We love you, Julian Edelman. We love everything about you. But guess what? If you can go get money from someplace else, go do it. Yeah, but but Bill doesn't spin it afterwards and say we had an overwhelming desire to keep the guy. Bill's upfront and honest with the way in which he conducts yeah, business. Because Should Bill- I read Bill Belichick's statement he released after Brady signed in Tampa? I mean, he had but, to wipe that thing off. I mean, it was the greatest player of all time. Right. There will never be another Tom Brady. It was a pleasure to coach. He's the but greatest. What does that Patriot. have to do with anything? He's waxing poetic about what he means to I'm the organization. I'm talking about his the way in which he conducts business. And he also you waxed poetic wait. after what? the guy was gone. What, what Curtis? You, you just said that he doesn't. Are you say- on the payroll with the Red Sox now? This is shocking. What happened out there this weekend? Why are you mad? You <laughs> just, I'm not mad. I'm d- 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 Give it to him, Curtis. I think it's pretty clear you're bothered. I, I but- think it's, it's interesting that you're able to spin a discussion about the Red Sox into some sort of negative about Bill Belichick and Tom Brady. No, you're saying that the Patriots don't do it this way, and uh, I'm just saying they, they don't. Do. They, they you do. know what Bill does. They did it Bill's with Brady. Not gonna, Bill's he's not going to overpay you, for guys. He's giving you overpay a ba- for guys. Brady, who who's doing it now? Go down to um. I don't even know what, where they are right now, but go down to the Bruins facilities. They wax poetic about David Pasternak. We'll pay the man his money. Yeah, they're going to. Uh, when? Uh, when, it- when David Pasternak wants it done, the end of the season. Ooh, so now it's on pasta. What, what What do you mean, ooh, ooh, ooh. now well, it's on we've pasta? We've heard it was what? on pasta, that, yeah. that, is, well, that his team went to them, said here's what he wants. They said yes, and then they were like, wait, oh, wait, we well, actually want more. Well, that clearly wasn't enough money. Well, that's on pasta. That's on pasta's team. <laughs> well, if you if want you initially that bad. Go, t- if you initially go with a number, the Bruins say, yeah, let's do it, and then they go back and decide that they're going to go higher, then that's. Then maybe you should go, you know what, all right, pasta, what is your number? You want to go higher than the 11 They mil- did that. No, 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 but now they don't want to go to the 12 and a half. <laughs> I know. Well, now that's when negotiation comes in. But well, to say that they didn't me. do that from the from the jump. Yeah, but that's bad negotiating, Wiggy. That's not right. the Bruins. No, yeah. It's bad negotiating by the Bruins. Pay the man. You're going to lose them. <laughs> this is Kevin from Quincy. Hello, Kevin. Hey, good morning. How's it going, gang? What's up, Kevin? Um, 
I'm a baseball guy. I know Curtis loves, like, you know, he references the 04 Red Sox being life-changing, and it, and it was. And we've won four World Series in the past, what, 19 years. We've also lost in the ALCS two or three times. So, I mean, we've had a good run here. And they're smart. You know, they, they drag out guys like Jim Rice and Pedro and David Ortiz and, and then guys from the 2013 season like Breslow and whatever. So, you know, you don't see this really in other – sports in our city you don't see booing of the ownership when you've been really successful i mean they're smart um they're they're a smart marketing team and uh, uh, to answer courtney's question uh, it was they didn't do it the last three years but it was pretty raucous it was Mm -hmm. wild to see a last place team get cheered so hard that's what I was saying. I think that there are a lot of teams, regardless of sport, that if they had a weekend like this after a, a not great season, mm-hmm. fans aren't coming out in, you know, boatloads to come support or boo, whatever. And I, if I'm John Henry, I don't really care if you're booing. You're still here. You're still paying the price of admission. Because that's it's what like, the Red Sox do. They're the only team that has the balls to do it. Mm-hmm. You, When do you ever see other owners of these teams roll out a weekend for the fans that is not uh where they can control the narrative you know and and you saw you saw with the with the Red Sox they go out there you know and maybe you don't like some of the things they say but at least they're uh what's the word I'm looking for at least they're a accountable accountable yes and they're an organization that's where they're proactive when it comes to you know trying to get whatever message it is out there to the fans I mean there were you were there Curtis there were a lot of people there there this were weekend. And I think we're, we're, I don't know why we're arguing, Greg, and I just want you to know that I think the Marconi looks lovely in your home studio. Oh, thank you. Um, the, the situation is that the Patriots have the clout, whether it's that Robert Kraft's from here or that Bill Belichick's won six Super Bowls or whatever. There's never been a doubt about the intentions of the Crafts. Do we ever speculate if the Crafts are selling the Patriots? No. It's going to be in their family for as long as they want it to be. So the issues that we have with the Red Sox are that they constantly feel the insecurity of needing to resell themselves to the fan base. They also have to sell out 81 games versus 10 or 8. And so the Red Sox have been trying to change the narrative through words, which is a mistake every single time. And what what Sam said was the messaging, which is instead of talking about how much you want someone, you either do or you don't, there is no try. And that was their big flaw this offseason. And their big flaw was saying that they wanted a guy they knew was leaving. And they were doing it to curry favor with fans and with the player. Neither cared about anything but the bottom line offer. And they were woefully woefully far apart from what Xander ended up getting. And yes, that's you, why they you, heard that. You and I agree 100% on that. That's yeah. the, the, the entire point of this discussion is that you can't, if you're Sam Kennedy, you can't sit there and say... We are, we absolutely, we want this guy. We're going to do whatever it takes to sign him if you're not going to do whatever it takes to sign him. And just be honest and say that. Yeah, but how does that sign if you go, we love this guy, but unfortunately we can't afford to pay him? But it was more about the they, years, they can't right? afford it. We don't want to afford to no, pay no, no. him. No, no, no. We don't want to pay him because we, because of the length of the deal, the age of the player. Just say that. But 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 that's not good business. That's but, not good. But Greg, you know that. You're in business. It's not good to come out to your fans and go, hey, we want this guy. We love him. But... We only love them at X amount of dollars. And here's the thing, though, Wiggy and everybody. What were we saying about Don Sweeney from the day that he fired Bruce Cassidy until the Mitch Miller fiasco blew up? This guy should be out of a job. The Jacobs are distant donors. They don't invest in the team. This is a dumpster fire. How could they do this? Guess what? The most expensive ticket in town is lining the pockets of the Jacobs family because they're a great team. All this other stuff is BS. If the team's good, nobody's going to give a damn what you said or what you did. It's all about what you're doing. So that's why it's bullcrap for these people to say, I'm never going to support this team again because if they're good, you'll go. (laughs) And it's also stupid from the people that run the team to try and curry favor by saying things that don't matter to the fan base. This is Mike. Hello, Mike. Hey, guys. How you doing? What's up? What's up? Hey, Curtis, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think the really thing that upsets me in retrospect now is looking at the trade deadline last year. I really feel like High and Bloom was on the precipice of carrying out his plan. He traded Vasquez. Then they get this massive blowback from the fans. So instead of trading Evaldi, Martinez, Bogarts, 
Waka, all of them, just unloading them off a prospect. They couldn't stand true to the philosophy, what they hired High and Bloom for. The management was so worried about the fan blowback, and they knew they weren't doing anything last year, and they had a chance to build up that farm system, and they didn't do it. They should be honest and say that it's it's a rebuild or whatever it is, or they're building the farm system. Like, just, I, they're worried. Fans are going to go regardless. We've seen that. That there, there's ne- that that the place is loaded with people. It doesn't matter how you're doing. It also, if I was them, in any interview I would give when it comes to Xander, I would have been like, "You guys need to understand. He's asking for a specific amount of years, and all you guys do is complain about it when we've done it in the past with certain players." I think a lot of fans would respect that. Would be like, "All right, he well, you're said, putting things into perspective Heim for Bloom me." Said as much about Mookie. That's but, exact, but when it came to Xander, it was, nope, we're going to do everything imaginable to get this guy. We love him. He, he is a homegrown guy. We're going to do everything in our power to get him. And that's the thing is if today the Red Sox had two or three better prospects in their system after dealing Xander and, you know, say they traded Evaldi or J.D. Martinez as well, you'd be closer to where you want to be. And all you got was a two-month stay of execution that did nothing. Like, all you gained was the ability to say to your fans, we never wanted to trade Xander. He was a Red Sox. But what you lose is the proximity to winning again, which is really what all you care about in the, in the beginning. Well, it's I the mean, business I'm, I'm, model has I'm, changed. I, I, yeah, I'm okay with it. If they, if they, But you have to tell the fans th- what it is. I mean, Heim Bloom is up there at the town hall meeting saying they weren't willing to make the bet on Mookie Betts. Why would you make the bet on Xander Bogarts then? But just say it. Well, and if your philosophy changes, you have to commit to the new philosophy. You can't then waver just because fans start to get upset. Yeah, but for they a weren't. Moment. They weren't light like, years apart with Mookie Betts based on what we have heard before. We heard that they offered him three hundred no, million. He didn't want to make the bet on the length of the deal with no, Mookie no, Betts. No, That's the what length he said. of the deal. We knew it was ten. Oh, that's year. what Hein Bloom said. Did you watch what he said? They didn't want to go the extra two years, but they, we they they offered him ten years, three hundred. I know, but they didn't want to. He's telling you they don't want to make the bet long term on these players. But I think it was the extra two years he uh, ultimately got from that's the Dodgers. That's not what Hein Bloom said. I'm telling you what Hein Bloom said. And listen, I ultimately think the Heim Bloom situation, it was more about Mookie not wanting to be here. They offered him 10 years and $300 million. At least that's what the rumors were. He he ends up signing with the Dodgers for, what, 12 years, 365? So it looked like the Mookie thing was more about Mookie not wanting to be here. Because we thought that it was way different uh, until we actually looked it up. And when you looked up the reports of what the Red Sox offered and then what he actually ended up signing, it's like, all right, do we really think that he picked up and moved over there just because of the money or the those two years? No. Right. Where we know with Xander, basically the money was he gets 280 from what's the, San Francisco or uh, the, the San, San Diego. Diego. Excuse me. Yep. He gets 280 from them. The, what was the number we heard out here? What was it, 165 or something mm-hmm. like that? That's it. So look at the difference yeah. in that versus Mookie at 365 versus 300. Mookie decide. I could see why Xander would go to San Diego, but their 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 mindset was, well, it wasn't like they offered Mookie two. I mean, uh, Xander two thirty, right? And then you go, well, you know what? The money was there, but it ultimately looked like Xander wanted. To and move there on. were a lot of there were more. So, t- so you're calling Heim Bloom a liar? Yes. Right? Oh, yeah, okay. I am. Okay. I'm saying. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm saying that I don't really buy into that. I, I believe it was more about Mookie not wanting to be here. And if you're Haim, of course you're going to say that it wasn't about that. That's a bad look on the Red Sox exactly. saying that Mookie didn't want to be here. Or we, or we didn't want to give this guy I, that no, many I, years. I would, I, I, I would much rather say that than the other. I'd much rather say that we understood that the player didn't want to be here long term. But it's a All bad right. look if you go, well, we don't want to give that guy that many years because now you you got you got Rafi Devers who's yep. kind of coming up in the pipeline who's going to want that. And if you're saying, well, no, we're not giving these guys 10, 11, 12 years, it's not a look, good look if you're the young guy going, well, wait. they already have a deal done with Devers. Right, but we're talking initially. This happened with Mookie Betts, what, three years no, ago? No, I'm talking about what Heim Bloom said about Devers at the town hall this weekend. Right, about a, a Mookie at the town hall this weekend. And I think I said, I think he's lying. You think he's lying? Yeah, it, 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 the Mookie thing was clearly about money. I'm not lying when I say this. The biggest winner of the weekend outside of my wallet, 49 bucks, thank you, MGM, was Alex Cora because he came away looking like a – you smelling like a rose. 
because he's on that dais and everybody's getting the riot act read to them. <laughs> and then Cora speaks and they're like, woohoo, we love you, Alex. They love Alex Cora. <laughs> yeah, just All don't right. tell Governor Sanu. We're going to take, <laughs> take a quick break. Um, I do want to remind you that tomorrow it is a Thai Tuesday. Thai Law will join us at 820. Every new year, we make resolutions to lose weight, eat better, work out more, and generally make changes for our health.
That time three years ago, everybody knows it, we were faced with a similar choice one year away from free agency with a superstar player. We didn't sign up because when you make those bets, they're big bets. Those bets are much better up front and on the back end. We know that, every team knows that when they're making those bets. But if you want to make that type of bet, you better be ready to back it up. You better be ready to surround that bet with a whole lot of talent, a whole lot of young talent I don't think anybody would disagree where the organization was. We just weren't ready to back up that bet. Heim Bloom at the town hall meeting, suggest, I guess suggesting that now they're ready to surround that player being Devers with the homegrown talent from the farm system. Is that what he's saying, Curtis? I believe so, in a roundabout way. Okay. Uh, not a great choice of words with the bets on time oh. there. It was a bit much. <laughs> Do you think he had that ready to go? Yes. Uh, the bets pun? Yeah. You know, well, Curtis said it five minutes ago that everything is very scripted now, it feels like. Like that, it was a moment that if it just happened, it would have been great. But to say it over and over again, it's like, all right, we all get right. it. When we, all know that you're, when we all know that you're lying about the situation because you offered him 10 years. So if it wasn't you weren't willing to make the number of bets, what is a lie? Because the rumor was you offered him ten years and three hundred. He signs with the Dodgers for twelve. So two more years. Come on now, that that's not it. That's not the reason why we're like, well, we didn't want Mookie because we didn't want to be on the hook for two more years. And when he was, you know, thirty eight and thirty nine, that wasn't it. Is you offered him money, you wanted him back, but it wasn't enough. For him to be like, okay, I want to come back for the extra sixty five. Yeah, I think I would I would just respect it more if the organization said we are taking a small market approach, building uh, building from within, and we believe we're going to be competitive doing it that way. But that would be a lie because a small market approach means you wouldn't even be offering these guys that type of money. And if you're a fan, you're like, oh, you guys are going to take a small market approach? Okay, then give me small market approach money yeah, for me to go to the to Fenway. That doesn't work here. You can't sell fans where uh, to, uh, taking a small market approach in, in Boston. You well, can't... It, isn't that what Heim Bloom does? That's why you brought the guy in. Well, I, I think he 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 did that in Tampa Bay, and I you, I think you brought him in to try to be able. The problem with the Red Sox is they're trying to walk in both worlds. They're mm-hmm. trying to walk in the Dave Dombrowski world of going out and spending a ton of money mm-hmm. on big price free agents, but they're also trying to walk in the high bloom world of maybe that small market approach. It's very difficult to do that. You can't do that. And every time you say small market to Heim Bloom, he immediately will come back at you. Like he right. doesn't he that that were those words are not in his vocabulary. It, he it, does not want to be called a small market anything. Right, and that, the reason you alluded to, Courtney, is why with the ticket prices. But this is why it's like well done is better than well said. It doesn't matter. They could literally have gone up there and mooned the crowd. And if they win the World Series this year, nobody's going to give a damn. They'll say, moon us again. Who the hell cares? That's why you can't shape public opinion. You either are winning and the people here know it, or you're building something and the people here know it, or you're intentionally not signing top talent and you're falling behind in the division. And if they finish in last place again, it's going to get even uglier. But th- nothing they said over the weekend is going to bring people back to Fenway or keep them out of it. There's just so much money spent in PR these days. You might as well just light it on fire. <laughs> right? I mean, people, especially here, they know a bs when they see it. And that's the issue, is that when you start telling people something and you don't follow through on it, then they're going to disbelieve everything else you say. But the good thing about, and I think this is what the Red Sox know, 
is that we could feed them BS and they're still going to come like Courtney said. They're still, the seats are still going to be filled up. Do you think that the when it comes to the philosophy, anything changed after what happened this weekend? When it comes to that that ownership group or Heim or Sam Kennedy or anybody? No, no not after this weekend, but after the end of the season. Yes, if, this weekend will play a role. We will remember Friday night for years to come. If they don't if they don't perform well, I think they fire Heim Bloom after the season. And then they kind of go back to well, let's walk more in the let's more walk more in the world of the Dave Dombrowski and let's spend money on big ticket. And items. I just think, yeah, we'll remember it. But John Henry probably like got into a black car, opened a nice bottle of red wine, and like toasted and laughed about it with Linda. Like, nah. I really, I, I do not think that he. I, I don't he think it bothers him. No, I do I, not I think it bothers so him so strongly. Yeah. If you're a billionaire and you are never told that you're wrong, that he, it, John Henry sat there. I'm guessing. I don't know. Thinking, I bought this team. It hadn't won jack squat in 86 years. We've won the most championships of any baseball team since I bought the team. Four. And you're going to boo me? Yeah, that, he that's has how that he chirping. reacted. He, I mean, he has it. So do you, when it comes to the fans that did that, do you feel like they're, they're, glut, they're gluttonous, like they're spoiled? No, I think Mm-mm. that that is the best. That it, if this were a election, I would say this is democracy at work. The paying consumer took time out of their day, didn't mail in their ballot, drove to Springfield, arrived, paid for the hotel, bought the ticket to Winter Weekend, sat and waited, and gave their allowed the people they're paying to hear their displeasure. That is, and America. then they left. Did they leave after booing, or did they stay for the rest? No, of the there weekend? was a long line of autographs outside exactly. of Bradford's tent. <laughs> what would they be called, Greg? They're like, uh, you ever see the? I don't know what the exact word for them is. Is you know nowadays the new word the kids everybody's calling them simp's. But the Red Sox <laughs> would be the dominatrix of the oh. fans of the Boston Red Sox. So, so <laughs> my point is. The pain that they get, they enjoy, but guess what? They keep going back and paying for, you know, you to put the gag ball in my mouth. Oh. Yeah. It, that's the, and the Red Sox know that. I think it's called a ball gag. But I understand what you're saying. <laughs> what I say? Yes, gag ball? Gag. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same I, thing. I get the analogy. Yeah, it's the same thing. I understand. But that's what the fans are. They'll, they'll sit, they'll complain <laughs> about it, they'll do all this other stuff, but come, you know, opening day. They'll be out there mm-hmm. and they'll be taking their selfies. They'll be at, buying their jerseys and they'll be doing going to the concession all. stands. They will be doing it all. Yep. And they enjoy the pain. You know what? It's, hey, Mrs. Dominatrix, uh, <laughs> can we do this again next week? So then uh, why was last year the lowest attendance for any team, any you, season since Henry I, bought the team? I, I, listen, you say that. I mean, I don't know the attendance numbers, but every t- every game so I I'm went. I'm lying like Heim's lying. No, no. Lying. Every game I went to, the joint was packed. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, there's actual data that they use and, where they they so and I and I don't think it's because of John Henry Curtis. If anything, it's like inflation; people can't afford to go. Like I don't think it's because people don't want to go. Right. You will always find somebody who wants to go to Fenway Park. Well, you can go; you just can't buy the eggs. <laughs> yeah, you gotta <laughs> yes. skip out on the eggs for a month. Right, yeah, right. and I've been to a bunch of games there, and that place is always jam packed, okay. always. So, I mean, when I go there, I don't see the difference. And you watch these games on television, some of these baseball games. You put on Baltimore. You put on Tampa Bay. Like, these stadiums are uh, not even a quarter filled. When have you ever seen Fenway Park like that? Never. 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 And so, the whole attendance thing, I kind of agree with more about what you're saying, Courtney. People, People can't just afford. Yeah, they can't yeah. afford to do it. But they're still doing it. Every time that you went to the game, Wiggy, Greg was slinging glizzies, so mm-hmm. that's why it was packed. <laughs> Pizza's good there at Fenway, too, so Chicken maybe. tenders, too. Very good. <laughs> yeah, I don't mind their tenders. Yeah, and I also think John Henry has dealt with so much when it comes to Liverpool. Like, he's had fans probably be way worse to him over there than any Red Sox fan has ever been. Like, him, bo- them booing at winter weekend... But it bothers him. I, I don't know. I think he's probably so immune to it. The man he, was sitting, soccer fans sitting, are sitting out in his of this penthouse. World. Let me tell you something. The man was mm. sitting in his penthouse, heard them talk about him on the radio, and showed up at the radio station. So you're telling me now, all of a sudden, <laughs> it doesn't bother a man like that? I don't know. I just think that he has probably dealt with it tenfold over there. Yeah. All right. Uh, I can't get the the uh, dominatrix thing out of my mind, so I got to <laughs> take a quick break. But we'll be right back. <gasps> Gresh and Fourier. Bill Belichick interviewing.
This hour of the Greg Hill Show is brought to you by Shaw's, the official supermarket of the WEEI Red Sox Network. The Greg Hill Show. You're listening to the Greg Hill Show on WEEI. And streaming everywhere on the Odyssey app. The bills make me want to shout. Kick your heels up and shout. It's, what makes him good is, is what you saw. Is he's very competitive, like we all are. Uh, we work extremely hard at these jobs to, to, to be the best we can possibly be. And it hurts. And um, I wouldn't want a guy that it, it doesn't hurt, right? So um, he put it all on the line out there. We put it all on the line, and tonight it wasn't good enough. And uh, um, you know, that's that's the part that stings. Buffalo's happening now. We're on the moon now. The fields are happening now. They're making it happen Sean McDermott defending the toddler temper tantrum, uh, tantrum-like antics of Steph Diggs, uh, who cleared his locker out before uh, some of the coaches even got off the field after that loss. I don't know what that means. I mean, he looked pissed the entire game, I felt like. I, he was even, like, throwing the ball down at some points. It's If we're going to talk about Mac Jones in a certain way being on the field, you could say, well, you know, Diggs is very talented, so we can have a different outlook on that. <laughs> but he was kind of temper tantrum-y. He was mm-hmm. kind of acting yeah. like a spoiled brat throughout. And so I'm not surprised that after the game he took it to the locker room. If I was a teammate of his, if I was Josh Allen, and he's yelling at me on the sidelines, then he's going in and putting on that performance in the locker room, I'd be pissed. Yeah. Like really pissed. I mean, Josh Allen basically just ignored him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, I think there Good was for a, him too. There, He's like, there was a play early in the game. It was like a little hitch route that Steph Diggs caught, and the ball was low, and he was kind of telling him he like, threw it, he, and he was like telling him, "Get the ball up, get yeah. the ball up, get yeah. the ball up, so I can do something with it." That whole Bills team has like a has just like a weird vibe right now. I mean, you saw Josh Allen was trying to talk smack after he ran in that touchdown to like cut it to seventeen mm-hmm. to ten yeah. or something, and he, like it the whole they had this weird attitude like they'd won something before it's and the they pressure. acted like they're the kings and 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 that they deserve everything and it's just that was not the case at it's, all. They, they choked again. Yeah. Yes. And you had the in in this particular season, you, you basically had the entire country. Rooting for you. It's the pressure Mm -hmm. of everybody saying that they're the team. But think about how impressive what the Patriots accomplished over the last 20 years is 
seeing these teams either not winning one or only having one trying to get two with a little bit of attention on them, they fold. I mean, it, it, we will look back at what Bill and Tom did for generations. This will never be re, it never be accomplished. Again. No, because you could start, you could see that the pressure of everybody in the country basically saying, you know, and the NFL experts saying Buffalo's the team, Buffalo's the team. This is their year. This is their year. Last year they were saying the same thing. The pressure is now starting to build on. We hear everybody's basically saying, when are we going to arrive? And the Josh Allen has gotten there. His performance is played. He's there. And now you're starting to see. I, I mean, I don't want to revisit the Burrow versus Mahomes argument that, that, that you were fraudulent yeah, about. Yeah, because that one was a stupid argument. Earlier this morning. But <laughs> what? What's stupid I would about I would take Joe. I would take Joe Burrow over Josh Allen. Right now? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. But would you take Joe Burrow over Patrick Mahomes? I think I would. Well, then you're what? You're stupid. Really? That's just uh, that's just dumb. That is I mean, dumb. I mean, look what happens when uh, when how do they do head to head? Oh them? my God! Here we go. How do we do head to head? How many they, they, they he's beat them the last three times that they played? No, the only three times. Mm. How many Super Bowls does uh, Mahomes have? How many years he's been in the league? Six. Uh, this will be a six year. Yeah. He's one. already he's, he's already, got one. He's got one, and he's already elite. He's already won the league MVP. And Joe Burrow's been in the league for three years, and yep. he's been to one, and he's probably going to get back to another one. So, and if he gets back to another one and he loses, what are you going to say about him? I still take him over. I would argue that I might still take yeah. him over Patrick Mahomes. Stop it. Mahomes uh, has stop it. Inarguably, one of the top three or four offensive minds in the history of the sport as his head coach. Oh, he might be the top offensive mind in the history of the sport. Who's okay, that, Andy Reid? Yes, you, right. So I, I to say like how many Super Bowls did Andy Reid win before he got Patrick Mahomes? None, but he was zero and one in the Super Bowl. He's one and one with Mahomes. Not a big difference. And there. he made Alex Smith look like an All Pro. There's there's a big difference. You won one, and Andy Reid was was extremely overrated because he could never win. He always had talented players. Donovan, Donovan McNabb. Yeah, dude, not being able to win, though, is very different than being a great offensive mind. I'm not saying that he's not a very... Like, we all know he was horrendous at clock management for right. years. He was a terrible head coach. Right. But we're talking specifically until, offensive mind. Right. He might be the greatest to have ever done this. V very talented. But until he got Mahomes, that was when he got over that hump. Okay, so if Joe Burrow wins the Super Bowl this year, who would you take? You'd still I'd take... I'd still take Mahomes. Okay. But then Joe Burrow, at least now Joe Burrow's in the conversation. <laughs> you just don't like that style It has nothing to do with that. It I just, does. It has everything I to told do with you, it, Wiggy. I told you I'd take Joe Burrow over Josh Allen any day. Based on what I'm seeing on where they're going and the way that it feels, I feel like Josh Allen can't handle the pressure of being called the guy. I would take Joe Burrow over Josh Allen. Now... So I would, but I'm not taking Joe Burrow over Patrick Mahomes. What a choke job, though, for the Bills because you, we, Again. Demar goes and speaks to them in the locker room mm -hmm. beforehand. Everybody was on the Bills' side. Be a Bengals fans upset that they didn't get home field for this one. They go into Buffalo and are able to pull off that. And the way Joe Burrow plays, he has such swag about him. I I don't know how anybody would not want him to be their quarterback. It all, it, it would it all culminated too in that one moment where Demar Hamlin's up in the booth oh. and they show him with the heart like mm -hmm. through the snow, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden the the stadium erupted. And what happens? Joe Burrow put to dime right at Jamar Chase, which mm. should have been a touchdown. Been a they touchdown. ruled it incomplete. Yeah. Like, that is just cold-blooded. Got to survive the ground, Shime. You know that. I mean, he... Wait, it he was incomplete. It was a great throw. And it was Four a, steps inbound as a football. No, 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 no. Once you had a... And it was a great throw. I mean, it was a greater throw than probably catch, but once he, he dropped and the ball went between his, like, legs. But it's just, to me, the Buffalo Bills... They are a very, very talented regular season team that always puts them in a position where they'll win the first round. Most of the time, they win the division round unless they run up against Mahomes or, and now it's starting to look like, Joe Burrow. Well, and Josh that, Allen is feeling that pressure. Bill's Mafia better hope that Tom Brady doesn't somehow end up in the AFC or they're, or, or they're going to go another one with another choke job. I, I, I can't fathom. The misery in Buffalo today. Like, when's the next good day? August? Yeah. <laughs> like, talk about a long, hellish winter. 
Like, at least, you know, the Patriots season ended uh, prematurely here, but we have the two best teams in hockey and basketball right now, and we'll have the Red Sox, we'll have, you know, whatever. We have the North End, a little nice restaurant area, Greg, you should try it. Uh, but in Buffalo, what the hell do you have to look forward to? <laughs> Although some of your weather watchers are sending in pictures that, I, that are making me cringe. There's a lot of snow north of here. I would contend that we have more weather watchers than Al Roker. You, really? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Oh, that's impressive. Take that, Al. Wow. That is impressive. I mean, Al's half the man that he used to be, and he has oh, no other watchers. Full, Protect uh, Al Roker <laughs> at all costs. Full uh, potential Hillman Jinx scenario going on here with this discussion. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, oh. And, the and Jack, he's sick a little bit. And the Jack, the two Jacks <laughs> discussion earlier from Courtney and Wiggy. Yeah. Uh, there are, there are, there's the potential for Jinx all over the place. Oh, yeah. Mm. Stop talking. Do you think Jack Nicholas will be at the 50-yard line this weekend at Arrowhead? <laughs> Which one is that one again? <laughs> uh, this is Russ from Connecticut. Hello, Russ. Good morning. How are you, sir? What's up? I just wanted to agree with you, Greg. Um, Burroughs is uh, Wiggy's next Mac Jones. Um, he doesn't like the style of a pocket quarterback. No. I just told you I would take him over Josh Allen. Did, did, did you miss that the thing I said? I said I would but take, you wouldn't take him over, over, Patrick Patty, Mo- over Patty Mahomes. Yeah, and Patrick Mahomes is not even a running quarterback. Mm-hmm. So he's Greg, not like, that's not even something that he does. Greg, how many of those skilled uh quarterbacks in the last 10 years has been in the uh, Super Bowl. Last year they had what? Burroughs? And who else? Oh. Go, uh, Stafford. 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 Mm-hmm. <laughs> Skill set? Let me ask you this, Wiggy. Mm-hmm. Where, where is Jackson uh, uh, right now? Where's uh, uh, Murray? Lamar okay. Jackson's hurt. I mean, Jalen Hurts is in the yeah. NFC Championship. Jalen Hurts is pretty good. Season. I don't want to hear it. Oh, whoa, whoa. You just, I mean, you're <laughs> bringing it up. You just brought it up. Jalen Hurts is a hell of a runner. No, oh, J- Jalen Hurts is my pick for the win. Well, so there you go. You agree with me then. You want yeah, a mobile quarterback. Look at him. Look at him. He can, okay. Wiggy, he yeah. can stand in the pocket and flick it. Right. Right. Would you take Lamar Jackson? You, I think you answered this earlier. Uh-huh. Would you take Lamar Jackson over Joe Burrow? No. Okay. Oh, but I would. would okay. No. no but right, I good. would. Finally, we're making I would, progress. I would say. Who would you take, Jackson Mahomes or Burrow? <laughs> Mahomes. <laughs> Mahomes Jackson. All the, Jackson wow. Mahomes on right. TikTok. Nice. I would take Burrow simply for the fact that he doesn't come with an annoying wife <laughs> or brother. Yeah, that, or brother, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I yeah I agree. I'm not gonna. Yeah, I can kill us. <laughs> yes, yeah. just win. I cosign, Greg. Cosign. That that lady is a little much. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> you talking about Patrick Mahomes? Why? Yeah. Hey, she's she ride or die with a man. She is. Ride I got or no die. issues with that. Yep. Support oh. your man. Uh, there's one thing to call it. And his brother, his brother's got his, you know, for the most part, his brother's got his back. I don't know. He has been MIA when it comes to actual well, football what, games. Brother? Yeah. It seems yeah. like Patrick sat him down, but he is not, oh, you yeah. know, dancing on the sideline well, anymore. Well, he told him to, like, turn it down a yeah. little bit, so. Mm-hmm. J- J- I don't know if you'll get this reference, but Jackson Mahomes is like the pitching coach and rookie of the year locked in the uh, uh, equipment closet, not allowed out in sight because he used to be pregame TikTok yeah. everywhere. He is nowhere to be found. No, nah, no. Nah, Pat definitely got to him and said, hey, you guys, you got to tone it down a little bit. And, you know, he listening to him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, tomorrow, Ty Law on this show at 820. It's a Ty Tuesday tomorrow. Right now, Courtney, and what is trending this moment? The Rich Keefe Show. Weeknights starting at 6. Now, here's what's trending on WEEI. Trending now brought to you by the 99 Restaurant. The Bruins shut out the Sharks last night at the TD Garden. Four goals coming from Lindholm, Pasta, Charlie McAvoy, and Nick Felino. Linus Olmark and Jeremy Swayman combined for 18 saves. A nice stat from Razor after the game is that Olmark becomes the fastest goalie to 25 wins in the history of the NHL. Montgomery talked about the goalie rotation after the win. Here's what he had to say. No, I mean, we're just going to stick with the rotation right for now. If we do the rotation throughout, I think we'll be fine. We'll go ahead and then all star break. I would just like to also say, uh, Omar got screwed out of another career shutout last night because he had to come off the ice for like three minutes yeah. to fix a blade that got that got knocked off his skate. Yeah, so thought- Swayman came in, made one awesome yeah. save, yeah, and then Omar comes back in. They- no. no. Combined, he would he would have had officially had the most uh, shutouts in his, in a single season in his career. However, now he has to wait for that. Montgomery coach of the year? Oh, he has to be. At this rate, absolutely. I take Mahomes. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, they're off tonight. They take on the Canadians on the road tomorrow. The NFC and AFC championship games are set Sunday at 3. We have 49ers and Eagles in Philly. And at 6.30, Bengals and Chiefs. No neutral site needed here. This one is going through Kansas City. Reminder that all these games can be heard right here on WEI or for free on the Odyssey app. Patrick Mahomes did suffer a high ankle sprain this weekend. He has been clear that he feels like he will be good to go next week, so no worries there. Anybody think Adele will push the week game back a week so Mahomes is 100%? <laughs> <laughs> he might need to. <laughs> mm. And, Curtis, your guy Tom Brady has been fined a reported $16,000 for that slide tackle. I'm sure that will really hurt his pocket. He was framed. Uh, we will also have uh, – we've heard from a lot of his teammates saying that it felt like a, a final goodbye if for the Buccaneers and Tom Brady. Yeah. But it's, is it's it a, a final wrap. goodbye for career? No, 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 no. I told I you. Think it might if be. San Fran don't win, he going to end up in San Francisco. I'm telling you, he's going to end up there because Kyle Shanahan is like, listen, it ain't the quarterback. I can prove. I've already proven. I got Jimmy G there, and now if I get Purdy there, but I need the guy that can help me win it. Curtis, would you take Brock Purdy over Patrick Mahomes? Oh, hell yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, my God. I all hate day, Mahomes. All day and Saturday and Sunday, yeah. too. Brock yeah. is a real family guy. Okay. Mm. Well, the Celtics are in action tonight, taking on the Magic in Orlando. Uh, banged up injury report here. Robert Williams listed as questionable for that knee management. Uh, Malcolm Brogdon is out for personal reasons, and Marcus Smart is out with a right ankle sprain. But, Chime, still betting, riding with the Seas. Yeah, I mean, they're absolutely on a heater right now. Nine in a row, looking to make it ten. I will uh, lay lay the eight points with the Seas, even though they didn't have quite uh, good luck against the Magic last two times. All right. Looking for a great value for lunch? Visit the 99 Restaurant Monday through Friday until 4 p.m. and Enjoy their new flatbread lunch combo starting at just $9.99. The 99, always the real deal. That's what's trending. Here's Curtis with your weather. All right, we have drizzle right now, but don't. Get complacent. The snow starts at 1 in the city of Boston. We could see as much as 2 to 3 inches. So get some milk. And right now we're going to show you Princeton, Massachusetts. Mm. Whoa. From Pat Gaff, the sidekick of Angry Principal Dave. He has a lovely scene there in Princeton getting some snow out there. So be careful. You need a snow throw for that one. (laughs) Coming January 30th, Adam Jones joins WEEI. This is...
How are you feeling? What happened on the bike? How are you looking forward to bouncing back this year? Good. I um, actually been started playing catch right around the same time. Uh, got off the mound before I got up here. Been playing long toss, so uh, everything's been going good. Uh, you were hoping to come back and pitch, right? If not for just a freak, freak thing that happened. Yeah, I mean, we. Uh, my thumb doesn't even feel like it ever broke. <laughs> I got basically full extension now. I mean, I can do all this, so it, it, it's fine. Um, you know. I've, Hopefully the luck turns. You know, what, what can you do? Chris Sale on the award-winning Ken and Curtis show from Winter Weekend in Springfield. I, Ken kind of let him off the hook oh. there. I, Curtis, where were you? I thought you were doing a deep dive investigation on Chris Sale. Okay. The- you know what? When you get to Springfield, you're already happy. It's <laughs> like, I think there was a study, second happiest city in America. Uh-huh. So I was in a good mood. And they gave Cora as the buffer. We thought we were getting Cora at 9.30 and Sale at 9.45. Uh, they gave him in between us. And to be honest, I thought Chris Sale was, was honest and, and, and forthcoming. That was a question sandwich, though. He asked three questions, put right. the ba- bicycle one in the middle right. so that he didn't have to answer it. You, you should work with him on his brand when it comes to asking <laughs> questions. No, sir. Okay. Ken can do no wrong. I, I think he just got a little flustered there. <laughs> Yeah. I was just, sh- and there was no follow up. Like, okay, but back to the bicycle. No, back to the bike. Yeah. Far be it for me to criticize my boss. I, I would just say that Ken Laird not only sounded good, he looks good. I think he's lost. He weight. does. He looks amazing. Also, uh, throwing as he as he referenced in the off season should be a no no for him. Let's just wait till uh, till he's out on the actual mound pitching in a game. Could you like, imagine the pit in your stomach if you're Cora Heim or Sam and your phone rings and it's Chris Sale? It's like, oh my god, what happened? <laughs> I think they're really all. I think they're all like out on Chris Hill. Oh, what? Out in the sense of, do, do you think their expectations are high? Honestly, that he's going to give them much. They but, should but, be. Give him what the twenty-five million dollar yeah. value that he's that he's being paid. This no, right, you, that's my point. Do you feel like they go into it and you know every team goes into their season and evaluates what they have? Do you really believe that they're going into the season going okay? We expect a lot from Chris Hill. Yes. No, I think. 
You do? They have to. They're no. paying him all that money. And They're he, paying him all the money because it's too late. They already gave him that contract. But he spoke, he spoke to reporters and the tweets out there that he's it was, he said, I owe my teammates the starting pitcher they he, thought they were going to get. I owe the front office you, the starting you, pitcher they paid for. And I owe the fans you know what? the performances that they're paying to come you and see. You know who told that to? He told that to us. What was it? Last year or two years ago, we he, we talked to Chris Sale. Yeah. He said the same thing. Yeah. Like, and everybody's like, we love Chris Sale. We love Chris Sale. He, <laughs> he's a great talker. Great. We know that. But when you think of, like, even as a fan, do you have any high, do you have, you have any real high expectations for Chris Sale? I, I'm more concerned that he gets through an entire season That's my than, point. than I, yeah. I mean, I don't know what uh, I, I don't think they're down on him. I just think no, that but they're... it's like he's a su- you know when you have a Sunday, a hot fudge Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't put a cherry on the top, do people care? No. Right. That's what Chris Sale is. Yeah, Chris but I don't think Sale is not the is... cherry yeah. for this team. He's no, no, essential. he's like the ice cream. Right. But, but no, but it, now he's he is no longer the ice cream. He is now the cherry. If I... there happens to be, if he happens to do good, great. But if not, then we still got to figure out the if, Sunday. If, if, I don't think way. the front office is saying, "Meh, swinging a miss on that one." I guess we're just gonna How wash, you... flush that those millions of dollars down the drain. He hasn't been good since two thousand and what seventeen. He gets hurt every other day. That's my point, Courtney. So if you're so real, keep him in a bubble. I would be making him sign his life away. It, hey, it, no bikes, no this, no that. But it does. If you're Heim no Bloom, if you're Heim Bloom, <laughs> and you're the front office, so you're Alex Corey, you have to be sitting there and looking at it and going, "We can't high, have high exp- expectations for Chris Seal. If he gives us something great, but we got to go into the season based on what we've seen from him from the last three or four years production-wise, you can't have. And that's why I think the Red Sox are just like, hey, we're already into this guy, that money. There's nothing we could do with him. If he happens to hit, he hits. But if not, you know, our expectations are we don't think that he's going out there and he's going to be the ace. (laughs) I I, I think that what you're saying is accurate, but – the, for this team to be successful, Chris Sale has to be healthy. If Chris Sale isn't healthy or makes ten starts, they will finish in last place again. So, so then you then then well, your expectations are they're going to be in last place? If if Chris Sale is not healthy, this mm-hmm. will be a really bad team. Do they allow him to take the stairs at the casino, or does he go in the elevator? Oh gosh, I was... I, I it was it, it's such a weird thing because he looks emaciated. I mean, he is tiny, so you get how he can be hurt. But it wasn't a setting, as I said. It's not like you're sitting there. There's Red Sox fans everywhere. You're going to sit there and be like, you know, Woodward and Bernstein trying to find the Huffy marks. I mean, it's not exactly (laughs) something he's going to be forthcoming They should just move him to the bullpen. Mm -hmm. I know you're paying him a ton of money, but he's better off as being a guy that, you know, if you can get a couple innings from him in the bullpen – Fine, that's what he should be. But if you have the expectations of like, even if you keep him off the bike, didn't he get hurt like um, in rehab? Sean, no. what are the odds on his next injury? Is it like a area rug or something? Like, what are they like? Uh, can you can you? Mm, bet it might on be that? banana peel, Greg. It's another Smash TV. <laughs> the old banana peel. Right, but did he get hurt when? Yeah, when he was in Worcester. Right. So, right. That's it, it's like said. keep the bikes away from, <laughs> keep the TV away from. The guy goes out there and warm up. He's gonna. There's like it's almost like this guy's gonna get hurt. Mm, yeah. Medicine cabinet can't have a mirror. Got to be mm, careful. Yeah, he's a bullpen guy. I I don't I don't know what the Red Sox are waiting for, but garage door on the hand or something oh. like that. Is that a? I mean, I, the automatic oh. garage door. The I, door I shut opener. the car door on my finger. That thing hurt for months. <laughs> Burns his hand trying to cook pasta. Oh, Ooh, no yes. electric stove though. Uh, this is David from Florida. Hello, David. Good morning, troglodytes. What's up? No. Pencil in sale for the Cy Young this year and MVP. You can have a Roger Clemens like our 1984 season. <laughs> and uh, about, the, about the Bills, though, I don't think that McDermott had his team prepared prepared for the game this week. Uh, and you got to I, – I need to be very careful how I say this, but you wonder how much everything around them was was affecting them, if it was a distraction. And, uh, I mean, I, you, you got to ask that. I, I really think you have well, to I ask. Mean, I, I, I think it was, I mean, certainly was a distraction. They were worried about their teammate. I, I don't. I think that. Well, no. But, uh, 
but I mean, like, honestly, especially once he got back, once they knew he was going to be all right, and obviously, again, I mean, we're all delighted for that. But yeah. uh, I mean, they they just and him coming back to the team and at the game, yeah, uh, I don't know. I mean, he, they weren't well prepared for the game. Yeah, and McDermott needs to take needs to be held held accountable for that. No, I think it's more on what. Wiggy said earlier, which is that Josh Allen seems to have an issue when it comes to the big games. Mm-hmm. That's I, I mean, I think everybody thought that there was going to be a momentum boost for them because of that recovery and because of the way that went. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't feel like that was a distraction that led. To no, that. no. I, I think it's more of the expectations, right? And everybody expects them to be expected them to be in the Super Bowl. Tony Romo was even saying it during the broadcast. Oh, uh, uh, Josh Allen's got to put on the Superman cape. He's got to be Superman soon. A- a- he never left the changing room. Like he he didn't have a ch- he didn't even have an opportunity to because the team was just struggling and just giving up points. The defense stunk. And you know who's you know who's kind of in that same category that we see here on a daily basis? Jason Tatum. Right, so Tatum is now gonna be in the category going into this postseason of mm, a lot the, of pressure, the expectations yeah. for this team and what who you are. We need to see you perform at a level like we saw Josh Allen perform at such a high level against Kansas City uh, last play last year in the playoffs, and they, but they lost. So then everybody's like, okay, this is Josh Allen's year. I just thought he would have a bounce back game because he didn't look good against Miami. So then you go into this one, and that's why I was so surprised because he just didn't seem from start to finish like he had it in him. Right, and it was like with the with Demar being there in the locker room beforehand. We said after the their game against Miami, I mean they get a win, but we didn't think that it was going to be as close as it was. Now you go into this week, and it's like back to back poor performances from. And him. that's what Greg and I were saying when when people talk about the NFL and the AFC, they talk about two things: Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes, mm-hmm. and so. You now hear about that. So this is your time to shine. You're in the playoffs, postseason, you got home field. Like the expectations now are like, we need to see you go out there and light it up. If you lose, it ain't because of you. And so now you're starting to see that, okay, maybe this pressure is too much. Like Mahomes wasn't feeling that because he was playing well until he got hurt. But Josh Allen, you looked at, and now I think a lot of with the Buffalo Bills. And especially in Josh Allen is, all right. Are we just a team that dominates in the regular season, and then when the lights get too bright, it's like, Ugh. does this make you reevaluate the Patriot Bobos saying that the defense was great? You just can't stop Josh Allen, considering his ability to carve you up the last two seasons. I mean, all I heard after the final game of the season was, "What do you want them to do?" It's Josh Allen. You can't stop him. Well. The Dolphins kind of stopped him in the second half, and the Bengals stopped him the entire game. So yeah, well, he also played that Bengals team pretty well when he played them this season, Curtis. I mean, in the second half because they took their foot off the gas because they were up twenty-two to nothing at halftime. I think it was. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think he only got back in that game because Jamar Chase didn't read a route properly and kept run, running, and that gave a touchdown pass from jo- Joe Burrow to the Patriots. Yeah, that was the, the Marcus Jones. And was then that you the had Marcus the deflection fifty-yard pass on third and seventeen that landed off a guy named Washington. I didn't even know was on the team. I think we also need <laughs> to start like uh, everybody kept yelling at you know people like me and Wiggy because we're advocating for the Patriots to go get a guy like Lamar Jackson, saying Lamar Jackson hasn't won anything. I just want you to bring that same energy when you're talking now about Josh Allen. Like you bring it to Lamar Jackson, you bring it to Justin Herbert. Right. Josh Allen continues to lose right. in the divisional round of the playoffs, and yet all anybody can say is he's like the next, like the next coming. Well, like I just I mean, bring the same Wiggy's energy. Argument against Joe Burrow, and right? Lam- same and Lamar, thing. And Lamar hasn't won one either. So, right. I mean, well, that's I, my point. It's that's the same thing for all those guys. Until you prove that you can get over that, and I throw Joe Burrow in that category. Mahomes, like at least Joe Burrow got there compared to, yeah, compared uh, that's to true. guys like Allen. Like uh, he, at least Joe Burrow is winning. He's going to AFC back to back AFC Championship games, mm-hmm. and he was in the Super Bowl last year. And he's only been doing it for three. That years, is true. He two did, and a half. He, he did get you there one year. But that's why I said when, you know, it's Mahomes and then everybody else. You know, when we're talking about the new quarterback, Brady is, and we're not talking about him. We're talking about Mahomes and then everybody else. And then if I were going to say, okay, who's next in line? It's, I would say it might be Joe Burrow. It's Joe Burrow. 
Next in line. He's so had he, half the time in the league. Mm-hmm. Right. If he loses this weekend and yep. is 0 and 4 against Joe Burrow, how can you with a straight face and Joe Burrow's younger, been mm-hmm. in the league half as long? How well, I already he's... got the built-in excuse of the ankle injury. Okay. Well then well, that's just... it. And, and that's gonna be Curtis. It's the way it is. That's how sports work. Okay. If if well, you can can Galuli go and whack Burrow so we have an no, equal no, playing but, field. <laughs> but if, if if a guy was hurt, that's what you would say. Right, if Joe Burrow had, if if the roles were reversed, oh you yeah, would, that's going to be everybody's right. Excuse, that, yeah. That's going to be the thing. And but the, at the same time, like Jalen Hurts has been hurt for weeks, and he came out and looked awesome in that game. Like, yeah, he, but that you, we saw Patrick Mahomes get a high ankle sprain, and then a week later he's going to play. There's no way he's going to be the same. I do think the Patrick Mahomes going up against a Joe Burrow team, I, I don't think that people are immediately, even if his ankle was okay, saying that Kansas City is going to win that. No, that's Whereas true. Whereas I think a, a lot of the other good quarterbacks out there, if their team was in it, it's like, oh, Kansas City has this one in the bag. Well, it would be it would be if he wasn't hurt, it would be like, all right, can Cincinnati – do it for a fourth time. What? What? Wasn't the expectation for Mahomes that after six years he'd have more than one? Oh yes. my God! Yeah. Oh my yeah. God. Quarterbacks have one. This is the only dynasty with one title in the history right. of sports. Yeah, they paid him four hundred and forty million dollars or whatever, and he's won one Super Bowl. Right, he's won as many as Trent Dilfer. Oh, well, he's been in two. Yeah, he's oh. won one. Well, yeah, I know the, that. Yeah, Joe he Burrow's lost been in one also. And he's how many has Joe Burrow won? If he's been in the league three years. All right. Well, what are we talking here? We lost- talk- so how many? What are we talking about? Winning Super Bowls, not winning about Super Bowls. Patrick Mahomes has not okay. lived up to the expectation that everybody had for him. Uh, basically, you're right about that. <laughs> okay, okay, basically, and he's the right. reincarnation of Aaron <laughs> Rodgers. And the, it's well, well, in the world no, 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 no. He's the most talented player on the planet. Well, Couldn't and, have said it better. No, no. As of right now, Patrick Mahomes has been to two Super Bowls. He's won one and he's lost one. He's only been in – you brought it up. He's only been in the league. This is his sixth year. If he's able to win another one in a six-year span where he's won two Super Bowls, been to a third one that he lost, you got to say, okay, this dude is talented. He's taking his team – Oh, my God. None to, of us are saying he's not talented, No, 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 no. Though. But you're, you're trying to compare him to Aaron Rodgers. This man Straw is – Straw man. No, this man <laughs> has been to the last four AFC champ. Well, AF, four out of five years he's been the AFC championship oh, and they wow. hosted him. Let's have a parade. So he's been – he's only been – you can't compare him to Brady. So you could – no matter what you say about Brady, we know you can't compare him. But if you want to start comparing him to his peers around him, Joe Burrow and some of these other guys – They're not winning that game. Only winners, Shime. What do we got? Only winners? Only Bengals. winners? Bengals. Bengals. Bengals, Eagles. Oh, by the way, Greg, before we wrap, uh, I have a potential mass hole Hall of Famer inductee when I was oh, out last night. Really? It was one of the most unique experiences, and it only happens here. Oh, okay. Look at you going out, Curtis. I know. James, was he was in a, a football sweater. He Ooh. looked like a million bucks. Very cute. All right. Well, we'll get that before we go. Sports. Gresh and Foyer. <laughs> Gresh and Foyer coming up at 10. If you own a business, then it's been a bumpy ride from pandemic to inflation. I'm sure you could use a break if your business has five or more employees and managed to survive.
got to get out of here so Curtis can go home and check on Jess and make sure that she's doing all the sanding and shoveling. Yeah, uh, it's a nice lady. <laughs> in advance of the big storm, which is coming soon. It's just rain right now. Yeah, but... just rain, but don't be fooled. <laughs> okay. Your, your the white sep- stuff's coming. Several of your maps saying two to four inches. Is yep. that correct? They're all coming together. They're or your models. Yep. Are they maps or models? Well, I just they? prefer to refer to them as just research, Okay, you know, because they're all bundled together. Is right? it going to be icy on our drive home? Nope, just wet. Okay. And then by the time the snow comes, it'll be icy later tonight, so make sure you check out for black ice. Uh, let's see. Here is, I'm looking at this Greg Hillary thing. What is this? What is this about? Can we address the fact that Greg allowed himself to be featured in a documentary about a washed-up meth head magician who faked a terminal illness to make a comeback? What in the hell? I don't know what he's talking about. You were in I a mean, doc I, and didn't let us know? I mean, I've been in countless documentaries. Well, I, I mean, was, Wiggy's uh, in every documentary. I've no, only been in one. I was featured in a documentary about the smiley face killer mm-hmm. uh, while, uh, while, being, while interviewing the two guys who, to this day, the two retired New York uh, police detectives who are tracking the smiley face killer. Um, what other? What are, uh, I was uh, once featured on an episode of... 80 for Brady. Uh, <laughs> um, no. Uh, the Phantom sh- Gourmet. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, who hasn't been on Phantom Gourmet? <laughs> I think that that is an accomplishment. Um, <laughs> Wiggy's been on that. That's no, right. the, the the show uh, that they investigate people that go, what's that show? Unsolved Mysteries. Unsolved Mysteries. I was on what? the original Unsolved. Well, I wasn't on it. Mm-hmm. The original Unsolved Mysteries did a show about a guy who had been on our program who disappeared. Mm, okay. Uh, but they hired an actor to portray me, and the man was in his 60s, which was uh, which was wildly unfair. Uh, wh- At the time, I was in my 30s. Well, the real unsolved mystery is how you landed on a sports uh, radio my, station. My Lord, what a disaster. Oh, uh, can I get my Maswell Hall of Fame out of the way? Yeah, but hold on. Let me just get Harry. Hello, Harry. Good morning. What's up? Shine, my new favorite guy. Sorry, Chris. Oh, but man. when I was watching Mahomes arguing to go back into the game, I'm thinking about Mac being carried off crying <laughs> on a high ankle sprain. Love you, Harry. That should be the subject of the week. Uh, and you want to know what? Mm-hmm. When Andy Reid sent him to the locker room, Mahomes spiked his jacket because yeah. he was so mad. Um. You nailed it on the Cowboys pick though this weekend, Sean. Eh, not so much. <laughs> Boy, the Cowboys. Right. I nailed the Bengals. I had that was my go to pick yeah. all week. I you was did. all over the Bengals money line and the plus five and a half. That was easy. You, you did. Ed Greg, yeah. long road fifty six in the Twitch chat. Yeah. Phantom Gourmet is not an honor to be on. <laughs> that was a joke. You pay them to be on the show. <laughs> mm. Sarcasm. Uh this is Bob on the Cape. Hello, Bob. Hey, Capital Grill Dog, what's happening? What's going on, brother? <laughs> so, for, <laughs> nothing much. So, don't ask me why I was watching it, but um, just so you know, it's the fact you're unaware, there's a documentary about The Amazing Jonathan on ah. Hulu. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, and you were on WAAF at the time, but this guy was, like, playing beats that he created. I don't know what was going on. You've done a lot better since you came on WAAF. Well, I think that he, I, I, he pro- I'm guessing that he was on. he was a guest on the show. Mm-hmm. Correct. And was and was filming it for a documentary. I did. I was not aware at the time the guy was a meth head or whatever. Whatever. <laughs> well, it's worth a watch, and uh, yes. you, you definitely want to. You know, I'm glad you're aware now because uh, it's a better look for you these days. Well, a meth will, head who uh, faked cancer. Uh, mm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> he had a terminal illness, basically, to, to make a comeback, and had three different documentary crews filming him at the same time. So, huh. <laughs> I want to watch. I, I'm, one of the you worst know. things I've ever watched, but it was it was worth it to see you, Greg. Uh, uh, I will get to that. I I also want to watch that documentary about the dude who uh, appeared to stop the axe, the attempted axe murder, yeah. and then actually was the one who did it. Yeah, he he like says he saved this woman uh, on the side of the road, yeah. and there was a, a guy wielding an axe, and yeah. he took him down, mm. and, and he, he ends up being he, the guy. Apparently, he's actually the guy. And people All were right. following him around, obsessed with him, yeah. saying this hero. Yes, yeah. yeah. It's a crazy um, one. Curtis, Mass Hole Hall of Fame nominee. What's the story? Very quick. Last night, went out to Anchovies, great spot in the South End, and uh, James, Jess, and I were seated, and Jess, when I was in Springfield, finished up White Lotus, and she was describing, you know, one of the scenes and what she thought where the well, the water was involved. I don't want to spoiler alert. The water? That when they were on the boat. Oh, and, the, you're talking about the last episode? Yeah. Mm. yeah. And so um, 
James is on my shoulder facing back towards the bar. And this woman in her 70s, very nice woman, stops and like interrupts our conversation and says, did this happen in your real life? Or is this a TV show? <laughs> you can never be too sure with Cohasset. <laughs> so we were like, no, it's White Lotus. She's like, oh, okay, thank God. That sounded horrifying. Wait, wait, so she thought that Jess was describing you trying to throw her off a boat or something? Correct. Oh, oh well, that was nice of her to intervene yeah. just in case. Yeah, she did a wellness check. <laughs> Like, there was no shame at all. There was no thought about, maybe I should be listening, can whatever. I, can I see your Google history, please? <laughs> oh, did you see what he was Googling? <laughs> if that was in L.A., people wouldn't bat an eye. Yeah. They would not care. They're so in oh, their own world. But totally. when you're at a bar, especially if you're waiting for somebody or alone, you listen to everybody's conversations around. And hey, sometimes honey, you, yeah. You might want to leave this guy. <laughs> yeah. okay, I know he's okay. in the bathroom right now, but uh, you mean, might want to uh, think about uh, calling the police. Oh, wait, first of all, you hear people's conversations, but do you ever think of interfering in somebody no. else's life? Oh, discussion? I think about it all the time. Really? You do? Oh, my God. Especially if business. someone's being a jerk to somebody else. Yes, stay out of people's like, business. Oh, man. But I would never actually comment to right. that person. I would be petrified stay that they out knew of I was eavesdropping. Business. <laughs> the worst thing you could happen. That's what they'll be reading at your, in your yeah. eulogy. She was such a great person. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, she stuck her nose into somebody else's business, and that's why we're all here today to wish her uh, her moving on to the <laughs> upper room, and now she sp- sits beside his God. Mind your business. Well, have would... you ever watched one of those shows where they have hidden cameras and there's like a couple fighting next yes, to this uh, person? Keonis. Yeah. What's his name? John Keonis. What yeah. would you do? Yeah, what would you do? My so sometimes ma- I'm like, oh mouth. man, am I part of this? I got to uh, interject. Okay. Wait a second. Uh, on the Subaru of New England text line before we go, speaking of local television, how about Wiggy getting seasick on the Mad Fisherman? Charlie game? Moore, yeah. You got seasick? Oh, yeah. I got sick as a dog. I had to throw up. I don't have sea legs. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And we were out there, and I'm not a fisherman. So, yeah, I got a little seasick out there. Uh, I only like big boats. Oh, okay. (laughs) Giant boats. Uh Big cruise ships. Yachts, if you will. Well, yeah, Yeah. I haven't haven't been on a yacht. You're you're more of a lake guy. Uh, Uh, That's a pontoon boat. There's no, see, you don't have to, you don't get sick on a lake because you don't have to worry about Oh, yeah, you do. No, you don't have to worry about the the, the current. Yeah, you do. What kind of lake you go to? Lake Winnipesaukee, I feel like I get more seasick on that than I do on a boat in the ocean. Wait, the other... Are the, what are the swells that bad? Uh, on the the waves can get really bad on Winnipesaukee, really? yeah. Well, I've only been on it once. I didn't have that issue. I always mm. thought the lake was nice and calm. I like the, the sandbars. Pull a pontoon boat Ooh, up to yeah, the sandbar. Nice. Did you just say you've only been on a boat once? I mean, I, I feel like there's oh. something... I- no, I only went to Lake Winnipesaukee once. Story, the story lingering about you on a boat at one time. I have no idea what it that story is about. wasn't that a lake, about. too? I have no idea. I only been on a uh, lake once, and that uh-huh. was Lake Winnipesaukee. Uh-huh. A lot of stuff that you read in the news is Not fake true. news. Yeah, Did really? you hear Trump? Fake news. <laughs> <laughs> See, if it's on CNN, it's <laughs> fake. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did, right. did you take a boat to Ocean Prime, or is that no? You just no, drove there. no. I, uh, that's the White Lotus. I saw Greg there. <laughs> I gotta check in next time I go, though. I won't do that again. All right. Well, that's gonna do it for us. We'll be back tomorrow morning. Ty Law on the show tomorrow at eight twenty. Gresh and Foyer are next. Be mm-hmm. safe in the storm. Very yep. safe. Careful. Yep. Everybody be safe. Be careful. All yep. that stuff. God bless. And we will talk to you tomorrow morning at 6. Thank you for listening and thank you for watching this show on Twitch. Reveal, reveal. Your friends are calling you. Baby, stay with me instead. I know you're saying that you're tired. There's a the door dancing you live. Even if I go of you in my bed of a good time
This Hour Aggression Fourier is brought to you by Cause for Kids. Old Cod giving you problems? Why not donate it? Call one 877 cause for kids today. Previously on Gresh and Fourier. We would go to the Burger King in like Wakefield when they would do like the two for four Whoppers or whatever. And I think I ate like four of them. And one of my guys, it was either my man Nelson or Dewan Reeves, one of the two guys I played with. They were like, you couldn't eat more. And I'm like, I bet you 50 bucks I could eat six more. They went and bought them. I made the 50 bucks. We started going in the slide. I got stuck. This is Gresh and Fourier. I think the, the most important thing I can say it's expensive to have baseball players. They have the best. Andy Gresh. Charlie Coyle will waste the clock dry. The Bruins get a combined shot out from Lena Solmark and Jeremy Swayman. They have outscored their opponents in this five-game winning streak, 21 to five. Christian Fourier. We have guys step up. Yeah, Peyton come out, play really well. Grant came out and got hot, you know, and that's what we need. We a team, so no matter who rolls the ball out or which team is, you know, doing what, I, I got, I got my money on the seas. I, I, I don't know if I can say that. Gresh and Fourier, right now. Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes. Joe Burrow have been the class for a while in the AFC. They're still there. It's going to take a lot to catch up with them. On WEEI. Well, thank you, Tony Romo. That is among the many things we'll be getting into today on this Monday edition of Gresham Fourier and Good Grief. Foyer, it was a very busy weekend all around in the world of Boston sports. Mm. And let's start in our own backyard where last night the Bruins whooped up on terrible San Jose for nothing at the garden. Linus Olmark with his 25th win of the year. He is the second fastest goalie in NHL history to 25 wins in a season. And the man lost a skate. How does that happen at a professional you, level? Listen, you're asking me. I don't even know what the equivalent was. The I'm, funny thing is that he was talking about earlier. He said, oh, you know, I had issues with my skate earlier in the day. But we fixed it. Oh, did you? Yeah. Did you really? Did you really? Nah. Like, what is the equivalent? Like somebody not screwing in like the old screwing cleats that you used to have. You used to put in with like a drill. They'd put this attachment on. Can I give you one? Maybe your shoelaces blowing up. Remember when Zion Williamson oh, blew yeah, out blew of his, his shoes? shoes? Yeah. It would be something like that. It would be like a, uh, honestly, it would be like a helmet coming unlatched. During a play, yeah, and a guy's helmet Something, popping off like, because no, no, of it. not even that. The because face of, mask, no, the face oh, mask. The, face mask, was, the face mask would just there you go. Like, like a couple of the bars would just you know come come from attached or something like that. And you would have to hit somebody mm. with your bare face. That is insane. And even funnier is the fact that he actually had to get like I guess pushed off like a fat penguin, like a fat <laughs> penguin who can't like literally <laughs> waddle on his own. He's like on a knee, and Taylor Hall comes around and like digs in and literally slides him across the ice. That was fantastic. That was the best part of the game. It really was kind of fun. So <laughs> crazy. Te- so technically, Linus and the Sway Man get the shutout yeah. last night. Uh, but Which after- is bull crap, but whatever. Well, I'm, I'm with you on For that. Three it's minutes. mere semantics, yeah. I suppose. But uh, after the game, Andrew Raycroft on Nesson talked to Linus Olmark about everything. What was up with the skate? but I want to go to the third period and the skate blowout that you had. I, I was looking forward to you making a couple saves with no skate. I mean, it's a, it's an easy game for you right now. Let's take one of your skates off. But what was going through your mind while that was happening? You know what? That was the first time that ever happened to me. And to be completely honest, I had no idea what the ruling was. But the ref was calling it that he can't blow it. So I just have to get back into the net as quick as possible. And, <laughs> you know, with one skate, that's not as easy as people think it is. And all of a sudden, you're standing there, or basically you're sitting because you can't stand up and it's hard to move around and guys were just yelling to ice it well your buddy jeremy came in and made a big save for you guys to keep the dual shutout going the other thing i was really hoping for and i'm not was there any talk of a line change uh, a change on the fly that would have been incredible no i don't think i don't even know what the ruling is for that one are are we allowed to do that but that would that would have been fantastic uh but it's never gonna happen (laughs) 
I like it. Razor went into full talk show mode where he, he made a suggestion, but he didn't even know if it was legal. But it, yeah. it would have been pretty cool. Uh, also, Charlie McAvoy potted one uh, yesterday as well. Amber 37 on the Twitch chat. And good morning to the Twitchers. Twitch.tv slash Boston WEEI. His comment is McAvoy's goal was the best part of last night's game. And I think Charlie McAvoy actually agrees in terms of scoring. Well, are you kidding? Uh, scoring goals is the funnest thing in the game, right? Like, it takes you back to when you're a mini mic. It doesn't matter if you're five years old or 25. Scoring goals is fun. So it's nice to see everybody scoring goals, and you see that, you know, that joy. This almost felt like uh, – so Lindholm gets the first one. His was pretty nice. Makes his defender look silly, goes right by him, mm -hmm. and he gets the goal. And then McAvoy's was almost almost like a coast-to-coast -coast type type deal, Right. right. Like passes it to himself, like makes an humble. I mean, it was almost like one guy was trying to, uh, you know, you know, uh, kind of like you know, you know, impress the other guy. Like, oh, you thought that was good? Oh, watch this. That was amazing. He looked like the talented offensive player that gets out of the penalty box and is able to grind it out in the corner. And then you're right, go end to end to be able to at least get a shot on goal. In this instance, it was uh, putting it in the back of the net. And for the Bruins, it's beating up on another bad team. You've got, you mentioned, you know, Hampus play great. Linus once again. They're just rolling right now. And even with a bum skate, Linus Olmark still finds a way to get a win. 25 wins, second fastest in NHL history. We'll continue to unpack all that. So that was uh, the big thing. It happened last night. On Saturday night uh, against Toronto, the Celtics really had to survive. They won 106-104. But uh, injuries were a massive part of this game. Uh, Marcus Smart gets dinged up. I know Robert Williams got dinged up. And it was the bench. It was Peyton Pritchard and your guy, Foye, mm -hmm. Malcolm Brogdon, really coming through in the clutch so that the Celtics didn't have that winning streak snapped. And it wasn't so much that Toronto was the better team. It's sort of the war of attrition for the Celtics right now. You take X amount of guys out of the lineup, but – there's at least enough bench, unlike there was last year, to be able to survive lights, not nights like Saturday night. So the Celtics bench outscored the Toronto Raptors bench 62 to 14. Mm. 62 to 14. So Brogdon had 23, Grant Williams 25, Pritchard jumps in with 12. And then he included like a late three pointer to really kind of seal the deal. And of course, uh, Al Horford gets that late steal. No, that's what it was about. When you go back to last year, like one of their biggest issues during the season, and more importantly, during the playoffs, their bench let them down. That part of their their, their game is fixed. Their bench is strong. Yep. It is real strong. Grant Williams, like he's got that corner three, but he's even better now. He's like the second part of his game that is starting to show up day in, night in, and every single opportunity he gets is his post game, his ability to get to the hoop. That's been significant. Pritchard is almost like a, and oh, by the way, like, I don't expect anything from Pritchard. I don't. I don't expect anything from him. The fact that he gave you 12 points in that situation was great, but I don't really – that that's not something I rely on. That's why you don't Brogdon, trade the guy. Well, yeah, you know, because last week we were talking about a possible trade, and I was right. like, ah, for what, though? You, you know, he's still a rookie. Just keep him. Like, eventually you, you may need him, and he may come up, you know, big for you, what you did, uh, you know, uh, was it Saturday night? Yes, Saturday I can't remember. Toronto, I feel like it was yeah. so long ago. Yeah, but so to me it was all about the bench. That area, and Brogdon just continues to impress. 23 points every single opportunity he gets. He's proving that he will probably win sixth man of the year. Like, he will. At the beginning, I was like, and Grant Williams is another guy that if Brogdon wasn't on the bench and, and wasn't so strong, he would have an opportunity to do that, but his points aren't enough. Well, that's, Brogdon's the guy. That's why they went and got Brogdon, because you realize that Grant Williams is a nice player. Sometimes you got to start him. Sometimes he's off the bench, but he's not someone that you can count on consistently to score. That's what they've now got in Malcolm Brogdon. And the Seas survive Toronto. They'll take on Orlando tonight. We'll get to the injury updates, hopefully by, you know, 1 o'clock before we're out of here too. We have an idea as to who might be in, who's out for the Celtics, 
and also for Orlando as well. They're a young team, but they've had some injuries, might have some returns tonight as well. So the Celts will take on Orlando, who in record-wise doesn't look great, but boy, they're acquiring a lot of talent down there in the uh, Magic Kingdom. Uh, By the way, apparently the, uh, what was it, the flume ride down at uh, Magic Kingdom, I guess, is gone, whatever in the world that is. The flume ride? Whatever, the water ride down there. Splash Mountain? There you go, yeah, I guess. Splash Mountain is gone? Why is Splash Mountain gone? I don't know. They're shutting Stop down. It. There were people lined up yesterday for like a mile to go on the thing one final time. Wait, are you saying? Oh, so it's because that the so Splash Mountain is. Uh, I mean, that is in the spirit of an old old uh, Disney movie called Song of the South. Okay, which has uh, well, it is. It's got. It's how got, in uh, the hell do you know? It is. This? It is because the song that they sing is uh, Zippity Doodah. On that ride. Well. Yeah, no, it's called Song of the South. And the the main character is this rabbit who jumps into Briar Patch to get away. It's a whole thing, right? So it's it's the influence is from a and here's the thing. Well, the thing is they don't even they don't even uh there's a lot of racial undertones in that movie. Oh, of course. Okay. And a lot of them, and they don't even release that movie anymore. That's the one movie from Disney. That th- that you can't find anywhere. Oh, you can find I every single it. movie, but the one where you won't say it's bring up Zippity Doodah. Find Zippity oh, Doodah. Here we go. Okay, no, well, you brought it up. Okay, so I didn't know that this ride was like disappearing, and I'm sure they're gonna replace it with something more. I don't know, accepted by everybody. That and if you go on that ride, there are no racial undertones uh, undertones to the ride itself. It you just it's like a, a small world, but with a big giant. This is it right here. <laughs> this is it. This is what you hear in that stupid ride. It's insane. So they got rid of it. Yeah, they did. Because the name is, and the guy that sings is this big black guy, you know, and he's from the South and he sings Zippity Doodah. That's it. Says they're Why re- is the Zippity Doodah? Hold on. Part? It, it says they're, the, they're redoing it. it. Apparently they're redoing Splash Mound, according to some texters, shutting it down, but reopening it with some other name and theme. And then the, the 603, also, it's falling apart. So there is that as well. So anyway. The Magic Kingdom will deal with the Celtics tonight, uh, that being the Orlando Magic. And we're going to really get to this at 11 o'clock because, folks, there is one piece of audio that you must hear from what was an uncomfortable Red Sox winter weekend in Springfield, Foyer, where John Henry is maybe realizing why he doesn't go out in public very often. Uh, this is, uh, was, should this have been predictable? Did you, because it was, this was next level amount of, it's almost like all the frustration um, for like the past year was just all the fans had an opportunity to voice their frustration. Mm-hmm. And what's, what usually is this like kumbaya, feel good, everybody comes back, it's winter weekend, hey, camp's yep. like a, spring training's a month away, let's all get excited about the season. Get an autograph but from Boomer Loney yeah, right here. But, <laughs> but they've been, they've been the, the, but they've been like, I guess just fooled. They, they probably feel like a bunch of suckers. Like if the Patriots had a, what is called a spring weekend, a summer weekend, similar to what the Red Sox have, there, you think there would be booze with them? Well, what mm. just happened with all the, you know, the Matt Patricia and the Joe Judge and the gaslighting that existed? Oh, oh yeah. Do you think there would be – I feel like the, the, the Patriot fans are different. I don't think they'd boo. But I think the Red Sox almost feel like it's part of their DNA to boo and to yell and to scream and, hey, we're going to make you pay for putting out such a crappy product. We're going to make you – we're going to show you how frustrated we are by you guys telling us that you were going to sign Xander Bogarts with really having no intentions of doing it. Like, I was watching it the entire week, and I was listening to Ken and Curtis. It was amazing. It was amazing. It was like ownership was up on the stage, GMs, managers, all the David Ortiz, and they're just booing all of them. Explain yourself. Pretty they amazing. do it. It really is. And we will have the, the audio to unpack at 11 o'clock because – I think John Henry is realizing, oh, man, I got a real problem here. When you combine the Winter Classic with what is supposed to be a friendly crowd in Springfield that clearly wasn't. We're here to celebrate you. Yeah. This is a, this no. is a whole, a, hey, let's uh, get ramped up for the season. Hey, everybody's back, guys. We're getting ready to go to, to Florida to practice, to, to put a great product out on the field. 
and nobody's happy about it. I wonder if uh, Hein Bloom said, hey, we're going to do it, and it's going to be awesome. I don't know if he rolled that one out again like he did at the yeah. press conference uh, about a week or so ago, but we will get to Red Sox Winter Weekend coming up at 11. Don't forget you can watch us on Twitch. Good morning to the Twitchers. Follow WEEI on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Boston WEEI. You can also text us at 37937 and listen to us on the Odyssey app because – We're going to get into the football coming up, but Fourier, AFC and NFC championship games are set, and I would like to congratulate all of Bill's Mafia and all of the Buffalo Bill's fans everywhere on being the kings of the wild card round. Congratulations, Buffalo. Excellent. Well done. Same old Bills. Good for you. Same old Bills. Oh, my God. They got Steph Diggs, and they got this guy, and they got that guy, Mm -hmm. and they can't Can't win at home and score 10 points. Oh, my goodness. How delicious was that? All those Bills Mafia dopes sucking the hot dogs up their noses, power bombing each other through tables, and they get them they get a team at home in the snow. Oh my God. It was That's perfect a peanut for you. butter on oh, the yeah. nipple moment. And they <laughs> just soil the back of their britches collectively. Hey, I tell you, oh, how it was the perfect. Was it? There were so many beautiful aerial shots of that stadium with the snow and the yes. lights. You're like, wow, this is tailor made for Buffalo. How romantic! Is, yes. Exactly. Oh, it was oh they got they got Demar Hamlin up in the up in the suites. You know, with the snow coming down, he's doing the heart signal. You're like. Let's do this like you had every single opportunity and advantage, oh. except you didn't have Joe Burrow. Beautiful. <laughs> well, we're going to get to Joe Burrow because he is drawing some comparisons. Uh, we had a Saturday of, oh, the teams that lost tried hard. On Sunday, it is two teams that are very similar who have hit a same glass ceiling, but maybe for different reasons. We will unpack the NFL playoffs with you at 617-779-7937. Billy Laney for the first trend of the week. He's ready to go. The Rich Keefe Show, weeknights starting at 6. Now, here's what's trending on WEEI. The Boston Bruins extended their winning streak to five games with a 4 nothing win over the San Jose Sharks last night. Goaltender Lena Selmak had to come out of the game briefly with a busted skate, but went on to earn his 25th win of the season and his seventh career shutout. The Bees begin their five-game road trip tomorrow night when they will visit the Montreal Canadiens. Puck drops at 7 p.m. The Celtics take their nine-game winning streak to Orlando where they will face the Magic tonight. The Seas will be without Marcus Smart, who is out with a right ankle sprain, Malcolm Brogdon, who's out for personal reasons, and Robert Williams, who's listed as questionable for left, left knee injury management, tip off at 7 p.m. Kansas City Chiefs quarterback Patrick Mahomes suffered a high ankle sprain in Saturday's win over the Jacksonville Jaguars. Mahomes plans on playing in Sunday's AFC Championship game against the Cincinnati Bengals. And in the NFC, the San Francisco 49ers will face the Philadelphia Eagles in the NFC Championship after last night's win over the Dallas Cowboys. Trending brought to you by Awaken 180 Weight Loss. Learn how Awaken 180 has has a 98% customer satisfaction rating. Proven results when you choose the solution for weight loss. I'm Billy Lanny. That's what's trending now on WEI and WEI.com. Jacksonville and the New York Giants, very similar, but so are the Cowboys and the Bills similar. We'll get to Divisional Round Weekend next. 93.7 WEI.
playing for the AFC Championship. Andy Reid's amazing, isn't he? Mike Tirico with the final call of the Kansas City Jacksonville game. That's where we begin talking about an NFL divisional round weekend. 1023 Gresham Fourier here with you. Good morning to all the affiliates across the board. You can listen on the Odyssey app at 103.7 down in Providence, 105.5 FM. Real busy this weekend out there in Springfield with the uh, Red oh, Sox yeah. winter weekend. And, of course, Worcester, Cape, and the Islands up in New Hampshire and in the uh, great state of Maine. And, Fourier, I figure that Kansas City-Jacksonville probably needs the least amount of analysis from us because, for me, you can tell Jacksonville they just weren't ready for the moment to go into Arrowhead, into Kansas City, and get a win. And it felt like... Every time Jacksonville scored, Kansas City countered right away. Even if it was they put up a touchdown, went down and kicked a field goal. Whatever it was, it felt like whatever Jacksonville had for them, like if Kansas City needed to score 35 to win, they would have found a way to get the 35 points and win the game. Yet Jacksonville was hanging around but never really in the game, if you know what I mean. I felt like they they missed out on an unbelievable opportunity because – Wow. Because, yeah, because uh, the, the best player in football, like, got hurt early on, and you're like, all right, good, at least we can – at least we don't have to deal with that guy, okay? That guy, the way he extends plays, just everything about him is great. For sure as hell, Henny, Chad Henny comes in, like, 15 years in the league, something crazy – and he goes 97 yards and gets them a touchdown. You're like, holy crap, you had them backed up. You should have been off the field. No, so they sure as hell, they get seven points. They pad their lead. And you're still thinking, okay, even if Patrick Mahomes comes back, he's going to be severely limited, which he was. But he still starts making plays. I thought they missed out on an opportunity. But you're right. I felt like uh, they missed a uh, – the Christian Kirk drops a, like an, <clears throat> an easy catch on a bomb from Trevor Lawrence. They – they fumbled the ball inside the 10-yard line, which could have given them, given them points. Mm-hmm. So they made it interesting, and I would have all-out blitzed Patrick Mahomes so much just to force the issue with him and his hurt ankle. They he were a, afraid to do they, that. It's like they didn't want to do it, so I felt like they, they missed opportunities. But really? Yeah. He's, okay, I get he can still throw from the pocket, but the best part about him is his ability to improvise. Well, don't you think that Kansas City— They just City, didn't do it. Even though Kansas City let Tyreek Hill go— they still have home run hitters, and I think a part of the fear, just thinking out loud, is that if Jacksonville gets caught in the wrong blitz to either the wrong screen or the wrong you know, jet sweep handoff, something like that, that there are too many guys out of position, Kansas City hits the home run. It felt like there was a little bit of the, let's keep it in front of us if we're Jacksonville. As long as they ain't behind us, they can't kill us. But if we keep them in front of us, we might have a chance to manage this. I thing. just thought that they just they should have just attacked him and forced the issue. And let's see, because I've had multiple ankle injuries like that. We've seen other people have him. And the fact that he went in tells me that he obviously got some Toradol and some extra strength Tylenol. Okay, he probably got himself in that. <laughs> That's the only freaking way he comes back, Gresh, right? He probably, the general... You know, the general rule. Took some Anison. You take you take that. Most guys, even if they're not hurt, they take a Toradol shot. Okay? Yeah, Which yeah. is a really strong anti-inflammatory. And it just make, I don't care what kind of aches and bruises you have. You don't feel any of it until like Monday afternoon. For those who are wondering, if for those who have never been a professional athlete, it's like when you go to the dentist and they numb you up. That's essentially exactly what yes, it is. Just a it different is kind of cane. Fabulous. Or okay. doll at the and end of you, the drug. And if you pair that, I'm not telling kids to do this. Don't do it, okay? But if you pair that up with, like, some, I don't know, just Vicodin or extra strength Tylenol, which you, which is safe if you take it with the you know permission of a doctor, will remove all the pain and all the fear. So you're able to go out there in an unbelievable challenging contest and, like, perform. And he's still hobbling. They should have attacked him. They should have made him freak out. They should have made him worried about hurting it worse. And there are even these quick little slip screens and these quick little throws to the side that he was short-arming because he couldn't, he couldn't step into them. I just felt like they could have made it more interesting. They could have forced the issue. They could have really made them panic a little bit, and they didn't do it. So uh, I wonder if uh, Patrick Mahomes will be getting a uh, a surgery a la Mac Jones or or will uh, push back on that. Or who knows, 
maybe all the Kansas City fans will be like all the Zappy fans around here and go nuts and be screaming for Chad Henney. No way. Came in the playoff. I mean, why not? It's exact you, same thing. This is these situations in a in like the bubble of a of a game. Like, okay, listen, of like a two hour span. I'm going to do what I need to take to win. You're going to play out of your mind, and then we're going to just uh, we're just going to make this work. All right, drugs wear off. Reality sinks in that Cincinnati is actually going to game plan for Chad Henney. Good freaking luck. Right. Now, I'm not saying that he, he can't you know, be productive, but it's a significant drop-off, right? Yeah, Mahomes will be in there. We'll see what level he's at come Sunday afternoon. But, yeah, I, I only kid because, again, everybody around here went crazy for the backup. So, who knows? Maybe Henny Mania will run wild in Kansas City here before the uh, the AFC Championship game. And then for you on that second game on Saturday, well, the Giants went into Philadelphia, and this is the legend, Merrill Reese, on our sister station, WIP in Philly. This is first pass of the game to let you know everything you need to know. As Hertz takes the snap, he's back, he's looking, he is going deep, looking for Devontae Smith, who has it all the way down at the 35-yard line. Yeah. Brought down by Julian Love, but what a connection on the first pass of the game for 41 yards. He lines up in a very tight split, and he just runs by the defense. This is just one of these plays where you allow him to run that deep post or over route, and he just runs by Love, the safety. He doesn't have the speed to stay up with Devontae Smith. You got the answer to the question, is there anything wrong with his shoulder? Nothing. More. So oh, wow, you got, interesting. I mean, there. So there you go. You had Jalen Hurts. I mean, Philly was up 28-0. It was Cruise control over. after that. That, that was... Um, they were a little starstruck. They were a little like, uh, you know, look, it's like they were staring at headlights, right? You know, for some train coming out. The Giants. Out of them. The Giants were. Yeah. They're not ready at all. Phillies, man, they're, they're a lot better. I, it's funny, like, so when Jalen Hurts got hurt, you're thinking, like, okay, you know, all those wins were, you know, didn't exist, but they're better than I thought they were. And, you know, and the Giants. You listen, they they made the playoffs after what they went through the year before. They should year. be they should be so happy. Mm-hmm. The only thing they're doing right now is going, holy crap, how are we going to compete with Philly for the next some odd years? Whatever. That's what they're thinking. Yep. Because they're not going anywhere. A.J. Brown's not going anywhere. Devontae Smith isn't going anywhere. Jalen Hurts in his third year. I mean, talk about – you know what the funny thing is? Philly, is that, two first-round picks, by the way, as well. The, it's amazing that one they, of them they is have num- that. One of them, number 10, from New Orleans. There was somebody sent out this tweet. I don't even know who it was. I liked it. I should probably try to find it. It was like the University of Alabama is, like, taking credit for, uh, for like, Jalen Hurts. It's, it has something to do with, like, so Jalen Hurts was, what, like, the first uh, first Alabama quarterback to win a playoff game since, like, 1960. Something insane. Wow. It was insane the amount of, uh, oh, here it is. Jalen Hurts is the first Alabama quarterback to win an NFL playoff game since Richard Todd. Anybody remember Richard Todd? Yeah, Richard Todd. It was the 80s, wasn't it? It was the Jets. From You're right. You're because right. Ken the, Stabler would have been right. the other Alabama quarterback you're right. the one before that. Yeah, good job by you. Led the Jets past the Raiders in 1983. Wow. So the big th- debate going on right now is like, who actually can claim Jalen Hurts? Is it the University of Oklahoma or is it Alabama? And the other part is like, that's the last time an Alabama quarterback with all those studs, with all those first round draft picks, that's the first guy to win a to win a playoff game in the NFL. Well, Greg Seems McElroy, amazing. Greg McElroy was close, I'm sure. Well, I'm I mean, uh, I mean, maybe because he backed up by Andy Dalton. And you remember Didn't for he? and remember for a healthy chunk of those years, uh, Alabama was not very good. I mean, like you came out of Gene Stallings. I was and say there Gene was the, the Dennis Francione era, and then remember that guy got punted for I don't know. Was he another one? Like, did they just run him, or was that kind of like a? Uh, Doggone it, the guy who ended up at UTEP, he was at Washington State, but he went to uh, Alabama and then left. Mike Price. Ooh. Remember, he was there for about five minutes, and I don't wow. know if it was uh, that out of your an buttocks. unzip situation going on there or whatever, but nevertheless, Alabama is a monolith now. And um, hey, I just look, thought it was amazing with all Jaylen those first-round like, picks. He He's, played well, but he didn't play great. He did enough to be able to win, but it's fine. Their ru- look. Where is Philly dominating lines of scrimmage? Again, it isn't sexy. People want to go crazy over wide receivers and running backs and da-da-da. 
Where is Philly killing people right now? They dominated offensively on the line of scrimmage. Both they sides. ran in for over 200, but they added Sue and they added another big body in there. His name is slipping me. We're on the defensive line. They're now better equipped to deal with the run because Jordan Davis, the big kid, I think got hurt. And I can't remember if he came back, but they added some beef along the D line as well. And that's where Philadelphia is smacking people around. Running well, the they, ball they are they, they are definitely the uh, the favorite. But for a while, all I heard around here on sports radio was you got to throw to win. Run games don't matter. <laughs> really, look at what happened in since. Look at happened with Cincinnati. Look at Philadelphia. Look at San Francisco. I know we're going to get to those other two games, but running the ball and staying balanced matters. Ask Josh Allen if he'd like isn't, to have isn't, thirty carries for one hundred and twenty yards a game. Isn't that funny though? Like when it really so you can get by with slinging it all over the place. You can get by with taking advantage of a team that has weak to non-existent corners. You know that just can't cover. That don't know how to tackle in space. But then when you get into the playoffs, like the same old like you know. Adage still holds up. Can I give you the it just four holds up? Can it, I give you the four changes. things I learned in college in '92? Okay, it was if you want to win consistently, if you run the ball, you stop the run, you win the turnover ratio. It sounds like Bill, and you win on special teams. That's what I was taught in '92 when our coach was like, "Here's kind of the blueprint," and he would say, "Because if we run it, we're gonna work play action." If we stop the run, they'll be in third and long. If we win the turnover ratio, numbers are in our favor to be able to win close games, and special teams is the deciding factor with hidden yards. Normally, if you're pretty good at those four metrics on the whole, you got a chance to win consistently at any level. No, it, it is, and uh, I remember even, uh, I don't know when it was, uh, we were talking to, we used to talk to Michael Lombardi, I don't know, every Friday, and he was basically mocking the idea of uh, teams run. oh, it was, it was the Tennessee Titans, when they finally ended up losing to Kansas City in the AFC Championship game, and the Chiefs ended up winning the Super Bowl, they they made they made it to the to the AFC Championship game by running it primarily. That was it. They ran the ball. They played good defense. They didn't turn it over. They were good on special teams. They didn't need bells and whistles. They didn't need the new innovative like you know play scheme. They didn't need it. They knew who they were. They owned it, and they played to their strengths. Mm-hmm. And that was pretty freaking simple. Because when I look at like all the teams, all the teams that advance all do that. Cincinnati will get to like uh, taking advantage of turnovers. Buffalo with the loss turnovers. Like Josh Allen has just disappeared. Uh, I mean, even um, uh, you know San Francisco. They all have Dallas. It's like you just can't keep turning it over. Right. You can't get paid that much money, Dak Prescott, and keep turning it over. It just doesn't work. You get paid too much money. So to me, I'm with you. It just cracks me up with all the metrics and all the, you know, the stats and information and, you know, surrender index that you see by all these knuckleheads out there on Twitter. Try coaching a team. Try coaching a team and put up those stupid stats about surrender index and passing on this and doing on that. If you're not willing to get your nose bloodied, especially in the winter, you have no chance of making it or or advancing. It just doesn't exist. So that gets us right into Cincinnati and Buffalo because Buffalo had, uh, you know, Allen had the turnover late, but they got down and then they couldn't figure out how to put anything together consistently on offense. Steph Diggs was pretty much a no-show, four catches on 10 targets. Hey, listen, I don't think uh, Cincinnati is great on defense, but they did a great job of frustrating Diggs to the point to where when Josh Allen did throw that interception, Stephon Diggs was ranting and raving and going nuts on the sideline. Diggs, after the game, apparently he was out of the locker room so quick that I think it's Duke Johnson, who was on their practice squad, had to grab him, pull him back in for whatever McDermott had to say, and then Steph Diggs got the hell out of there. And after the game, Sean McDermott was asked about his little hissy fit on the sideline. That's what makes him good is, is what you saw. Is he's very competitive, like we all are. Uh, we work extremely hard at these jobs to, to, to be the best we can possibly be. And it hurts. And, um, you know, I, uh, I wouldn't want a guy that it, it doesn't hurt, right? So um, he put it all on the line out there. We put it all on the line. And tonight it wasn't good enough. And... Uh, um, you know, that's that's the part that stings. Yeah, so guys like that always drove me nuts because this is when I need you to, to kind of calm down. 
This is when I need you to be, you know, have your wits about you. This is when I need you to just not, to you know, not be so emotional. Like, we're all trying to win. I'm trying to get you the ball. I threw it to you ten times. Okay? They're obviously doing something uh, that is, uh, that is uh, you know, causing us not to be as successful. Okay? So, fine. And you know what? They had a good game plan, and I suck right now. <laughs> like, that is that is the other aspect of mm-hmm. it. But what le- but for me for Cincinnati is the thing that stands out is just Joe Burrow. It's the obvious one for me. Joe Burrow, they're down three starting offensive tackles. Oh, sorry, not offensive. Three no, offensive, offensive linemen, linemen. Three offensive linemen. Three backups started it, that game it yesterday. Just doesn't matter. And people will like to draw comparisons to the greats of the past, like even the present, like a Tom Brady, like a Joe Montana, like a Aaron Rodgers. To me, the thing about Brady that made him special is that even if you had issues on your offensive line, it just didn't matter. He was just, he knew where to throw the ball and he he had receivers that knew where to go under those circumstances. He got the ball out on average 2.5 seconds. It took him to get the ball out 2.5 seconds. He just, just darts it out there. It doesn't matter. I mean, they had the same issue last year. They went to the Super Bowl, And the thing that stands out to me is I feel like the, after it's all said and done, I feel like the NFL has a Cincinnati Bengals problem. I don't think the NFL wants the Cincinnati Bengals to be the darling of the NFL. I don't think they want Cincinnati to be uh, like the next like up and coming team. This is market this is, size deal. I just feel like it's like God. We thought it was a fluke. We thought it was like last year was a fluke. The way they beat Tennessee, the way they advance, even against uh, you know you know the way they advance, the way they beat the Raiders last year. That two of the first games. We're like almost flukish. And then they actually beat, you know, uh, the Kansas City Chiefs in overtime with Jamar Chase and, and with their kicker. It was amazing. I don't feel like the, the NFL wants them there. I don't know how you feel, what, you, what you've what seen uh, with them. Look, I think if uh, Pittsburgh is a similar city of size, and I know they go back with a much more rich history than the Bengals, where most people grew up with the Bengals as losers and the Steelers as winners. Um, I think it's okay because it's really about the star power of Joe Burrow. And after the game on CBS, they asked Joe Burrow about the neutral site possibilities. And yeah, he, yep, yep. He talked about it yesterday, just that chip on your shoulder. Everyone talking about a neutral AFC championship game, not even thinking about you guys. How much did that motivate you coming into this? You better send those refunds. (laughs) Yeah, boy, See, there he isn't is. Isn't that that's Sticking more? It. Isn't that that Brady does that all the time? He holds on to something, he doesn't mention it, and when he is successful or he wins, he throws it in your face. There's more at like from the videos to the, like you know post game press conferences. He they just don't talk about it and credit Zach Taylor. But then actually, when it's all said and done, and it's safe to kind of mock people mm-hmm. for using it with the tickets. He says, well, hey, well you know, those refunds. Well, I get those refunds back. You know, you guys didn't want us here. Here we are. Well, you know what? And you mentioned Zach Taylor. He talked about it post game as well. And after you hear this, it was evident. The rallying cry was about this whole neutral field game for the neutral site. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we, we just, we had our mindset to go play in Kansas City, and, and uh, it, it, I, it, is, it is tough because they're, they have to formulate the plans for coin tosses, and they got to formulate the plans for neutral site games, and we just keep screwing it up for everybody, and <laughs> I hate that for, for people that have to endure all those logistical issues, and then uh, we just keep screwing it up, so I'm sorry. Dude, that is Bill. That is so condescending and passive aggressive. It's the same script, Gresh. It is. It's the same script, yep. and the players are doing it. The quarterback is doing it, and your coach is doing it. Hey, with a straight face, that's amazing. Uh, I'm just sorry, you know, guy, you know, those guys got to keep changing those plans, and I don't know what to do. Like, I know they're they're working their ass up, but, man, we just keep screwing it up for them. God, oh, shucks. That is a script from the Patriots over the last 20 years. They rallied around that. For, of course. And they, one of the what are the page we rallied around a stupid fake uh, parade parade that that the that they were still doing here in the city of Boston. And you took the cheese, didn't you? Willingly. You- <laughs> Give me more. I want more. Yep. There's a video of that going around that actually shows me. And I am so dead serious. I can't believe these guys think they can just plan a parade. Like, hey, we haven't played a game yet. 
Who they think they are? That was also your first Super Bowl, too. So uh, there was no. That was my second one. Wait, was that 04? Oh, that oh, that's one. right. It was the second one. Sorry, the first yes, one was in I was Houston. Really brainwashed by then. Got it. Oh, oh you were, I was one hundred percent. You were like zombie. I was like, oh, they Bill. think we suck. You guys won twenty one <laughs> games in a row. We are not good. We won that. We were the first. We we're the number one seed. Oh, we suck still. That's amazing. <laughs> We keep winning. We lost two games. We got lucky. We will get to <laughs> uh, we will get to Dallas and San Francisco a little bit, but also some Patriot news as well. That we got to run by Christian and you next. Ninety three seven W E E I Boston Sports Original. Guys, the new year is upon us. It's a time of reflection and often a time to make positive changes in your life. This is Dale for Northeast Men's Health, and if you've been suffering with erectile dysfunction and don't want to suffer anymore, I'd like to invite you to call us. Because frankly, there probably isn't a better resolution you can make than to be done with ED. You see, ED doesn't just affect you, it often affects your partner as well. ED can cause rifts in a relationship, even if the one you love isn't talking about it. But the good news is that if you're like most guys, you'll get your sex life back, because our treatments have success rates as high as 90%. You might even find you're performing like you haven't in years. So make an appointment and resolve to get ED out of your life. Your initial visit is just $99 and includes blood work, a medical consult, and if medically advised, a test dose. And if that test dose doesn't work in the office, your visit is free. Call 617-793-5000. That's 617-793-5000. Or go to northeastmenshealth.com. We have four offices, Salem, New Hampshire, Dedham, Marlboro, and our new office in Woburn with 7 a.m. appointments. Eric was way behind on his taxes. I owed a lot of money to the IRS, almost $15,000. I tried to make payments. The IRS wasn't satisfied with Eric's efforts, so they came after him full force. They're coming to put a lien and a hold on all my income, my home, my car. I was just overwhelmed at what to do. Then Eric called Optima Tax Relief. When Optima Tax got involved, the cause was stopped. The threats would stop. It was easy like uh, one, two, three. Optima Tax Relief is A-plus rated by the Better Business Bureau, and their team of expert tax professionals took care of Eric's problem. I owe 15000 and now my debt is clean. I don't owe anything. Take Eric's advice. If you have a tax problem, you need to call Optima Tax now. Call Optima Tax Relief for a free consultation. Call 800-749-4055. That's 800-749-4055. 800-749-4055. Optima Tax Relief. Some restrictions apply. For complete details, please visit OptimaTaxRelief.com. Hey, it's Greg. QC Kinetics is the nation's leader in advanced regenerative medicine, now with three clinics here in Weymouth, Lawrence, and Lowell. Their unique protocols use healing agents from your own body to target your aching joints, repairing and restoring damaged tissue so you can move again with no drugs, no surgery, and no downtime. If you've got shoulder pain, excruciating hip pain, or you have arthritis pain or lingering pain from an injury, don't let them operate on you or give you more steroids and say no to the pain pills. Call QC Kinetics and see if their life-changing all-natural treatments will work for you and get you back to living your best life in the new year. People are raving about their treatments. It's the future when it comes to joint pain management and appointments are available as soon as next week. Make 2023 the year you say goodbye to joint pain. Call QC Kinetics for a free Free consultation at 617-644-PAIN. That's 617-644-PAIN. 617-644-PAIN. Looking for a great value for lunch? Visit the 99 Restaurant Monday through Friday until 4 p.m. And enjoy their new flatbread lunch combo starting at 999. The 99, always the real deal. Hey, Boston. Julian Edelman here with big news. The WinBet Sportsbook is about to go live. Go to EncoreBostonHarbor.com slash sports betting to learn everything you need to know about Boston Sportsbook. Be sure to sign up for a Win Rewards card to receive exclusive benefits and offers. That's EncoreBostonHarbor.com slash sports betting. Let's go. Must be 21 or older. If you or a loved one is experiencing problems with gambling, please call 1-800-327-5050 for 24-7 support. Hi, I'm James Pratt from Basement Technologies. Find out how fast and inexpensive it is to keep your basement dry for good. Don't let rain cause damage to your home. Call 1-800-BUSY-DOG or visit basementtechnologies.com and keep your basement dry for good. At Fisher Investments, our clients know we have their backs. How do your clients know that? Because Fisher Investments is a fiduciary, the highest standard for a financial advisor. It means we're there for our clients and always put their interests first. So wait. 
You do it because you have to? No, we do it because it's the right thing to do. Our clients trust us with their retirement savings, and we know how important that responsibility is. So we take the time to really get to know them. Get to know them how? We make sure we understand their unique goals, finances, health, family, and lifestyle, so we can tailor their portfolio to their specific needs. Our goal is to help them achieve a comfortable retirement. Sounds like a big responsibility. You must make big commissions then, right? No, we don't sell commission-based products. We have one single transparent fee that's structured so we do better when our clients do better. Visit fisherinvestments.com to find out why investors like you are switching to us. Fisher Investments, clearly different money management. Investing in securities involves the risk of loss. Now, now, more Gresh and Fourier. On WEEI. And streaming on WEEI.com. Back to your thoughts on Coach Michael. Does a result like this change anything in your mind with him? No. No. No, not at all. And um, uh, their decision to, uh, for the, our kicker was exonerated with his uh, field goal in my mind, and uh, I'm proud for him. Uh, but uh, this is, uh, this is uh, very uh, sickening not to uh, not win tonight. Oh, we'll hear the response that made John Henry sick coming up in uh, 10 minutes, but that was old Jared Jones. Hey, I know you don't ask me about how terrible this was, but I'll tell you I'm vindicated by the kicker, and we'll just look the other way that I'm the only owner slash general manager in the league, let alone the only one that'll do a press conference five minutes after the game end to tell you Dak Prescott's still my guy. <laughs> and, oh, by the way, I'm going to pay him $32 million in salary. That's how much I believe in him, fo yay. Uh, I love it when the Dallas Cowboys lose. I love it when the Dallas Cowboys lose. It's glorious. It is, a, it is amazing when you think about how, when was the last time that the, they were actually in an NFC Championship game? It was like, I don't know, the 80s or the 90s, 90s something or, or something like that. The last time they won the Super Bowl, probably. Mm-hmm. Um, and Philly has done a better job at staying relevant than the Cowboys. Like Philly, uh, even going back to the Steve McNair days, you going back to uh, hell, like uh, we or Doug Peterson, mm-hmm. okay? And then they go ahead, and now they're then they reset, they fire everybody, and then they're back at it again. I mean, out of all those three, of all the teams in the NFC, uh, what was it? NFC uh, East. East, like the Philly, Philly's like the best. Like the Cowboys are the worst. Who else is left? Who else is in that conference? Well, oh, the, oh, the Washington, Commanders are oh, yeah. the Commanders are terrible. No, the but, Giants are actually have done more than they have. But New York since and, New York and Dallas went to the same round of the playoffs this year. So if you're a Giant fan, you're like, hey, listen, you had a better regular season, but you putts is you didn't win. The best part about that game was the last play. Yeah, the last play of that game. I don't know what the hell they were trying to do. But they were trying to do some sort of trick, razzle dazzle. Let's you know they had uh, Ezekiel they were, Elliott snapping the ball. They were trying to run something a la Boise from when they were in the Fiesta Bowl twenty years ago or whatever it was. Well, now. yeah, it was. It, it was like they only had like three or four offensive linemen. So, so what happens is, so they go ahead. Ezekiel Elliott snaps it to Dak Prescott, and then I don't know who he ended up throwing it to, but he gets tackled right away. But then, you, as you, if you go back and watch it. Dak Prescott, it's almost like a weird version of a hook and ladder. That's what it was. Yeah. They it was were like, all right, up- so, and then Dak's going to get it, and then he's going to, because we're going to take some offense. Like, I was like, oh, what is this, Indianapolis, you know, like, you know, 2.0? Well, they made Dak ineligible on the play because he snapped the ball and, and got, got run trucked. over. It might be his last play as a Dallas Cowboy. He got trucked. Him getting uh, trucked on that final play. And Mike McCarthy cost his team on the low end 40 seconds, on the high end maybe a minute 10 with the way he handled the two minute warning with three timeouts. So not only at two fifty on the clock, does Dak Prescott get sacked? They then let the clock run all the way down to two eleven before they punted when they had three timeouts and the two minute warning, they did it ass backwards. They used the two minute warning as the first timeout. When in reality you bang one of your three timeouts with two fifty, or when Dak gets sacked, Then you're punting. They're getting the ball with about 2.45 to go. You still have two timeouts, and then the two-minute warning is your last timeout to where they would then punt it back to you, and you'd have about 150 with no timeouts on the clock. Instead, this guy did it ass backwards. They got it back with 45 seconds. It couldn't do nothing. Stupid, stupid, stupid. That is why I think Mike McCarthy, 
So should be fired. Peyton, uh, what is it? Like Old Sean Jarrah Payton, said, no. Nope. Uh, I don't believe him. I don't believe him. If you, I feel like if you, if you brought Sean Payton in there, like maybe he does a better job. Who, both guys won a Super Bowl. Both guys have had crappy years and good years. Maybe it doesn't change anything. Maybe you just need a better coach with Dak Prescott. Like how a guy can constantly so, throw so many picks and just think that like that is conducive to winning. He needs more weapons. He you needs mean, more weapons. Oh yeah, like Dak Prescott needs yep. more. How many? He's got two great backs. He's got a good tight end. He's got a he's got great wide receivers. Nah. What else? What else does he need? He's got a great wide receiver in C.D. Lamb, and I would argue whether that guy would be great or not. Dalton Schultz is a nice player, but he's not an impact guy. You need better talent around that dude. No, oh, by the way, both running backs are free agents. So I'm just saying the talent I, would be the last need, thing I would say with a quarterback that's making close to $40 million a year. He needs it. He should be able to get out of, he should probably make he should more out of what he's got. Yeah. Uh, the salary is going up to 32 million. I do believe oh next my year, Lord. by the way, if they get rid of Dak, it's like an $80 million cap. Thing. They're not kind of like he's there Aaron for Rogers good. Right he's going to, he's going to die with that star on his chest. Uh, but old Jerry Jones being like, well, this doesn't change anything with the coach. It's like, come on, man, <laughs> you got to look in the mirror here and figure out how to get and who knows maybe he'll look at it and say i can have a first round pick or i can send my first round pick to new orleans and get the guy i've always wanted in sean payton no no uh, we'll see jara he always reserves the right to hey change my mind it is amazing to me that for some reason i'm curious to know if this will continue to happen for the patriots is that they have not done anything in forever they haven't won anything in forever. The Cowboys, yet they're still have not won so a division relevant. round game since '95. Yeah, it's like they're still relevant. They're still talking about them. It's like always the place to be. They always are up in the ratings. I just, it's like the. It, that's why I said the the NFL has a Cincinnati Bengals problem. They, I feel like, you know, the Bengals probably feel like they're overlooked, and it's like they they haven't gotten enough respect. And then other teams with less get more attention. I don't know. It's just like the Dallas and like the Patriots, like are they going to continue to be relevant even though they're not winning? Well, that is an interesting question. And among the things that we will get to here today on Gretchen Fourier, we will get to Gerard Mayo sitting in on OC interviews. We'll do that coming up in a little over, uh, well, we'll do it in about 25 minutes from now when we get into something that has definitely got our attention in the, what Bill Belichick is doing with his assistant coaches this off season, but up next rough weekend for the Red Sox in what they thought would be a safe space at the winter weekend in Springfield. You will hear what went down next. The Red Sox station. 93.7. WEI. Boston. Sports original. Do you ever want
Lawrence, Boston. Always live on the free Odyssey app. This hour, Gresham Fourier is brought to you by FindMassMoney.com. Now, back to the guys. Gresh and Fourier on WEEI. Because you had a bad day, you take it one down, you sing a sad song just to turn it around, you say you don't know. You know, Fourier, in this time slot, we used to have a producer who said that whenever he has a sad, he would ball up in the shower and just let all that hot water run down on him and maybe listen to music and stuff and and let it out and maybe have a cry. You have a sad. You have a... I like that. You have a day. You have a bad day. I'm okay with embracing the sadness and almost like piling on the sadness. I I like that. Feeling bad, you pick a song uh, and you just kind of... And then it's over. Okay, now you move on. I like that. I feel like everyone should just... Embrace the sadness and not fight it. Have a sad every once yeah, in a while. Absolutely. Well, did uh, John Henry have a sad <laughs> after Red Sox uh, winter weekend in Springfield where Ken and Curtis and Arcan were out there on Saturday? And, uh, well, yeah, normally you figure that you are in a safe space. If you're around Red Sox winter weekend, that it's going to be more of the fans who would call sports talk radio with the you know if you guys just got behind the team Absolutely. they would do better you figure it's going to be a lot of those right and i and i say this with love the carabases of the world who you know they can do is, no wrong right they Never always rainy sign, day. It, it's always the the optimist it's yes. like dan roach dan roach Perfect was there example. you thought there was a there's this a convention center filled with dan roaches yep you thought you, yeah and i would say like dan roach you know if, if that's the if that's kind of how we're using it like you would he would never curse he would never yell he wouldn't even if you there was multiple signs of dysfunction and pain and loss in the future he would still kind of whitewash it and be like nothing to see nothing here to see everything's here. gonna be fine we'll be all right oh cora will figure it out john henry he's already spent a lot of money that whole thing Just the exact opposite. Yeah, it got ugly quickly. So Red Sox management walked out on stage for what was this big panel discussion. They got booed. And then we're going to amplify the audio for you here so you can hear John Henry speaking at winter weekend and not only the reaction of the fans, but the reaction of Henry <laughs> then trying to pick it up again and Sam Kennedy jump in to try to help this big mess. I think the, the, the most uh, informed thing I can say is that it's expensive to have baseball players. To have the best. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously? So, 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 what what has enabled us over the years to be able to spend with the Yankees and the Dodgers and is is your support, and that support is through ticket prices. It's, it's watching this, but a lot of it for us is ticket. Put a product on the field. Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's really important that we provide accessibility to Fenway. I mean, it, it, we cannot grow that next generation of fans without people being able to, to get there. And we do have high ticket prices at the high end, um, mostly corporations and businesses that buy, whether it's luxury boxes or lower box seats. But we also have $9 tickets for every single game, for every student anywhere in New England can come to Fenway Park for $9. And that's really important. Um, we have to make Fenway Park accessible, um, and it's it's critical that our fans know that the revenues that we generate go to two places. They go into the player payroll, into the product on the field, and they go into Fenway Park, preserving, protecting, and enhancing Fenway Park. Holy cow! And that was for that somebody sitting in the stands. It's amazing. Yeah, that's just our it is word amazing. Of, where do we start? I don't. I you know what? Okay, I'll just start with what I what what it reminds me of. It reminds me of two things. 
a couple like, you know, defunct businesses where I was like a shareholder and I actually sat in on some of the calls and then some of the shareholders were allowed to speak. They all yelled and screamed at the, at the governing bodies, right? They just yelled and screamed, you're ruining the company. Or we call that a Surly Johnson. Yes. There you go. Thank you. Forget about the reference. We'll explain it later. The uh, the other one is those those old school like movies where like you know the king and queen are like you know saying oh let them eat cake and then all the all the peasants go hey, she wants us to eat cake oh, they're not giving us any food we need bread and water ah oh, there's poop in my house like what is sanitation come pick up my trash and they throw stuff and then they just and then they overtake the stage and they go oh crap we should probably get the hell out of here. That was the most unruly like, fan appreciation day I've ever heard in my life. Hey, guys, baseball players cost money. Shut up! What a visceral reaction in a room full of people that you thought would be sycophants. Really? I, I'm amazed. It's like they just don't <sighs> give a crap anymore. They don't want to deal with what they perceive. It. Here, John Henry is right. It costs money. They spend a lot of money. If you average out what the Red Sox spend as, my, as far as teams that spend money, they're still up there with the top ones. They still spend. So, I mean, what fans are they just, aren't happy with how they just, they're spending they don't, they the don't money. Care. So how do you actually please them? So uh, what what makes you th- what made them act this way? What 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 was the final straw for them to sit there and spend all this money and time and energy to go down there, hang out, sit in this crowded place? And listen to ownership, management, coaches, and players talk. Um, what was the final straw? Why are they up? Why are they, Why have they had it? I think now there is a little bit of a lack of awareness from John Henry, the owner. We talked about how boy he had to be surprised that with a bunch of Bruins fans in his ballpark for the Winter Classic, when that guy's face was shown in public, people were booing. Not even a Red Sox fan base. That's more of a Boston sports fan base of those people who are thinking Bruins first in Fenway. That guy's getting booed. And then to come out and say what he did and sort of walk right into it, that to me is just straight up a lack of awareness. And the texture out of the 413 says, Red Sox fans are disgusted by the Fenway sports group not getting what the sports they own really represent over and above money. Just ask Liverpool and NASCAR fans, they would boo John Henry too. I just think it is a general lack of awareness, not from guys like Sam Kennedy. Like Sam Kennedy, even though he had to jump in to save John Henry from verbally drowning right there. Does it all the time. Sam's not unaware of the reaction of the market, but that guy works for someone. And the person that he works for was the dude who was about to verbally drown there on stage, literally, because it furthermore makes us understand why John Henry can't come out. We've been critical of the guy for not being there. You signed Rafi Devers on a day you should be happy. Why aren't you there? Because of moments like this and walked right into what was a pit. Just right down fell for it, hook, line, and sinker, and the fans weren't there to catch him. They were there to say, hope you have a nice fall, buddy, and watch that guy drop. Sorry I'm, to disappoint you. I'm amazed. So so it's he's not a stranger to this type of environment. You mentioned Liverpool. They're, they Remember when they tried he to? He shouldn't be. Well, again. I, but I, it feels I, I, like he is. I don't understand how a guy so successful, so rich, so smart can be so obtuse. I don't get it. He just doesn't understand. He doesn't get it. He probably wonders why are they why are they booing me? Yes. He doesn't get it. Yep. He just he's slow to get it. And I don't understand with all the smart people around him, with him being so smart himself, I don't understand how I think he walks out of there like I don't get it. Why are they yelling at me? It's the same reason why like the Liverpool club that he had, the football club that he had, he still has, right? Is he trying to sell it? Uh, yeah, they're, they're remember, people. They, these sales take time. Well, remember when they tried to create like this super like league with a bunch of other teams? Oh, yeah, and, they wanted to break away and, and the, do like the Super League, yeah, I guess you would say, or Super said, Duper League. Or the fans said, uh-uh. Right. Not, this, this is not the Red Sox. We don't. They 100% fan support killed it, shamed them. 
mocked him. I remember listening to like radio shows out there, football, football radio shows, just like we do here, destroying him. And he was like, he just didn't get it. So, okay, well, he backs away, says forget about it. And here he is again. To me, that is probably his biggest flaw. And thank God Sam Kennedy is there. And I think he's there. He needs more people just to save him from himself. Right. Hey, it's like they don't want to hear that. I feel like the like the reason is because I feel like they have been similar to what the Patriots have been doing this whole year with the offense, like gaslighting you. It's my word of the year because you're acting like we're stupid. You're acting like we don't get it. You're acting like we don't follow. Hey, I gave up my weekend to come listen to you. I know what's going on. So don't act like, uh, you know, we're stupid, you know, or maybe it was the Xander Bogarts thing. Who the hell know? It seems like that him, John Henry especially, doesn't know how to read the room. He just has no ability to do it. Like, he can, he can make unbelievable deals. He can spend and make lots of money. He just doesn't get it. He, feel like it's, he feels like it's okay. You know, Curtis said something on the Greg Hill Show earlier today that I can kind of co-sign on, and that is the richer you get, the more removed from reality you are. And I think there was already a level of a removal of reality for John Henry and the Red Sox in general. And the road I thought you were going to go down for you was the, well, they don't want to hear that stuff. And you know what? It is reflective in the way. Who, the fans? No, no, the, uh, the, the Red Sox. Oh, okay. Ownership. and uh, Again, w- let's just be real. What is Nesson? It's nothing more than a Red Sox commercial on most nights. There's no one over there who's going to rock the boat or do things differently. I mean, think about it. How many people have walked through that network who, instead of looking at it and saying, man, this is a regional network run by two teams that have big blueprints in this region. My God, the fun stuff that we can do. Nope. Nope. Instead, what's your uh, what's your lead-in to Red Sox baseball? They do the gambling show and then Anglers Illustrated or whatever crap they're going to put on. There's no one that rocks the boat. There's no one that thinks, oh, my God, we could do better if we do this or we could do better if we think this way. I think it is a thought process that just permeates with the Red Sox of the, hey, man, we're just staying in our lane. And as long as the money comes in, we're all good about it. This is an organizational philosophy that even bleeds over into the television relationship where you would think they got an endless pot of money there. They should be able to do more. And instead, we'll run infomercials for, uh, you know, people that got uh, warts on their feet for 30 minutes at uh, 1 a.m. after the Red Sox are gone. See, I do think it's just amazing. There's more of a European obsession with the Red Sox uh, as opposed to any other city in the United States. The Yankees have been dysfunctional, have been, you know, underachieving for years. You don't see that type of, like, anger at some sort of fan fest. You look at the Dodgers. You look at the Houston Astros. You look at all these other teams. This is what sets the Red Sox apart. That's why it's hard to play here. That's why players who come here, if they're honest and open, they're they're usually beloved, even if they suck, mm-hmm. okay? But the fact that you kind of throw out, it's almost like a – Hey, then when John Henry throws out the hey, baseball players cost money, and uh, you know, and it kind of we, it kind of you know, kind of felt like it weaved into that's why prices are expensive, that's why beer is expensive, that's, that's why right. it's the highest ticket price. Mm-hmm. And then you heard some other lady be like, "Yeah, right in your pocket." It's like you're taking advantage of us. We be- we love you and we're loyal, and you're taking advantage of us, and we don't want to take it anymore. So we're sick of you screwing with us. We're tri- we're tired of half truth. Just tell us the truth. You let go of Xander Bogarts, and you said for months and months and months you wanted to sign him. We love him. And then you let him go, right? And then you try to make up for it like a week later by signing Devers. Like that was going to like make it all better. So to me, it seems like the fans are just getting fed up with the BS that is per- the perceived BS. But will it's they like stop showing up? Because that is the real message to send. Well, the only way is just stop buying tickets. Well, again, yeah, our, stop but, watching. but a part of the reason why ownership and why John Henry is as in the clouds as he is is because there's still, what, 3 million people rolling through the turnstiles every year. It's can a they, museum. Can they, can they really be that mad if they keep coming? 
that to me is if John Henry is really about the bottom line and that's why he's unaware of a lot of this, then what will people really do to affect the bottom line for him to get it other than booing him occasionally, which can just be the, ah, John, you're the owner. They're going to take it out on you, yada, yada, yada. 617-779-7937. Bill Belichick is up to something. We'll get to it next. Here's Billy ready to trend. Now, here's what's trending on WEEI. Boston Bruins goaltender Linus Allmark had, a, had to come out of the game briefly with a busted skate, but went on to earn his 25th win of the season and his 7th career shutout in the Bruins' 4 nothing win over the San Jose Sharks last night. The Bees take their five-game winning streak on their upcoming road trip beginning tomorrow night when they are in Montreal to face the Canadians. Puck drops at 7 p.m. Marcus Smart is out, Malcolm Brogdon is out, and Robert Williams is listed as questionable for tonight's Boston Celtics game against the Magic. The Seas are riding a nine-game winning streak. Tip-off in Orlando is at 7 p.m. Kansas City Chiefs quarterback Patrick Mahomes plans on playing in Sunday's AFC Championship game against the Cincinnati Bengals after suffering a high ankle sprain in Saturday's win over the Jacksonville Jaguars. And in the NFC, the San Francisco 49ers will face the Philadelphia Eagles in the NFC Championship after last night's win over the Dallas Cowboys. Trending brought to you by Dr. Matthew Lopresti at Leonard Hair Transplant Associates, the hair doctor of Matt Grizzlick at 1-800-GET-HAIR. I'm Billy Lanning. That's what's trending now on WEI and WEI.com. Why is Bill Belichick sending the majority of his assistants to be a part of these draft process bowl games? That and Gerard Mayo sitting in on OC interviews next. 93.7. I love you, yeah, man. 93.7.
Divisional round weekend is over. The AFC and the NFC Championship games are set. You can hear them right here on WEI. 11-23, Gresham Foyer here with you. We'll get to football. We got you on the phones as well at 617-779-7937. But Foyer, I know we wanted to get this to uh, get to this a little bit earlier. We'll get to Bill Belichick and the assistance because this does tie in. Uh, over the weekend, Albert Breer of Sports Illustrated tweeted out about how Gerard Mayo has been sitting in on the offensive coordinator interviews. Now, over the weekend, Sean Jefferson did his interview. All of the interview interviews, apparently, Foyer, have been conducted over Zoom or video mm. conference. Just get a real understanding of what a person's like over a video conference. Exactly Absolutely. right. Further leading Check to the box. sham process and the whole deal. But what do you make of Bill allowing Mayo to sit into some of these, according to Breer? And those yeah. of you on Twitch are seeing the, uh, the, uh, the tweet. Yeah, so... Um, what does this mean? Okay, so this, again, this reminds me back when uh, Josh McDaniels walked away from the Indianapolis Colts head coaching job. And I remember Mike Reese had this uh, report of one of the reasons why. And Terp, I don't know if you got it or not, but if you don't, don't worry about it. Um, and basically it was the whole, hey, part of the allure of staying after that dinner at Davio's was, hey, listen. You've been here a long time. If you stay, I'm going to open up my world to you. I want you. you to be by my side. I'm going to open my world to you. That mm. was it. I want you to be by my side. So it's sound. So this situation, Gresh, I immediately thought of Josh McDaniels. Hey, don't leave. Stay. And if you stay, I'm going to do for you what I don't do for anybody. You're going to be by my side. You're going to be like a... Uh, like uh, I'm just gonna call you an apprentice, but you're better than an apprentice. You're just gonna you're just gonna learn by you know osmosis, and you're gonna see what I do and see how I trick people and see how I tell them that this is a good deal for them, and 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 then you're gonna learn at an accelerated rate because I know you want to be a head coach, mm -hmm. okay? Um, so I want to put you in those real time positions, right? Because you're my protege, you're my padawan, okay? Just like Josh McDaniel was. Now look at him; he's a head coach, or or he's just the assistant head coach. <laughs> That's really it. You're the assistant head coach. Let's not read into it. You're now the assistant head coach. You got to be a part of this stuff. Well, maybe I, that's what it is. I do wonder how much of it is Bill being able to say to Mayo, "Are right, you been on the other end of these interviews? Now I'm going to show you how I do them." Kind of. Well, thing. that's the. I want you to be by my side. It's I a don't leave. You're not well, ready. But it's the why, right? So why? Like, what does Bill do in an interview process that would be different? than what Gerard Mayo would have experienced being the guy sitting across from the owner interviewing him. Like, you're flipping the script a little bit. So I just wonder what could be gained for Gerard Mayo by sitting in on those, considering they're doing them over a video conference, for God's sakes. One of them's with a guy whose contract is up here, and the other three, I'll bet dollars to donuts, those guys ain't getting another OC interview in the whole process. And we're talking about Adrian Clem and Keenan McCardell and Sean Jefferson. Yeah, so, okay. Just like, the, what's the allure I, for Mayo to sit there? What would Bill have sold him on? Well, I mean, I guess, I mean, all right, so listen, you know what it's like to be interviewed. interviewed right. Okay, you know what that's like. But I'm going to teach you what to look for, the pitfalls. Guys try to trick you. They try to act like there's somebody they're not. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you. Uh, you know, the three keys to looking for a coach, you know, like I don't, maybe that's it. I don't know. He's because if he is a head coach, he's going to have to hire an entire staff. So what is that like? Right. I mean, you've never done it before. Let me teach you what it's like. So when you do it for the first time, you're not surprised, right? You're ready. You're not some novice and you don't get hired and you're fired a year and a half because you didn't know how to hire a staff. Okay. So I'm going to put you, you're going to be part of that situation. That's got to be. Now, maybe that isn't something that he was part of before. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's what it was. Like, he was just, listen, you're just a, a, you're a, you're a position coach. You know, you're a co-defensive coordinator. You're the guy that talks, though. So, to me, I guess that's valuable. I mean, I guess. I mean, listen, if you've never done it before, wouldn't you want to see how it's done? And with that, but with that and, and I, would just, I would just grab somebody who's done it before.
I'd grab somebody that I respect. I'd say, hey, you've done this three times. She's been a head coach. He's going to turn to Patricia and Judge and be like, hey, not how'd you guys. hire a staff? Not those guys. Are you going to turn to Troy Brown and be like, hey. No, not him either. How'd you know? They're, that's the thing. There's you no don't think one, there's, there's maybe no one on that staff to turn to other than Bill to be able to get advice on how to set up being a head coach and how to I pick assistants and things like I, I that. I think that's the easy. Isn't that the easiest explanation? It as feels to like why? It. Hey, listen, Bill is, and it's, so, and it's obviously so. So Breer gets this information. Mm-hmm. Somebody wants him to have that information. It's the same thing with the press release. Hey, we're looking for an offensive coordinator. We're going to fix this and that. We're not going to let Gerard. We're going to make sure we extend Gerard Mayo. Hey, just so everybody knows what we're doing, I'm not going to send out another press release, but I'm going to leak some information to Breer. Hey, oh, by the way, don't forget to mention this. <laughs> Gerard Mayo's in on all these meetings. It's crazy, right? It's crazy. Kind of is when what's, you think about it. What like, about the other ones? What about Detroit Brown doesn't want to be well, a head coach? Because Lord knows, and it's been bandied about here for years now, everybody goes to, oh, succession plan. Oh, succession plan. Oh, there must be a – Gerard Mayo must be the succession plan. Who's the succession plan? Is there any other football market in America that is in the NFL – that has had so much discussion around the succession plan. Are people in Kansas City going, hey, well, I'll tell you that Andy Reid, it's getting old, it's chubby, you never know. Maybe they win and he walks away. What's well, going to be the succession plan? The only other, the only place this is going on is here because half of the folks who ask that question want to push Bill out the door, and the other half are just like, oh my God, make me feel better that it's someone I know who might take over. That's what this has really led to. Oh, oh boy, it must be him. Well, well, cripes. If Bill walked away next year, you'd have a guy that was a big candidate in Mayo. You'd have Joe Judge hanging around. You'd have Matt Patricia. And if they hire Bill O'Brien, you would have had three former head coaches on the staff with a guy who's an up-and-comer. And it's like, okay, that like there are people here that they could pick from. You might not like the choices, but we don't know where the crafts are at on all this as well. And it's just like, God almighty, can we just, like, Bill's here. Bill's here. So why are we going through the whole, I don't think Kansas City is being the boy, I hope Eric Bien is the guy taking over. Stop. This, let me just comment on Eric Bien real quick. Please because do. It just This like triggered me. There, you know, during that, in, over all these games, especially the playoffs, uh, the other day, the game of the Kansas City Chiefs, they didn't mention Eric Bieniemy's name once. Mm-hmm. They didn't show him on the sideline calling plays once. They didn't show him interacting with Patrick Mahomes or Chad Henney once. Like, you wonder why he's not getting a job. You wonder why nobody's hiring him. It's almost like it's Andy Reid's, I guess, he's the head coach and it's his, and it's his offense, but Eric Bieniemy is the one that used to be a position coach and the offensive coordinator. Then they stopped being the off- the, a position coach, and he's strictly the offensive coordinator. Yep. But they don't mention him at all. Like, you didn't see him on the sideline once. It's like he didn't exist. I think maybe one or two times in passing. I thought there was like a shot of over his shoulder maybe one but time. Usually but usually you're no. piling on. Look at this. Christian, this four years ago, offense. he was supposed to be the guy. What has happened? Uh, he what honest, has happened? He's a terrible interview is my guess. I, it's amazing that with usually that plan, that scenario, that system will, will easily pr- promote coordinator after coordinator after coordinator to to head coach to head coach to head coach that's the succession plan for some reason he's not involved in that conversation at all maybe he said screw it he lets everybody know i don't want to do it i'm happy and content where i'm at but back to the why with bill you know why people keep talking about the succession plan because it's no different than bill walsh it's no different than chuck Knoll. it's no different than uh shula don shula it's no different uh, Levy, and I feel like they know the end is near. They know they're getting older. Like the the best years are behind them. Now you're either trying to break some record, or you're just holding on because you have so much goodwill equity and you have so many you know you know awards and championships, and like nobody wants to move you out. And you're still competing, but it the it does feel premature, I'm sure. But it doesn't feel any different than when Shula was on his way out. And, you know, how many years do you think they started talking about his succession plan before he actually left? How many times do you think George Seifert's name was mentioned before uh, Bill Walsh finally gave it up? It, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't remember. wasn't following it then. But I feel like it's a natural just progression with 
the with the coaching life. So is it only reserved for legends? Because yeah. the group that you mentioned, Noel, guys like that, yeah. all legends. All that's that's. I think he's in that category. So naturally, you go wow. This is four so four with the Steelers, a bunch with the the 49ers, undefeated season, lots of success with Shula, and then the other one would be um, Tom Landry. If you want to go way back. You know, you want to start using, you know, you know, names that you don't really have any well, relevant names now. It took an ownership change for that to happen for Jerry Jones to move Tom yes. Landry out and, and he that, brought in yep. and he brought in a guy who was for every bit as good as he was as a coach was a, like, you know, Belichick, kind of a legendary GM as well in terms of the way he built the football team and he was lucky to do it pre-free agency. That so helped do, as well. So and that is my issue. I'm with you. It's like there's so much focus on what is Bill going to do next? But this this went back with Josh McDaniels. When he was up for that job, that was like 2017, 20. I don't even know when it was. Well, the Indianapolis, I think it was 17 yes. so because or 18. Even back then, it was like, all right, hey, you stay. We're gonna op- you're going to be by my side. Before, I was, I was real closed off. I didn't want anyone to know how I did business. I didn't want anyone to know how the sausage was made. Mm-hmm. Okay, they may be grossed out. Okay, now... I'm going to let you in. You're a part of a select group of people who get to know how everything works. So that's that's valuable, right? Because you screwed up the first time because I didn't open up my world to you. I didn't have you by my side. Now you are now you go start your own family. Draw mail. You're next. We will get to Bill Belichick and what he's doing with his assistants, but Butch in a Kushnid, once in on Mayo, sitting in on the interviews with Gresham Fourier. Hello, Butch. Hey, what's going on? Christian, I, I usually uh... – Uh-oh. Enjoy <laughs> listening to you, and I usually agree, but I, I disagree on this point. I think that what's wrong with with Coach Belichick asking Mayo to sit in? There's so many benefits for Mayo to, to get out of this. One is maybe Belichick wants his opinion, what his thoughts are on the people that he's interviewing, and what about if Mayo becomes a head coach or goes through the interview process again? He gets to meet or uh, he's introduced to future candidates that he may work with. No, Butch, you're missing the point, though. We all, of course, it's valuable. No one's saying that it isn't. The question is why. Why? Why yes. did he do it? Why is Breer, Albert Breer, releasing this information about, hey, oh, by the way, guys, with all the other stuff going on, Gerard Mayo is sitting in on meetings right by Bill's side. I'm not saying it. It's extremely valuable. Right. Think about how much you can learn. But but how many people has Bill like did Bill Belichick ever do that for Charlie Weiss? Did he ever do it for Romeo remember. Cornell? Did he it's, do it for McDaniel's the first time around? I know he point. gave him that book of the hey here's kind of the blueprint and Josh still went screwed it up. Yeah. Did he pull Bill O'Brien in before Bill O'Brien went to Penn State to just be like hey if you're ever going to be a head coach again da da da. This is Bill Belichick opening things up behind the scenes to people that he could have in the past, but why did he choose to do it at the points in time that he did? See, to me, it's like this new... Okay. So we know that there are these, um, using the term loosely, folks, these bowl games, right? They're not traditional bowl games as in here's Mississippi State against the, you know, third team from the Big Ten in a New Year's Day bowl. These are the draft process bowl games. There's the East-West Shrine game. There's the Hula Bowl. There's Which the, is the Polynesian Bowl now. The Polynesian yeah. Bowl now, right? And then there's the Senior Bowl, and there's yep. other smaller ones that are kind of all over the place that your scouts might go to or whatever. But there is a high amount of of Patriot assistant coaches that are involved in these various bowl games, whatever it is. Like, Troy Brown is going to be the head coach in one of them, and DeMarcus Covington is going to be the defensive coordinator of one, and you've got all these different assistants that are now being a part of the process of, yes, coaching guys coming out of college and getting the touchy feel, get their hands on them, see what they're really like, But Bill Belichick is also, in a way, challenging his guys to take on different roles throughout this process, like Troy being a head coach. There's got to be a part of you that is giggling inside (laughs) of the, oh, my God, Troy Brown's going to run a football team for one of these weeks at these bowls. But I'm not laughing. But why is Bill doing this now where it's not just one or two guys it's like four or five assistants that are going to do things differently than they do here in terms of these bowl games. 
What's he up to? Well, let me ask you this first before I answer that because I feel like this is I feel like this is normal. I feel like if if uh, I don't know who ends up each each like the senior bowl, which is the, the the best one, is coached by a specific team, right? And their coaching staff based on how they finish or something like that. Um, well, that was always the Pro Bowl, from what I remember. Well, the Pro was... Bowl, but I feel like it's a Senior Bowl too. It's not the Senior Bowl is not coached by you know ten random coaches from no, different teams. Not. It's coached by a specific you a staff. staff. You bring the entire staff. So I feel like this is like somebody must have said, "Hey, oh by the way, you guys have to coach the Hula Bowl. You have to coach the you know the East West Shrine Bowl." That's, okay, fine. Patriots are heavily involved in okay, that. Okay, right, and fine. some of the Senior Bowl, Jim Nagy, as we know, used to work. For yeah, the but Patriots. it's still like there's only one staff that does it. Right, like, you're not going to have you know the Tampa Bay Bucks tight ends coach coaching you know one side of the ball, and then sure enough, the quarterbacks. It's it's one staff for each side. Okay, so I'm curious. It's like they probably just. You know, decided, okay, Patriots, your staff, you have the uh, Shrine game. All right, Bill's like, well, I'm not going. I don't want to go. I'm going to send my guys down there. Two things. One, I don't want to go. I have better things to do. Of course. Okay. Three, you know what? It uh, gives me a good opportunity to put some of these guys in a leadership role. You know, get them used to speaking in front of future pros. Uh, now we're You know, talking. that's what it is. So there's a, there is a does method to e- the madness. Does it accelerate the growth rate of those younger assistants considering, A, we've always heard Bill maybe lives in fear of people leaving the organization, or B, maybe Bill is realizing, I got to hurry some of these guys up to get them up to the level of what is going to be around them, meaning Joe Judge maybe as a special teams coach, Bill O'Brien as an OC, Gerard Mayo as de facto defensive coordinator. Hey, I need to accelerate these guys to get them to That's catch up. That's a good up. point, too. And the other reason, there's a reason why you're not sending Matt Patricia or Joe Judge. Those guys have done it before. Right. You know, there's a reason why Scott Pioli is not returning in some capacity because he wants to elevate and mentor and, and you, know, um, you know, younger, you know, Players, younger coaches. Mm-hmm. And also I feel feel like also it's like, let me see if they can succeed at this. Are they any good at it? Maybe maybe I put Troy Brown in a leadership position for some college all-star game. Uh, well, he'll probably won't work with any of those guys ever again. Maybe a couple of them if he's lucky, if they end up crossing, crossing paths. But he has to you know what, he just, you know, he's not good at it. Couldn't manage the clock. Uh, nobody understood him. His message was not clear. Um, you know, who was all he was nervous. Uh, who knows? Who knows? Because don't you want to kind of weed out the weak of the group? Just like any other, you know, uh, any other situation, this guy, nah, not good for him. Is he hoping maybe someone's like, ooh, I got to have that guy. I got to steal him next year. You know, that kind of thing. As not a that, coach? Not that Troy would necessarily ever leave, although you never know yeah, for opportunity. Well. Be, listen, uh, didn't we, uh, what was it, uh, um, who coached the Louisville? Who was it? The, oh, I can't believe I can't remember his name. But which one? Uh, the Louisville, Louisville. Uh, former uh, Patriots wide receiver. I can't believe I can't. Oh, remember Dion Branch. Dion Branch. Yeah, he coached Louisville in the Fenway. Yeah, Fenway Bowl. I think they won too. One of your teammates. Yeah, I forgot and you it. had brain block. And on I just that. saw a highlight of him like two seconds ago of him playing against the you know Pittsburgh Steelers and catching all those passes in the AFC. And I think that was because Satterfield, the head coach at Louisville, had signed on to go to Cincinnati because yeah. Luke Fickle left. And then yeah. Satterfield, I think it was him, was in between. I yeah. hope it was him. It's I, a I weird, tried. weird bowl game. Very, very weird setup, to say the least. Uh, but interesting what's going on in terms of the Patriots and trying to get that staff maybe up to speed or sort of challenge them in different ways. Don't forget, you can get a hold of us on Twitter – Follow us on Twitter, Gresh Fourier, W-E-E-I, on Instagram. It is Gresh and Fourier, and your lunchtime parlay is next. 93.7 W-E-E-I.
Download the Odyssey app. All right, everybody, here we go, the lunchtime parlay. And, well, the lunchtime parlay, as we were rolling into the weekend, uh, went kaput. How about the Cleveland Cadavers? On Friday night, they played Golden State after Golden State rolled in here. They sat down everybody. And I mean everybody, like Steve Kerr. I don't Mm -hmm. know if you saw this. Yeah. On Friday night, Steve Kerr did press conference before the game, and it was the... Well, you know, people save a lot of money to come to these games, and now you're sitting down all these players. And he was just like, well, you know, the regular season's real long. If we were at 72, I wouldn't have to sit these guys as much, blah, 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 and just deflected, deflected, deflected. Then Golden State went out and got a win. They played great. Cleveland rolled over like it was, ah, we can roll the balls out. We're good enough. So my Cleveland minus eight got torched. Josh (laughs) Allen did not throw over one and a half touchdowns. And luckily, Terp saved us from the, uh, well, the Golden Sombrero's 0-4. It would be, uh, the I guess, the the triple sombrero, let's say. Uh, But Terp had the 49ers covering over the Cowboys. So we're back up on that horse again. We are only down seventy six dollars, and all we got to do is hit a couple three teamers, and you are uh, go from the red to the black real quickly. So I'll start. I don't know if you saw uh, Kansas and TCU over the weekend. Wolf, KU got pantsed by TCU. They got a tough one against Baylor tonight. It's Baylor minus two. Uh, I'm just gonna go safe. Baylor on the money line over Kansas. Don't know if it's a one point win. I don't want any wonkiness. Just give me Baylor. Rolling on Kansas right now, who's definitely kind of uh, downtrodden a little bit. Uh, Terp, what do you got? Give me DeJounte Murray over 21 and a half points tonight in Chicago against the Bulls. Uh, he's averaging 28 over his last five, so this number doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. And Atlanta's playing some good basketball lately, so somebody has to score those points. Rumblings that Trey Young is not happy in Atlanta already, which uh, that, that didn't take long. They traded Luka for that guy. Just remember that. Bad relationship with the head coach is not good. Oh, no, it isn't. And, of course, it'll be, well, who do you want in here, Kyler Murray? <laughs> so I'm going to be one of those deals. Billy, what do you got? All right, Marcus Smart's out. Robert Williams is questionable. Brogdon's out. Give me Jalen Brown over 27 and a half points Ooh. tonight. In Orlando. Oh, baby. So oh, Jalen Brown over. DeJounte Murray over in points. And I'm going Baylor on the money line over Kansas and College Hoop. Ladies and gentlemen, $10. Just a very simple $10 will win you $63.35. There you go. There you go. The, uh, the, I like the Jalen Brown one because uh, he got 27 on what Saturday. And you would think like with, uh, with, with all the extra opportunities with everybody out and this his willingness to, I'm going to save the day, he should be over 27. If he isn't over 27, then that's – that's just, I mean, these are the, these are, this is when you pile on your stats. This is when you confirm to everybody that you should start in the All-Star game. Uh, in theory, yes. You're right. In theory. Like, in theory, yes. Now, again, not a ton of spots. A lot of guys get some automatics. Kind of see what happens there. You'd like to think that Jalen Brown would be an All-Star and that people would give him that kind of respect. But they're going against an Orlando team that's supposed to be getting some people back as well. This is one of those Monday night against a bad team at home. Don't have the letdown. Try to have a great fourth quarter. Use your bench as much as you need to. That's why those guys are there. Figure out a way to get a win. To me, this is pure survival for the Celtics tonight. Uh, Back to football. Nick and Weymouth once in on the Bills losing with Gresham Fourier. Hello, Nick. How you guys doing? Uh, Clearly, they were all played. The other team had a better quarterback, better everything all around. But what's amazing is how can you go back to the Patriots winning in the snowstorm there, never threw a pass. How can you have a team in Buffalo and can't play in the snow? In other words, no strategy. They've got the players. I, I, it looks like a huge uh, meltdown by the coaches. And uh, one final thing. <laughs> what is there, a time limit on a catch? That that thing with uh, – what's his name, uh, Chase? That was clearly a catch. He didn't get two feet in bounds. He got four feet in bounds. The guy kept trying to wrestle it out of his hands. 
So put it, so turn this around. What if you're at midfield, you're a tight end, you catch it, you bobble it for 15, 20 yards. Nobody touches you, and you go down in the ground, and you still bobble it when you go down the ground, but it never touched the ground. And I'm talking you ran 15, 20, you know, 10 yards, you're know, bobbling it the whole way. Why is that a catch? Well, the so, problem is, is that he, he ran what, out. He, no, George Kittle had one in the middle of the field in, in yesterday's game right. against the Cowboys. The problem was that he ran out the back of the end zone. Right. So the, so the, the back end line kind of caused them to kind of, you know, hey, listen, did he have control over it? That's, that's what it was. You could bobble it for 99 yards if you want. It doesn't matter. Just don't jump out of the back and fall out of the back of the end zone. The issue is also that if you make a catch and you cross the goal line, then it's in. And the, hey, did you have possession of it when you were in the end zone? Therefore, it should be like crossing the goal line. We're starting to get into all those semantics as well. Yeah, it's not timed. It's more of the whole, like you said, Christian, falling out of the back of the end zone. The NFL has created this mess. I don't know if they're ever going to be able to fix it. No. They're not going to be able to put the toothpaste back in the tube when it comes to catches in this league. No, they're not. And I don't know, is is the farther you get – from the first original catch rule and, you know, uh, you know, con- what is it they call? They call it uh, not con- S- surviving survive the ground. Survive the ground. That's right. Survive. I remember, like, uh, if you caught the ball and, like, you caught it up in the air, you got two hands on it, and then you hit the ground, if you lost it, it didn't matter. Like, listen, hey, the c- ground can't, can't cause a fumble. That was the yes. I used to love that. Mm-hmm. Now – you have to survive the ground. It doesn't. It just. It does. It changes all the it's a time. Mess. Tra- like calling games when you have these type of situation. They go, oh no, okay. Did he bobble it? What did he bobble it? All right, I think they're going to overrule it. <laughs> Dude, I never know. Even if I have all the rules in front of me, mm-hmm. and I have the definition, and you go through my checklist. Okay, got to see this first. Got to see that. Okay, listen. That, listen. They. Sh- they. Sh- it's a catch. Sure as hell. After further review, we have determined that he it is not a catch. You're like, well, I don't know what the hell they're looking at. I honestly to God don't have a clue what they're looking at because every time they give me the rules or they go over the rules, even in a live game, it feels like they go against their own rules. It's like, ah, I'm, I'm in the mood to uh, feel this way. Or there is the tuck rule equivalent of something within the catch that none of us knew, and it's like, oh, I didn't know that was a part of what would make a secure catch. Patrick Mahomes had a fumble to me in the game against um, – the Jaguars like he fumbled the ball he was kind of hobbling and it was an obvious fumble to me but then they ruled it an incomplete which is weird and same thing with Josh Allen I felt like yeah I felt like that was just a hey he's Patrick Mahomes I'm like you know what I mean I felt like he was getting the Jordan treatment the Jordan rules treatment but then they did it but then they did it in the Bills game with Allen and it was more of a flawed rule if your arms up like this and you're and the guy stops the arm and the ball comes out. I don't care if your arm's moving forward or not. The defender's making the play. Yeah, I don't see. My thing is, I would just keep it simple. If you cough up the ball, whether you are trying to pass or you're trying to run, that's a live ball. Correct. So let's not try to like really figure out the exact instant where you were attempting to throw. We're going to frame by frame this. If you let go of the ball, it's a freaking uh, fumble. It's just plain and simple to me. I don't know. It's, but again, how I'm dare we gonna, use logic? I know, I know. That's well, our if, problem. But if what if this happens? Oy. Really, there is always that group. Well, what about this? There's always there will always be something like you could sit there and practice for every scenario. Something will come up where you have not practiced, you've not rehearsed, you've not even thought about it, and sure as hell, it's right in front of your face. And the only guy who's covered it is Bill Belichick. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we head into the lunchtime hour of Gresham and Fourier. The Bruins keep winning. The Celtics survive in Toronto. And the latest on the Patriots OC search, if there is anything. Next. Coming January 30th, Adam Jones.
Always live on the free Odyssey app. This hour of Gresham Fourier is brought to you by East Coast Metal Roof and act now and save 10% during their winter work special. A U D A C Y. Type that into your app search, then download. Gresh and Fourier on W E E I. Will the Bruins ever lose? No, they won't if they play at home. I feel like you're you're, you're creating a monster. Terp. What's this? Who? T- no, 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 yeah. no, no. I think we did this last week. I think you got about you know two and a half minutes in before you actually ran out of material. Uh, it's the uh, ability to not. I wouldn't call it freestyle rapping ability. It's just the uh, you know. My best friend, Nelson Martinez, used to re-ride in the car all the time, and he would just rib me by doing that. He would, there, a song would come on, and he would retrofit it to rip on me, and everybody in the car would be laughing and all that stuff. So I think that, that <laughs> so kind of just... sits in my head a little bit of the whole. You're, so you're scarred, you would say. Uh, I guess, because he is among probably maybe five people on earth. Maybe I'm up to ten now. Where it's like, you know, th- th- his words might affect me or make me think because about you, something. Because you care about him. Well, no, because I have <laughs> one feeling and only certain people know about it. Mm-hmm. And on the whole, I'm normally. Content? Yeah, on the whole, I'm normally <laughs> just, eh, whatever. Like, eh, the idle thoughts of other people don't really bother me, but certain ones do. But that always stuck in my brain. And it was always a fun game to do because. Like when when my boys met him, they'd be like, "Hey, can we take a ride?" And I was like, "Why?" I'd be like, "We want Nelson to mess with you," <laughs> and they'd be like, "You want to ride around and just make up songs?" But the Bruins keep winning, four nothing over San Jose. This is insane. Through forty six games, the Bruins have a fourteen point lead right now in the Atlantic Division. That is just crazy when you think about it. They're on pace for sixty six wins which would be an NHL record. And last night, Linus Olmark, originally it was thought that he was the fastest goalie to get to 25 wins in the history of the NHL. And then NHL PR put out a uh, graphic saying that basically he was the second fastest goalie to be able to get to uh, 25 wins in a season. Only the immortal... As you Twitchers can see, Tiny Thompson huh? did, it, did it in 29 games during the 1929-30 season. Linus Allmark, 30 games this year to get to 25 wins. He passed Eddie Johnston of the Bruins from the 70-71 team. What's really amazing, Fourier, is that three complete different generations of Boston Bruins goalies are one, two, and three on that list. Um. It really is absurd. I don't know how many different ways you can just, I guess, appreciate them or like you you're know, running out of adjectives. I just don't. I mean, I don't even have any more. So, so uh, yesterday's game was okay, different in a way because they had a bunch of defensemen, not just making, you know, making getting goals, but making unbelievable moves to get those goals. Mm-hmm. That's like something you would see, you know, Marchand do or Bergeron do or Pasternak, of course, just nifty with the stick back and forth putting people like just in their place, like passing to themselves. Like, so what is this? So uh, Lindholm gets the first one and you're like, wow, that was real impressive. So it's one, nothing. And then sure as hell, Charlie McAvoy decides, you know what? I can do better. I can do anything you do better. So he does, his is even better than Lindholm's. And just like listening to those guys just talk about how scoring goals is fun. It's like you would th- sit there and go, wow, they're putting such an unbelievable emphasis on these guys. And you could see it's like 
It doesn't even matter. Hell, Pasternak didn't get his goal till the third period. Mm-hmm. Okay, by then it was pretty much over with. Like I said it last week, if they score first, if they get that first goal, you're screwed. Can you imagine like the mental, like you know, just defeat that you feel? Oh, you when know, they it. get the first goal, mm-hmm. and you're like, oh, what are they? We can't. We need a lead. If you're on we the, we can't op- get a, We can't play from behind against this team. If you're on the opposing team, you know you can't get down. And to your point, here's Charlie McAvoy talking about scoring. Well, are you kidding? Uh, scoring goals is the funnest thing in the game, right? Like it takes you back to when you're a mini might. It doesn't matter if you're five years old or 25. Scoring goals is fun. So it's nice to see everybody scoring goals and you see that, you know, that joy. Well, the fact that the defensemen are comfortable enough to be able to get involved offensively and not worried that some coach is going to yell at them and things like that, it's made a massive difference in this team. That end, San Jose ain't great. We know that when the Bruins went out there, what was it, a week or a week and a half ago, uh, they ended up, uh, San Jose was one of the teams that lied in their wake when they went on that West Coast trip. Uh, now there is a quick update on Jake DeBrusque. Uh, Jim Montgomery told the assembled Bruins media yesterday that he believes Jake DeBrusque will begin skating today. Of course, he's coming back from the broken leg. Uh, I did see a report or two, and I don't know if it was a straight report for you. It was more speculation that uh, DeBrusque uh, might be able to make it back before the All-Star break. Listen, at this point, make sure the guy is right. No need to be tricky with this. No need to rush him back into the lineup. It's good that he's going to be back out there skating. But I think given the success of this team, there will be guys when they are dinged who are going to want to rush to get back because they're missing out on the fun. Mm -hmm. I'm not stamping Jake DeBrusque as a true, you know, top line winger. However, given his importance to this team, the slotting of everybody else, Take their time with Jake DeBrusque in terms of getting them back. Yeah, that's, uh, discretion is a better part of valor. That's what I would like to kind of chalk uh, it up like to. It phrase. just doesn't really – I mean, it's amazing that he's already skating, right? It's like he's already kind of in the mix. Mm-hmm. There's no rush. Think about it this way. So right now it's 78 points. So you got Montreal tomorrow at 43 points. So you're 35 points better than what used to be an unbelievable matchup, an unbelievable rivalry. It's not even – like it may not even be worth your energy to even pay attention to it. Mm-hmm. The next best team, as far as points go, would be oh, – who would it be? Would it be – yeah, Carolina at 66, uh, Dallas at 63. Toronto these, these, in your division, right? Are they at 64 or something uh, like that? I'm just in terms yeah, of Toronto 60, Yeah, Toronto 64. Yeah, actually the – yeah, actually, the second, uh, yeah, the, one of the best teams actually in all of hockey is actually second in your division. So there's really no threat. There isn't any threat. The thing that I worry about is, I think, is just complacency. Mm-hmm. Just, huh, oh, yeah, yeah, you got playing this team. So you, you would think that some team, not Montreal, would kind of steal one from them. Eh, you know what? We kind of want to take a break. And you felt like that was Seattle like a couple weeks ago where Seattle comes in here and they just, you know, they're on a heater and they, they come in and they, they beat you up a little bit. And, but you're mentally, physically weak. You just beat down. I just don't know how it ends, but complacency could be the only thing. Injuries, but even injuries, like he's going to be back. after the so the, right next, so, so the next three weeks, you won't see the Bruins for the next three weeks here in Boston. They've got a bunch of, what, five road games, the all-star break. And then by then, what are you going to be in the next three weeks? Then it's trade deadline, ramp up yeah. for the playoffs. Just really. how do I how it's do I just what's left. manage the minutes? You got two great goalies. It doesn't matter. You one of those guys getting mentally fatigued. So what? Like play the other guy. Like to me, it doesn't even matter. It, the storylines. I don't know how the story. You know the storyline is going to go to awards, awards season. Oh who's yeah, who's getting the awards? Who's getting this? Who's getting that? You know. But I just don't see, you know, anybody. You know, stay, you know, keeping up with this team. Remember, uh, All Star Game first weekend of February, first weekend of March is when the NHL trade deadline hits. So you do still have a while to be able to address any extra injury issues that pop up in the trade market. Hey, don't forget, ask your smart speaker to play 93.7 WEI. And, of course, you can get us anytime, anywhere on the Odyssey app. And Celtics were able to survive on Saturday night for you in Toronto, 106-104. Marcus Smart got dinged up in that game. Mm -hmm. Robert Williams got dinged up in that game. Uh, but Grant Williams, one of the guys off the bench who did a great job in that one. I think it was a career high in points, but uh, 
Grant, or excuse me, this is Joe Missoula on how big Grant Williams was Saturday against Toronto. He was great tonight, man. Like, he was the trigger for us, you know. Him, Al, Rob, those bigs, they, they trigger the offense for us because, you know, they're the ones that notice the covered solution and they're the ones that get us to the next action. And so uh, Grant was huge tonight in, um, in, that, in our covered solution and our trigger to get to the next read and next action, and uh, he did a great job for us. A career-high 25 for uh, Grant Williams, and it's interesting, uh, Christian, to hear Joe Missoula talk about you know, getting us into our offense and getting us into certain sets and becoming a part of the answer and all that kind of stuff. It, it was really a night for the Celtics bench to shine, and I know you've been all over Malcolm Brogdon, but again, a lot of nights, Grant Williams is going to be one of those dudes coming off the bench. I think the real takeaway is this bench – light years different than it was last year and they don't even have Gallinari it, yet. it is amazing and, and who even cares at this point in time if you, if you if he comes back and he's actually able to contribute like oh, chalk huge. it up as a plus I know but it's like when you talk about bench points so la- so Saturday the belt the the Celtics bench outscored Toronto 62 to 14 62 think about that let's say you're a starter for Toronto and you're listen you're doing your part and you're padding the lead and you're like making it really challenging sure as hell sub sub here goes the horn and then they just completely these are starter numbers 23 for Brogdon 25 for Grant Williams little Peyton Pritchard gives you 12 points hit an unbelievable three-pointer late with like less than a minute left in the game to actually almost like really confirm it and then a good old wise old Al Al Horford gives you a late steal, then he actually seals the game. So, yep. listen, even when they should lose, they they don't. They don't. Just somebody picks up the slack. It's amazing. And it is crazy to think that the two teams that are relevant right now in this city, they're both the best at what they do. The Celtics are the best team in the NBA, and the Bruins are easily the best team in the National Hockey League. It's pretty easily. Im- yeah, like you said, the numbers. Uh, now, tonight the Celtics will be without a couple of guys – uh, I think Marcus Smart is out. I know Billy's got it coming up in the uh, in trending, uh, but it looks like Malcolm Brogdon is out for personal reasons. And Robert Williams, listen, Robert Williams, the left knee management. I had him penciled in for fifty, so I know he's going to be in and out of the lineup. It's can you lose Smart and getting these guys right? And I know that it it stinks to say it, it really does. But just make sure these dudes are upright for the postseason. Now, and and I'm not saying that it's done and that the number one seed is salted away and locked up. But now you got to be mindful of balancing winning games, but also making sure that your guys are uh, upright come playoff time. And the difference between the Celtics bench this year and last year, it's it's light years different to the point to where Peyton Pritchard's probably what your tenth guy. Maybe you're 11th guy, or let's give him 10th man, let's say. And that guy's coming in off the bench and giving you 12. It's another reason why not to uh, flip that dude. Uh, So we had some Celtics and Bruins here. Uh, Latest on the Patriots OC search is that five interviews are conducted. I don't know if the Patriots are going to do any more. So does a deal get done with Bill O'Brien as expected very quickly? And Gerard Mayo was sitting in on the interviews. Take that for uh, what you will. 617-779-7937. 617-779-7937. A conundrum that the Patriots find themselves in after divisional round weekend. That's next. But first, here's Billy ready to trend. Your home of the Sox. Now, here's what's trending on WEEI. The Boston Bruins extended their winning streak to five games with a 4 nothing win over the San Jose Sharks last night. Goaltender Linus Elmark had to come off the come out of the game briefly with a busted skate, but went on to earn his 25th win of the season and his seventh career shutout. The bees, bees, be, the bees begin their five-game road trip tomorrow night when they visit the Montreal Canadiens. <laughs> Puck drops at 7 p.m. The Bruins have also recalled forward Mark McLaughlin. Mark, now you're in my head. Now the Bruins have recalled <laughs> forward Mark McCoff, McLaughlin. Who? Mark McLaughlin. Okay. From Providence. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Celtics take their nine game nine game winning streak to Orlando, where they will face the Magic tonight. The Seas will be out without Marcus Smart, who's out with the right ankle sprain. Malcolm Brogdon, who's out for personal reasons, and Robin Williams, who Robert Robert oh, Williams, Lord. not the comedian. <laughs> Robert Williams. I'm like Melvin Mora. I make one error. It's only a matter of time before I make three or four more. Melvin Mora. 
Oh, oh my God. Keep going. Oh, my God. I threw it. And, and Robert Williams, who is listed as questionable for left knee injury management, tip off at 7 p.m. <laughs> Kansas City Chiefs quarterback Patrick Mahomes suffered at a high ankle sprain in Saturday's win over the Jacksonville Jaguars. Mahomes plans on playing in Sunday's AFC <laughs> Championship game against the Cincinnati Bengals. And in the NFC, the San Francisco 49ers will face the Philadelphia Eagles in the NFC Championship after last night's win over the Dallas Cowboys. Trending brought to you by Awaken 180 Weight Loss. Learn how Awaken 180 has a 98% customer satisfaction rating. Proven results when you choose the when, when you choose the solution for weight loss. That was rough. I'm Billy Lanny. That was, that's what's trending now on WEI at WEI.com. Uh, a conundrum that the, <laughs> the Patriots find themselves in next. 
Say it right. Can Billy ever say anything right? It's hilarious when he can't say it right. But we get to laugh when Billy doesn't say it right. So don't say it right. Apologies to Mark McGough. Oh. I can't even say it. See? I, why? Where, why? That should be what we right, were Bruce coming made a call up in Providence. This is Billy at his first shine moment. The Twitchers, by the way, absolutely loved it. Guy for the 207. Big Thunder is losing it. Uh, John in the car. Billy makes fun of himself, and it's gold. W-E-E-I MVP. People said I was going Charlie Steiner because I legitimately did lose it. Um, Patriots NFL won. Shime once said David or cheese. Don't worry about it, Billy. <laughs> he also had uh, Dick Prescott and ALC uh, ass as well, which Wiggy was going to use the dossiers on a uh, good baseball weekend, but it uh, never uh, came to fruition. So that was really, I'll tell you what, though, in all seriousness, because one of the things that we discussed before the new show started was Billy was going to do trending. And he openly said, hey, listen, I'm like the kid in class that when he reads and it starts to, you know, it starts to like mess up a word and, and then it, it, it just, just steamrolls. Yeah. But the, the whole the best part of that was I'm like Melvin Mora. One leads to another. It's just such a funny ass lie. <laughs> it's just my, the memory of that guy oh. that I have when he played for Baltimore. If you hit it hard down the third baseline and he booted it, yep. you're gonna get a couple more out of him. It was awesome. What a great pull right there. So good job by uh, the land man and Terp on the other side as well, hitting us with the music. Are you already thinking of your Foyer Friday crap fest? You're gonna bring our uh, way again with man, this music. I'm really disappointed with Turpin today. What I do? It's yeah, what did really Turp do? Uh, yeah, it's just. I what just, are you What are you looking just, for? I'm just really disappointed. I thought you'd be more advanced by now. That's all. Yeah, Gresh has liked it. I've seen him nodding his head a couple times. He's you're twi- in his wheelhouse now. He's 21 and he's wheelhouse. on his 10th actual day on the job. Yeah. Your level of expectations are very high. I would expect. Were you I sitting expect- and coaching him personally on your expectations, or yeah, I think, were you I just think, expecting think, him Turp to learn I, through osmosis like yeah. Gerard Mayo? Yeah, I feel like Turp. We had, I, I had you by my side. I said I would open my world to you. Didn't I say that? You did. You did. Yeah, I said I'm going to open up my yeah. world to you. I want you to drive in for an hour and a half as I bitchy complain to everybody who drives Yeah, by. I was just going to say, hopefully the uh, audio gets in before 930 that he wants you to pull there, Terp. Is, Fourier is also going through a bit of a Trans- sort of an, transition, a transition sure. as well in terms of uh, the level of detail and I get things like in I, early. You've I been very like good. I've, I've transitioned you've done, to my mighty fine. You have. You've done it. You know what? Athletes are adaptable. You are proving Most, to be some of them adaptable. Are. Most of them Most are. Most of them are. Right. Uh, the ones who don't render themselves unplayable and normally mm. aren't in leagues, whichever mm. given sport they're okay. in. But no, you've been fantastic Thank with you. that. Jeez. No, I mean, but we do I get the it. no, but we do get the occasional uh, mid segment. Uh, hey, Terp, can you find me that squirrel talking on that commercial that they showed with the yes. toilet paper two nights yes. ago? If you can get that, that'd be great. That's never going to change. <laughs> That's never going to change. But you're even harnessing the, the key, that a little bit. The key for Terp is he needs to uh, be two steps ahead of me. Well, that's good tough. Luck that is with tough. That. No, 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 yeah. no, no. It just takes time. It just takes time. He's like the age of one of your nine kids. He's actually the, he would be, he would, he would. Like the second oldest, right? No, third. Third oldest. Yeah. 20, wow. 23, 21, about to be 22. Yeah, he'd be third. Yeah. So you need to nurture him like he is one well, of I your children. Well, I will say this. My son ain't working. So. <laughs> <laughs> I actually brought my son in here one time <laughs> to like, I brought him to work. I was like, you're going to work for a week. It was back in the old building, the New Balance building. Oh, when you get away with that stuff. Yeah, and I, I brought him in there, and he was like, uh, he was like, <laughs> he was so resistant to it. I remember one time I caught him, like, hiding underneath the desk. So, like, <laughs> we couldn't see him. So we couldn't see him. I was like, you're supposed, what are you doing? Did you send him to a school where the nuns are oh, cracking his man. fingers. I was like, stuff? what are you doing? He couldn't wait. He's all he asleep. wanted to do is, all he wanted to do was, like, go down to the cafeteria because the other building had that unbelievable cafeteria. I mean, you name it, you ha- they had it available to you. Like, you talk breakfast, lunches. Here we have, like, a stupid vending machine that actually, like, I've never used in my life. Or, like, candy that you can buy. That's it. Those are your only options. Right. At the old building, you had breakfast, they had, like, an omelet bar. 
You had omelet station. You had oh yeah, omelet station. It felt like no, it felt like a like a college dorm. Like you go there, but like a nice one, like a nice one where like all the food uh, you can get sandwiches, you can get fresh any uh, fresh meals, fresh breakfasts. Coffee was great. No Uh, wonder why at that time everybody here was so heavy. Yeah, I was fat. And now you're bringing in your own coffee maker. I know that lasted that lasted a day because it was way too much of pain, too much work. I should make Turpin make the coffee every day. Oh, I don't know if I have time that for that. That is, that is very. Turp, hey, hey, give me It's not like he drinks it. I can see if he drank a glass of it, then a cup of it. Okay, then, yeah, then, I'll then, make yeah. co- Coffee's on me. No. So, yeah. Turp, does coffee not coffee. exist for you? Like, no, I don't it? drink any coffee. And Billy doesn't drink it either. I think. No, no, Billy drinks coffee. One Do cup you? a day. Yeah, I get yeah. A oh, cup. that's it? That's it. Oh, okay. Me too, on the whole. One, I it's try to limit it to get me going. Exactly right early, especially on, for me on Monday mornings. Good Lord. I feel like kids, I need, like, kids high test. nowadays like start drinking coffee. If my parents drink coffee, I didn't have a sip of coffee till I was in the pros. Not till I was in the pros that I actually, like third or maybe fifth year in the pros, Finally, I was like, uh, I, was, I guess, I guess, I, don't, I guess, I should be drinking coffee because those late night meetings during camp. That was the only reason why I started drinking. But it, but at, back then, like I never drank it in college. Never drank it like ever. Didn't drink it as a kid. Kids drink coffee on the East Coast at like age ten. They want coffees. Oh, they yeah, want this. They want that. Early. They want their Dunkin'. They mm-hmm. want their Starbucks. And I'm like, uh, dude, I want a coffee. My grand. My uh, my. My pap on my mom's side. So my mom's dad, he was a good two pots of coffee a day. It's pretty much all he drank. Just hammered it all the time. He liked a little bit of coffee with his cream and sugar. He was one of those guys. See, I was amazed that uh, when we had Bill on the show that he doesn't drink coffee. Bill Belichick, you mean. Doesn't drink coffee. Doesn't like the smell of it. Like his grandma, he tasted it when he was a doesn't kid. Doesn't like the and smell I, cause of my, it. And my thing was... Ooh. If you're an NFL coach, there's only a like, late, late nights, long, long nights. Right. So uh, my question was like, hey, like, what do you do to stay up? So you either dip. Okay, a lot of them would dip. I don't know how how uh, how many coaches do that still. I feel like it's not as much as it used to be. Oh, you drink coffee. That's really the only two vices. Who was that uh, Turner O-line coach down in Miami who was ripping rails and talking to hookers and stuff well, like that? Oh, or, that's right. That was Miami. That's another way. Yeah, that's, 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 Miami. Miami. that's another way to stay up. Have your O-line Inter- coach ripping a line. That's and right. Going, ah, special teams is next. Yeah. I got to go. <laughs> that's right. That was, that was the <laughs> – wait, we got to find that story because that was the extreme. That's a true story. Like he was like legit, like a drug addict, like doing coke and doing all sorts of crazy stuff. Maybe he just needed an, an escape from like breaking down like the L one and the R one. You know, maybe he wanted nothing to do with it. Yeah, but but Bill doesn't drink coffee. Can't stand the smell of coffee. Yeah, he doesn't like it. I was like, well, I mean, he just stays up. I don't understand how he does it. Every every single coach I've ever met has always had some sort of stimulus like that uh, they use either it's dip either they're dipping or they're drinking coffee i had some coaches they would smoke and they would and they would drink coffee sorry i had the wrong guy what wrong turn chris forster was the guy from miami it was yeah, Dolphins. yeah 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 i had the what, uh what was his he was it was this guy was nuts uh well lost his entire family lost everybody because he was hooked on cocaine said and- he was introduced to uh cocaine in 2015 and according to a story here from uh tmz by the way, they released a video of him uh, snorting it on his desk. He sent it to some... Oh, that's right. Yeah, now yeah. Here. So he was taking this video and sending it to this prostitute, and the prostitute outed him. Yeah, that's right. He said he was using it for like eight or nine days straight or whatever. Look at me. I'm, he's the, I was so, like, I'm, I'm thinking of you. So that guy could stay up. Oh, my God. Maybe Bill's a tea guy. I don't know if you're. I don't know if like if you're not a coffee guy. I think tea is bleh. Nah, tea either maybe way, is like I can live with you know, it. I'm only drinking tea with honey. Like if I'm sick, oh, yeah. like I can't talk. I'm losing my voice. One I think of that, those deals. That to me is probably out of all the things that Bill does. That to me stands out the most. The fact no that no coffee. Imagine back when he was in in the seventies, when they had to do the old school like uh, you know film. Like it was like you put it on the projector, oh, when you put it on the reel, and reel you had to reel, sit yeah. there, and he would have to break down film for like what fifty hours or something, some yep. crazy number, and he didn't. He had, he had no stimulus other than his just only desire to be great. That was his stimulus, his desire to prove people wrong. All just football that's a, nerd mess just it. going through it's his just head, going crazy. Yep. His my mind was going like crazy, like he couldn't sleep, so he had to stay up. I don't and like it, coffee. 
He doesn't like coffee. That's I feel like pretty amazing. amazing. I just feel like that. Like and no, that's it, crazy. here's the other thing too. If he doesn't like the smell of it, if you're a coach, you can't bring it into a meeting. But that's the other thing. Everybody so else thing. drinks coffee, so right? So doesn't... you either have to cap it and hope he doesn't smell it, or you can't bring it into. I think that like you're the right. conference room. So how many coaches? How many people? Are in like a team meeting just with coaches. I mean, there's a there's a lot in there. Yep, at least twenty five. I want to say twenty five. If you have a full staff meeting, yep. that would include the junior assistants and uh, then the analysts yep. and stuff everybody. like that. Yep. Everybody, you're the right. Matt Patricia's 20, at 20, least twenty five. Yeah, they're all drinking coffee. Yep. You're right. So they can't come in with with no cap on it. He probably gives you stink eye mm-hmm. and stares at you, and he probably makes you feel like an idiot. And you probably and you only take the little thing off when you drink it, and you go <laughs> and right? put it back if, on real if quick. If that, so the so the smell doesn't escape the lid. You're better walking in there with a giant lipper packed in with a spit probably. cup than you probably are walking in he with coffee. Probably except that except because I don't think I've I, that doesn't smell to me. It's disgusting when I see it. Oh, but it doesn't. It smells wonderful. Oh, I hate it. No, every time it's I still smell it, I thing. get that craving. I'm just like, okay, I gotta get away That's from right, this. That's right, because you I can't do it anymore. Because I'll, I'll, yep, and it'd be off to the races again. And I, I used to do the upper tank, the whole nine. I already oh. beat that. I'm done. I'm good. I'm just in, in an effort to feel to be cool. Back in my day, when I wasn't because I couldn't do it. They had these uh, these knockoff versions, like the candy cigarettes, like the kids used to oh, have. Oh yeah, yeah. But it was uh, it was like uh, <laughs> bacon or something like that. It was like oh some yeah, bacon, weird ba- bacon flavored candy cigarettes. They're my favorite. Yeah, but it was like dip. So pe- and, and they were in a pouch. So you would do the pouch. Dip Those are and called would- skull bandits. Is that what it's called? They're called bandits. Yes. Oh my God. In the pouch. Unbelievable. Those are much easier to deal with, depending on like if you're in class or something, and you're worried about it. Because you can just go swoop, scoop it right out, dirt, chuck it away. Nobody sees it. There's nothing left behind unless you bite down on the thing, and then there's a real problem. Let Ugh. me ask you this. Ugh. Whenever team building goes on in the NFL, normally there's a team in everyone's division or conference that they say, we got to build it to beat them. The New England Patriots, for a long period of time, was that team. Got to build a team to be able to beat the Patriots. Well, if you're Bill Belichick and Gerard Mayo and the assembled geniuses down there and you're getting ready to build the 2023 Patriots, who are you building it to beat? Is it Kansas City? Is it Cincinnati? Is it Buffalo? Is there that big a difference between those three? Is the blueprint the same? So if you're Bill Belichick and you're thinking, who are the teams we got to beat? That's a pretty healthy group in front of you, but... How do you go about getting to that point to be able to beat all three of them? See, that's interesting because just off instinct, I say start with your division. Win your division. That If you win your division, if you're the best in your division, all right, well, you'll take your chances, you know, during the playoffs against other teams that are not in your division. But even with that, I feel like you need to think about it more from like a 30,000-foot view. So what are the trends telling you that is going on right now? To me, it's been obvious based on, the old school Ted Johnson, LeVon Kirkland linebacker doesn't exist. They gone. That big meathead, run downhill, take on guards, take on fullbacks. You don't need him anymore. There's maybe two or three teams that even have a fullback. Most of those ISO blocks are done by tight ends who don't want to block. So it's never as successful, you know, or you or you scout and you draft to it and you do what, uh, you know, uh, Baltimore does with their guys or what Tennessee does with their guys. But the, the league is turning to a more spread out hybrid. So so your old school, your old school strong safety is now your hybrid linebacker. So Rodney Harrison in today's game, yeah, he's a linebacker. Would play in the box. He, he's a weak side. He would be a uh, he would see he would be a will linebacker. Okay, Sam is front side. Mike's in the middle. Will is your uh, nerding out right now, but that's fine. Is your weak side linebacker? So he would come down and he would play that weak side. But I even see some of those guys, they play the front side now. They play the sandbacker because they want to be able to cover the tight end or the back, and they need to be in there inside the box, not outside the tackle box, inside of it, right? Yes. Because, because they're going to have support coming in outside. So the tre- that is the trend. That is the trend. You can't get away with not having big, beefy guys, right? So you have to have your at least your three you know fat dudes in the middle. I don't think you can get by with having skinny 
guys like that. Well, it's interesting you say that because it feels like a lot of defenses, because they've got to play more nickel, are now going back to the three down front the way Bill played it when you first came here. Yeah. Right? So where it like was a, a fat in the middle. And then two and linebacker then types with two in the two, middle. Well, yeah. I mean, if you think of Will Fork, Warren, and Seymour, if you had those three guys right now, you'd have a pretty good start on – and then, you know, Willie was a part of that. Willie was kind of one of those stand-up defensive ends, can put his hand down or whatever. It feels like, at least from a front standpoint, I think the linebacking part has changed – But in terms of the three down front, there's those interchangeable outside linebackers, defensive ends, where there's where you really got to find the right guys. Because your interior defensive tackles will change a little bit, but on the whole, they're there to gobble up people to try to slow down the run. Yeah, so I almost feel you mentioned dime and nickel, or nickel and dime, depending on whatever, but that's more of a consistent presence than your your normal yep. just defensive front with your linebackers your your two safety one strong one's one's free the strong safety is the run stopping guy always plays to the tight end side you know then your two corners traditional defensive front now there's more hybrids and corners just because you have to be able to cover like you know the good teams with all the weapons athletes athletes Athletes, right? So how like tough Kyle is it? Pitts. Like if you're dealing with a Kyle Pitts type tight end, you might not be able to put a safety on him. You might have to have a one you might have to have one linebacker that can match up to not get overwhelmed by him in the run game in the event they ask him to block, or have someone with some size that you hope can run with the guy. See, I thought it was interesting years ago, um um I, I was able to talk to Bill about Gronkowski and we were just having a debate, and sure enough, Bill walks by. We're like, I was like, hey, um, what type, like, how do you cover, like, a Gronkowski? Like, what type of, is it a linebacker or is it a strong safety? And he was basically like, you really need another Gronkowski that plays defense. Because the little, you just, now now he's a he's a unicorn to an extent. Oh, no, you need a unicorn on yeah. defense. So yeah. somebody maybe like a Shaq Leonard from Indianapolis Jamie Might be Collins able to hang with him, right. was that type there of guy. Yeah, yeah. But even when he had an opportunity, when the Patriots played against the Broncos, he got beat by, I don't know, on a double move like twice in a row. I forgot who the tight end was. Beat him twice for touchdowns in the AFC Championship game before the Denver Broncos and Peyton Manning went to the Super Bowl. But anyways, the point is, is that where is it going? How do you build your roster? Find as many athletes as possible to cover on defense. I'll tell you what I think we are going to see this draft season. Cause again, everybody goes nuts over the skill guys. I get it. Teams are going to invest more in the line of scrimmage than ever before. Look at Cincinnati. They're still finding a way to coach around it, but their defensive line is very underrated there. And look at Philadelphia right now. Arguably number one in the trenches on both sides of the ball, easily, and I know by a large margin that. And you even said it again. People accuse me. Oh, you're a lineman. Of course, you're going to push for the bigs. No, former NFL tight end Christian Fourier said last week when we start talking about this offense and getting it right, like number one need is a number one receiver or a tackle. If you can't block, you can't run your offense, and that's where the Patriots have to get to just to then figure out what they're going to do. And I think they're going to be a lot of teams because if you look, arguably, the biggest reason why teams underachieved is because their lines of scrimmage weren't good enough. And I'm fully and, expecting teams to attack that this offseason. And the only way to combat that, like the get out of jail free card, is to have a guy like Joe Burrow. Like, and, okay, then how many guys have him? You know, Patrick Mahomes. Like, good luck. Right. Good luck hitting the lottery with those guys. They just don't exist. And that's why the, those guys will be running this conference, the AFC conference, those two guys for the next 10 years. Easily. I know that we can get into Joe Burrow, and maybe we can wait until the final hour to get to that. But I want to ask Christian Fourier what it is like for an NF to be on an NFL team when you have a disappointing loss in the playoffs. How does it work in terms of – like, do you kind of know there are going to be changes? Like, if you're in the Dallas locker room today, are you talking amongst yourselves as players? Man, Jerry might fire this head coach. We'll take you inside the locker room next. 93.7 WEEI, Boston Sports Original.
On WEEI. I don't know if this is technically your five minute football nerd, but I do think there is a worthy discussion here because, well, four teams are heading home. And if you're the Jacksonville Jaguars and the New York Football Giants foe, yeah, you're probably feeling pretty good about yourself. Mm hmm. But if you're the Buffalo Bills and the Dallas Cowboys, you hit the divisional round once again and then went kaput. Now, I know in the year of our Lord 2005, after two Super Bowl championships, mm. Christian Fourier, you were on a team <laughs> that went to Denver and, well, didn't exactly live up to expectations. And I know you've been in other locker rooms. You were in Carolina. You're in Seattle as well. So... Day after the end of a regular season where you miss the playoffs, is that kind of standard operating procedure for players versus where if you're on the Buffalo Bills or the Dallas Cowboys today, is your antenna or anxiety up a little bit because you were a part of a season that many people view as fell short? Well, I would say end of the season, uh, regular season, honest to God, I just wanted to get the hell out of there. I just, like, didn't want to. I was like, okay, there was a couple times we had away games and we knew we were gone. We would bring our stuff and sneak it onto the plane and then wouldn't even fly back with the team. We would just take wow. it, hop in a cab, and, like, do our exit physical and then be like, later, we see in, like, three months. That's if you weren't hurt. But, like, when it comes to, like, losing game, like, think about the Bills. The narrative is starting to change on the Bills now in real time as opposed to what you were doing, what they were doing last year, to what they are now. Love it. It almost feels like, uh, here we go again, same old Bills. or And suddenly, like, Josh Allen is not the solution. He's now the problem. It's just so quick. Like, nobody just believes in you anymore. It's amazing how it happens. Like, you got the guy's like the talk of the town. He's the second coming of Jesus Christ. And sure as hell, he can't get to the Super Bowl. So you sit there and go, I'm looking at, oh, are they really going to build a new stadium for this team? They can't get out of their own way. They still can't do it. So there's a lot of a lot of regret, I think, for the Bills and, I guess, anxiety based on what the narrative is going to be. And then you're going to have to live with that narrative all the way to August okay, but when if the you're, season starts. So let's flip it. If you're a Cowboys player, is your anxiety, oh, my God, somebody else might be running this thing next year? Or do you even not think about well, that? Well, what is my contract? If, well, my con if, okay. I'm, if I'm protected by my contract, I don't care. Right. If I'm like, uh, I had a situation where Dennis Erickson was fired and I was a free agent at the same time. And then sure as heck, they they hired Holmgren. So the whole time I'm sitting there going, is he going to want me back? Is he, I mean, what's it going to be like? Like, should I sell my house? You know, listen, he, he ended, they ended up resigning me. So it wasn't a big deal. But they're obviously, but I don't think Buffalo's in that situation. Dallas feels like there's Dallas more does. anxiety there because they got running backs walking out the door. Their head coach is a boob. Jerry Jones is I again he wrote it out forever with uh Jason Garrett the carrot does he look at Mike McCarthy and be like nope you got to go I got to bring in I got to trade the pick and get Sean Payton I just sometimes I sit there and I wonder at some point in time do the players go it's never going to happen like when do you Ooh. like when does it when do you sit there and go man we had the perfect situation and we still couldn't win like what is it is there like is are they doing a massive autopsy right now like self, are they sitting there? Are they self reflecting? The team's doing an autopsy. That's what they're doing. No doubt, they're peeling down every layer. They're looking into everything. They're pulling out your guts and trying to feel like, okay, wh what's the problem? What do you think Jerry Jones is doing? You know, he did this whole interview before the game, and he was talking about. He's like, hey, well, you know, you hear if you hear some screaming late at night, oh, that's me screwing into my pillow because I can't get back to the Super Bowl. So he actively talks about it. He almost like. I almost feel like he jinxes himself because he so publicly addresses the fact that he just can't. He's just doing everything in his power to get back, but he can't. Like, they can't get back. So, in that regard, and I don't believe Jerry Jones for a second.
Well, even if you played on it, if you nope. played for him, you wouldn't believe him. If um, if you were on that team right now, would you take him at his word that McCarthy's nope. job is not in nope. jeopardy? No. If something better walked by him, I think he would break his neck turning to look at it. And if that could be Sean Payton. I mean, if you look at – I think at this point in time, you're looking at teams that could be that could do better with somebody else. We have reached our, our ceiling with Mike McCarthy. We have reached our ceiling with um, – Dak Prescott? Well, well, I would say another coach, Staley. And, oh, okay, Brandon uh, you know, Staley. Brandon Staley. In, right. Okay, and you would sit there and go – um, like teams like the Jacksonville Jaguars, they feel great. Same thing they happened to Bill O'Brien in Houston. Yeah, they, they can't hit a ceiling. That's and that it. was it. That's it. Like the Jacksonville round is gone. Very uh, sick now. You would say like the Jacksonville Jaguars, they they can't wait to get back to work. Oh God, they're excited. Yep. See, what's another team that kind of? Well, you know, the Giants, and I know the they Giants got a are another team. Nope. That's yep. Let's we're, go. We're ahead. Yep. We are ahead of the game. We're not going to freak out. We're on our way. Now they have some decisions to make too with Saquon Barkley and others. You know, Daniel Jones, their quarterback, but they feel great about their position. They weren't uh, supposed to make the playoffs. I saw this on Twitter, so I admit I'm stealing it from someone out there. Here's a little theory for you. Is Dak Prescott Southern Kirk Cousins? Southern Kirk Cousins. Oh, man. I think it's a great analogy. It is. I mean, I feel like there's a lot of those guys. Like, there's got to be more of those guys that are so, like, great regular season record. Uh, lots of just lots of money getting paid, lots of success, personal success, doing lots of commercials, but they can never like Tony Romo. Good, not great. Tony Romo wasn't, wasn't Tony Romo like yep, Kirk Cousins before guys. Kirk Cousins? Very much so. Um, I feel like there's always a ton of those guys that they're good, but they get paid like they're great, but they never quite do it. I'm seeing reports right now on Josh Allen. Like the the reason Josh Allen and the Buffalo Bills are not advancing. If you go back to the last four years, because he he he's overrated. Like suddenly Josh Allen is overrated, and the quarterbacks that he's going against outplay him. Joe Burrow outplayed him. Patrick Mahomes, yeah, he did outplay you. He got the final score with uh, Travis Kelsey, and they went to the Super Bowl the year before that. It was uh, I think it was Mahomes also. So you could sit there and look at um, the Buffalo Bills and say, you know what, the problem is that quarterback. We need we need to we need to bring him back. We need to bring Brian Dable back because he's overrated. Well, it's what I said about Dak Prescott. He needs more people around him. Those guys that hit the ceiling, it's like, how do I make them better? I don't know if I can make them individually better. So can I put better people around? Well, them? when did when is when does Josh Allen turn into Dak Prescott? When does that narrative change to him being Dak Prescott? I mean, well, he's getting paid like a superstar. He's getting he's playing in these superstar games against other superstars and they're all playing him. Because I think Dak Prescott is a part of the problem because Jerry Jones has overrated him. I think Josh Allen is good, but what you're asking him to do is be Superman good. And that's where against good teams in the playoffs, that stuff can kind of run out. I know, but out. what is the difference between uh, the Kansas City Chiefs as, asking Patrick Mahomes to be Superman, Cincinnati asking Joe Burrow to be Superman? I don't feel like there's any difference. Like, he's just, to me, he looks like he's Arm turning talent. back into Wyoming. I throw it into team meetings, Josh Allen. Well, this is where Josh Allen, the athlete, needs to meet Josh Allen, the quarterback, and maybe that's the difference. Maybe have a that, conversation. But the other two guys, <laughs> you know what, they should. But the other two guys you mentioned, they're true quarterbacks at heart. They anticipate, they throw with accuracy. With Josh Allen, a lot of his plays are... Some of the superhuman stuff. I can throw it 75 yards and let my guy run underneath of it versus let me dink and dunk and be precise and get down the field with two minutes to go and no timeouts. Well, like, the I question the question is going to start with Josh Allen. When are you going to win something? No doubt. It's already going to win something. Like you, enough's enough. What do you when, when it's you, fair? Yeah. And Joe Burrow's ahead of him. Patrick Mahomes is obviously ahead of him. And Trevor Lawrence is catching up. Catching up. No doubt. 617-779-7937. We get into the final hour. We'll continue talking football with you, but uh, pretty rough winter weekend for the Red Sox. You'll hear all that went down next. The Rich Keefe Show.
This hour of Gresham Fourier is brought to you by Shaw's, the official supermarket of the Red Sox Network. This is Gresh and Fourier. I think the, the most uh, important thing I can say is that it's expensive to have baseball players. To have the best. Andy Gresh. Charlie Coyle will waste the clock dry. The Bruins get a combined shot out from Lena Solmark and Jeremy Swayman. They have outscored their opponents in this five-game winning streak, 21-5. to five. Christian Fourier. We had guys step up. We had Peyton come out, play really well. Grant came out, got hot, you know, and that's what we need. We a team, so no matter who rolls the ball out or which team is, you know, doing what, I, I, got, I got my money on the seas. I, I, I don't know if I can say that. Gresh and Fourier right now. Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes. Joe Burrow have been the class for a while in the AFC. They're still there. It's going to take a lot to catch up with them. On WEEI. Into the final hour, Gresham Fourier here on this Monday. Thank you for making us your choice in uh, Boston Sports Talk Radio. Wherever you are across New England, we are Boston and New England Sports Original, WEEI. Well, we know the NFL season is over, but you heard mixed in there as well. And we'll give you the uh, extended version of... What it was like at Red Sox winter weekend in Springfield, Mass. Now, normally, Foyer, as we have come to know, I think it's a little bit of a safe space. I think you figure, oh, it's a lot of Red Sox fans. Yeah, they love it. they, these people, yeah, they want to be there. They want to like, be there. they want to like act like there's nothing wrong, right? They're the, they're the Dan Roaches of the world. They're just happy to be there. Happy, happy, happy. Nothing to see here. Nothing to see here. Oh, my child is so good. Oh, he's no. Everybody's great, right? Every everything is perfect. The everything is awesome crowd. Yes, the everything is awesome. At crowd. least that's what you thought until Red Sox management, meaning Heim Bloom, yep. Sam Kennedy. You had Alex Cora mixed in there, and John Henry. They all walk out on stage for the big. Hey, 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 oh my go. God, they're all in the same room together. Yeah, no, it was more of the boo, boo. It wasn't bad booing. It was a little bit of booing whenever was, they came got, out on stage. It got pretty bad. Well, that's the thing. It got way worse when John Henry started to open his mouth. And we've tried to uh, elevate the audio the best we can. I do believe this is from someone who was sitting in the crowd around other people, which is why you will hear some of those comments a little more clearly than maybe what you hear John Henry saying about, well, it's expensive to have ball players, and then Sam Kennedy jumping in as uh, John Henry was verbally drowning on stage. I think the, the, the most uh, important thing I can say is that it's expensive to have baseball players, to have the best <laughs> So, 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 what what has enabled us over the years to be able to spend with the Yankees and the Dodgers and is is your support, and that support is through ticket prices. It's, it's watching us, but a lot of it for us is ticket. Put a product on the field. Yeah, you know, it's, um, 
it's really important that we provide accessibility to Fenway. I mean, it, it, we cannot grow that next generation of fans without people being able to, to get there. And we do have high ticket prices at the high end, um, mostly corporations and businesses that buy, whether it's luxury boxes or lower box seats. But we also have $9 tickets for every single game, for every student anywhere in New England can come to Fenway Park. They like that. And that's really important. Um, we have to make Fenway Park accessible. Um, and it's, it's critical that our fans know that the revenues that we generate go to two places. They go into the player payroll, into the product on the field, and they go into Fenway Park, preserving, protecting, and enhancing Fenway Park. Oh, man. How about the last one? In your pockets. So, the <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Like the I'm amazed at this. I was just trying to keep track. So, the first line that really got him going is um is basically um hey listen uh you know, <laughs> baseball players cost money they're expensive they they're expensive they cost hey listen the only way we can spend and to support those those uh those players to pay them is uh, ticket prices nobody wants to hear any of this nobody wants nothing see that is the reality of it right so hey you guys want all these guys they're expensive don't bitch and complain about how expensive ticket prices are. You keep telling me you want good players. They spent over $170 million during the offseason. Like, hey, I spent money. You just don't You don't like it. I just, it. It's so amazing. They finally are just said, screw it, because they have this whole fan fest thing every single year for, I don't know, as long as I've been working here. I've never seen it get this contentious. Yeah, put a product on the field. Yeah. Put a product on the field, the guy says. He's not happy. Why are they? Why are they acting out? Why now? What led to this? Out of all the years when things have not gone their way, and all the, you know, John Henry's like, you know, whatever it is. Now they decided to say, you know what? We're sick of it. We've had enough. What did they do? They signed Devers. Did they not? Right. Not, they can't. They can't help that Trevor Story got hurt. Like Mookie Betts, is is this just the culmination of like all those things that happened? I think Mookie Betts started it, but I think what really put people over the top, and maybe there are those who think that this was unfair. Six one seven 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 nine seven ninety three seven. Maybe you think that the Red Sox ownership shouldn't should have gotten booed worse, or maybe they shouldn't have gotten it at all. It started with Betts, and now it's really kind of kicked up a notch when fans now start to figure out that you were way off in terms of what you were willing to pay Xander Bogarts and you brought in Trevor Story. Well, it's so not now, ideal. And the other, the other thing too, Christian, is that I think the business of sports, and I'd even limit it to signing players, if you just want to go there, people are hip to the game now. People know whose contracts are coming up. You know if you brought in someone. When they signed Trevor Story – the narrative began before the season even started this year on, well, if you're bringing him in, what does that say about Xander? And it led a lot of people to think, well, he's going to be gone. And then the Red Sox came out and said, well, he's our number one priority, but he really wasn't your number one priority because your price point was nowhere near. So I think it is accumulation of that. And, and while I understand why John Henry doesn't come out much because of what he said there and the way people reacted to it, the fact that for a lot of people, if you're not seeing the owner, it is much easier to get mad at him. See, uh, when yeah. Robert Kraft is front and center, people see him, mm -hmm. they see him at games, they hear him on NFL Network, they hear people like Jeff Saturday when collective bargaining agreements are done. That, oh, Robert Kraft was a big part of it. None of that with John Henry. There's not enough goodwill from the owner other than product I'm putting on the field, which is very much business. Hey, I look on a sheet of paper. Here's how we did. We had the good numbers. Here's what we did. We sold the tickets, da, da, da. But people have a connection to Robert Kraft because they see him. People have a connection to Wick Grosbeck because you see the guy. And whenever there's something that goes down, you see Wick Grosbeck sitting with Brad Stevens when they're dealing with Ime Udoka. You have a warm and fuzzy day where you sign Rafi Devers and the owner can't show up? 
People are going to draw I, their I, conclusions. It is, it is amazing to me that a guy that successful is, is so obtuse. He's so disconnected from what the crowd wants to hear. And I, 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 there's a reason why he doesn't talk because he's no good at it. Mm-hmm. There's a reason why Sam Kenny has to save his ass repeatedly. You can go all the way back to the Pablo Sandoval. Oh, oh yeah. not many people have 12% body fat. Dude, what? That dude's like a 26% body fat. He's fat as hell. But he does. He treats it. Like a spreadsheet, guys. Hey, hey, you're the fans. You gotta, you gotta like, you gotta encourage them. You gotta like, maybe you know, hide the truth a little bit. Maybe you have to, I don't know, high road them to, to like, like crazy. Take the high road on everything. You can't tell them, guys. You want, you want good players, right? Hey, well, listen, that costs money. I'm spending money, but I gotta raise ticket prices. Beer's gonna cost fifteen bucks. It's gonna cost you a lot of money. To, yeah, we'll have some seats in the, you know, in center field for nine bucks for all the college kids to give us a younger demographic. Ooh. But really, ah, it's wrong, expensive. Wrong to put that Parking, in there. you can't do it. So they yell and they scream and they, they they mock him. And then Sam tries to save him, but he doesn't do any better. By that point in time, it's it's too late. They just it's too late. Nobody wants to hear it anymore. And I do feel like they kind of feel like and Kennedy kind of tried to explain this when he when he tried to explain like the Xander Bogart situation. It's like, ah, you know what? I feel like I oversold like our love for Xander Bogart. So it probably led people to believe that we were going to sign him. When in reality, we were just trying to let people know that we love him, but we can't do that type of business because we have to sign this guy first. So it made you think that he was a priority because you said it was a priority. Uh-huh. And then you let him go to San Diego. Yeah. So, I mean, I, uh, you know, uh, you suck. You know, so Xander's gone. Devers the only one here. You still look like you're going to be in last place, and you're charging us all this money. So I can understand how they got frustrated and acting out. But I also think of owners, and why did Jeremy Jacobs in the 2000s and even the early 2010s, why did Jeremy Jacobs take heat? Because it was viewed that he was never around. There was the thought that you only heard from Jeremy Jacobs, and by the way, it isn't completely wrong, Whenever there are labor issues in 07, then you'd hear from Jeremy Jacobs, right? But it was never, hey, he's here for a big press conference or something. There were a lot of Bruins fans who I do think still feel detached from the ownership, even though Charlie Jacobs is around a lot. And I think that when someone's out of sight, out of mind, it's easy to direct the vitriol at them. Where when you see and hear Robert Kraft and you could say, all right, he screwed this up, but he's done a whole lot of other good, and that's my owner. And see, that's the thing, too. Fans want to take ownership of players, organizations, and they want to feel like not that their owners necessarily want to then because they are a billionaire, but that in some way I can connect with that guy. And when you see Wick and Robert and you don't see Jeremy Jacobs and John Henry – it's easier for you to feel warm and fuzzy about two of them and get angry at the other Absolutely. two. Absolutely. Even though I bet you, uh, Henry, John Henry probably sits there and says, why are they booing me? Right, we're successful. We, why are they I, upset? They didn't, there wasn't any success before me. I spent money. I improved mm-hmm. this. I did that. Like, I'm, I'm spending money. Look at the top spending teams. The Red Sox are right there at the top. Like, so why are you angry with me? I don't think he gets it, and I think a lot of it has to do with his ability to connect with a common man. I I think there is something to that. One line available, 617-779-7937. Too rough, too easy on the Red Sox management during the winter weekend. We've also got to get to Shannon Sharp, if possible, because uh, we have us an apology of the day. But first, here's Billy. Uh Uh-oh. Ready to Uh-oh. trend. Oh, no. The Rich Show. <laughs> oh, come, Billy, six. come on, now, Billy. Here's what's trending. Straight through, on Billy. W-E-E-I. The Boston Bruins shut out the San Jose Shocks 4 0 last night. The Bees begin their five game road trip tomorrow night when they visit the Montreal Canadiens. Puck drops at 7 p.m. The Bruins have also recalled forward Mark McLaughlin from Providence. Marcus Smart is out. Malcolm Brogdon is out. And Robert Williams is listed as questionable for tonight's Boston Celtics game against the Magic. The Seas are riding a nine-game winning streak, and tip-off in Orlando is at 7 p.m. 
Chiefs quarterback Patrick Mahomes plans on playing in Sunday's AFC Championship game against the Bengals after suffering a high ankle sprain in Saturday's win over the Jaguars. And in the NFC, the 49ers will face the Eagles in the NFC Championship after eliminating the Dallas Cowboys last night. Trending, brought to you by FindMassMoney.com. We can all use some extra cash now that the holidays are over. Go to FindMassMoney.com and search your name. You could have unclaimed money from forgotten bank accounts, stock certificates, payroll and refund checks, insurance proceeds, and more. Go to FindMassMoney.com today. FindMassMoney.com today. Mm. It's fast, it's easy, and free. I'm Billy Lanny. That's what's trending now on WEI and WEI.com. Well done, Billy. Wow, well, look at that. Uh... Good job, Billy. Oh, man. <laughs> Thank you, boys. Shocks and smart. Let's get to uh, should the Red Sox begin booed next? The Red Sox Station.
Tom Curran is going to join us tomorrow at noon, scheduled to. And, uh, <clears throat> oh, yeah, you said oh. he's got a little nugget here on. Yeah, uh, want to tease it now? On, uh, well, we'll just mention it now because I know we're going to okay. go to these Red Sox calls. Yeah. But uh, so apparently Matt Patricia could be gone. Yeah. So the Lions uh, don't owe him anymore. That contract has expired. So it looks like he could be on his way out. Forget about being reassigned. He could just be gone and going to another team. Like to go be a D coordinator somewhere, you mm, think? Well, who or... knows? Who knows? But the fact is that, that you know, he's no longer an asset because they, now they got to pay him. Right? Now they got to pay him yep. for what he's worth. Not you know, underpay him because he's getting like, you know, $10 million from another team. Joe Judge is now just on that plan in terms of the Patriots coaching staff. He's still getting paid from the yeah, Giants. Yeah, he's still getting basically. paid from the yeah. Giants, but Matt Patricia is no longer getting paid, so it'll so, be interesting to see how they handle him. I wonder if they just move him into the front office for now, or does Matt Patricia start taking interviews? Does he want to go be a defensive coordinator somewhere? Jeez. And who and who brings him with them? Yeah. Like, Brian Flores is interviewing today for the Cardinals head coaching job. Now, there's been a lot of rumblings about B-Flow in Miami, and there was a reason why I think he went through a lot of coaches, if you want to put Mm -hmm. two and two together. And I wonder if – could Matt Patricia swallow working under a guy like Brian Flores? As a coordinator? Yeah. I think he's untouchable for a year. Personally, I think he does. But uh, uh, Coach a position. Settle back in as just a listen. No expectations. I'm just coaching linebackers. There, I was just going to say linebackers. I'm just coach. coaching linebackers. I don't. I'll listen. I can help you with this, and I can teach you some things. But I don't want. I just want to reset the market. Really reset my reputation. Well, there's that too. That's that's the most important thing. I think people look at him as a as a laughing stock. Really, to be honest with, you. I feel like he's like a comic figure now. Yeah. And I don't think he's earned it, but, I mean, actually, I do think he's earned it, but it, I don't think it's necessarily his fault, especially what happened with the Patriots. What he did in Detroit was 100% his fault, and he wasn't ready. Couldn't handle the media, couldn't handle the heat, said a lot of stupid things. And there will be, I think, a lot of people across the league who will look at Matt Patricia that way, and then there might be those who say, hey, this guy's actually done a lot. Like, he dangled in the front office for whatever that was for, Yes, he poorly called plays on offense, but he coached offense. Yeah, He's a defensive a guy. He's been a head coach. Like, if you're a head coach who is looking for someone with some added value in terms of what else they can do, that's where Matt Patricia might have some value. Then again, I don't know. I mean, is, is anybody going to bring him in for a D coordinator interview or anything like that? No. Like I, that's does, he have hard- any, does he have any friends that are getting jobs? Start with that. Does he have any friends that are getting jobs mm. that will bring him in as a D coordinator? I think the answer is no. He probably would have a better opportunity legitimately interviewing to be somebody's defensive fill-in-the-blank coach. Right. You know what I mean? Hey, listen, I'm really good. I can do this. I can do that. He's very bright. Well, if you're He's Atlanta. He's extremely bright. He's not a dumb person. Dude, you can't you know, excel in the classroom like he did and be dumb. Right. You can't. But you I can't wonder, be a rocket sci- scientist and be dumb. Atlanta lost Dean Pease. I wonder if that if they're interested in staying scheme sound with what Dean Pease does. It's not that far from Patricia, I don't think. I don't, I don't want the heat. I don't want the heat. I just want to. I want to go under the radar. I want to coach linebackers. I want to coach um, you know safeties, and that's it. I don't want to talk to the media. I don't want to have to answer for whatever. I just want to. You just want to be a guy. I just want to be a guy. Yeah, I got enough money. I don't need to be anybody else but that. Interesting. 617-779-7937. Back to the booing of Red Sox management on winter weekend. Let's go to uh let's go to Chris in Boston with Gresham Fourier. Hi, Chris. Hey guys. So I think they should have got they should have laid into them so much worse. I mean, this has been coming down for a long time. How they let go of Lester was an atrocity. Then to bring in David Price after saying you weren't going to pay someone that much money over the age of 30, but you'll pay a guy who only had one good playoff run with you versus a guy that actually helped carry your team into a World Series victory is beyond me. And then you want to sign guys like Edgar Renteria, Carl Crawford, all these other bozos for all this money just for them to flop here, but you won't pay and extend the guys 
during your reign of having a top five salary who actually proved to you that they could play in this market, A, and B, win you a championship. It's disgusting, and they should get it so much worse. Like, I would have been throwing tomatoes if, that, if I was there. I probably would have gotten kicked out, too. Well, there, I was just going to say, insane. yeah, we don't encourage the throwing of tomatoes. However, let me sum up his point here. This has been building for a while because the Red Sox philosophy is like a roller coaster. Sometimes we're up and we're spending, and we got a GM that wants to do it. Now we got a guy in here who wants to build the farm system. And well, build the farm system up. Like when you think of the way Theo Epstein handled things, and then sort of the hoops that he had to jump through just to retain his job and get a little power to go to John Henry. And then you had the the whole setup when Theo left, and then Ben Charrington ultimately is in there. So you went from Theo to Ben Charrington to then bring in Dave Dombrowski to now Heim Bloom. I think it's another thing that the owner gets sort of thrown in his lap, which is your philosophies are all over the place. I think if there was, hey, this is who the owner is, this is the way he thinks about things, this is how we run our organization and you bring in different GMs to do it. That's one thing, but it was, Oh, what does this GM think? Fine. Go do it for four years. Oh, we want a championship. This guy's going to leave. Guess what? Now we're going to have a whole nother philosophy. You can't follow what's going on. Like for as better or worse. The one thing about Belichick is he believed what he's believed in when you were there in the early 2000s as much as he does now. Yeah. <clears throat> to me, it was just crazy. It's like, do you remember Showtime at the Apollo? Oh, remember God, that show? Yeah. So Steve it was a lot of, Harvey. Well, but even before that, there were so many. Basically, you go up there, you know, it's a lot of amateurs trying to get discovered. And if they don't like you, they boo you right away. Yeah, they do. And they got that guy, the Sandman, that comes up and does his little thing. And they give you the hook and they th- and they usher you off stage. They stole from the Gong Show, but yeah, nevertheless, well, well, let's not. You know, Where's Chuck actually, Barris? I don't FBI know which one. Operative. Actually, but yeah, so to me, that that's why it was so odd that your loyal subjects finally revolted. Mm-hmm. They are finally sick of being served stale bread and crappy products. And being lied to, they decided they weren't going to take it anymore. That was amazing. And you do not have a connection with this owner. And you never will. No, I agree. I would say you could I hire agree. you could hire like Sam Kenny, but everybody knows like Sam Kennedy is not the owner. So right. I mean, so but he you, speaks you for the owner because know, the owner has but, a hard time speaking for himself. And I know why because right. he always steps in it. Always, he just doesn't have it in him. It doesn't mean he's a bad guy. He just doesn't know how to relate. Sam is more like a politician sometimes. Like, he can, oh, hold up. Let me smooth it out real quick. Very much Here's so. what he meant to say, guys. Yep. yep. It, does, it doesn't have the same weight. It doesn't, doesn't mean as much. Well, Red Sox fans figure it out after a while. And I think fans do figure it out and after a while. And if you're winning, so what? Let them be a jerk. Nobody cares. Uh, there you is start that suffering and you start making bad decisions and losing homegrown products that you don't keep. And you get outbid by other teams when you're supposed to be spending money because you're, hey, you said it. You're charging us a bunch of money. You want to spend money? Okay. We'll buy the $15 beer. Get good players. Keep the guys that we like. And there's also the, hey, this is our number one priority, but we were off by 200 oh, or no. $130 That's million. Dollars. We're That's... All, you just think, you think we're dumb. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, let's, I do. I kind of thought your guys were dumb. Let's go to uh, <laughs> Kevin down in beautiful Amelia Island, Florida, with Gresham Fourier. Hello, Kevin. Hey, guys. How you doing today? Good, man. What's up? <clears throat> um, the, I, the Red Sox have, have turned out to be one of the bigger frauds of ownership in, in recent time. You had mentioned Jeremy Jacobs, but I think they're even – surpassing that now when these bozos came in and bought the team all we heard for the first two years was that they were going to be stewards of this team for new england and red sox nation okay so as being a steward you're supposed to act in the best interest of its fans its owners its whatever else you call it and then we've got this situation now where they're saying one thing and doing another I had a boss once who said, after you've screwed up for the fourth time, you're either a liar or you're stupid. (laughs) So you pick which way you're going. (laughs) So you lied to us about the fact that you wanted to sign Xander Bogarts. Uh, You couldn't sign Mookie Betts. Okay, great, great, great. Or you just were stupid enough to underestimate the market going forward 
And that was evidenced by the initial offering they gave Bogarts way back when, and it's just insulting. So what is it, guys? Are you liars or stupid? Inter- interesting. I, and I don't know the answer. Yeah. It, uh, uh, it's, why can't you be both? Interesting. You know, it's an interesting way of putting it, Kevin. Stupid people lie. Badly. And uh, the Loop <laughs> in Amelia Island is a great restaurant. Yeah, I'll leave okay. it at that. The Loop. the Loop in Blue, even though okay. I don't like blue cheese on burgers or any of that stuff. But it is an interesting way of thinking of it, right? It's either, well, you BS'd me or you BS'd me a different way. And and I think there was always the thought from a lot of fans that they're interested. And then here comes the commas at their price. And that's the part that always gets left off. And you know what? Bill Belichick has been guilty of that, too, where it's the, well, yeah, well, I wouldn't be interested in someone like that. And it's like, well, the money goes through the roof, and then it should have been the at my price. Nobody boos Kraft. Nobody boos Wick. I don't know about Jeremy Jacobs. I can't remember the last time I saw him. But he, John Henry should be as beloved as both those guys well, for you, what he brought and, you know and the what? amount of money that he spent to get championships here when nobody else could do it. And here's the thing that the Bruins at least got right. They made Cam Neely president of the organization because to the rank and file truck driving pond hockey playing Bruins fan, that is a guy they want to remember fondly. That's somebody that, hey, that's a Bruin, right? You can hear, you know, Lanny, a guy out there with Lanny voice. Yeah, Cam Neely, he represents me. That's a Bruin. Okay, so the Red and, Sox need to do the same thing. But there you go, and that's the Who thing. is it? And maybe that is, well, look. Who I know what it is. To have someone go in and be the president of the organization – and be involved in finance and all different kinds of planning. And who knows? Maybe there are times where Neely's just like, hey, this guy runs this department. He's the smartest guy in the room here. Want, tell me what we should do. Let me consult, and we'll go from there. And that way it's kind of his decision. But I think with Cam, it is the plausible deniability of when he stands there, visually you're not, here's that effing Cam Neely. Whereas I think from some Red Sox fans, you cannot fans, bring yourself to do that. Here's this effing Sam Kennedy. Well, see, no fault of Sam's because he's hired to be in that role. But I think there's none of that athletic connection. Whereas if David Ortiz were the president of the Red Sox, it would take people a long time to get sick of whatever sort of team BS he's rolling out there because he's big poppy and everybody see, wants to love the guy. I, I would say, you know, I, I do like that angle. You know, Sam is a great guy. He's he's a great guy. Yep. He, sometimes he's put in some real difficult situations, oh. but he's listen. He's a great guy. Um, but I do I I, I kind of like that you know that angle. If you were to find the equivalent of Cam Neely to almost protect the owner, who is you know an absentee, right? Who would it be? Like, who would it be? Who has the amount of street cred, history? In reputation, who do you think would be the right person to take on that job? Oh, man. I think that's a real – I feel like that's a real solution. Well, the money is a part of it as well from this standpoint. If you're in big league baseball and you're a made man, like a David Ortiz. Sure. You've probably made some money and you might not need the job, mm-hmm. right? Whereas with Cam Neely – yeah, I'm sure he had a, a nice, healthy chunk of dough, but he's also making really good dough in the role that he is in right now. Mm-hmm. He played in an era where it wasn't tens of millions of dollars, so maybe there was a little bit of the, hey, this helps me pad the bank account, I stay in hockey, all that kind of stuff. If you're finding someone in baseball like that... Hey, it's uh, Lou. Unless it is somebody now... Th- I, perfect. I was just going to say, I was I was hoping that you would say Lou Merloni. Well, because it makes you, it's got to be somebody who understands the business end. It's yep. got to be somebody, who, but it's also someone that the fans connect with. And the problem is, is that if you try to find someone on the Red Sox end that was as much a shining light as Neely was, might be difficult to do. See, I, I, I'm with you. So, like, and I honestly, God, I, I you know. I think Lou would be fabulous because he does connect. He is from here. He's passionate. He played on the team. And if Lou was in that situation, like I think he would have handled it differently. Mm-hmm. I think he would have said, hold on, you crazy, you crazy sons of bitches. 
let me explain to you what is going on because mm-hmm. you're all emotional and none of you can think rationally about what is going on. Let me and let me feel better about it. I do think there would be some. Ah, oh, he's one of us. He gets it. I trust him. Right? Yeah. And and and, and not that you don't. It. Not that you don't trust Sam. But I do think it's different. Well, everybody I knows do. his role. Now. I know. So it's obviously and, and, and like he's always going to try and sugarcoat it and make sense of it and try to politic his way through it. Mm-hmm. And he does a good enough job. But I think people see through it as like, oh, you're just you're just talking for the man. There you go. Lou, and when you Lou don't would, hear from the man, yeah, and there Lou you go. would, you, he, Lou would provide you with a little bit more street cred, which will get you out of these jams. I'm just saying, like, listen, I know he's, he's doing nesting games, he's doing games here. Like, that would be the first thing. If I was the Red Sox, the first thing I would do would call him up and say, how soon, Lee, can we, can we hire you to work for us? Can you imagine hearing, ladies and gentlemen, press conference at Fenway Park today at Glorious. 3 o'clock with uh, Mego and Arcan, <laughs> where Lou Marloni will be named the co-president uh, of the Boston hey, Red Sox. I'm telling you. And then hey, uh, <laughs> do it. And then we we but neither I didn't tell we didn't talk about this before, but that is the one thing they're missing. Yep. If you because you're right. Like uh Ortiz, when, I, when you see uh, Cam, Dustin Pedroia, I would say a guy like Chris Sale when he's done could easily speak to that, but like he wants to do it. But but Lou is similar to that role. Listen, never won a championship as a player. No. Just missed. Just missed. Save right? Pedro from uh, Gerald Williams. Yep. That is a big deal in Red Sox Nation. But that's the thing. It's also somebody who kind of understands the business end of it as well. I don't know if Neely is completely versed in hockey money, let's say, just in terms of what's coming in from the league, the collective bargaining deals, things like that. But he doesn't like, have I don't to, think, right? But that's the thing is that – a, a part he of his role people. is to be aware. Yeah. No, he speaks for management, but, but to he the people. feels like uh, that's what it is. I, he speaks for management to the people, and the people accept it. He's a translator. When Sam <laughs> speaks to the people, it is, we don't connect with you. You represent someone that we never see. All you are is this, and it allows people to form their opinion right or wrong. Whereas with Cam, you're like... I didn't like what he said, but do you remember in 91 when? Yeah. And yeah. that's when it's, ah, give me yeah. the peanut he's butter hardcore. and everybody goes nuts. He's hardcore, too. He doesn't take no junk from nobody. Nah, there's, no, you know he's what? one of us. You, you give him respect. Hey, stop your booing. Lou's speaking here. Go can, ahead, Mr. Maloney. Can you Maloney. imagine that? That would be, that would be awesome. Lou comes First, up. He's like, shh, guys, guys, hold on. And he starts talking like Lynn. Is We're the, not really sure what to do. Is the first press conference <laughs> at like the Framingham Elks Club? Oh, it's at Framingham where Bakery. They, where was it where he was walking down by? He made the team and they got the whole, oh, his family's oh, there. The, and oh, he's wearing yeah. those corduroy dungarees like that are like four sizes Club too big. of America or something like that. Billy Everybody, smiling. shut up. Bill, <laughs> Billy smiling because he remembers those. They got Lou White. Yeah. He had like the white shirt on. It yeah. was like the real thick corduroy yeah. pants back yeah. in the day. Yeah. That's where it'll be. With his horn, with his Italian <laughs> horn. Hey, yo, yeah, yo, guys, what are we doing here, huh? Uh, yo, yo, what's up? Uh, by the way, Lou is going to be a uh, part of our baseball coverage here on Gresham Absolutely. Fourier. And, uh, and, and then, unless the Red Sox snatch him up and, and make you him know part what? of their front office. And if they do, we get Even a front better. office report. Absolutely. <laughs> Pick a little bit of both. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> are you done? Brings it home next. 93.7 WEEI. Boston Sports Arena.
Time for. Are you done? Are, are you done? Are you done? Are you done? You done, right? You done, right? Are you done? Are you done? On Crash and Fourier. Are You Done is brought to you by Unified Office. If you run a business, you know the rough impact the labor shortage can have on your customer's phone experience. Unified Office specializes in keeping businesses from losing income and customer calls and revenue. Learn more at unifiedoffice.com. Billy Lanny, are you done? I am not done. So this is a story out of Cumberland, Rhode Island. Ooh. Yep. It's a rich part of Rhode Island. Yep. So the, uh, Ooh, is the, it? It's one of it's the... Like country life They got there. some money, though. So they received a handwritten letter from a young girl partially eaten cookies and carrots and this girl requesting a dna test that santa claus and the reindeers <laughs> did in fact eat the cookies and carrots uh, that she left behind well wait you how know. old is this little girl it doesn't give an age just as a yeah, just as a young girl young girl she still knows the spirit of christmas it doesn't matter what age right handwritten letter you could be you could be like elf you could be 50 years old and still have the spirit of Christmas in you, this Christian. Is this is What's true. wrong with you? Yeah, in your letter, I took, I a, I took a sample the of the of cookie Christmas. and carrots that I left for Santa and the reindeer on Christmas and, and was wondering if you could take a sample of the DNA <laughs> to see if Santa is real. Can well, they would have to have, that? in order to match it, they would actually have to have Santa's DNA. Well, that's correct. why. Well, I got to it's on file. Well, that's why you they can. it's on file. Well, yeah, I mean, somebody that famous has got to be this fingerprints everywhere. Well, he that, wears white it, gloves. Yeah, but at least one of those houses, that the white gloves came off. Yeah, that's a good call, too. The white gloves might make it the tough. The white gloves. See, that's the thing is that you yeah, can Santa do it. Santa can't mess with Santa. You can do it and humor this little girl, but <laughs> also be like, hey, we didn't have anything that matched in our system. And then she'll go watch a bunch of Law and Orders and realize what that means. You know what would be really funny? Actually, no, it wouldn't. I'm not even going to say it. Are you going to be mean to a child no, who say, just has the spirit wanna, of Christmas? If you, like, your parents, if you want to teach her a lesson, you got to have some fat guy, some, you know, like, hey, man, kid over here. Hey, you keep your mouth shut. <laughs> you know, Never like, get roughed up by the guy in a Santa suit. <laughs> Go get a mall Santa and have hey, the corner hey, listen, Soprano oh, style. Hey, nobody wants to. Nobody needs the truth. You hear me, kid? That's now beat it. Oh, you break one of her toes. Break one of her toys. <laughs> not her toes. One of her toys in yeah. front of her. It's more where this came from. Hey, Are listen, kid, I'll snap your favorite you pencils. Yeah. You Stop done? turning stones over, kid. Exactly. Terp, are you done? I'm not done real quick, so I don't know if you guys caught this during the Giants-Eagles game, the chains. How you, they broke the chains, and they brought out an extra set of chains that were all tangled up and just not ready to go. Like Christmas lights. How are you not ready to go in a playoff game, and you're worth how many billion dollars in the NFL? Well, all right. Let's be fair, though. Like, the extra sticks are probably just kind of laying down on the side, or they're in some equipment room. Well, they're in that, some shed somewhere. Yeah, and then they yeah. use masking tape to fix it. <laughs> that That's the best part about it. Uh, they used mat. What? Use white Masking tape. tape. No, they fix you use the chains. They, yes. like, they use like athletic tape. Yes, to fix the chains. Where the hell is Phil Swift in this you didn't situation? Catch this? You mean to tell me how come uh, there ain't no flex? There's no flex tape there for them to be able to make sure that this thing doesn't pull Phil apart. Steel. They brought the second pair of chains tape. out, and they couldn't get them unraveled, so they just taped together the old chains. For a playoff game. I mean, is that legal? Is that like the exact length of what I'm it assuming? Be? Um, where was this in Philly? This was the Philly game. That's about right. Considering that turf well, at one point in time was so bad that players refused to play on it, that's about not right anymore. for them down No, not anymore. not anymore, but still. Are you done? Are, are you done? Are you done? I am done. Foye, are you done? Uh, real quick, no, I'm not. Uh, uh, Sunday, uh, Gronk is doing the, uh, he's like one of like 1,500 people on set at Fox. It's unbelievable. It's amazing how many professional former athletes they have back there. But I thought this was interesting. I don't even know if he said the name right or not, but he's talking about a coach, and listen to the way he call, says his last name. Their offense is the real deal, led by head coach Nick Sirianni and offensive coordinator Shane Spikeman. <laughs> it's why. <laughs> It's the t- All right, let He's me ask you this. Spike Man. All right, hold on. I'm going <laughs> to ask like a you. Superhero. All right, so Shane <laughs> Spikeman is not this gentleman's name. Uh, his first name is Shane, but I'm going to ask Fourier to pronounce the last there. name of the Philadelphia is Shane who? Uh, Steichen. There you go. Close enough. And what is it? I think it's Shane Spikeman. Shane Spikeman. <laughs> How great is that? It's like Jay Spikeman coming to get you. In the words of in the words of Seinfeld, it's like an ice cream man named Cone. Uh, it's so funny. <laughs> are you like, done? Are, 
Are you done? Oh, yes. Are you done? I am done. Oh, you're we done, too? Are, done. are you done? Oh, yeah, that's I feel it. like we hijack are you done, and you never get to play at the end. I'm totally okay with you that. You sure? Yeah. I feel like we might have to reverse it. No. Like, maybe. You sure? If I got something big, I'll get in there. Uh, you'll, but otherwise, you'll shoehorn it in there? Otherwise, it's time for us to go. Tom Kern will be with us tomorrow. We'll have a Celtics game to recap, and uh, maybe a little bit of the uh, five- or 15-minute football nerd. Who knows Ooh. what we choose. Turp and Billy produced it. If something went wrong, blame them. Marlone. Oh, I mean, excuse oh, me. Oh, I did it finally. Oh, I got who one. Got who won? Mega. Well, you said it would happen within a week, and it's been yeah, two and a half. So, okay. uh, Mego and Arcand are coming up next. Hey, it's Lou. <laughs> Fourier, that's the new president of the Boston Red Sox. Uh, Fourier and I will see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. Don't. Are you are, are you done? Are you done? Okay, okay. Are you done? You done, right? You done, right? Are you done? Are you done? Okay, okay. 937 W E E I I want you to call them.
Welcome in, Sports Radio, WEEI. And before we even begin the show today, Megan, uh, I should tell you, I have worked uh, with a lot of different people in my life. In a lot of different studios? I've come on the air after people, uh, Mike Adams, Scott Zoll. I mean, you know, lots lots of different people of varying hygiene. This is the most foul, rancid, Think I've ever walked it. Adams, I'm serious. Like to walk to walk into this today. I thought some someone or something died in here. What happened? It's disgusting. This in is here. this is it preposterous. Is this is this is like unhealthy. Smell. It's the worst smell. We're just sitting in it and it's attaching itself to us. You brought a trash can over next I'm, to you. I, seriously, on the Twitch chat, I might vomit. I honestly, I've never experienced anything like this. This is hazardous in my life. workplace. We we walked in. It's a biohazard. And I here. screamed. <laughs> and and Terp looked up and was like, what's happening? And I asked, what happened in here? Because to be fully transparent, oh. we've been walking into this studio recently. And it's just been smelling like farts. Like all with the new show lineup <gasps> that Fourier and Gresh just sit in here and fart. Like, I'm pretty sure that's what they do for four hours. I think they just, like, have, like, a contest. <laughs> Today? To see who can crap their pants harder, because that's what it smells like right now. <laughs> it's so disgusting in here. We found out Fourier proudly made Brussels sprouts in the kitchen, brought them in here, ate them in here, and then, I don't and know. And then he's trying to lose pooped weight. Pooped them out. <laughs> <laughs> then he metabolized them remarkably fast. You know how, like, you around yeah. something that smells eventually you get used to it? I'm not getting used to it. No. Like, I'm not, it's, it's wor- like, every second it makes it worse. It's like, That's it's fun. like a chemical attack <laughs> is what smells, it feels like. It smells like a hundred dead rats have just been, you know, beached out of the ocean <laughs> no, legitimately at, thought at low tide. Something died in that studio. Because I was in there Sunday morning and it did not smell like that. I was... Uh, just over 24 hours, oh. I was in that studio doing radio with Chris Scheim. No scents, no odors, no nothing. Walk in there today, it legitimately smells like a rat died in there. It's like and then my we eyes figured are it out. Fourier nuked his Brussels sprouts. God bless him. He's trying to lose weight. It smells like dead carcasses in there. It is disgusting. That's, I went this out is in the hallway. all time stuff. I went out in the hallway, and I was like, I'm about Fourier, to go out in the hallway. What? the hell happened in here and he told me oh you don't want the you don't want to start a war you don't want to start this i'm like start what dude the, the great mark mingles is here who takes care of our thank building you. he's mark, got toss me that bottle got he's spray got some spray right over here oh lysol thank you thank you very much uh this is thank i mean you. listen is it like an odor you got any eater? febreze out there that'd be great too uh i'm gonna i honestly like i'm gonna freebase this <laughs> and it's so gnarly in here <sighs> I don't, you know, like I'm, I'm pretty, these things I've, I've lived, you know, I'm a guy. I've lived in nasty apartments before. I've lived with people who were uh, not the greatest hygiene, but this is, this Hi, is. My name is Asshat. I mean, my <laughs> God, my God. <clears throat> I have a dog at home right now who has diarrhea <laughs> and it is nothing compared to what is happening in this studio right now. It is. I, got, I don't think Guantanamo Bay is like this. We need to push through it. This is. I don't disgusting. know if I. I honestly don't know if I can do this. This is joke. an <laughs> issue. I need Ken. I need Ken to address this issue. Ken Laird, please address this issue immediately. We need a memo out to the company. You no more Brussels sprouts. Whatever happened today in the midday show can oh. never happen again. 
Yeah, ever, we need ever, like ever. A, we need a manager's meeting or something, and we have to address this. Uh, whatever, whether it's the two of them ripping ass in here or the uh, Brussels sprout situation, the combination of the two. This is this is an unhealthy working environment. That's I mean that's the only that's the only thing I can say. Uh, thank you. Four is in oh, here with yeah. the Febreze. Yeah, now. like that's gonna go far. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, he who uh, committed the crime, <laughs> however that thing goes. Where, where did you get that Febreze? Okay, stop. It I'm not. Barely, I'm not it being barely dramatic. Barely smells in here. I'm not being dramatic. And that is the cost of all your mocking and your shaming over the past year about how fat I was. So now I'm trying to lose weight, and you're shaming me for it. That's not right. No, 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 no. I'm not shaming you for losing weight. Well, Mega is shaming me for I it. Like, I have to eat vegetables. If this is what we have to deal with, I'd rather you be record, fat. Oh. I, didn't fi- I didn't fart once. Oh, sure. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. I didn't fart once. Sure. I will admit, <laughs> walking in here, it did smell a little bit. Oh, a little, a little bit? bit? Oh, I wonder a why. I think bit? I was used to it. Uh, the glass my studio it is smells, foggy. It, it smells like you? someone dug up a casket and opened it in the studio. Yeah, like the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what, and like that's what killed everybody. And like 70 fell out. I don't know, I'm sorry, you, want me to keep, you guys want to keep this? Yes, I would yes. like to keep this that, This actually made it worse. I don't know. At least it's masking, the Febreze is masking it somewhat. Oh, it's dead animals okay, and flowers. Awesome. Yeah, sorry. right. You spray a line of Febreze in the Just table. Just never again. Snort it up right now. This one's I can't, for free. I cannot promise... Anything. No, I need you to promise it right yeah, now, Christian. I can't eat fish. Ugh. I can't eat Brussels sprouts. You tell me what's These allowed to eat. These are basic common what, what, what is office a, What are things. you allowed to eat? Tell me. What is, give me a list of have things you're allowed to eat. Have a peanut butter sandwich. That's too many carbs. I have to eat really lean foods that with not a lot of carbs and not okay, a lot of like how about anything. step one? Don't get fat in the first place. That's you okay. do this Again, every year. See what she does? I'm going, to, I'm going to HR right now to complain about <laughs> I'm you going to HR to complain complained. about the smell. Oh, you can't, you can't get complain. in line. I open this a bag of hazardous. chips. I open a bag of chips. When you open chips, don't you? You they, open you white cheddar popcorn. That's that's right. Now it smells like white cheddar, great. Brussels sprout popcorn. I like the smell of chips. You're ruining that for me now. Yeah. Oh, sorry, guys. I don't want to tell you. Just this is get kind of, out of here. This is kind of the smelly this is Brussels kind of the way your life is going to be for a while now. Why? Because I have to be eating do like this every you? single we day. We will do our show Whenever in the other show, studio. You're have this. We'll do, do our it, show in the other studio. Do, I'm sorry. You we guys might do it. We might do it. If it's going to be like this, like nobody can work like this. Did you or did you not soil your pants today? I didn't fart once. I told you. No, that's, that's not what I asked you. That's, that's not what I asked you. How are you soiling your pants if you're not farting? That's a lie. I'm sorry. You guys are so much better you than didn't me. Fart you're once skinny. On air today? You're in shape. Sometimes you, know, you gamble on you a dart and it goes fart. south. You know, you just you never fart. You don't eat anyway, so I don't know what the big deal is. <laughs> but here we go again. Eat a burger, Mango. How about that? <laughs> So that's true, Fourier. People look at me and you and say, wow, that guy, the other guy's in shape, not you. <laughs> that's what they say when they look at the two of us. Thoughts um, and prayers to your car. Uh, and to your intestinal system. My goodness. Uh, let me let me just say, all right, as someone who's gambled on a fart and lost before, you know. What, I think what that, is that story? I think that may be what happened with Fourier. He says, I didn't fart. I believe him. Because what, what happened what in here wasn't a fart. Him. I believe him. I think he actually uh, made. It was a fart <laughs> with an S-H. Exactly. I, think I he, don't know if we I can think say he that made on air, here so. is what happened. I don't think you can say that either, but I think that's what it is. And as as has been said many times, if you won every time, it wouldn't be called gambling. So I think what happened is he gambled on a fart and lost, and we had to deal with it when, he, when we came in here. That's, that's my theory, and I'm sticking with it. Anyways. It smells like there was one day when I was uh, getting a ride with my friend to high school, and she accidentally <laughs> ran over part of a deer carcass Ooh. that had been out for like two days on uh-huh. the side of the road, or like on, in the lane of the road, and she drove with this dead, just rotting animal attached to the complete underneath of her car. And even that was smell it bad. coming through the vents. That's what this smells like. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one time at a bar I was working in, a rat died in the vents. And so all the air coming through the vent <laughs> picked up the scent of this dead rat. That would be and refreshing blew it into the bar. the studio that, in there. If so that happened right now, I would be right up next to the thing like... <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, like someone who was like trapped in like a, you know, like you be like, mm, am I in a cedar closet? It oh, I'd be breathing it in, in like it was oxygen, and I'm drowning. I'd be like, yes, thank you. For God. people who are like, you're making too big of a deal out of this. We're not. We're in a windowless room. Yeah. In a sub basement, like there is nowhere for this air to go. Mm-mm. This is our life now. Yeah. And this is the last week that we have. Without a vulture infestation coming into the building. Oh, that's right. I'm not going to have to come in here as much. This is the last week without... This is like burning my nose. Jones joining. So this was supposed to be like the feel-good week. 
And now we sit in here and it's just like ass central. <laughs> this is And not in a good way. <laughs> No, Ass Central is usually a really happy place to be. I love it. This is a yeah. sad place. Ass Central is my I'm favorite. very sad about how bad it smells in that studio. Yeah, this is rough. Uh, this is rough. I'll tell you what. <laughs> I got, these, now these I know how the, John Henry felt on Friday night. Just so, yeah, we'll get to that in a second. Fourier, and I'm I'm not going to like set these parameters for anyone else, but Fourier is not allowed to eat Brussels sprouts, fish, or broccoli, because I know that's where he's going next. He microwaved fish last week, and I park on the top floor, and I can smell it as soon as I walked through the reception area. That's, that's again. two flights of stairs that the scent has traveled. And he's like, oh, what? I can't cook fish. No, in no office in America is it okay to do that. Okay, so is it okay to sea microwave fish? fish? Sea Who? Fish. Sea fish. You're not allowed to. No, that's just, I mean, that's basic common courtesy. Tomorrow, we're going to come in, and he's going to be eating, like, raw eggs. <laughs> <laughs> like some kind of from. egg salad. Well, we sell a big ham. He's going to have egg salad and asparagus is what you know he's going to have tomorrow. We're all ripping on uh, Fourier here, but Gresh was in here too. Okay? No, Gresh was like very sheepishly like, I never eat in studio. And I was like, Gresh, Maybe he sweet, wasn't eating in sorry, sweet Gresh, angel Gresh, I'm not accusing you of anything. I'm asking why you didn't say anything while it was happening. Mm. Like, you were a witness. Yeah. You were an accomplice, essentially. You I let think so. this happen. And if he was in here, you know, in cut, a court of law, too. he has some responsibility. That is aiding, aiding and, and abetting. abetting. That's exactly there right. He was aiding and abetting uh, Fourier's funk. I understand he's trying to make his new radio partner feel comfortable and confident in everything, but you give him an inch, he's going to go a mile with this. I can't believe how bad it smelled when we walked in here. I'd, it's, I'm starting to get a little better now because of the Lysol and the Febreze and everything, but, like, you can still, there's still, like, undercurrents of it. You know, there's still, like, a, a, a faint scent I'm in the air. I'm worried that when I go home this evening, this is what I'm going to smell like. Yeah, like the, like B, the gonna, Seinfeld with the B.O., remember? Yes! <laughs> yes, with the car, yeah. the bad car smell. <laughs> That's what this then is. Then they can't get it off themselves. Yes, it's going to, like, guys, I have long hair. It's going to attach itself in my hair. It's going to be in my skin. Ken, we need to have we need to have an entire station meeting. Um, I, know, I think Ken's going to lunch with those guys right now. Oh God, they're having Brussels sprouts. <laughs> Brussels sprout, <laughs> all you can eat Brussels sprouts. Uh, well, that's great. Anyways, we have, I believe it or not, a lot to get to today. If our brains aren't completely uh, fried by the uh, by the smell in here, and we'll start with winter weekend out in Springfield with the Red Sox because why not? You know, it was uh, it was an interesting weekend. I likened it to uh, Woodstock, but if Woodstock went backwards, like the first Hold night, on. Woodstock, uh, how is this bad like Woodstock. Woodstock? It was like Woodstock, it was like Woodstock ninety nine, like Woodstock ninety nine. Like okay. the first night was like the last night of Woodstock ninety nine. All the porta potties were on fire and people were screaming and bathing in their own filth and all that that was the first night and then after that it got chiller and like saturday was actually okay but uh the way that thing started and the open forum for red sox fans to voice their displeasure with the front office with high and bloom with uh, ownership and everybody else let's just say they took full advantage of that and uh, made their voices heard we'll get to uh, what was said how the ownership group tried to put lipstick on the pig that has been the uh, last year and off season of the boston red sox and we'll get get to uh, the explanation that we got from High and Bloom the next day and from Sam Kennedy as well. The reactions to it, maybe even more of the story. So we'll get to all of that. We'll get to your phone calls as well. 617-779-7937. We also got a ton of division weekend stuff to get to as well. It's all coming up next here on Sports Radio WEEI. Now, here's what's trending on WEEI. Trending now is brought to you by Awaken 180 Weight Loss. You have your AFC and NFC Championship games. Hey, they have been set. The 49ers, they are going to be in Philadelphia Sunday at 3 p.m., which will be followed by the Bengals in Cincinnati by six thir- at, at 6.30. I think Arkin just went in the hall and vomited. Uh, Tony Pollard, he was carted off the field after suffering a fractured left fibula in the Cowboys game last night. Meanwhile, Patrick Mahomes ended up staying in the game after he was rolled up on in the first quarter. Mahomes has a high ankle sprain, but he is expected to play, according to Jeremy Fowler. Now, Burt Breer had an interesting little nugget over the weekend. Uh, He tweets that Patriots linebackers coach Gerard Mayo was alongside Bill Belichick for all of New England's offensive coordinator interviews last week, according to sources, which, as Burt Breer writes, is a good sign of Mayo's growing role with the team. The Bruins, well, they win again because that's all they do. They won 4 nothing over the Sharks yesterday. Linus Olmark has become the fastest goaltender in NHL history to reach 25 wins in a season. The Bruins are in Montreal on Tuesday. Tomas Noshek, he is expected to miss a few weeks with a non-displaced fracture in his left foot. 
Mark McLaughlin has been called up from Providence to take his place. And it looks like the Celtics are going to be without Marcus Smart and Malcolm Brogdon tonight in Orlando. They tip off at 7 o'clock. Smart left the Raptors game with a right ankle sprain. Rob Williams, he is also questionable. He also left that Raptors game after Jalen Brown fell into his leg. Trending Brown, Trending Brown, Trending Now is brought to you by Awaken 180 Weight Loss. Now, sure, hunger suppressants, fasting, or a cleanse can help you lose weight quick, but is it sustainable? You know the answer. All you have to do is make the call, and of course, you make the call to Awaken 180 Weight Loss. I'm Ryan Garvin. That is what is trending now on WEI, and we review the pandemonium and all the chaos that happened at Winter Weekend with the Boston Red Sox brass, and we do it right after this. W-E-E-I. 93.7 WEI.
Concerns to fans who say, "Why aren't you at the top if the prices are at the top?" Yeah. I think the the, the most uh, informed thing I can say is that it's expensive to have baseball players to have the best. Sports Radio, W-E-E-I, it's Arcan, it's Mego, we're here with you until 6 o'clock, and that was just a small sampling of what you heard if you were there Friday night out in Springfield. Just a short hop, skip, and a two-hour drive away from Fenway Park, <laughs> winter weekend out there. It was, uh, I was there for Saturday, I had my Saturday show from 1 to 4. Well, it was really 115, 120 to 4, because David Ortiz sat down with Ken and Curtis right before their show ended, and rather than, you know... Stick to a schedule or something. You let you let Big Poppy talk as long as he wants to. Um, but I got to talk to Hyam. I got to ask him about that. Um, I also spoke with Tanner Houck and Chris Martin, newest Red Sox. And all in all, I thought that second day was a pretty fun, chill, kind of more of what you expect when you think of Red Sox winter weekend. You don't expect a room full of angry people all heckling and jeering uh, the front office. I mean, I'm sorry. Like, that was that was a new one. I, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting expect that, that to have. No, not at this thing. The type of people who go to these things aren't the type of people who generally do that. That's in my experience, which isn't, you know, that big. But, like, there's been other bad years. There's been other bad seasons, and they still, you know, sit down and face the music, and they never at a winter weekend festival with, you know, kids trying to steal home, and they had that thing where you throw two pitches, and then you guess the speed on the third one, and you win a prize, and I was always good at that when I was a kid because I had a little noodle arm. I could only throw, like, 30 miles an hour, so I knew my I knew my number. But, uh, you know, they had that. They had, like, a little uh, – um, it was like uh, – uh, there was someone pitching, but it was like a small baseball field, and kids were you know hitting with a uh, with one of those like foam bats. Wiffle was, ball. It wasn't it wasn't, it wasn't wi- like wiffle ball though. No, no, because the bats were like made out of foam, and there was these like it was those plastic. When balls the kids full of like holes. got a hit, did they yell like? Screw John Henry! <laughs> no. Like, run for first. No, that was all... I mean, it was all very uh, family-friendly and sort of PG the next day. But, man, that Friday night was unlike anything I've ever uh, experienced. And I didn't even experience it. Just watching the videos was uh, really something else. Coop, you were there Friday night, right? I, I was there So what all did, the awkwardness. What did people miss who maybe just saw the videos? So it, it starts out, they introduce all the players and whatnot that are there for the, the weekend. They get them off stage, and then they bring on this town hall. And John Henry was never slated to be there. No one knew he was going to be there. Hmm. And I don't know if that was the catalyst or just him being there, period, was the catalyst. Because as soon as he comes out, you know, they they announce Jared Crabb as you know, Tom Karen as the mediators, uh, Alex Cora, big applause. John uh, Henry, or it went Heim Bloom, Sam Kennedy, John Henry, mm-hmm. and the booze just got like progressively worse, <laughs> and, and you, they couldn't stop it. I mean, Jared Carabas, he's he's he is what he he is. Carab, I mean, he was just sitting there like yeah, yeah. And, and, <laughs> no, and kudos to him and Tom yeah. Karen because they asked legitimate questions. Yeah. Well, I don't think it. I would say ninety nine point five percent of fans have zero problem with either of those guys. Yeah, right. they're the media guys who one of them at least is a huge fan. So, and, uh, suckered into this situation like anybody else. And Red Sox PR and Sam Kennedy, they they always know what they're doing. So bringing them up up on stage, 
they, I, they're like sacrificial lambs. Yeah. Like, and, and, you can't be mad at TC and Carabas. No. And, and I think that's what they were hoping for, to stifle some of that, which now makes me kind of believe they were expecting the booze. But I don't think anyone was expecting how bad it ended up being. It was blood in the water. Was um, it just supremely awkward? Yeah, because you would get the booze, and then it would kind of settle down. Because like Arkan said, it, it's mostly like season ticket holders that are buying these tickets. Paying customers who yeah, were there. Yeah, it, it's like $90 for the weekend. Yeah, it was $50 for a day and like $90 for the, for the two days. Yeah, you're right. So, I mean, that's not that's not cheap, you know? No, <laughs> like, and, yeah. and, I think a lot of people would pay $90 to be able to boo John Henry in person. Mm. I think that's what it ended up being. Like Everyone I talked to, they all said the price of admission was worth it just for Friday night. It, <laughs> and like it eventually settled down. And they would they were able to articulate some of the questions and whatnot, but you would always have someone just chime in and yell like Dave Dombrowski, Xander Bogarts, Theo Epstein, and it would just it would put a pause to everything, and Heim Bloom would just froze. Bloom it, couldn't get a sentence out in no, the beginning. I'm very interested to see how because Nesson's supposed to be airing that tonight. I don't know how they're gonna cut that up. Like if they, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Was she there? I I wish she and was like, there. Hey, pipe down. She they would have brought speaker. her up on stage, and it would have settled everything. Um, it was. I'm thinking good. It was rough. Uh, Sam Kennedy, who the next day said that it was awesome, the reaction that they got, uh, had a lot to say about the Xander Bogart situation. But let's go ahead and start with that clip you just heard on the way in here. And that was John Henry, who was basically saying and was asked, you know, with uh, with ticket prices being so high, why do you keep letting all these players go? If you're going to charge this much, why uh, why why do these players keep walking out the door? Right. I mean, if you charge this much, you should spend money on the players. Here's what John Henry said. I think the the, the most uh, informed thing I can say is that it's expensive to have baseball players. To have the best... Stop it right there. It's expensive to have baseball players. Yes, John, it is. The question is... Since you're charging more than any other team in all of baseball, and I get it, you got a smaller park, but come I on. I understood the question. You're still you're you're doing that, and uh, and the players are still leaving. Okay, <laughs> like the players are still getting paid more to go play somewhere else, and you're concerned about luxury taxes and things like that. That's sort of the problem. But go on. It's expensive to have baseball players to have the best. Weird how they didn't like that answer, huh? So, I think I'm losing my Come on, guys! So, so what, what has enabled us over the years to be able to spend with the Yankees and the Dodgers and is, is your support. And that support is through ticket prices. It's, it's watching ticket this, prices? but a lot of it for us is ticket prices. Put a product on the field. Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's really important that we provide accessibility to Fenway. I mean, it, it, we cannot grow that next generation of fans without... Okay, people. stop it, because now is they that, start talking about Is that Heim or Kennedy? I believe that's Kennedy. That was Kennedy. Kennedy, and, Kennedy yeah, jumped in so Kennedy many times. Kennedy decides yeah. that when they're talking about ticket prices, that's the avenue that he's going to pivot towards? Yes, the $9 tickets for students and, uh, you know, cheaper price tickets, which go quickly when the team's good. And when the team's not good or probably easy enough to get, it's just they're not as uh, in high demand. That being said... That doesn't answer the question, and that certainly doesn't, uh, you know, stem the mob or anything. And I think that John Henry really was uh, taken aback by the reaction there. And now I sort of get why he doesn't like to show his face in public all that much. Not that I'm saying he's right here or anything, but you know, that's this is it. This is sort of what happens when you uh, when you when you duck out of of facing people eventually. It builds up, you know. It builds up over time, and then when you have a chance, when people finally have a chance to address you, it may not be, uh, may not be all sunshine and roses, you know. I'm sorry. I just think that might have been the worst answer he could have given. <laughs> it's expensive to pay baseball players mm -hmm. to field the team. That's your job as the owner. If you don't want to pay baseball players anymore, get out of the business. Sell it then. Like nobody's saying that you had to go and spend like the Mets. Or I don't think a lot of fans even want you to spend like the Yankees. But they don't want to see their favorite players get tossed out of town nonstop. They don't want to see between you and your general manager mismanaging contracts of guys who publicly say that they want to be here when you're worth $4 billion. Yeah. $4 billion. That's the estimated net worth of John Henry in 2023. 
It's actually up, estimated by Forbes. It has gone up since the pandemic. So all the stuff that they tell you about, oh, we lost so much revenue during the pandemic because nobody was watching the games and the season got all reshuffled and canceled and everything. And by the way, don't forget that they could have been the only product on sure. for a month during the pandemic, but they couldn't, they couldn't, the owners couldn't get anywhere with the players in terms of coming to an agreement. So they botched that. He has more money now than he did then. So I just don't understand how you sit there. And the answer is it costs too much. If it costs too much, fine like if you don't have the metabolism for it anymore fine don't say that to the fans who are showing up over the weekend because they want to find out what they are going to see this season get out of the business then i mean honestly what are you in it for one thing i can say is that it's expensive to have baseball players okay well that's good um that's the, so uh, bad. I'm. Am I totally off here? Christian? No, you're not off. You're not. That off is at all. such a bad answer. It's a bad said, answer. That's the. This is the most informed. Does he have media training? Say. No, no way. Are you, does that sound like a man that has media training? Has he ever seemed like he had media training? Like he just got up there and told on himself. Yeah. I grew up a fan of the St. Louis Cardinals. Oh yeah, stand the man. Um, the uh, other part of it that was upsetting to me was when he said, you know, if you want to spend with teams like the Yankees and the Dodgers, then you have. It. It's like, wait, wait a minute. Who's what you think you're spending with the Yankees and the Dodgers? Did, did the Yankees uh, lose Aaron Judge in free agency or did they offer him a record setting contract and keep him there? You know, the Dodgers may have lost a couple of players, but my God, between Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman and just a couple other guys there, you can tell that they're committed to spending money on that team. Like, don't compare yourself to those teams. You're not those teams. And the other thing is, like, you were over the luxury tax. tax. You just weren't spending money well. Like, you weren't. It's true. You went and you made the wrong deals. Um, and you couldn't keep the guy, the guy who wanted to be here. And then you had to toss a whole bunch of money a year early. But I'm not mad at the Raphael Devers deal. I'm not going to pretend like I am. But it's just like you mismanaged your money. And now you're mad and you don't want to spend more because you don't like the way it was spent before. But if that's the metabolism that you have, like if you've lost your taste for this, then just get out. Mm. Because you're in a town where people aren't going to sit there and say, oh, they don't want to spend money. Oh, that's okay. Love the park. The park is so pretty. You can get a cocktail at the park now. It's true. Like, that doesn't fly here. It flies if you're coming in from Indiana because you're on a ballpark tour with your son and you want to see Fenway in July. Okay, those people are always going to be there. What about your actual fans, the people who go to winter weekend? This is this is what they're feeling. Yeah, and they made that very, very clear. Uh, here's a little more from Sam Kennedy as they tried to avoid getting booed off the stage. We cannot grow that next generation of fans without people being able to, to get there. And we do have high ticket prices at the high end, um, mostly corporations and businesses that buy, whether it's luxury boxes or lower box seats. But we also have $9 tickets oh for every God. single game, for every student anywhere in New England to come to Fenway Park. Uh, losing them again. And that's really important. We have to make Fenway Park accessible, um, and it's it's critical that our fans know that the revenues that we generate go to two places. They go into player payroll, into the product on the field, and they go into Fenway Park, preserving, protecting, and enhancing Fenway Park. And we are very, very appreciative. Hold on, stop it right there for a second. Did you hear like three different guys all at the same time go, yeah, in your pocket. Yeah, Statler and Waldorf <laughs> Right there, there in your pockets where the money goes, huh? <laughs> and, and enhancing Fenway Park. And we are very, very appreciative of the best man base in all baseball. And we understand why people are restless. Uh, and that's what makes this market uh, Is, Are you really going to say that's what great. makes this market great? Okay, thank you. Sam Kennedy the next day said that it was awesome getting booed like that, um, which I thought was... How yeah. come you suck? Okay. All right, Sam. <laughs> whatever, whatever you got to do to uh, to get through the thing. I will give them credit for this. They're the only uh, team in town that does things like this, and they're the only one, and they all stood there and they took it. So, I mean, at the very least, you can say that about them. You know, you may not have liked their answers. You may not have liked the offseason. You may not have liked anything that they've done here. But at the very least, they let people throw tomatoes at them for, you know, an hour on Friday night. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's a step up from some of the other uh, ownership groups in town, I would say. Not that I think everyone has to do this. Okay. But when there's a bad offseason, they face the music, Silver right? Lining, Mega. A lot Come of on. people, a lot of the ownership, they won't face the the music for something like that it's like you'll never hear bill belichick the and the crafts sit crime. down and do that i mean they're not going to do something like oh, that oh good I, I, okay so they had the transparency to be there yeah 
great. Absolutely. That's gonna that's gonna make this season awesome. I'm not mad. Anymore. I'm not saying like, it makes the season good. I'm just saying Bill Belichick's not doing that. Bill Belichick, after a disappointing, crappy season, isn't going to stand up there in front of the fans and let them all rip him and say what they want to say. You know what I mean? Robert like that's Kraft not. Will. I don't think so. Is Robert he Kraft made do town halls like this? At his owner's meeting. Okay, but do they have town halls with like this where uh, people buy tickets and can go in there and uh, say whatever they want? Like I don't think so. Like, I think this is a unique thing for the Red Sox, which again, you know, doesn't and excuse I wouldn't give what's him going too on much here. Credit because this was essentially the first time that we heard from John Henry in what like. Four years? It's three true. years? Yeah. He doesn't so, talk to 2019 much. spring training, I believe. And he said that he doesn't feel like spending money anymore. Mm-hmm. That it's too expensive. It is. It's expensive to have a baseball team. <laughs> thing I can say. I didn't I realize hear- it was going to be so expensive to own the Boston Red Sox. Man, this is a money pit. Well, he like, did buy them do- for like, what, $120 million that's at the time? That's okay. That's mm-hmm. fine. Sell them then. Yeah. I, you them. got You got your return already. If that's how you feel. I mean, if that's if that's sort of what you're thinking, but it's not going to because despite, you know, what we're saying here and you're right and I'm right, you know, this isn't this isn't acceptable to uh, to Boston fans. But what the hell are you going to do about it other than pay fifty dollars to yell at him on a Friday night in January? Like there's nothing really else you can do. He owns the team. It still makes money and he's not just going to sell it because people around here want him to. He's got this big portfolio and he wants to make money. And that's what's going to happen. That's what's going to keep happening. So unfortunately, this is your only real (laughs) way to do it. I think that uh, ownership should lean into this. Like if they have another bad season and another bad offseason next year. Lean into like we're bad with our money. Have like a dunk tank, you know, like (laughs) Like when Roger Goodell walks out on stage. (laughs) People are booing him. He's like, yeah, come on. I can take it. Oh, is that oh, the do, best you got? Hey, do the whole Oprah on. thing and just be like, oh, and if you look under your chairs, tomatoes. <laughs> All right. Throw a pie in my face. Like, yeah, okay. Sure. Make it fun. Do you guys think that if ownership and management had been able to nail down something with Xander Bogarts and he was still with the team that they would have got this reaction or is this all just predicated on how bad they've been last year a hundred percent I think it was Xander Bogarts I, I, I agree I think happened. it completely changes it and I think that was very fresh on a lot of people's minds it's they've like, had bad seasons before you know they've had seasons where right. they came in last place before but the Bogarts thing 69 win season it's the this combo didn't of happen. the two that pushed it over the top I, I think, think it's the combination yeah well I, I mean it certainly didn't help that they lost too but if they had just won the World Series and Xander Bogarts got let go then I think that people would have been a little bit more you know they would have been mad but I don't think they would have been booing them uh, at, uh, at, the, at this thing but the fact that if, if it was just yeah it was probably the combination because it was just losing and losing a bunch of games people would still come to the thing they probably wouldn't boo if it was just losing Bogarts but they had won the World Series people would have been okay with that too they went and I liked that they'd have been okay with it this I mean there was no way that they were getting out of this one alive really I mean it was just uh it was a bloodbath up there it really was 617-779-7937 there's your phone number uh let's talk to Steve who is in somewhere in Massachusetts he was at winter weekend go ahead Steve yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. Uh, I got to give credit to the fans because they really kept the language clean, but um, they were not asked tough 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 questions. Hi, sorry, Bloom was not asked tough question. Uh, the owners not asked a tough question. I mean, all the questions they were asked from the fans were like scripted. I think they were handed in by the Red Sox and they were planted. Is that right, Coop? Were there planted questions? Thanks for the call, Steve. So they weren't planted, but they went around beforehand with uh, note cards, handed them out to fans with Sharpies, and they asked for people to write questions, and the ones okay. that they liked, they took up. It's not like people were just walking up to the mic and being like, I got something for you, Haim. You know, it's not like it's just people coming out of left field. They picked the questions. Yeah. And then they answered them poorly. <laughs> they did. They answered them poorly, and when they tried the answer, sometimes the crowd just wouldn't let them answer, including this from High and Bloom, uh, when uh, on Friday night explained the philosophy behind trading Mookie Betts. Listen to him try and get through this. One year away from free agency with a superstar player. And we, we didn't sign and I want to explain why, because it relates to where we're going. It relates to where we're going. We didn't sign up because when you make those bets, they're big bets. Stop it right there. He says he <laughs> says bets so many times. It's it's, it's like, like subconscious. You're for talking him. about Mookie bets, who everyone's mad about, and you keep saying bet. Like, oh god, I was cringing so hard when I heard this. He says the word bets like eight times, 
and it's just each time it gets worse and worse. You got to back up your bets, and the thing about bets is that bets are really big, and bets. <laughs> one thing about bets is that a bet's a bet, and it's like so. That's like a psychology thing where I think he just said it for the first time, heard the booze, and now he was just and then he just couldn't get out of bets. it. Yeah, yeah, he couldn't get out of uh, out of bets. So anyway, he keeps saying bets. We didn't sign up because when you make those bets, <laughs> they're big bets, and those bets. Those bets usually, now y'all know it. You guys are smart. Those bets are much better up front than Six. on the back end. We know that. Every team knows that when they're making those bets. Ah, stop it! But if you want to make that type of bet, you better be ready to back it up. You better be ready to surround that bet with a whole lot of talent, a whole lot of young talent, or you're not going to win. And you see it all the time in, that, in this game. You see it all the time. And I don't think anybody would disagree where the organization was. We just weren't ready to back up that bet. Ah! We got 10. There's 10 bets. He said bets 10 times. That's impressive. <laughs> Jesus. I got to be honest. That's impressive. Oh, Maron, come on. <laughs> what, do you th- what do you think? And also, the whole thing, like, where were we in 2019? Like, the, the, the team wasn't ready. You were one year removed from the yeah. best season you'd ever had in the history of the franchise. Ever. At the, all the way back to the 19th century. Like, that was the best team you ever had. Had. Look, I inherited a really bad product. <laughs> what can I say? God. I mean, please. Like, I understand. Maybe things weren't perfect. You didn't have that Do same you know roster, what the but prospects come on. Were like? My God. Really? <laughs> oh, that was that was tough. And you know, he can't go out there and say, and I know he probably wanted to, but he can't go out there and say, listen, I was told I have to get under the luxury tax, and there was no way I could have done that with uh, w- while extending Mookie bets at the same time. Maybe I that's traded. why John Henry showed up. Maybe to make sure he didn't say that. <laughs> hey, you watch your mouth up there. <laughs> He's just like shooting daggers at him anytime that he walks towards that line. I know, really. Um, there was more. We'll uh, we'll play some more of this as well. Six one seven 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 nine seven. 937. There's your phone number. We heard uh, from Haim and we heard from. When you make those bets. Stop saying bets for the love of God. Bets. Please stop and saying those bets. bets. Those bets. Those bets. Those bets are much better up than uh. making those bets. But if you want to make that type of bet, you're ready to back up that bet. Who's your favorite baseball player? Mookie Betts! Uh, we'll hear from Haim the next day and from Sam Kennedy the next day as well because they talked about the Xander Bogarts move, which really, I think we all agree, was the driving force behind all that vitriol and all the booing and yelling and heckling that you heard on Friday night. We'll get uh, Sam Kennedy and Haim Bloom's perspective on that move, or lack thereof, I should say, of uh, of Xander Bogarts going to San Diego, and we'll play it for you next. 93.7 WEEI, Boston Sports Original.
Yeah. Awesome. And uh, 617 779 7937 is your phone number. We're talking Red Sox winter weekend out in Springfield, which I was at, by the way. It took a while to get out there. I did a lot of driving for the station this week. Yeah. We had the Christmas party out there in Marlboro. We had That's winter true. weekend out in Springfield. <laughs> I logged a lot of hours in the car today uh, over the uh, over the course of the past week. Because there was some significant snow out that way, right? Well, it was while snowing on the way up. So I'm driving up there. I left at like 10 15. And it was snowing while I was driving up, so it routed me around 90 through, like, Carlton and, uh, uh, not Carl, Charlton, is that what it's called? What's the name of that town? Sturbridge. I don't know a single yeah, town. Yeah, Charlton there. and Sturbridge and all those towns, you know, up no on the offense. line there. And, no uh, offense. No, no, no. You no. could Big make up, offense. like, three Central Mass knows different where, names, yeah. and if they end in ham or mouth, I'll be like, yeah. There you go. Um, but, yeah, it was uh, it was sort of a tough tough ride up there, easier ride back. But um, once I got there and, you know, was uh, hanging out in the – in the casino for a second, and I actually stopped by on the way out, won some money at the craps table, which was nice. Hey, now. Uh, I had, it smelled like the craps table in here when we walked in, first <laughs> of all. Uh, but the uh, the main talk of the whole thing, even the day after, I mean, you could stay, even though there were a lot of kids and it was a lot more sort of family-friendly during the day and everything, everyone was still talking about what happened on Friday night, um, including High and Bloom and Sam Kennedy. Now, Kennedy went on with Ken and Curtis before I got there and was trying to explain the Xander Bogart situation and uh, may have inadvertently told on himself a couple of times as well. Here's Sam Kennedy on Ken and Curtis Saturday. I think maybe we were guilty of just being too open and honest about our love and <laughs> for, for Xander Bogarts. We really did want to try and, and keep him a, a, a part of the organization. Hold it right there, Ryan, group. because when he says that, we were guilty of loving Xander Bogarts too much. Doesn't it make it sound like they offered him too much money? Of course. <laughs> Wait, is he you know? talking about they were too transparent with him like he took advantage of the situation no you know, it was more related to the narrative the open narrative that sam kennedy and high and bloom like talked they about. were too transparent he, with everyone xander bogarts is our cornerstone we want him here we want to win with him and yes. that, this is him explaining that uh, what happened and why they, they were saying okay the so they they're saying. still pretending like this situation was totally out of their control oh, of course okay. basically yeah and bloom said that too later on but when he says we were guilty of loving xander too much <laughs> You did. You were guilty of not loving him enough. I think is really the point. You said all these things no, to make it seem too much. like you cared and that you wanted to sign him and you'd do anything it would take to uh, to sign him. <laughs> we and then when it came down of... to it, you didn't love him at all. You didn't show yeah. enough love at all to even really be in the conversation for for getting him. So that's a weird way to phrase it. It makes you seem like you know you, you offered too much money. That's not what you did. Uh, listen, I think maybe we were guilty of just being too open and honest about our love and <laughs> for for Xander Bogarts. We really did want to try and and keep him a, a, a part of the organization for the rest of his career up until the San Diego winter meetings. We all know what, what he ended up getting and right. we just weren't we weren't, we, galaxies apart might be uh, appropriate for um, where those conversations went um, and so maybe if, if you look back and say well, you know, what mistakes did we make maybe we were just too over the top about our desire uh, to extend him but those feelings were truthful we really did want to extend him um, and you know in the end we didn't so that's on us. Yeah yeah, it is. It's on you. And listen, there's a belief, and I know there was a belief in that building, that Xander Bogarts wasn't going to forego the opportunity to become a free agent again. 
the last time he could have been a free agent. He said, nope, I'll take the deal. It was a hometown deal. And for Scott Boris, a Scott Boris client, that's an unusual uh, thing to have happen. And the Red Sox knew that. And they still were like, nope, we're going we're gonna to lean real hard into this whole thing about you're a lifelong Red Sox and we'll really pull at the heartstrings and sort of everything else. I said this at the time with John Lester, but they're doing it again here too. You ever heard the expression like, hey, nothing personal, it's just business? You know, people say that all the time. The Red Sox do the opposite. They take business out of it and try and make it all personal. And that's what they did with Bogarts. That's what they did with John Lester. They try and, you know, strip everybody of the idea that they're trying to make money here and talk to them about things like being an all-time Red Sox great. They like, used to do it to David Ortiz. Right. Like Xander Bogarts isn't already an all-time Red Sox great. And John Lester, all these other guys who just walk out the door because they're not willing to even pony up. They don't want to look like bad guys. So they say things like, we love Xander too much. Oh, that's the problem. We let it be known that we loved him so much. But, you know, we just... We couldn't afford to uh, to keep him, which, again, San Diego offered him a lot of money, all right? That was a big contract. They're talking about it like it was the worst, most ridiculous contract ever written and ever signed, and it's not. Xander Bogarts was a top three shortstop in all of baseball last year by almost every single measure except for home runs and RBI, and that's it. In on-base percentage, OPS, slugging percentage, basically everything else, he's top three. In short, for all shortstops, not just American League, and people are acting like, oh, well, yeah, that that contract was just so ridiculous and such a ridiculous thing. Was it really? Was it that ridiculous? I mean, it was a lot, sure, but you're talking about it like they gave it to some player who didn't deserve it. Galaxies apart might be uh, appropriate. If you loved him so much and you were so transparent, you were so open about how much you loved having him here with the Red Sox, why did you offer him Four years, ninety million. Is that a loving contract? No. Does that say like we are over the moon for you? We want you to finish your career here. Is that any indication? Like that? I don't understand how they can talk out of both sides of their mouth and think that anyone's buying that. That the issue was that they were too open about wanting to keep them, and so they lost their leverage in the situation. So he went out to test the market because he knew he was getting paid more elsewhere. That is not what happened. Like, they completely lost control of the situation after they botched it. That wasn't where the contract was going to be last summer. It's true. That wasn't where the contract was going to be in April, in May, in June. Like, you completely misread the situation. You didn't know what you had until he was gone. Literally until he was gone to free agency. So now you sound like some bitchy boyfriend who lost his girlfriend because everybody else knows how hot and awesome she is and you were just like eh whatever you took her for granted that's what it's like i love the 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 town and the players and i am as guilty as anyone maybe more so of falling in love with players especially players who have been a part of of winning a world series championship i mean for me it was Really hard to see Kyle Schwarber go, for example. Right. I knew he was a guy Didn't win a World that Series, wanted but to okay. be here. Um, <laughs> fit in so well. And, and he fit in so well. Um, he's he's got to stop. Because like, on one hand, there are business meetings happening that maybe Sam's not privy to as far as like who can be signed and who can't be signed. And meanwhile, you have Sam Kennedy going out there and be like, listen, I was really heartbroken because Kyle Schwarber wanted to be here. And we're like, oh, neat. We all wanted Kyle Schwarber. Why didn't you sign him in the first place then? Xander Bogart, you love him so much. Why didn't you make a better offer to him? And it's it's you have these two conflicting things going on where they're doing one thing and Sam Kennedy's like, I don't understand it. It's just... This was a really bad weekend for the Red Sox. Kyle Schwarber signed a four-year... $79 million not even contract. Eight, not even $80 million. I, I looked it up when I heard him say that. I'm like, that is so ridiculous that that would come out of your mouth. That is not a lot of money. I'm and sorry. Ra- and by the way, radio silence. And Schwarber is on record by saying that. like, It was radio silence from the Red Sox as soon as the offseason hit. Yeah. They knew. I mean, they knew they weren't going to approach even that, which is a reasonable amount of money for a guy who hits that many home runs. I know he had a crappy batting average last year, but, like, you know, you pay him for one thing and he does it. <laughs> Masataki Yoshida, Kyle Schwarber, hmm, Rob Ref Snyder, Kyle Schwarber. Uh, I mean, look, I know who I'm going with. Especially when you know J.D. Martinez, you're not keeping him either. You yeah. know, and you let Schwarber go. Like, that's just, it's ridiculous. Uh, there's more of this that we're going to play later on in the show, but first, we got to take a break. 617 779 7937 is the phone number. When we come back, we're going to get into the division round. Mego is over a uh, certain quarterback, <laughs> and uh, we'll get to uh, more reactions from what was a pretty uh, wild weekend, I'd say, in the NFL. It's all coming up next. The Dark Knight Rises, coming January.
Always live on the free Odyssey app. It's third and seven to the end zone. Open! Wide open! Hurst hauls it in for another Cincinnati touchdown. And you're seeing why offensive coordinator Brian Callahan and Zach Taylor have the third best red zone offense, or top five, I should say, red zone. And that's they create all of these things. Chases a decoy on a screen, and Hurst is wide open. Well, that game wasn't close, I'll tell you that. It's 617-779-7937. It's Arkan, it's Mego here. Sports Radio, WEEI. Bengals come away with a convincing win over the Buffalo Bills, 27-10 in Orchard Park, and it wasn't even really that close, it didn't feel like. Um, I know you're over Josh Allen. I think a lot of people maybe are looking at Josh Allen a little differently today. Looking a little sideways. Yeah. Um... I'll say this, like I like Fourier. Fourier and I both kind of were on this train of being slow. To, don't even don't even bring his name up. Right sorry, now. I know being slow to like catch on and actually believe in Josh Allen. Yeah, because uh, 2018, 2019, he just looked so silly, especially playing the Pats. Like he just soared the ball over, looked like he was going to knock out the guy at the hot dog <laughs> cart. Like I mean, we used to make great jokes back uh, when I would cover the team. Then, and when I would cover the Patriots and he'd come to town, I'd be like, oh, great, this is going to be very entertaining. And then all of a sudden in 2020, he looks like, you know, he looks like the stallion that's been tamed by Brian Dable. And you see the natural talent that he has. Like, he's built like a Madden quarterback. Like, he's just completely ridiculous the way that he can get out of things in the pocket and the way that he can just muscle his way through and basically be the entire Bills running game. Uh, through the le- second half of the season and yeah. through the playoffs. He became like Cam Newton in his prime, right. basically. Yeah. But at the same time, just watching him face off against Joe Burrow on the other side, I just came away from that going, yeah, the Bengals are the better team. The Bengals are the better team. That's not how I think a lot of us felt in September or October or even in November. The Bengals are the more balanced team. Joe Burrow is the better quarterback. Like, when we look at that class of really elite quarterbacks between Burrow, Mahomes, Allen, Mahomes is still number one. Mm -hmm. I think Burrow has taken that number two spot. And with Allen, like, I just have some serious questions about his decision-making, his judgment, him trying to put everything on himself all the time without Dable here. Like, I wonder what the next two to three years of his career are going to be. I'll ask you this. Do you feel like winning... Is a QB stat? Um, yeah. You do? I do. To, I, an, I to an extent, like yeah. That's pretty split mm-hmm. among people, whether they feel like they'd count wins. Because if that's the stat, I think, like, Patriots fans are maybe kind of afraid to say this because he's owned you recently. Like, he's absolutely owned you, and Patriots fans have their tail tucked between their legs a little bit. But what has he done? Like, he can't win an AFC championship no nope, he's, he's like short. mr divisional round <laughs> and sometime lately not even that he's mr wild card bye like i i'm not trying to be insensitive because i know that they 
went through a lot this team and you know it was great to see Demar Hamlin even though you couldn't really see him oh, on that the broadcast could have been anybody cuz the snow was like is puke and snow so much like I think that was actually a scarecrow window. with a red jacket yeah. on that's sitting up in the booth move there. the arms around and make it look <laughs> but it's see, like get loud on defense said the scarecrow I feel that if um another quarterback was in the position of that Josh Allen was in yesterday people would be hammering it and saying like how do you not show up more and he was trying to do a lot. He was trying to do a lot. But then you look at these critical points in the game. It's 17-7. Halfway through the third quarter, they're down. Third and goal. And he just seals it over Devin Singletary in the corner of the end zone. And they have to settle for three. At 27-10, there's like eight minutes left in the game. Just under eight minutes left in the game. Uh, it's fourth down. He has Gabe Davis and Steph Diggs and... Uh, Tony Romo's on the broadcast being like, Steph Diggs is fool's goal. Don't even look his way. I guess that's what he did because it looked like Steph Diggs, there was a safety who was an Eli Apple who was splitting between Steph Diggs and Gabe Davis. You're talking about the Gabe fourth Davis. down play? Yeah, yeah. And, and Apple just like swats it down like it's freaking backyard football. He had a hell of football. a game, by the way, Apple did. Yeah. Apple was all over the place. He was he really played well, I thought. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Allen was, Allen was not himself. As far as turning the ball over, though, it's been a problem for him all year. He led the league in turnovers. Like, he was a turnover machine this year, despite his gaudy numbers, which he still put up. And the fact that he still put those up, even without Dayball, tells me that he's not completely reliant on it. It's not like he's dependent on Dayball, and without him, he he's can't play. He's a good quarterback. He's still course. a very I'm good quarterback. I'm saying he's a yeah. top three quarterback. I'm just saying, I think because he got that enormous contract and because he's done things for the Bills that nobody's done since 93, since 95, and they are so desperate for the savior, and he certainly looks the part, mm -hmm. and he can play the part. But, you know, you see Cowboys fans today, and they're talking about Dak Prescott. Like, oh, man, is this the ceiling with Dak? How far can we go with Dak? Got to get rid of McCarthy because got to pair somebody else who's going to pull more out of Dak so we can go further in the playoffs. At what point do the Bills fans get to that? Like, are they... Are they content just owning and running the division and then never going anywhere further? Because I wouldn't be. Um, no, of course not. I don't think they are. I think that Buffalo still has some not, work to I'm do not, with their roster, I'm not too. saying move on from Josh Allen. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I feel like at this point the conversation could change with him. Yeah. Instead of being like, my God, Josh Allen is the ultimate success story. You got to stick with your rookie quarterback through two, three, four years because he might be Josh Allen. It's like, okay, well, what has Josh Allen done to suddenly be in the conversation, even with Patrick Mahomes? Yeah, I mean, Mahomes beat him. Led some nice playoff runs. Like, yeah. we don't talk about Shanahan quarterbacks that way. No, that's true. We don't. And I do think that, jo I mean, Josh Allen's like an MVP candidate. He has been for the past couple of years. So, so long as he's putting up. But that's up, where I ask you, is, is winning a QB stat? Is win yes, it is. I think it is. I still think it is, and I think that that still matters. But when it comes to playoffs and, and things like that, Josh Allen was considered a really good late-game quarterback. You know, he had a bunch of fourth-quarter comebacks and game-winning drives over the last couple of years, and it seemed like he was one of those type of guys. But I think that's starting to wear off a little bit. Or it could be just as simple as, he's really good, but Joe Burrow's better than him. I mean, that's it could just be as simple as that. And Joe Burrow, I think, also may have a better offense than than what Josh Allen has. Josh Allen doesn't have much of a running game other than himself. He is the running game. He's the running game. Singletary's not a very good run. They just don't. They don't have that uh, that element. Their tight end's not very good. You know what I mean? Like you have three really strong wide receivers there in Cincinnati, and you have one and a half in Buffalo. So it could be, you know, something like that too. It could just be the Bengals are just a little bit more equipped uh, to go into a shootout and win, especially in the elements like that, which is funny too. Okay, that's the other side of this. Buffalo couldn't play in the snow. That was wild to me how sloppy they were because it's this is supposed to be like you know you're. The, the trump card that you play over the rest of the league. Right. And it's not like they've had a fluky warm winter. There have been like snowstorms Maybe that's that why. have displaced them. They had to go to play in Detroit, so they don't know how to play in the snow this year. <laughs> you know? It could was, be that. It was just, it felt like the disparity between those two offenses yesterday was huge. The way that the Bengals came out, that Joe Burrow came out, and it looked like after the two touchdowns, like, they were just never really going to be able to get in the game. And here's the other thing with Josh Allen. Like, this does bug me. The crap that he talks <laughs> after he gets in the end zone, it's been like two back-to-back -back games that he's he, done he this. He runs his mouth. Where he runs his mouth to the defense, and then he just 
trots over to the sideline and leaves his teammates to be like, that's our QB. What do you got to say for yourself? <laughs> you know? He got like, into it on the sideline awkward. during the Dolphins game after right. a, a run. And, you know, it was the same thing where he goes over there. Christian Wilkerson, chirping. yeah. Yeah, with Christian Wilkerson. And then he just walks away. He's, he's like, oh, I've probably been talked to about this. Deion Dawkins like, I got this. I he's got like, this. oh, yeah, I'm worth $265 million. Maybe I should stop yeah. doing this. Stop <laughs> pushing defensive linemen. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Um, 617-779-7937. You're right. Josh Allen, I think, has established himself as a step below Joe Burrow and a step below Patrick Mahomes. I thought this on Saturday. As the AFC, you know, the, the first games on Saturday were getting ready to go. You look at the four quarterbacks, AFC quarterbacks who were playing this weekend. Trevor Lawrence, uh, Burrow, Mahomes, and Allen sub out maybe one of them with Justin Herbert. Like, that's five quarterbacks right there who aren't going anywhere. I mean, no, they're all and young, they, and they're all good, and they're they all, their teams like, are all good. They you know? felt like the quarterbacks who should be there Yeah, in like, the playoffs. They it's not like be. there's one team. It's, it's Frankly, it's not like having the Niners in right. your conference where it's like, oh, there's one team that just has a really great defense and they weaseled their way in there, and they're good in other parts of the game. Yeah, and I know, like, Trevor Lawrence, obviously it wasn't a great season for them, but think about what last year was like, and think about someone like Peyton Manning, which is who Lawrence basically was coming out of college. He was a blue-chip prospect. Him, Andrew Luck, those type of guys. Manning wasn't great right away. Lawrence was in the playoffs before Manning was, so, like, I don't know. I just I sort of look at that, and I wonder how the Patriots and Mac Jones fit into this picture, because right now I see that as pretty well sealed off, and even the team, you know, even Herbert, who wasn't even there that weekend, is sort of the guy I consider the the alternate i don't put mac jones on that list yet i don't even think they're well, really in the ballpark in terms of mac jones and how it relates back to the patriots like my other takeaway from this weekend was every time that the niners win and advance in the playoffs i think it's going to come back to bite the patriots because i watching that niners team i feel like that's exactly how bill belichick wants to construct a roster yeah and right. wants to run his team <laughs> and like he would love to be able to just like oh Okay, another quarterback down. Let's toss another one in there. This one, I like his confidence. He's good. Yeah, get in and there, just, Purdy, whoever exactly. you are. Yeah. And, you know, you win like these, like, you barely get into double-digit games or whatever, and it's just, I I don't think, they, he takes the wrong lessons away. Like, Bill Belichick took the wrong le- lessons away from the Niners and looking at that and being like, oh, maybe you should have an offensive mastermind on your coaching staff. Perhaps that's the difference maker. They yeah, have a fullback. We should have a fullback. Yeah, the, uh, the the secret isn't just having anybody play quarterback. That's not the secret. <laughs> the secret is having I don't know, not drafting Nikhil Harry when you could have had Debo Samuel. Maybe that's part of it, and uh, all the other players on that team too. And also, yeah, having a coach who has the foggiest idea what he's doing when it comes to uh, running an offense like that. Six one seven 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 nine seven ninety three seven is the phone number. Let's go to uh, Craig in Rhode Island who has a take on Josh Allen and Steph Diggs. Go ahead, Craig. How you guys doing? What's up? Yep. So uh, it's funny you said the we could add De- Debo Samuel and they could add DK Metcalf. Yep. Mm-hmm. So I just want to touch on that because you just brought it up. But uh, they could add Metcalf. I mean, they could add AJ Brown. They could add a lot of guys, Craig, instead of Nikhil Harry. Yes. Yes. So <laughs> what are you doing if you're Josh Allen and Diggs is coming over and you know, you know, he's not happy, pulling I, a little fit. I don't think Diggs has been happy for at least the last like seven weeks. I think right, since the first time that he saw you guys in Thursday Night Football. I agree. I totally agree. And his brother, I'm a Dallas fan. His brother, you know. Brother dropped an interception last, last night, yeah. You know, drop, dropped interception. Uh, the hit, the no hit on uh, Kittle. <laughs> Thanks, Craig. Thanks for the call, Craig. <laughs> uh, he in just terms wanted to him, just, you know, shoot the no, breeze. Yeah, no, him <laughs> handling digs. I mean, isn't that like a huge part of being the leader of the team? Yeah. Diggs went off. He was, I mean, he was making a whole scene. That's true. Unhappy. I think that's who Steph Diggs has been since high school. Like, I know that's who he's been since high school. Yeah. Like, he's a front runner. I mean, he's a front runner. When the team's doing well, he's great. It's not the first time there's been an overly emotional, like, very passionate wide receiver who wants to get his touches. Yeah. I mean, really. That's not my quarterback. Like, this isn't a (laughs) unique situation. Joe Biscaglia, who covers the uh, Buffalo Bills for the Athletic, had this tweet after the game. Bills wide receiver Stephon Diggs darted out of the locker room with all his stuff before some of the Bills coaches were even down to the tunnel area. It was practice squad running back Duke Johnson had to stop Diggs before he left the stadium and brought him back to the locker room. He left a few minutes later. Hmm. Duke Johnson. I remember that name. Why do I remember Duke? Oh, because he ran all over them with the Dolphins yes. in the se- regular season finale last year. It's like listen, he's on the B- Bills practice squad. Yeah, Bills practice squad <laughs> trying to get Stephon Diggs to like you know 
listen, it's the last game. You got to answer questions. You got to come back. Fine, I'll come back. All and right. then he leaves two minutes later. I yeah. know we had the break. Do you Splits. want to address on the other side some of the ongoing conversation around if the Patriots were here because they almost beat blank? I think we they have could to. have beaten blank. I really think that we have to do this because it's it's embarrassing, Patriots fans. Your reactions to these games are just really embarrassing. We'll get to that right after trending. <laughs> Now, here's what's trending on WEEI. We're just scratching the surface a little bit on the AFC divisional game between the Bills and the Bengals. Those matchups for the championship rounds have been set. San Francisco 49ers will be in Philadelphia Sunday at 3, which will be followed by the winning Cincinnati Bengals at Kansas City at 6.30. Some injury updates after uh, Tony Pollard, he was carted off the field. He su- uh, suffered a fractured left fibula. Meanwhile, Patrick Mahomes stayed in the game after he got rolled up on in the first quarter. The report is that Mahomes has a high ankle sprain, but he is expected to play, so says ESPN's Jeremy Fowler. Now, according to Burt Breer, he had this tweet over the weekend. Patriots linebackers coach Gerard Mayo was alongside Bill Belichick for all of the New England offensive coordinator interviews last week. According to sources, Breer continues to write, it's a good sign of Mayo's growing role with the team. After the team has met with five offensive coordinator candidates over video conference, obviously including Bill O'Brien, the Bruins, they do not lose hockey games anymore, I guess. They beat the Sharks 4 to nothing yesterday. Linus Olmark is the fastest goaltender in NHL history to reach 25 wins in a season. Bruins will be in Montreal on Tuesday, but without Tomas Noshek, he's expected to miss the next couple weeks with a non-displaced fracture in his left foot. Mark McLaughlin has been called up from Providence to take his place. The Celtics are also don't win, uh, don't lose games either. They are looking for their 10th consecutive win in Orlando tonight, but they will have to do it without Marcus Smart. Uh, he left the Raptors game with a right ankle sprain. Uh, Malcolm Brogdon has uh, is missing the games due to personal reasons. Uh, still up in the air. So this is Rob Williams. He is questionable after. Uh, he left that game as well against the Raptors. Jalen Brown rolled into his leg. Trending Now is brought to you by FindMassMoney.com. We can all use some extra cash now that the holidays are over. Go to FindMassMoney.com and search your name because you could have unclaimed money from forgotten bank accounts, stock certificates, payroll, refund checks, insurance uh, proceeds, and so much more. But you will never know unless you go to FindMassMoney.com and put in your name. It is fast, easy, and most importantly, it is free. I'm Ryan Garvin. That is what is trending now on WEEI. And Mego and Arcand have some issues with some of the rhetoric coming from Patriots fans over Divisional Round Weekend. We address those issues right after this. The Rich Keith.
Radio, WEEI, Christian Arkin, Megan Adelini here with you until 6 o'clock. We're going to play some audio from Tony Romo, <laughs> the weekend that he had. Some interesting analysis that we heard. Uh, and we'll get into the Patrick Mahomes high ankle sprain, which he played through. But first, I just wanted to address an alarming uh, narrative I saw taking shape, mostly online over the course of the weekend. And you probably noticed it too, Megan Ryan. I mean, I think everybody sort of saw this. So a lot of people out there, fans mostly, some some writers, some media-adjacent type of people, saying, you know, maybe they didn't make the playoffs this year, but the Patriots, they, they could have really made some noise if they did. Based on what? Based on what indeed. I know we watched some pretty rotten quarterback play this past weekend, and I'm not going to argue with you there. I mean, Josh Allen wasn't very good. Um, I thought that... Uh, the uh, Giants uh, on the NFC side. Yeah. Danny Dimes didn't do much. Dak Prescott didn't play well. Those are NFC teams. So it doesn't really uh, apply to what we're talking about here. But I just, you know, I mean, well, the Patriots only lost to the Bengals by this and they only lost to Buffalo by this. And look at that. I mean, you know, they had a better game against Cincinnati than the Bills did, (laughs) to which I just say, you know, those teams lost this year to teams. To, like, the Bengals lost to Cleveland this year on Halloween. You remember that game? It was an awful game. The Bengals got manhandled in that game. And the Bills, I mean, the Bills lost to the, the Bills Jets. Bills lost to the Jets. Thank to the, you. To the New York Jets. Like, they lost. They're capable, you're capable of beating There's teams out there that have actually beaten these teams. You had three cracks at it, and you didn't beat any either of them once. Like, what are you talking about? Well, if the Patriots played in this game, if the Patriots played in this game, they would have gotten smoked, just like the Bills got smoked. And if they were playing the Bills, the Bills would have smoked them too. <laughs> You're not on the level that you think you are. I'm sorry. Like, I just, that was that was very surprising. And I understand, you know, you sort of cope with the fact that your team's not in it. And you think, oh, well, if they were, maybe well, the defense could have played well against Josh Allen because we got a good day. Yeah, you have a good defense. That's true. Who's going to, how are you going to score points? Like, what, what do you think, what team do you think was going to be playing in this game? Because it was still the same Patriots. It's not like some new and improved Patriots and they're going to have a great offseason and then next year they'll be good. You're talking about this year's Patriots. And the fact that anyone thinks that the offense you watched all year long, it, even in that Buffalo game where I know they played a little bit better in some of the other games, all of which they lost, by the way, where the offense actually showed up, um, how you could watch that team all year and then watch these playoffs and watch these these quarterbacks who admittedly some of them didn't play all that well and think, you know what? That could have been the Patriots. Like, in terms of what? Because there was bad quarterback play 
and that reminded you of the Patriot? Like, okay, I guess I sort of see that. But that doesn't mean that you belong there. (laughs) That doesn't mean that you belong in the mix with these other teams. All these teams had great quarterback play all season long, and then in the playoffs, it fell off, or you had a bad game, or something like that, one bad day. It was the opposite with the Patriots. The Patriots had bad quarterback and bad offensive play all year long with, like, a couple of rare exceptions. That's not... You were an eight-win team, you know? Like, you were an eight-win team, and you barely were even that. Like, this was this was really sort of disappointing. I feel like there's still a lot of Patriots fans just in heavy denial right now about where the team is. Absolutely. This was a carryover from the conversation that came out last weekend, mostly online, but with some media people, that watching the Bills and the Dolphins game, oh, the Patriots would have been in this because Dolphins are on their third-string quarterback, and it's just like an awful situation. You weren't there, and you would have you beat the Dolphins in an in their horrible situation. Just like every game that you won against a good team, you didn't have to see their top quarterback, right? Except for the Detroit Lions, and that was Jared Goff. Like I think Jared Goff is a fine quarterback, but he's not in a tier with Joe Burrow. And so you hang your hat on, oh, well, if we they hadn't coughed the ball up. On Christmas Eve against Joe Burrow and the Bengals, they could have won. But you didn't. And that's the point. All of your best performances, I like that you brought that up. All your best performances on offense, Vikings, uh, Bengals. Ravens throw before another the one interceptions. In there. Yeah. Yeah, no. Again, Browns. before the interception. They are all nothing to write home about. It's like those were your those were your professional performances, really. That's where you look like you had a functional offense. Right. And if that's the baseline the times. that you're pointing to, you talk about, oh, the Patriots look better against the Bills in the, the second time they saw them. You lost by 12 points. That's what you're hanging your hat on? So I, I can't understand anybody who continues to watch these AFC teams play against each other. And like we just said, we feel like the right quarterbacks, the right teams mostly and the right quarterbacks made it to this divisional round. I don't know how you watch any of that and feel like your Patriots are close. Could have made some noise if they'd been there. Based on what? Based on what? Based on your defense? Your defense was good. Your defense was really good. Mm-hmm. I'll say that. And a good defense Absolutely. can take a mediocre team places. That's happened before. But you're not the Niners. You're not that, yeah. You didn't have a competent coaching staff below Bill Belichick. You didn't have any competent coaching on the offensive side of the ball, maybe outside of Troy Brown. I I don't know how you think that the way that you were going, you would make any noise in the playoffs. If you feel that way, I think you need to go back and watch some game tape reevaluate your stance. That's nuts. The Chiefs and the Bengals both scored 27 points this weekend to win their games. You know how many times the Patriots scored more than 27 points this year? I think one time. Three times. I know. Yeah, right. Three times. One of the, I mean, I think they were all in those games that you mentioned, Arkan. It, the, the one that jumped out to me was that Patriots fans should feel really good after watching these performances. I'm like, I feel worse than I've ever felt. I don't know why I would expect this to be a massive improvement, that you're so much closer to these teams based on what you saw this weekend. You watched the teams who executed well. Everybody was all nervous about the Bengals. Oh, they're missing a couple of linemen. The offensive line's already, you know, was a problem last year. What's it going to be now at this point? Offensive line wasn't an issue whatsoever in that game. They came out and cooked. So uh, apparently if you have two offensive linemen on the Patriots who check out in the second game of the season and never get clued back in between Trent Brown and Isaiah Wynn, that's catastrophic. You can't bounce back from that. And yet these other teams can. They have guys who actually can't get on the field. Your guys just can't stop picking up penalties. Like, I don't understand how you compare these two programs right now or three programs or four programs and go, I feel pretty good about where they could be. That's so crazy to Yeah, me. it's wild, too, especially the Bengals thing, because had that Bengals game end again, oh, a fumble from Ramondre Stevenson? Wow, really fluky, right? No, wrong. Not fluky at all. In fact, bad fumbles at the end of games were kind of a feature, not a bug this year. All right? I mean, that was not something it's that true. only happened one time. It was part of your identity. It was. It's the main thing people are probably going to remember about this year was the fact that you lost your mind at the end of some of these games. And it wasn't just some random player losing your mind. It was Ramondre Stevenson and Jacoby Myers, who may be your two best offensive players. Yeah. Like, that's the best you have to offer. And those two guys 
I mean, I'm not going to go over it again because we all watched the games and we all remember what it looked like. But Jesus, like you know, that was that was not something that just happened. It was a freaky thing. They had uh, brain farts all year long on special teams, on offense, you name it. I mean, really, outside of the defense, which was good, not great. I mean, there was plenty of times the defense got carved up by good quarterbacks and good offenses. I mean, that's not a that's not some thing that I look at and say, oh yeah, this defense was a championship defense. It was a good defense. It wasn't great, uh, but the other aspects of this team and how much does bill always preach you know all three phases two of the phases were bad just a mess this year they were a actively total mess. bad and that's why i don't think he, they belonged in the play that's why i didn't belong with these other teams that won their divisions and win games and didn't crap their pants down the stretch when they needed you know to to not fumble a pass or not you know throw some crazy wacky lateral play or whatever it was they were out there doing you know these are teams that were smart and got their job done and and got to the playoffs and were able to get this far now yeah buffalo played awful in this game and josh allen didn't look good and buffalo's gonna have to answer some questions in this offseason too but the questions they have to deal with compared to what you have to do in this offseason it's apples and carburetors like we're not even talking about the same object like come on come on patriots fans this is you you know better than this how many years in a row did you did you dominate all these teams and then have them say well you know if we got a, a crack at you like no 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 if the jets got a crack at you any of those years they probably would have lost except the two years that they didn't you are not really that team. You know, you're just, you're not. You were not even really a spoiler this year. You were just kind of there. You, you know? didn't like, spoil anyone. Yeah, you were just, you were just a team that was kind of that there. Was, that's and- the crazy thing is this team, and I don't want to just rehash the whole season, but when you talk about the identity, the personality of this team, they never stole a game. No. They never came in and made noise during the regular season. Maybe they did it for two quarters or three quarters, but they could never finish the game. They couldn't even win games that they were supposed to win, that they were favored in. Like yeah. the the Chicago game is wild, I, and you can't even say like they beat themselves. They just they just weren't that good in a lot of these games, and they just never really found it. They lost five out of their last seven games, and the only reason why their season wasn't over in like week twelve or something is because the Dolphins lost their quarterback, and some of these other teams were all losing too. I mean, really, that's it. The, the Chargers, Jets fell off a cliff. The Jets you were right the there with them. And Dolphins the Jets started six and three, and then proceeded to lose their mind through the last half of the season. Yeah, that's why. And you only finished one game better than them too, by the way. Just for the record, the you're Jets way, are seven you are and ten. Way closer you are to eight the and Jets. Nine. You are way closer to the Jets than you are the Bills. That's the reality. Yeah. Like, the Jets are not a really bad team. Everybody laughs, oh, the Jets, the Jets. uh, They have an issue at quarterback. You have an issue with two-thirds of your coaching staff. Yeah. I don't know which is – and you don't know about your quarterback. This is something I was thinking about this morning with Mac Jones because I was thinking about how certain people – and sorry, this is just going off on a tangent. Certain people kind of have changed their tune or they've gotten a little quiet that were pretty high on, oh, they got the guy. They don't just have a guy. Right. They have the guy Hello. in his rookie season, especially when they were going through that winning streak. Yeah. And then it was, oh, well, he hit the rookie wall. That's how I felt. I felt like it was a very uh, tangible rookie wall that he hit after going through Alabama, going through the draft, going, you know, the combine, getting the starting job at the end of camp, going through the whole season. I just think that it serves to remind you 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 have a very small sample size with Mac Jones, and you screwed half the sample size. Mm. If this was a scientific experiment, it's as if you went into the lab and the Petri dishes from all of this year, you just spit in all of them <laughs> and, like, threw up in two of them. And now that, that sample size is ruined. And maybe you don't feel that way. Maybe you feel like this is the experiment that shows you that Mac Jones doesn't have it this season. I don't feel that way. I feel that you absolutely wasted a season. And in that way, you're closer to the Jets, but you still don't have a Zach Wilson on yes. your roster. So at least you're not there. You contaminated the sample with the Patricia virus. <laughs> exactly. Is what hey, that's not funny. Um, 617-779-7937. There's your phone number. Let's go to Tim in Hanover. Go ahead, Tim. Thanks for thanks for taking my call, guys. You got it, Tim. Hey, I... I I just want to say the Pats, I think, can be competitive after this draft this year comes up if they get an elite guy on the defensive secondary, an elite guy on the offense. And, and what they need to do is sprinkle some guys to shore up the line and sprinkle a couple other players in there, and they'll be competitive. There's two elite guys in the NFL that are quarterbacks, and they're playing in their next game. 
Mahomes and Burroughs. After that, they got excellent quarterbacks sprinkled in around them. But they're going to show for the next five to ten years that there's nobody better than those two, and they deserve to be there. All right, thanks for the call there, uh, Tim. Appreciate it. Um, Jalen, Jalen bonkers, Hurts playing elite this year too. I am say. I bonkers the way the way that he's talking about it? I think mean, Hurts maybe if he wins the Super Bowl. I think he needs another season yeah. of this just to show that it's not fluky. Am I crazy for agreeing with him? Uh, no, I just think that you know if you listen, like they just need this and this, and then sprinkle oh, no, in no, this no, and no, sprinkle no, no. in all I these other on, things. I like, meant about elite quarterbacks. About elite quarterbacks, I agree with you there. I think these are the last two really elite quarterbacks. No, but in terms, sorry, of, his other points are crazy. The other point about you know the Patriots are only like a couple of guys away, and then he like lists every single position <laughs> right. on the roster, and it's like okay, if they get an elite guy in every positional group, and then they make the line really strong, right. they'll be in a great place. They need. I hope not, Bill. Uh, they need two tackles, definitely. I'd say they need at least a, a stud-wide receiver, um, if we're just talking about the offense here. But he also mentioned, like, the secondary. Yeah, sure, bring in, the, bring in a corner. If Devin McCourty retires, you may need a new safety. I still think they could use an upgrade at linebacker. Like, there's there's still plenty of, of ways that you can improve the team. Maybe almost too many ways, you know? And that's kind of the problem here, isn't it? Like, there's still a lot of holes on this roster, even with the free agent spending spree two years ago. And what I think was a pretty good draft last year. Year. You still, I mean, the four years prior to that, just so many holes. And now, you know, you're starting to see that kind of come up, certainly on the offense. You know, you, you spend a lot of money on offensive free agents, and you got a little bump that one year, but then, man, things just petered right out, didn't they? So I'm still uh, of the mind that because of how botched, how tainted the samples are on the offensive side, like it's not just about Mac Jones. It was an accident. I spilled my <laughs> I spilled my ranch dressing into the petri dish. <laughs> Excuse me, I was eating jalapeno poppers. It's just, <laughs> I feel that that extends to other guys on offense too. And I'm not talking about guys like Trent Brown hmm. who proven themselves. In other times in the Trent league. Trent was also so- eating jalapeno poppers <laughs> with me, and they got into the Petri dish. Excuse me, is this seat taken? <laughs> you can tell that he just didn't, that he just stopped trying, that he just checked out this season. But I'm thinking about guys like Tyquan Thornton. Right. I'm still intrigued by him. I'm not like, oh, okay, you know, he's a total bust. Uh, I'm trying to think of other guys off the top of my head. I still don't know what the two young running backs are. They both popped at couple points yeah in the that season one game where they both was pretty out. good yeah i thought so and obviously and then jones and jones are good and then so. there's guys like hunter henry and kendrick Bourne, hunter henry and scotty washington who will hopefully be back and be back to their 2021 selves instead of the 2022 selves because they'll have an actual offensive coordinator and play caller yeah so it's like you know i i in that sense i wouldn't say that all of the free agency spending was a bust because some of it really showed up consistently in 2021. And then we have the tainted sample. And then the lab had a meltdown. This one's a jackalope. That's a cross between a jackrabbit and a cantaloupe. No, that's actually not right. <laughs> uh, it's an antelope. Um, by the way, you talk about well, the Patriots. Could the Patriots have played this weekend? Yes, they could have. There was one play this weekend that really I watched and I thought, ooh, that's something the Patriots could have done. The last play uh, from the Cowboys. <laughs> 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 that that whole Did thing. Did they know what McCarthy when he called the draw? The Zeke Elliott snapping Zeke the ball. Elliott's <laughs> playing center, and three guys line up, and I'm like, <laughs> I know how this is going to go. Oh my god! That all right? That was Patriot esque right there. That was a Matty P could have drawn drawn that one up. I, think. I will say, I heard from a couple former offensive linemen who you almost were, busted out there. <laughs> Zeke almost very happy and wanted to see Zeke wrecked further. I mean, that was that was something. And then they finally get the pass. The guy gets drilled right away. <laughs> As soon as he catches the ball, I was like, Jesus. Didn't even have didn't even have a chance to lateral it. That's how fast the Niners were on him. That was really that was something else. They were that like, play. they looked at it like, are you really doing this? <laughs> Kidding me? All right, go <laughs> okay, ahead. Okay, here we we're, go. We're ready for it. <laughs> Let's go. I guess I guess <laughs> McCarthy hates Zeke. Yeah, sounds like it. Uh, <laughs> Zeke looked like Mac trying to tackle Chandler Jones. Uh six one seven 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 nine seven ninety three seven is the phone number. We'll get to your phone what calls. What was the plan? I have no I idea. Know. I mean t- completely nuts. Yeah, no no clue. Uh we'll get to your phones right after this. 93.7. W E E I. Boston's Sports Original. Is your new year still falling flat? You are not alone. This year, millions will be diagnosed with low energy. But Planet Fitness has the cure. Boost your energy.
Ezekiel Elliott at center here. Look at this formation. Yeah, so they have their right guard and tackle out here, their left guard and left tackle out here. It appears that Zeke's going to go to center. This looks like my flag football team. But obviously, Mike McCarthy's been working on this end of game scenario, and we'll see what he's got. Final play looks like barring a penalty. Prescott over the middle of the turret. Gets smoked right away, and that'll do it. The 49ers back to the championship game. Hearing it like that really doesn't do it justice. I mean, it was, you know, like it was one of those plays you kind of just had to see to believe. It's Arcan, it's Mago here, Sports Radio, WEEI. Um, the one thing that really made me think, yeah, the Patriots could have done that. <laughs> they definitely could have gone out that's there. That's very Patriot like. And uh, run that play at the end of the game. Uh, not that I felt like there was much of a chance anyway there for, for Dallas. What a tough game for Dak Prescott. Um, he's, uh, he's another one, you know. He's had plenty of cracks at the can and. Doesn't seem like it's going to happen for him either. 617-779-7937. And you know what? For the NFC, no Brady, no Rodgers. And Dak Prescott, I mean, just as much as anybody else, was probably a highest-rated quarterback still still out there other than Jalen Hurts. You know? Look, that's what I'm talking about when I bring up the Josh Allen stuff. I'm not saying that Josh Allen isn't a good quarterback, but there is something to if you're in this league mm-hmm. – and the whole point is to try to get to the Super Bowl and win the Super Bowl. Is it that much of a difference between Josh Allen, Kirk Cousins, Dak Prescott, if this is how far you're getting? You like that? If you can't win an AFC championship game, you can't even get to the Super Bowl. I, I'm, I'm like the ceiling is incredibly high for Josh Allen. So maybe they'll do it next year. Maybe they'll do it the next year. It's just starting to feel like every year is going to turn into this is the Bills year. Yeah. And this really felt like the Bills year. And then they run into Burrow and the Bengals, and that just looks like a way better team, way more balanced offense, just <laughs> actually has a run game. Years and years and years, you couldn't get through Brady in New England, right? You know, like even really good quarterbacks, really good teams. It's just Brady was there, and you couldn't get past him. I sort of feel like now you get, it's not like you have two Bradys, but as far as Buffalo's concerned, kind of kind of is. Mahomes and Burrow might as well be two Tom Brady. Like, you're going to have to deal with both of them. And I think he's a step down from both of those guys. And just, you know, that. eventually you, uh, you you break through or you just sort of are looking up at him forever. But right now, I mean, that's that's kind of where I see Buffalo, unless they unless they go and have another big offseason. And to be fair, part of their big offseason uh, got hurt. You know, Von Miller hadn't played since, what, was it week six or whatever it was that he got hurt? I mean, he was he was hurt early in the year. They'll be fine when they get he Aaron Donald in yesterday. the offseason. We'll all be good. Yeah, uh, we'll see. 617-779-7937. Let's go to George. I like that. And that's my son's name. George yeah. in Gramville. Go ahead, George. Hey, how's it going, guys? What's up, George? Uh, I just wanted to, I just wanted to talk to you guys about uh, Mac Jones and the doubt that Patriots fans have in him. I still think that uh, he could be a solid quarterback if they put the right pieces around him and uh, they get an offensive coordinator. I mean, this whole entire year was tough for, on the guy. When he drops back, he gets two seconds or less in the pocket. I mean, that, there's not much that a guy can really do. I still think that if you put people around him, give an offensive coordinator where they're actually calling plays where he's got people to uh, dump it down to maybe, maybe – not run everybody deep every time, then uh, they'll have a chance. But I'm just 
I, I still got belief in Mac Jones as a Patriots fan, and I, I think the Patriots fans still should too. All right, thanks for the call, George. And I haven't given up on Mac Jones yet. I don't think that that's fair to him. I don't think that is the right thing to do either. I think that you've seen you've seen flashes even this past year as bad as things were. That last Buffalo game, he looked really good at points in that game. There was some of those drives. I mean, he was carving that defense up, which now we're seeing maybe isn't that hard to do anymore. But like that that to, that showed me something. Against that Buffalo defense, like that showed me something. Mac Jones showed me something. Now, can he put it together for an entire season? We have yet to see that. Forget about getting to the playoffs and winning a playoff game. Can he be a functional, high-functioning, I should say, uh, NFL quarterback for an entire season? We have not seen him do that yet. We saw a pretty promising rookie year with some ups and downs. Then we saw basically all downs with a couple of small peaks the second year. Can he put something together in his third year that makes you think, yeah, this guy's worth investing in? Because right now, I mean, that's definitely uh, not a sure thing. If he can perform the way that he did in most of his rookie season and avoid the cliff that he fell off at the end of the season going into the playoffs that year, if he just plays that way consistently, they go to the playoffs and they lose to the Bills (laughs) in the first round in wild card or lose to somebody else, you know, in the divisional round. Mm-hmm. Is that enough for you to say, pay this guy? Um, He's the franchise quarterback? Depending on what kind of season he has. If he has a I'm if saying he has a season a where the numbers season. and everything are the way that they were for the first two-thirds of his rookie season. Before, I believe, he hit the wall. Okay, but then what does he finish with? You know, it's a full season and he finishes with like 25 touchdowns and 10 interceptions. Like, I don't know if that's enough for me if he's... 30 and 10, then maybe I'd, I'd think about it. Like, you'd have to have a big season. It has to be, you have to sort of pay off all these people who believe that you're something more than what we've seen these last two years. Because right now, I mean, he kind of looks like a middling quarterback at best. You have to show that your best is is something else. So, in his, I'm sorry to cut you off, Megan, but in his rookie season, month of October, he had seven touchdowns, three interceptions. Month of November, he had seven touchdowns, two interceptions. That's where a lot of the Mac hysteria started to grow from. But then in December, two touchdowns, four interceptions, one and two record. Uh, January finished with a four four touchdowns, one interception record. Yeah, I think that you're was looking after the bye. You're looking to see more of what they were doing when I mean there was a stretch last season where they're like, oh, I don't know, the Patriots could be Super Bowl contenders with this, right? Kid. Like that's the well, kind they were of the guy, number that's one the guy seed. you pay. So I, I'm wondering though if if people watch these games now at this point, see Dak Prescott, see Josh Allen, some of the highest paid quarterbacks in the league, see how far they get year after year with their teams, and it makes them reevaluate looking at a quarterback like Mac, yeah. who if he can be consistent, he won't be Joe Burrow, but if he's consistent and he gets you to the point where you can start making noise in the playoffs with other players around him, is that somebody that you can lean on? Do you want to spend the money there? Because it's still going to be a highly paid position. Yeah, and you're, He's not going to get Josh Allen money. He's not going to get Dak money. But he's going to get paid if he is able to to show up and get them back into the playoffs. Yeah, but maybe not by them. <laughs> I'm saying he's getting paid somewhere. He'll get paid by someone. 617-779-7937. Let's go to Dan, who is in Dover. Uh, Dover, Mass, Dover, New Hampshire, Dan. Uh, Dover, New Hampshire, and good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Hopefully everybody stay and warm. Uh, What's up? I'm on I-95 right now, and uh, it's awful. But anyway, peace and peace. Uh, two quick oh, God. <laughs> what, do you guys feel like both Dak Prescott and Josh Allen will have similar career trajectories as Charles Barkley did in the NBA? Now, you know, both of them have been, you know, obviously Charles Barkley was an all-star, and both Prescott and Allen have been um, pro bowlers, but there, it doesn't seem like they, obviously Charles Barkley never won the big game. And Josh Allen and Dak Prescott make it to the playoffs, but the conversation starts and ends there. So I, do you guys get that vibe on how the rest of their careers might go? Um, I think Josh like, Allen's already better than Dak Prescott. He's been, he's been an all-pro, yeah. I think second-team all-pro twice, and Dak never has. So as far as them, either of them not winning a championship, I think that's on the table for both of them, absolutely. And if Dak Prescott never wins a championship or never even plays in one, I don't think they're going to talk about him like Barkley. Barkley's talked about like one of the great all-time players that never won. In sports, not right? just basketball. Like him, Carl Malone, like, uh, just in basketball I'm talking about now. But right. like him, Malone, uh, Ewing, you know, a bunch of guys, a bunch of guys who were great players. And but... who did all those guys have to go up against? 
right. Michael Jordan. I don't know if there is a clear cut Michael Jordan boogeyman Chicago Bulls in the NFL right it now. It should be Josh Allen. Right. <laughs> it should You're, be. No, good point. He should be the guy. Yeah. And for Dak, I mean, in the NFC this year in particular, the boogeymen weren't there. You know, the, the Rodgers wasn't there. Brady wasn't there. He didn't have to go through those guys. And uh, you still. <laughs> found yourself with all you could handle against Brock Purdy and Brock the Niners. Brock Purdy whooped the Dallas Cowboys. Fair enough. I mean, listen, it was the Niners defense that was doing all that, not Purdy, but still. You know, you, you only get so many kicks at the can. And uh, Dak Prescott not doing much with his opportunities there. 617-779-7937 is your phone number. Let's continue with our Patriots talk as we move into the 4 o'clock hour. We'll get to uh, Tommy Curran's latest, which had an uh, interesting uh, potential piece of news about the future of Matt Patricia. What?! Uh, what, what is that? <laughs> uh, we'll get to all of that with your phone calls next. The Greg Hill Show. They choked again. In this particular season, you basically have the entire country rooting for you. The, it's you're... the pressure of everybody saying that they're the team. Think about how impressive what the Patriots accomplished over the last 20 years is. Seeing these teams either not winning one or only having one, they fold. Did you miss something? Listen to the podcast presented by City of Boston Credit Union. Uniquely Boston on the Odyssey app or at
Boston Sports Original on the go. Wherever you go. Just download the Odyssey app. We're right back to it on WEEI. Tommy, what's taking so long with Gerard Mayo? Speaking of sewing up your guy. Don't know. Haven't heard. Don't think it's worth sweating, though. No? No. Why not? I'm sweating a little bit. I mean, they made a big announcement. He canceled all his appointments, and now it seems like it's dragging. What, uh, you I know? I think you're. I think you're hardwired to sweat. I don't know what kind of announcement will come down if he's canceling interviews and they're saying they're going to work to extend them. I just don't know if there's an announcement that comes down that says he's staying. It's, it's almost assumed, I, I would imagine, in many ways. What all that did, in my estimation, Christian, was to say, we're not going to continue to have a brain drain here. We're not going to continue to have valued individuals not understand that we want to give the rest of the league a hands-off impression. The bigger tumbler to fall into places Gerard knowing that he'll have an opportunity to realize a, a head coaching aspiration here in New England. Mm. What is wrong with me? <laughs> I don't even remember making I don't think uh. I was conscious that I made that noise in a reaction. <laughs> that was fantastic. Mm. Uh, it's Christian Arcan, the, the grunting Megan Adeline. That wasn't really a grunt. I don't know what it's that like was. like a moan. Yeah, mm. sort of like a, yeah. Not like a moan moan, but like... It's like an intrigued tiger. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Anyways. Oh? Hmm. That was from last Thursday. Yes, last Thursday. When we spoke with Tommy Kern, and I asked him what the hell was taking so long with Gerard Mayo and why there hasn't been any announcements yet. Since it seems like they're going full court press to keep him alongside uh, Bill Belichick as... Assistant head coach, associate head coach. I don't know exactly what it is because no one's I believe. announced it yet. That's the rumor that I've heard. It would but be assistant. Right now, all I know is that his contract is expiring or has expired. It doesn't expire until like until the whole the season's end of over. This season, yes, okay. Because the, uh, the Patriots season ended two weeks ago, so like yes, it's when the, the NFL season's over. The end of the NFL calendar year. Got it. Which so is March. That's coming up. All right. So that's you know after the Super Bowl and everything fine. Um, Gerard Mayo. Uh, apparently, according to Burt Breer, was sitting alongside Bill Belichick for all the offensive coordinator interviews last week. Breer called that a good sign of Mayo's growing role with the team. They met with five offensive coordinator candidates over Zoom. And Mayo was right there in the picture, I guess, with Bill. Like uh, like the two bobs from Office Space, and um, that was that was surprising to me because I sort of feel like does he have a job yet or what? Like you know, <laughs> are you gonna are you gonna sign the guy? Is he gonna be part of the coaching? Can you announce it yet or no? If it's an extension, then I feel like you can. If you're waiting and he wants to go out and explore free agency or whatever, I mean, it's not the same as like players. But what what's the holdup here? You got him in there interviewing people. Can you announce his new job? Like, what, like what's the, what's taking so long? It's really interesting because they put out that really strange statement right. the other week. A couple of weeks ago, they put out the statement saying that they were extending Gerard Mayo in the subject line. And then you go down and it actually just said, we're planning, we are working on extending We really Gerard want Mayo, to extend Or something Mayo. to yeah. that extent. And then all the reports after it were, well, that... That statement came out because they're really close to extending him. Tommy Curran there saying, don't sweat it, but we may never get an announcement that they've decided to hire him. All of a sudden, we'll see the the way that they do, usually either before OTAs or minicamp. 
they put out the roster essentially of the coaches and their coaching positions because at some point they they do a really silly thing where they have to make all of the assistants available mm-hmm. once the new season right, right, right. once the new preseason starts that and what the Patriots weird like this year, yeah. what the Patriots like to do is make them all available back to back yeah so that you just ask the same question so that they don't have to face any breaking news or any developing storylines with the season whatsoever unless they're in a position where they want to. I'm not really aware about specifically what you're talking about. So what Kern was saying there is we might not know that Mayo is with the Patriots in an assistant coach capacity until they decide to put it in print on the website or in a little i don't know what you call it uh what is what's the little thing Press that they release? give out no 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 that they give out at training camp like uh, a program oh, like media guide like oh, a media, media guide, guide or yeah, a program yeah, and that is bizarre if you're going to put out a statement saying essentially you plan to extend him mm-hmm. it's just kind of there it seems like there may be a disconnect there between what ownership wants to convey to the fans and also back to mayo and then bill seemingly still being like I that's not that important to me. If he's going to do that job here, let's start having him do that job. So we don't know what the contract situation is. No, we don't. And I also sort of feel like Gerard Mayo is going out or he was going to go out and interview for a defensive coordinator job or a head coaching job. And he canceled those. And now he's in the Zoom meetings when you're interviewing offensive coordinator. You know what I mean? Like, what what does he want? It's almost like a front office job. You know, like, is that what he's angling for? Like, what's what's really the 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 point of this? Because if you're bringing him in to be the assistant head coach and then Bill Belichick's going to leave and you want him to be the new head coach after that, then that's a succession plan. That's big news. That's something that needs to be sort of discussed more than just, yeah. oh, yeah, he's in there on the Zoom meetings. It like might that's... make someone go, hmm. Yeah, someone like one of the people they interviewed maybe, like Bill O'Brien maybe, who was thinking, yeah, if I get in there and I'm the OC and then Bill retires and I could be the head coach and then he realizes, oh, well, they got Mayo there. He's going to do that. I'm going to go somewhere else. Am I silly mm. Am I, am I silly for being bothered that it was Zooms? Um, A little bit. Is that is that silly of me? That they did the interviews on Zoom call? Yeah. No, I, don't, I mean. I understand why that, you, why that all of these guys have other jobs, but if you're seriously considering bringing anyone in who's not Bill O'Brien, if there's a plan behind Bill O'Brien, plan B, plan C, it just makes me feel again like they really think they have O'Brien locked up. And it's like, what are we going to do? We're going to sit here and re like basically catch him up to speed from the outside of what he probably already knows through Nick Saban and other people that he's connected to through Gillette and the Patriots still. And we're going to talk about the job that he's already done. Whereas with these other guys, if you're bringing one of these other guys in to be a first time play caller or to be your off- a first time offensive coordinator in the NFL, wouldn't you want to sit with them for a while, like walk around Gillette with them, maybe get dinner with them, yeah. talk through what their vision is for that and yeah. how hi, they're going to be different than last year. Yeah, Sean, we want you to uh, we want to talk to you about you know some of the vacancies we might have. We just want to pick your brain a little bit. Maybe oh, no, no, just, no, no, don't worry about plane tickets. Don't worry about plane tickets. We're not that serious. Like maybe I'm just old school that way, where I feel like, or maybe it's my own subconscious thing because I know I'm terrible on Zoom. If I have to do a Zoom interview, like that doesn't convey well. But you learn a lot from spending time with somebody versus doing a video call. What Sean is that, Jefferson, like a have you ever minute video call? Have you ever dined at Red Robin? <laughs> because <laughs> there's is the Red Robin still open, by the way? Is that still a, a Patriot place? Or they get rid of it. I am not sure. I haven't oh, checked. Goodness. Well, if they did, uh, I if had they a friend. Did, that's a big mistake because talk about a recruiting uh, a recruiting boom. I had a friend who was the Red Robin in high school. Really? As her job, she worked at the Red Robin by our local mall in Maryland, uh-huh. and they once a month would make her get in the Robin suit. <laughs> Like, it was like a big... That's tough. It was a big red bird suit. And she was this little high school girl. And we'd go visit her. And she'd have to, like, stand outside the restaurant and wave to people well, with was, her wings. She had wings. to, like, point a size at her? Yeah. yeah. As far yeah. as I can tell, the Red Robin she, and Patriot Place is She'd try open. to, like, direct people into the restaurant. Thank goodness. Don't ever <laughs> scare me like that again, Arcan. Telling me the Red Robin clothes. What's wrong with you? I almost had a heart attack over here. I never see the Robin, though. Um, you never yeah, see, I don't the see the Robin, Robin. I don't see the Robin. Uh, speaking of mascots, my cousin, 
So there in New Hampshire, there's this arcade called Fun Spot up in uh, Laconia, and it's like Ooh, the, that sounds very it's the best. Edgy. It's honestly the best place ever. It's fun. It's the biggest go to the arcade. Fun Spot with your cousin. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I was like ten, and she was sixteen, and so she would bring us to Fun Spot, and she was dating. This is very troubling. The guy who uh, there. So the mascot of Fun Spot was this dragon <laughs> named Top Snuff, which is Fun Spot backwards. And my cousin was dating Top Snuff, dating the kid, the kid who wore the suit and walked around and handed out tickets and tokens to the kid and stuff like that and when i tell you it was like she was dating prince harry <laughs> like, you know what i mean like it was the biggest like we were strutting around yeah my cousin knows top snuff like so what, he just what complained you know? about his family the whole time um basically yeah <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty much the same thing uh 617-779-7937 is your phone number let's go to the phones talk to charlie who is in boston go ahead charlie hey what's going on great show so far guys Thanks, charlie. um so I'm kind of I'm kind of depressed that the Bills actually lost this weekend because I was just hoping they'd make it to the Super Bowl win and then they could just you know they'd rest on their laurels. But the fact that the Bills now have to improve is like that sucks because they're already so much better than us. It's a good right? point, Charlie. It's, it's a great point. Also, if you look at their offensive roster, though, it's Stephon Diggs and nothing, right? So it brings you back to like the quarterback versus the weapons argument, right? So if you look at the Bengals' weapons. I mean, you got T. Higgins, Jamar Chase, uh, Joe Mixon. The whole their, their whole roster is very good on offense. Bills don't have much, so we're going to see this weekend whether it's the quarterback or the roster because Patty Mahomes has Travis Kelsey and a bunch of no names. Um, um, listen, that's true, but they also have a fantastic offensive line, and that's the thing about the Chiefs that people often forget. You know, well, they don't have that many great. Bet. First of all, they got Travis Kelsey who's a top tight end, and Smith Schuster who maybe isn't. That great, but you could have had him two years ago. You passed and went with Aguilar and Bourne instead, and uh, he went back to Pittsburgh and then signed with the Chiefs this past year on like a one-year, $7 million deal. He cost nothing, and you spent a lot of money on those receivers who didn't give you much. But more importantly, the Chiefs have three elite, I think all pro if not, but all three of them are pro bowls for sure, offensive linemen. One of them was your old guard, Joe Tooney. He's still there, and he's still, you know, making a big impact. Uh, the other's Orlando Brown Jr., who they signed away from Baltimore when he was yet a Pro Bowl year with the Ravens, and they still ponied up the money for him. And the other one is uh, Creed, I want to say Creed Bratton, but I know that's not right, Creed Humphreys, the center, who they just drafted uh, last year or the year before and is already an all-pro center. Like, you have... You have a really good offensive line there in Kansas City, and I think that that's a huge difference. One of the biggest differences, other than Patrick Mahomes to Mac Jones, uh, between you and the Chiefs, and that's not one that I take lightly. I think that that's a huge difference maker, and you can see it just in the way that Mahomes is able to operate compared to Mac Jones. I do want to push back on the suddenly the Bills have nobody. Okay, first of all, the Bills were a darling to start the season. True. And you can say that their running game became non-existent and that other teams figured out how to run on their defense because that definitely were two developments that I would agree with. Mm -hmm. But to pretend like it's Josh Allen and Steph Diggs and nobody else, I mean, I don't know. Did Gabe Davis, like, evaporate? He had a good year. Gabe Davis had more receiving yards than anybody on the Patriots. Or what about Dawson Knox? Dawson Knox had... Knox had a disappointing season. He, and he missed a couple of games as well. I just had it up in front of me. He had um, over 500 receiving yards, six touchdowns, which is more touchdowns than Hunter, Hunter Henry. Henry and Jonu Smith combined yeah. for two. Look, I I'm, I understand that it wasn't as powerful an offense as the Bengals have looked or that, that uh, Josh Allen doesn't create the way that uh, Patrick Mahomes or Patty Mahomes, as the caller called him, <laughs> does but to this now this narrative that oh they don't have anybody josh allen does it totally on his own you can say that about the running game but i don't know if that i would extend that to the entire roster yeah the entire depth chart i wouldn't go there either and also when you have stefan diggs who's an elite wide receiver that elevates sort of everybody else i think oh we only have stefan diggs like cry me a river yeah mckenzie's a pretty good third guy davis i think is a very good uh, number two wide receiver um that offense from a wide receiver perspective was Nothing to sneeze at. They could have maybe had a little more help on the offensive line, and they definitely don't have any running backs. But, I mean, come on. They made it pretty far and won a ton of games this year with, with that offense. I mean, they grabbed Naheen Himes halfway through the year, and look what he did to the Patriots in their last game of the season for two <laughs> touchdown returns. How could I forget? Uh, let's go to Mikos up in Maine. Hello, Mikos. Hey, guys. What's up? Uh, this is my first time calling. I just uh, appreciate the show. I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about uh, 
you know, where the Patriots are at right now as a team. Okay, well, um, what do you want to say? <laughs> yeah, so basically, uh, you know, there's some upper echelon teams, right? Like 13-win teams, 12-win teams. AFC, you've got, you know, Bills, Chiefs, Bengals, right? But if you look at the Patriots uh, season, I mean, there's at least four games they should have won. I mean, the Raiders game, and nobody talks about the Bengals game. That was a Ramon J. Stevens fumble away from beating that team. That's going to go. Migos, we we get, did I, talk about those games. And thanks for the call. Just just so we're clear, we did talk about those games, and they should have won those games, sure. But the fact that they didn't wasn't some fluky thing. They what lost games like this won? all year. They lost games like that all season long. Why should they have won the Bengals game? That was a feature, not a buck, because they had the ball with a minute left. They and lost it the same way that they lost a handful of other games that's this season. My point exactly is that they had a lot of bad discipline and brain farts at the end of you games. You can say they could have. That not should have. You need to remove the should have from that sentiment. You can say they could have beat the bagels. Okay, they could have beat them. I said the bagels again. The bangles. Bagels. <laughs> Sometimes that get part of that word gets caught in my mouth, and I end up saying bagels. The end part. It's like I don't know where it is, but yeah. I, I bagels. I, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Those are some tasty bagels. But you okay? So switch it to could. You could have beat those teams. You could have beat the Raiders. You could have beat the Bengals. You probably could have beat Chicago if you hadn't just completely, I don't know, ruined both of your quarterbacks for at least a couple weeks Mm -hmm. in terms of their confidence and whatever you did there. That is bizarre, that game. Could have, not should have. Like, you weren't the favorite to go out and do all of this this year. Could have beat the Packers. That was an overtime loss. You it was be, an overtime you loss. You could have beat true. the Packers. It was a one-point loss. Yeah, but you didn't because you're not a good finishing team. You're just not. You know. That's why I mean, it's if could you, have not should have. If you're if you're down at the end of a game, you're generally not coming back. Uh, you're not the type of team that you know stages fourth quarter comebacks and has game winning drives. It's just not. That's just not who the Patriots are. And by the way, if the Jets didn't have Zach Wilson playing in both of those games, and you probably lost both of those two games too. So for every one of those, you can say, well, they should have won this game. There's some games they probably could have lost just as easily, uh, like both of those Jets games. If uh, biggest douche in the universe wasn't playing. Six one seven 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 nine seven ninety three seven. There's your phone number. When we come back, Tommy Curran had a piece uh, over the weekend that really. Um, I thought it took a flamethrower to Bill Belichick and this whole coaching search and had an interesting tidbit about the potential future of Matt Patricia. We'll get to all of that right after Ryan Garvin tells you what's trending. Your home of the Sox. Now, here's what's trending on WEEI. It appears that Patrick Mahomes will be playing uh, Sunday against the Bengals. Uh, Patrick Mahomes did stay in the game yesterday against... um, Oh, my God, I just completely blanked on who the Chiefs beat, but it doesn't matter because the Jaguars, Jaguars. the Jaguars. Thank you. That, no wonder I forgot. Um, but he is expected to play, according to Jeremy Fowler, after sustaining a, a high ankle sprain. Uh, the Bruins, they're also winning a lot of games. They beat the Sharks 4 nothing yesterday. Linus Allmark, the fastest goaltender in NHL history to reach 25 games, but the Bruins are expected to be without Tomas Noshek for the foreseeable future with a non-displaced uh, fracture in his left foot. Mark McLaughlin has been called up uh, from Providence. He will be in the game Tuesday against the Montreal Canadiens. Celtics are looking for their 10th consecutive win tonight in Orlando, but they must do it without Marcus Smart and Malcolm Brogdon. Malcolm Brogdon ruled out with personal reasons, while uh, Marcus Smart left the Raptors game over the weekend with a what is also a high ankle sprain. Rob Williams is questionable. He is dealing with some knee pain management after Jalen Brown rolled into his leg uh, during the Raptors game as well. Trending Now is brought to you by Awaken 180 Weight Loss. Now, sure, hunger suppressants, fasting, or a cleanse can help you lose weight quick. But you know what is sustainable? You already know the answer. All you have to do is make the call. And, of course, you make the call to Awaken 180 Weight Loss. I'm Ryan Garvin. That is what is trending now on WEEI. Tommy Kern wrote a very good piece about uh, what could be going on with Matt Patricia. And did he take some shots at Bill Belichick? We explore all that right after this. The Red Sox Station. 93.7.
424 here, Sports Radio, WEEI, Christian Arkin, Megan Adelini, taking you up until 6 o'clock. We'll get back to the Red Sox here in about, I don't know, a half hour or so. But we'd be remiss if we uh, didn't touch on this piece from Tommy Kern, which was posted, I believe, on Saturday? Yeah, Saturday. And it says, the Patriots' offensive coordinator search shows that Belichick's comfort trumps all. And he writes... Everything is on hold as we wait for white smoke to rise over one Patriot place. I already used that joke, Tommy, just so you know. It's a nice Pope joke. The Pope joke. Uh, signaling an actual real-life... <laughs> I know. Homo sapien has been selected to run the Patriots Oh, what? Real-life Homo sapien. Oh, okay. Has been, it's a human has been elected uh, selected to run the Patriots offense with a title and everything like you've seen on TV. When that news drops, we'll dive deep into either why hiring Bill O'Brien... Or means the Patriots are back in it, or why the Patriots couldn't get Bill O'Brien. And as we wait, we can credit the Patriots for casting a wider net at OC than they did last offseason when they cast no net at all. But the net still isn't that big, and if you're not a friend of Bill Belichick, you need not apply. Every individual screen has some kind of Belichickian tie. Adrian Clem, a second-round draft pick. Keenan McCardo played in Cleveland. Jefferson, wide out for the Patriots. Uh, overlap with Belichick in 96. Not when he was a head coach, though. Uh, Nick Cayley has been on staff since 2015 as a tight ends coach. O'Brien's obviously been here. The industry is teeming with offensive coaches with novel ideas and approaches, but it seems the only way to get an audience with Bill Belichick is by having been previously hired by him. Uh, Clem McCardell or O'Brien or shared a locker room, Jefferson. Doesn't matter if he goes back three decades to find that tie. If it's there, the number one qualification is satisfied. Then he will deem to give an audience. The incestuous approach has an obvious upside familiarity. Um, first of all, we talked about this as these interviews were sort of coming up here. There's a connection with every single one of these guys, it seems like. It's like and, the, what is it, the six degrees to Kevin Bacon? Yeah, right. So it has to be like one degree to Bill Belichick. One degree of Bill Belichick. Otherwise, you're not getting a meeting. You're not getting a Zoom call. You're not, uh, we're not going to bring you in. Two degrees too much. Care. Can't um, trust your word. Isn't this exactly sort of the problem or maybe not the problem, but the complaint that most people had about last year? and sort of the coaching brain drain and how this has all been sort of just, all right, there's lots of different ways to skin a cat and run an offense out there. But you're not really interested in hearing from anybody who's not already sort of beholden to you in some way or another, whether it's, you know, uh, 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 working together 30 years ago or more recently, you know, I've hired you onto my staff or I drafted you in 2000 or whatever it is. Like there's there's always got to be some sort of connection there, which leads me to think, he hasn't really learned much at all, you know? Like, I, I don't really think that there's too much you can say about what happened this past season and the approach this year and really think, wow, yeah, it seems like Bill's really kind of figured out that this way of doing things is very limiting and maybe you don't get the best candidates if you're only going with people that you know and that you've worked with before. And I just sort of feel like that that message hasn't landed at all, 
right? I mean, it really has. It. Like, it's not as extreme as last time where he would only bring in people who he didn't have to pay, you know, because they were already on someone else's payroll. And we'll get to another uh, part of Kern's a column which addresses that too. But just as far as all that's concerned, aren't we sort of right back where we started with all of this? I mean, this is really just a, a shallow pool he's uh, he's fishing from, and it's the same pool as before. What happened last season, last off season with the offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coaching situation is the worst case example of this, where it really just destroyed your chances of having a competent offense mm-hmm. kind of from the get go. Everybody in the know was sitting there saying this is just a really, really strange idea at best. It's a really odd choice at best. But it doesn't just uh, apply to his coaches who he works with. Obviously, those are the people who he's closest to and who he spends the most time with in meetings and everything outside of practices and games. But as Curran points out, it also we've seen it hurt the draft at different points. And it's worked for him in the draft at different points where everybody jokes about how obsessed he was with Rutgers because Steve was playing there. So he had a comfort level there and tapped in and got Devin McCourty and some other players. And so felt like that was a program that he could trust people whose Mm -hmm. opinion he could trust. It's more than anything. He only trusted Meyer guys out of Florida for a few years, Alabama recently. He trusts your system. He trusts your opinion and he trusts how you feel about players. But we've also seen it backfire immensely in the draft. And especially we talk, look, you can talk ad nauseum about the Nikhil Harry draft and how he had people on his staff going out and picking out different receivers, DK Metcalf, and saying, you know, you can get him here. This is a, this is the guy that you should be looking at. And instead he goes with what one of his pals says. This has been, an, you can say, an issue, a feature of how he does business all the way through. And he's going to continue doing it this way. Like, it, it comes down to, it does make you wonder if there are guys out there, people out there who are much more, I guess, a much better possible candidate, much more qualified, or have much more interesting ideas that they could bring into the position than these other candidates who he is bringing in besides Bill O'Brien. And I don't say that to knock the other candidates, and that they're bad choices or anything, but none of them have been play callers at an NFL level. Mm-hmm. And... They all do have this tie to Bill, which then makes you say, is he excluding a whole population out there just because he's not friends with them or he doesn't have friends of friends of them? Uh, Yeah. And or not his own kids you know, right. or something like that. But that's that's true. And uh, it's very it's very sort of frustrating, I think, when you when you consider, first of all, that, you know, Bill Belichick's been coaching for 100,000 years. So, I mean, there's not a lot of people who don't have some kind of connection to him out there somewhere. But there are plenty that are on other coaching trees that have uh, stronger connections, other places and are really just sort of known for being either part of Shanahan or part of McVeigh or part of these other uh, trees right now that are trendy and popular, and there's guys out there looking for work. And it just sort of seems like there's no interest. <laughs> like It's not just that I only want to coach the guys that I like and that I know, but it's I'm not interested in coaching anybody else. And that, I think, is, well, for a guy, I mean, obviously Bill Belichick's an older coach, and we all know about old dogs and new tricks here, but like they're, to a point, there has to be some sort of give I think at least when you want to get the most out of a job interview process like this at the very least bring in someone who you know you're not going to hire but at least bring him in for an interview and hear what they have to say well, he doesn't even want to hear what they have to say I think he's doing that but he's doing that with people that he trusts there are a couple of these candidates you look at where they're coming from and you wonder is he just tapping into information here is he just satisfying some curiosity he has about different systems mm-hmm. or different programs at the college level or whatever and it's, well, you, we want to hear a variety of voices anyway, but this isn't really a serious candidate, but I like where they're coming from. And he was a great player, and I think he's a great character, and so let's hear from him. But at the same time, you know, extend that to somebody who's not a friend of Bill or not a friend of the lacrosse world or, you know, doesn't yeah. have attachment to Rutgers or didn't play for you at some point. You know, both in the coaching staff and in the draft and in making trades for different players and all of it. 
I don't know. It, at some point, you know, this does happen to everyone on a human level. Yeah. It's not just Bill Belichick. It's not like he is some insular, you know, guy who won't meet anyone new. But as you get older, your circle does become smaller. Yeah. Like you just don't have as much time or patience for people oftentimes who don't see things the same way that you see them. And I'm sure that whoever he brings into this situation, he doesn't want to have to feel like he has to sell them on the way that he does things down there. Fair enough. But when that leads to I'm Matt Patricia and Joe thing. Judge right. running the offense. I'm then... not saying that a good thing. I'm just yeah. saying that's how it looks on its face. And that's fine. But then that means you have to reevaluate the way you do things. Um, Kern goes on to write, not everyone remains a made man forever. Trust can evaporate. Ask Mangini, ask Flores. But if you stay on the right side of Bill, Foxborough becomes a safe harbor for friends who got turned out into the cold. When Mike Lombardi got fired by Cleveland, he worked for the Patriots for two years. After Matt Patricia got fired, Belichick brought him in to stay busy and lick his professional wounds. Gross. Joe Judge (laughs) was dismissed by the Giants, landed back in New England. In each of those cases, the former team was on the hook for paying the balance of the contract with presumably some offset from the Patriots. He then goes on to say that... uh, both Bielma and Lombardi moved on from the Patriots when contracts with their old employers ran out and the Patriots would have to start paying. We'll see if that happens with Patricia, whose Lions deal has now expired. I'm hearing he might be on his way out as well. We'll see if this plays out that way. But that right there, that sentence right I'm there. I'm hearing he might be on his way out. Matt Patricia might be on his way out. I don't know. <laughs> Sounds like you do, Tom. If Matt Patricia's on his way out. And Bill sort of knew that this was when the bill came due, that this was what was going to happen. The fact that he put him at offensive coordinator this past year is, is a crime. I mean, honestly, that is like, that's a war crime. I cannot believe that. He should be court-martialed for that. If you're bringing in an offensive coordinator who you only have on the staff because he's getting paid by another team and the second you have to a pony up any money for him, you're going to let him go, you're going to fire him, let him walk out the door, and you entrust him with your second-year quarterback? Like, I'm sorry. That is ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous. That is a ridiculous way to run your team. And if that's true, I mean, we'll see if Patricia's gone or not. I, it, first of all, flies right in the face of all the happy horse crap we had to hear about how smart Patricia is and how, oh, yeah, you know, just because he's a defensive coach doesn't mean he also, doesn't also know offense. And, yeah, he can be a behind-the-scenes guy and do all that Ernie Adams stuff and be a great assistant to Bill and all this other, you know, nonsense that we heard about his role and how vital he is and how much they all like him there and how much Bill likes him and the Crafts like him. And, hey, maybe after Bill retires, Patricia can be the new head coach. We heard that. When he came back, people were saying that. And now he's gonna. The second you have to pay him a cent, he's out the door. Oh, that really pisses me off. That really that makes it seem like the offensive coordinator, whoever's doing this job, d- couldn't possibly matter less. Now I hear you, Arcan. I'm gonna keep you honest here a little bit, fine? Because I do recall that when we were talking about reports that there were not going to be coaches who were going to get fired. I believe it was from Curran. Mm-hmm. There's not going to be heads, heads on, heads heads on, on spikes. Sta- spikes being carried around, you know, Foxborough to show everybody, oh, heads are rolling now. And that bothered you that they were just going to get shuffled around and be in the building. Mm-hmm. So now, if he's out, if Matt Patricia is out because they don't want to put him on Robert Kraft's payroll, shouldn't that make you happy? It should. But the reason, it makes me happy. The reason for it because is what's I, upsetting. I go back to, okay, if you're trying to reset and get at least back, you know, back to baseline. Because I really do feel that they started last season in the offseason below baseline. Mm-hmm. So they're trying to just get back to baseline and build up from there. I don't want Mac Jones in the building with Joe Judge and Matt Patricia. And if Matt Patricia is one that has to go because he's not going to be on the craft payroll, that's something for me to feel good about. Fine. But that also speaks to me in a way that... That mistake already happened. It though. did. It already happened, and that's fine. And Matt Patricia probably should get fired. And if he was still here for free and they decided to fire him and say, hey, you know, it's not working out, we're going to move on from you, then I'd be okay with that. And if he was already getting paid and they said, all right, well, we're not going to pay you anymore because you didn't do a good job, then I'd be okay with that too. The fact that now that the bills come due, now that it's not free to have him on the staff anymore, they're going to move on from him. That's the main reason. That's a it's, not cause he was, it's not because he was a bad coach. It's not because he wasn't a good coordinator. It's because now it's going to actually cost you something. You're right that on that. That pisses me off. No, that's gross. It's a gross look, but it also was the look all last season. And so, again, I had to sit here and, and- – say to myself that mistake already happened 
We can be pissed off about that mistake all off season. Continue if it if it carries over some stink into next year. We can remain pissed off about it. But I'm not going to be mad that the guy's leaving the building. I'm not going to be mad that, oh, now that you have to pay him, you're going to let him leave. It's a gross look, but at least he's not here anymore. Sure. Like, I would turn in my math homework as a kid in school, and I would get the answer right. But then my teacher would circle the answer and say, well, the answer is right, but you, the work you showed doesn't make sense. Like, you just kind of lucked into the oh, so solution. It's almost like you looked at the desk next to you <laughs> and just took the answer and almost. then made up work that you were showing below it. Because the idea that Matt Patricia is not going to be in any kind of real authoritative figure over the team is like, how great, about he's, How awesome. about he's not even in the building? Like, if, if the relationship between your starting quarterback and now going into his third year and those coaches is how it looks is how it sounds don't have him in the building if you're going to bring that quarterback back but it's just the idea that we all looked at this and went this is not working and bill belichick is like i agree but that's not why he would be getting rid of matt patricia not for the the poor job that he did for the fracture in the relationship between mac jones and the team it's because you don't want to pay him I'm with you. It's super gross. Yeah, it it's sucks. super gross. And I think that's – and it, it, Curran goes on to write this. He says, what's the downside to incestuousness as it relates to the coaching search? Coaching search. The pool of young guys willing to work long hours for short pay with an ambiguous title must remain stocked. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll run low on future candidates, especially if a coach is hired elsewhere and he raids your staff like Belichick did when he came to New England. The previous decade of Brady-aided teams saw success from younger coaches and executives – Fleeing for new jobs, McDaniels, Patricia, Flores on the coaching side, Casario, Monty Austin Ford on the personnel side. They leave, they bring coaching friends with them, the staff shrinks, and the pool of experience replacements gets even shallower. He's basically just exploiting these young friends of his kids and everybody else and not paying them anything and not giving them any coordinator status or any sort of status that they want and keeping them around there because it's cheap. I th- you know what I mean? Like, that's just sort of what it seems like he's doing. He's trying to save money, which I don't know if there's, like, a coaching budget and he gets whatever, you know, is out there, and that's why there's no coordinators. I don't know exactly. It's always been a mystery as to why these jobs are so low-paying. The mystery of why they're burning the midnight oil, that's not a mystery. That's just how it has always worked down mm-hmm. there. But the low-paying side is interesting. And it's just, you know what? It's a Bill Belichick internship. You know, you want to get your foot in the door? Yeah. Here's your internship. Be some great exposure for you. You know, like that that's one thing you, you love to hear. You got your foot in the door with Bill Belichick. Oh, that's great. worth something. Yeah, someday you can be Joe Judge coming back with your tail between your legs, uh, begging for a job. You know, you can be one of these young coaches who work for Bill end up leaving, getting a head coaching job, coming back. And that's just because they want to be Bill somewhere else. I guess so. But get it, their own little interns. It's all good stuff to bring up between, like, if, if what Curran is saying here is what is happening between – how, the handling of Matt Patricia and then like how he treats the promising guys that could leave like Josh McDaniels gets blocked for an interview so Joe Judge can go and do it for the Giants Nick Cayley can't go and interview with the Las Vegas Raiders when all the other staffers are going out there and then you're not going to do anything but throw him a, a sympathy interview because his contract is up why the hell would you want to work for this staff why the hell would you even want to work for this team there's got to be better jobs out there that are going to lead you to something because um, he's the greatest coach of all time okay great Gerard awesome. Mayo wants to be a defensive, right, a defensive coordinator, which I would imagine comes with a big raise and a pay uh-huh. bump. And Bill says, you know what? How about you just come in on the Zoom calls while I interview the offensive coordinators and we'll work on what we're going to call you somewhere down the road. Just call him a defensive coordinator. All right. You know, that's what he wants to be. That's a, a nice what promotion about assistant head for coach? being the linebackers coach. What the hell is an assistant head coach? He's the other guy on the Zoom call. <laughs> I mean, obviously, my God, he's who the cares other about that? I, can Maybe you, he gets to say something about whether or not you get hired. Maybe. Adrian Clem, could that's you walk power. us through what a day in your life is typically like yeah uh okay weird first question no that's what he gets to do yeah He's gerard, gerard mayo is like asleep next to bill while clem's talking about a day <laughs> like, i don't know six one seven 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 more sean jefferson seven ninety three seven there's your phone number quick break we'll be right back ninety three seven w e e i boston sports original ladies and gentlemen it's official
And take Boston Sports Original everywhere you go. Sports Radio WEEI, Christian Arcan, Megan Adelini here, taking you up until 6 o'clock. We turn things over to the Rich Keefe Show. Uh, we spent a lot of the day talking about the Red Sox, talking about the Patriots. Real quick, what's going on outside? How much snow is there? It's dumping out there. I don't know how much is accumulated. I can't it see anything. It's like now. dark out there. It's, uh, I mean, I still see it falling. See so. some things on Twitter about the roads being bad. I get a little nervous. I have all-wheel drive, but I am not from these parts. And after <laughs> 11, 12 years, I am still a really crappy driver in the snow. You guys drive SUVs. You'll be fine. You'll re- it's like probably a couple inches around Boston. No I always deal. have this fear of switching lanes. Do you have that in the snow? Like, I, I always worry for some reason that if I switch lanes... My car is just going to spin out of control. In the Sometimes, snow. and I because I lived in Colorado for a while, and that happened before. You know, yeah. you drive through those blizzards it's out there. Not happened to me. Knock on wood, but I just think I watched too many videos on the internet about it. Just be careful. Be careful when you drive. I drive like a grandma. Drive when like it a grandma snows. today. Yeah, I mean that's the best way to avoid those sorts of things. Uh, no one needs thought. to be a hero out there. Uh, speaking of which. Except for the, the first responders. The first responders do have to be <laughs> heroes out there. That's true. Um, and your uh, winter teams heroically continue to just beat the ever-loving you-know-what out of everybody they play. This is unbelievable. Like the, Even the Celtics, they're all banged up. They're injured. They lost like half the roster. Still beat Toronto. Uh, almost gave it away at the end there, just like they almost gave away that Golden State game. Still ended up winning it. And the Bruins, I'm sorry, like the Bruins look like they are uh, – like they're playing against a bunch of uh, AHL teams when they when they take the ice. They look like they're playing in a different league than many of the other teams in the NHL, which is just watching it. I mean, if you're a Bruins fan, it's remarkable. But for a talk radio perspective, it's really hard to say anything other than these guys are awesome. But with the Celtics, there may <laughs> be uh, there may be something here because chinks in the ama. Really, I mean, there was a lot of injuries in that game. A lot of guys going down with injuries. A lot of guys. A lot of guys already kind of banged up, um, and Tatum took that game off because of uh, wrist injury, which we know was just him uh, getting a little bit of uh, load management there. But man, I mean. You had an ankle injury for Robert Williams colliding with Jalen Brown. That was a weird play, too, by the way. Brown yeah. just sort of flailing out of control, and Williams was just standing there. It was, not an ambi-turner. I can't turn left. It was, uh, it was very illustrative of the character like the character of both of their games at times. Yeah. <laughs> Jalen looked just utterly out of control of his body trying to get the ball, and Rob Williams just standing being like, what's Jalen doing? Uh, Rob Williams... I'm ready to have Rob Williams sit for extended periods of time at this point in the season. To protect I feel, him. Yeah, yeah. I feel confident that he has come back mostly healthy and fine from the second surgery that he had on that knee, that same knee that he hyperextended against Toronto in the last 10 months. Like, dude's undergone, like, gone under the knife twice in 10 months. You're going to need him in the playoffs. So maybe, I don't know, the other night uh, Tatum was talking about how Al Horford had two days off and then went out and balled out. So maybe put Williams on that plan. I don't feel like I need him playing against Toronto on a random Saturday in January. Yeah. Maybe that's just me being NBA soft, but the guy has like just soft tissue injuries for days and you need him and you don't really have a great other big behind him and Al 
no offense to Blake Griffin or, or Luke your Cornett. guy Luke Cornett. The murder Cornett. They both, what did they play, like a combined eight minutes or something? Um, Something like that, yeah. Or eight minutes each, and they had two points? Yeah. And Not too much. great. Um, the injury report, which came out yesterday, has Marcus Smart out with a sprained ankle. Robert Williams is questionable with left knee injury management. And Malcolm Brogdon's out for personal reasons. I don't know what those are, but uh, not injury-related. Derek White also took a nasty spill the other day. Mm-hmm. They said that he's okay. Um, Marcus Smart and Robert Williams, they both said from x-rays, avoided any kind of serious injuries. And that's great. But now we're talking about the meat of your roster with some issues you know and not just not just little things here like robert williams that he hyperextended his that's knee. what i'm that's saying the knee that he had surgery on. like there's there's a thing there that's that's a problem that you have to keep an then eye again, on again apparently they have 15 to 20 to 30 to 45 sports medicine experts yep. on staff who They're are all there calculating exactly how many minutes he should have so they probably have a better idea than me being just a yahoo on the radio being like i don't like how much you're playing him he hurt his knee again but it does feel like at some point shouldn't common sense take over and go, you really are going to need this guy in May and June. Yeah. So he doesn't need to play against Toronto in January. The most important thing, obviously, is keeping Brown and Tatum healthy. And I think that they are, for the most part, both reasonably healthy. But I also think, I mean, it's a thin line, especially with Jalen Brown. It's a thin line between healthy enough to play and out for a month. I mean, really, like, that's, you're right there. You, I feel like he's towing that line every single time he steps out there. And it's not that he's frail or anything or that he's injury prone, but when he gets hurt, he gets hurt. And he's and he, oftentimes he plays playing physi- with stuff. He yeah. plays physically. He plays like, through it, things. It goes along with it. The style of play that both he and Marcus Smart play leads to, I'm not saying that they play dangerously or anything, but they're physical players. You know, they're not just going to, like, stand on the outside and shoot for the most part. Yep. Uh, Despite all this, the Celtics, the hottest team in basketball. They've won nine in a row. And uh, tonight... They got the Orlando Magic, who randomly Ooh. owned them this year. This Their is biggest true. rival. I mean, honestly, like Orlando's won seventeen games, maybe this year, seventeen, eighteen. Kind of like games. A, a nerdy basketball thing that I Arkin, you actually you guys might be in on this. You know who might be making their season debut who has not played in the last two years for the Orlando Magic? That'd be Jonathan Isaac. Jonathan oh, Isaac weird. is expected to make his return for the first. I know he's played some G League games. I think he played like two or three games where he averaged like 15 or 16 points. But Jonathan Isaac was a guy coming out of the draft. I'm like, ooh, I like him. He, he's got all the tools. Big, long athlete. I want to see what he does. Orlando tends to draft well. I think they've done okay with their young players. But that was just something that popped into my mind when you mentioned the Orlando Magic. Jonathan Mag- Isaac. Dreaded, or, dreaded Orlando Magic. Am I, am I wrong or is Jonathan Isaac a little touched? He's a little, he's a little out there, right? A little Kyrie in him. Oh, I, I don't know anything about I think, his person. I, I think know. Jonathan Isaac was like a hardcore anti vet like one of those guys. Oh, geez, okay. I, think, really? I, may, I may be wrong, maybe don't mixing him up with somebody, that. but let me just make sure I'm, I'm right about this because I think I am. Uh, and I, I liked him coming out of college too, but I think that he shared some very extreme. Maybe it wasn't about that, but it was. Yeah, no, he, he was anti vex Yep. <laughs> well, he had a lot of time to do reading. You know, the two years that he was not playing basketball. Yes. Yeah. I, was, um, I yeah. was talking to somebody the other day, and I was like, is there something, is there anything horrible that I should know about Brock Purdy? I think we just don't know that much about him. He's a young guy, yeah, you know, other than being Purdy. Mr. Irrelevant. And they were like, no, no, I don't, I don't, I haven't seen anything about Brock Purdy. And I was like, cool. I like Brock Purdy. I think I'm not going to Google anything about him. I'm not going to find out anything. He's I just on video like him. kicking puppies and kitties. It is so rare that you get someone like Joe Burrow where the more that you learn about Joe Burrow or the more you see him speak or the more he says, this is what my foundation is doing. You're like, wow, what a great guy. He just seems to get better all the time. That is such a rarity. Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah, our game uh, stopped the Jonathan Isaac. Yeah, yeah, are down, you in a rabbit there. hole there? I was, but just I just let it go. Just, just close that window. It. I don't need, I don't need the uh, thank else you to Jonathan everyone Isaac. on the text line who's saying that uh, they've switched lanes in the snow and they have totaled their truck before. That makes me feel much better <laughs> about driving home in the snow and the fear that I have about getting in an accident. One time I was driving uh, my friend back Stop looking at the text line, to his apartment way. in uh, in Colorado and I had to take a right and there was like this frontage road and there was like a ditch in between the two roads. And so I go to turn onto the street and we just spin right into the ditch. And oh the car God. the car stayed up, so it's not like we flipped over or anything. So we were still How like How fast up, were you going? Like nothing, like a mile an hour maybe. I was turning onto a street. Okay. So I was barely going any like amount it up, but it, we just started sliding and the car goes nose first right into the ditch. So 
we get out and we're trying to, you know, push the car and everything. And outside the ditch, there was like a little bike path and these two big trees. And I'm gunning the engine trying to get out of the ditch and the wheels finally catch. And when I tell you, I split these uprights of trees, like right in between them. I'm pretty sure that I knocked one of my uh, rearview mirrors right off. And we sh- shot right up out of the ditch oh my and God. made it out. And so we all get back in the car. Wait, I get back onto car, the road. It was uh, four Taurus. Okay. It was like a 2002 Ford Taurus. So I get back, we all get back into the Taurus. I go back out. I go to make that same turn and I go into the ditch again. <laughs> <laughs> this exact same thing happened. Brett Maher would have really taken bad. that Ford Taurus and put it right into the left tree. I know. He would have. <laughs> and by the way, I felt I felt good for Brett Maher when he finally made a kick. I was like, good for you, man. The first one, though, <laughs> was so yeah. wide left that I think yeah. one of the gunners actually got his hand on it. Like, yeah. Even if they didn't block it, he still would have missed it wide Yeah, left, that anyway. got blocked by the chain gang. It was so off to the left. That was uh, that was a brutal one. But then he kicked a couple after that, and uh, good for him. His team lost, but uh, I felt good for Mar. 617-779-7937. There's your phone number. We'll continue with your phone calls. And when we uh, come back, we'll reset on the Red Sox and the weekend from hell that they had up in Springfield. That's coming up next. Gresh and Fourier. I will go as far as to say that this offense once.
W-E-E-I, Christian Arcan, Megan Adelini here with you on this snowy Monday. Um, we'll get to your phone calls in just a moment as we take you up until 6 o'clock. It was a tough weekend for your Boston Red Sox. And how could it have been a tough weekend? It's not like there was some big signing they didn't get. It wasn't like, uh, you know, the season started and they had a bad weekend or a bad series. No, no, no. It was winter weekend. Red Sox winter weekend out in Springfield. Yay! Conveniently out in, uh, out in Springfield, man. Yeah, it's so fun. Um, which was just uh, right now. It was at the um, Mass Mutual Center, which is right across the street from the MGM Casino, which is where I parked and just so happened to walk through there on my way. You know, to wait, 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 wait. When you described this event, because you went there for your Saturday show. Yes. I thought that it was in the casino and that's why you were playing craps while no, you no, were no. there. I parked in the casino. And then walked across the street to the Mass Mutual Center. So you, this is like how yesterday I said I have to go to the grocery store to pick up some food. And really it was because I wanted to go to the star market that where I saw online that Girl Scouts were selling cookies. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, That's yeah. kind of what you did. I mean, yeah. My version was way more innocent, but I wasn't same ju- idea. I didn't drive two hours to Springfield just to play craps for an hour, which is what I ended up doing. Uh, and won a little money, too, by the way. But uh, no, that's not the whole reason why I went out there. Uh, it was I was there to do my award-winning Saturday program, of course, and to hang out with my good friends Rob Bradford and Ken Laird and Chris Curtis and all those guys. And, of course, Doug Lane, which uh, I hadn't seen Doug in a while. We belly bopped. It was great. Um, anyways, okay. uh, that was the good stuff that happened. Also, David Ortiz yesterday. Not yesterday. The day before. Saturday. Um, David Ortiz came and did an interview with us. He talked to Ken and Curtis. And when I tell you that there was a crowd like seven rows deep around the stage that we were doing the radio from, it was probably even bigger than that. And people were just chanting and, you know, d- d- trying to get his attention the whole time. He was, he was cool as hell. He was up there with his sunglasses on answering questions. And uh, that was another highlight, I would say, of the weekend. Big, big pappy over here, you heard? Other than that, it was pretty rough for the Red Sox and their brass, certainly on Friday night, which is when they had their town hall. And also when I think, uh, I don't know, the the first time, you're right next to a casino, right? So if people come out there and they're waiting all day for something to do, what are they going to do? They're going to go gamble, maybe drink a little bit in the casino. They got into that town hall and they let John Henry, Hyam Bloom, Sam Kennedy, and the rest of them, they let them have it. Can you Uh, all hear me? uh, Yeah, they could hear you loud and clear, John, and they did not like what you had to say. Let's just take a quick listen in case you missed it to uh, the reception John Henry got. Would you like to address those concerns to fans who say, why aren't you at the top if the prices are at the top? Yeah. Let's have it up to Tom Cameron. I think the, the, the most uh, informed thing I can say is that it's expensive to have baseball players. 
Just to have the best. The be- hold on a second, Ryan. The best part of that whole part of the, that, that booing interlude right there, the reason why you don't hear Henry saying anything is because he kind of just looks out at the crowd and shrugs. <laughs> He's like, eh. <laughs> I, guess. I mean, come on, it's expensive, you guys. Why? You don't think it's expensive to have a baseball team? It's like, no, John, we know it's expensive to have a baseball team. We're aware of that. We're not stupid. We're just asking why you charge more than anybody else for your baseball team and then let all the good players leave in free agency or you trade them away. That's what we're, that's what we're more curious about. Now, if Henry wanted to give an honest answer, answer there that wasn't going to satisfy anybody but was maybe a little bit more sincere than this he could have said listen we have the smallest ballpark in all, out of all the bar i think it's smaller than wrigley right it's the smallest one smallest ballpark it's the smallest ballpark in all of baseball the yankees the dodgers these other teams they have way more seats that they can sell so they don't have to charge as much and that's why they can afford more players and that's why they can sort of do all these things and we can't and that wouldn't have been a great answer either we have played like bleep but that's a lot better answer than, hey, it's expensive. It's expensive to have a baseball team. Like, no kidding, John. You think that's going to you think that's gonna calm the masses? It, it, it give High and Bloom credit. At least he tried to explain himself as he uh, went back over the Mookie Betts trade and unfortunately said the word bets about a million times. Not enough, right? Uh, yeah, listen to this. One year away from free agency with a superstar player. And we, we didn't sign him. And I want to explain why, because it relates to where we're going. It relates to where we're going. We didn't sign up because when you make those bets, they're big bets. And those bets, hang with me here, hang with me here. Stop saying bets and we'll hang with you. Those bets usually, now y'all know it, you guys are smart. Those bets are much better up front. Hold on a second, Ryan, real quick. You guys are smart and very handsome, and you're all probably (laughs) well-endowed. You're all I'm great just, hygiene. I'm looking at this crowd. I'm seeing a lot of really good looking, impressive, a smart, people responsible out there. stock <laughs> portfolio. <laughs> Are any of you guys single? <laughs> I got a, I got a, this a, a, back. a niece who would love each and every one of you guys. <laughs> you guys are smart. Those bets are much better up front and on the back end. We know that. Every team knows that when they're making those bets. But if you want to make that type of bet, you better be ready to back it up. You better be ready to surround that bet with a whole lot of talent, a whole lot of young talent, or you're not going to win. And you see it all the time in that in this game. You see it all the time. And I don't think anybody would disagree where the organization was. We just weren't ready to back up that bet. Man, he said bet a lot. Maybe too much. Maybe a little too much. You know what? sort of I think made all that really hollow though we need young talent and you need more prospects you need all this young talent to surround your your great players is okay say that's true and it is to an extent I think you don't need young talent you just need talent but let's say it's young talent that he really uh prioritizes and thinks is the most important what's that young talent going to turn into Mookie Betts Andrew Benatendi, Xander Bogarts, who you're just going to let walk when they start costing money. Like, why should we get excited about these prospects if you're going to treat them like you're the Florida Marlins and you can't afford to keep anyone once they start outplaying their arbitration and their rookie contracts? Like, where's the? How does that make me feel better as a fan? How you know does what it I mean? make? How does it make the clubhouse feel? That too. also. Yeah. I mean, if you're a prospect who comes up and is then playing in Fenway day in and day out, and you look at the way that things have gone recently under this general manager and ownership, don't you feel like you're in your starter home? Okay, I'm going to play out here. Maybe we'll have a great year. Maybe one out of the next three seasons will be pretty good. And then I'll go get paid somewhere else. Hang with me. I mean, Hang that with really, me. You're, that, very, you're all very really, handsome. That's who they are right now. It's true. The bets thing was weird. Um, he got stuck on that word. That like became the worst crutch word he could have chosen. It really talking was. Talking to, were, were people, um, were they sauced up? I mean, on know. a Friday. They, okay. they were GM selling alcohol. I, just, no. I wasn't there. I wasn't there. So they were selling alcohol checking. in the arena at they that were. time. Mm-hmm. Yes. So you got a sauced up crowd and you're just saying the name of a recently departed darling of a player yeah. over and over and over again. Bad verbal crutch It's like there. a bad wrestling promo. I understand we're down here at the MGM in Springfield, and there's a lot of gambling going on. Well, I got something that you can bet on. Da, 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 da. Now let's try again back to the drawing board. Yeah, this is uh... interesting. So Chad Finn from the Boston Globe, he just tweeted this out. Uh, he Because Nesson is supposed to air the winter meetings tonight, mm-hmm. He reached out asking if there would be any kind of editing or anything or if they would show the booth. I mean, they're going to have to edit some of it for FCC reasons. So 
Was it that? Was it that? Was the language like that? Some I, of the, I the, didn't hear any, uh, any, like, one of the cuss videos words. I heard, a, I heard a cuss or two, but it was just okay. like, I mean, it was, it was din, you know, in the background. Yeah, so. that probably okay. won't get picked. So yeah. the response he got from a spokesperson was the show tonight at 8 p.m., as is always the case with television production, we made tweaks where needed to accommodate sound quality in the unique amphitheater environment at MGM. And condensing a 90-minute program to the hour-long format of the show. With that said, the lion's share of ownership front office Q&A is included in the show. All right, we'll see what that lion's share actually is because it sounds like they could trim out about a half hour and make it seem a lot different than it really was. You, you know? suck. What if they do extremely creative editing and when they come out, there's like a band playing and everyone's <laughs> like, yes! Yes! Just gonna be fifty-five you, minutes hon. of Charlie Moore. Well, John fu- Henry says, you know, it's expensive to have a team, and they cut to the crowd. And it's a standing ovation. <laughs> well, that's the thing. They had they had a it's crowd just, coach. It's just like a cut in from a past Golden Globes award, <laughs> like a Golden Globe award audience, where everyone's like, like, "Wow, beautiful!" Like the Rock is there. <laughs> like, yeah, that's amazing. But that's the thing is, like, they had Meryl a crowd Street coach. Like, why the hell is Helen Mirren at the Winter Weekend? She's like, bravo. Way to go, John Henry. Awesome. Wait, there was a crowd coach, you say? There was a crowd coach off to the side like it was an SNL episode. Was he wearing a uniform like a manager? <laughs> he was wearing like a Nesson uniform, mm. but he you can go back and look in the videos because he's off to stage right. And uh, he's just waving his hands like an air, uh, like out, like he's out on the tarmac. Are you sure, at wasn't Logan. someone who was doing no, like, like the entire time he's like this, like trying to tell everyone to just <laughs> silence. And it was just like the most meaningless job in the world at that moment. I think the, the... Wait, that guy to the side waving his arms? I thought that was the interpreter. I thought no, that was a, no, really? no, no, no. That was there, the co- I thought that was it for deaf people. I thought it was there was an interpreter language. on the left side. There was a crowd coach okay, on the right. So there wasn't a third. Right. What is a crowd coach? He's just telling you when to clap or when to laugh and whatnot. Can, okay. I, can a light do that? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Also, bad sign when you have to do that. I, I got it. I fixed it. The most uh, informed thing I can say is that it's expensive to have baseball players. To- Bravo, bravo, John. Wonderful. When you make those bets, they're big bets. Those bets, those bets usually, now y'all know it. You guys are smart. Those bets yes, are much we are better smart. on the yes, front thank you. than on the back end. We know that. But if you want to make that type of bet, you better be ready to back it up. You better be ready to surround that bet with a whole lot of talent. A whole... Sounds great. 617-779-7937. There's your phone number. That's what it's going to sound like on Nesson tonight. Uh, let's go to the phones real quick. Bill is in Rhode Island. He has a thought on John Henry's comments. Hi, Bill. Hey, guys, real quick, and I'll hang up and listen. But uh, John Henry's essentially a bozo because he's talking about baseball players being expensive. How about the guys that he has to pay for in soccer, hockey, racing? So maybe if he wasn't dipping his budget into all different sports, he could focus on the Red Sox. Thanks, guys. Fair enough. I mean, Thanks, Bill. You Pittsburgh know, Penguins, they all do it pro bono. They can, Love the uh, game. They can afford to get more baseball players or hockey players or racers or whatever, you know, soccer players. This is an issue over at Liverpool as well. Like, Liverpool fans hate John Henry because he won't spend. Everyone hates him. Everyone hates it's, him. It's if you don't want to spend, it's so funny. Just don't have the team anymore. Yeah. Just sell the team. You're worth four billion dollars. Or buy like the Oakland A's. Your buy job a team is where people to don't pay baseball you players. Your job is to pay baseball players and make the park nicer every single year, even though it's a crumbling relic and just a museum, and you can't sell enough tickets. This is the job of owning the Boston Red Sox. And if you don't want to do it anymore, then don't do it. Fine. Like, yeah, I don't, the baseball players cost a lot of money. Like, that's something new. I mean, I just can't. I, I thought that that was the worst answer. answer ugh, the worst answer of the entire evening. Here's it was, a relatable thought. Baseball teams are expensive, right, guys? Hello? Right? Hello? Me and all my other this billionaire friends were just talking the other day about how expensive it is to do this. So, uh, you know, you guys should all be able to relate to us. Uh, 617-779-7937 is your phone number. Here's Ryan Garvin with What's Trending, and we'll dive back into uh, Winter Weekend with the Red Sox next. Gresh and Fourier, weekdays 10 to 2. Now, here's What's Trending on WEEI. We have an AFC Championship game. We have an NFC Championship game. The games go as follow. The San Francisco 49ers will be in Philly Sunday at 3 p.m., which will be followed by the Bengals at Chiefs at 6.30. Start sending those refunds for the neutral site game. Uh, some injuries occurred yesterday in those divisional games. Tony Pollard, unfortunately, he was carted off the field after he suffered a fractured left fibula. 
Patrick Mahomes, he stayed in the game after he got rolled up on in the first quarter. MRI results showed that Patrick Mahomes was playing through a high ankle sprain, but according to ESPN's Jeremy Fowler, he is expected to play on Sunday. Uh, we talked about it earlier in uh, the 4 p.m. hour. According to Burt Breer, he tweeted over the weekend the Patriots linebackers coach Gerard Mayo was alongside Bill Belichick for all of New England's offensive coordinator interviews last week. According to sources, Breer uh, continues to write that it's a good sign of Mayo's growing role within the team. Your winner sports, well, they just keep on winning. The Boston Bruins beat the Sharks 4-0 yesterday. Linus Olmark, he has become the fastest goaltender in NHL history to reach 25 wins in a single season. Bruins will be in Montreal on Tuesday, but they will be without Tomas Noshek for the next couple weeks. Noshek suffered a non-displaced fracture in his left foot. Mark McLaughlin, he has been called up from Providence to take his roster spot. And the Celtics will go for their 10th consecutive win. They start a back-to-back -back series Monday and Tuesday in Orlando, tip-off at 7 p.m., but they will do it without Marcus Smart. He left the Raptors game on Saturday. Uh, with a right ankle sprain. Malcolm Brogdon, he is unavailable tonight due to personal reasons. Rob Williams' status still up in the air. Uh, Jalen Brown rolled into his leg. Uh, he has been designated with uh, left knee management. I'm Ryan Garvin. That's what's trending now on WEEI. We continue to explore the fallout of winter weekend for your Boston Red Sox, and we will do it right after this. 93.7 WEEI, Boston Sports Original. Don't let pneumonia stop you from...
Boston Sports Original, everywhere you go. Six one seven 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 nine seven ninety three seven. There's your phone number. It's Christian Arcan, Megan Ottolini here with you for another forty minutes or so as we continue to pick apart what happened over the weekend at a uh, winter weekend. Picking through the wreckage. In Springfield. It was wreckage, too. It really was. I mean, <laughs> that first night, that that was, I've never seen anything like that before. Uh, the the type of people who usually go to these things are not fans who get drunk and yell stuff. You know what I mean? Like, it's not, it, I just sort of feel like that's not usually the It's not the a lot of our callers. Expecting. Right. <laughs> it's not our callers. It's not people up in the, the bleachers who are, you know, screaming at people and, you know, raining down chants and things like that. It's not. It's generally not. It's usually kids and parents and, you know, just fans, fans who are there to just enjoy. It. And uh, for to their credit, the Red Sox had a lot of stuff for fans and kids to do there. So it's not like it was some, you know, cheap thing. Like it was it was a pretty good weekend, I'd say, in terms of what they were trying to make it. But that Friday night, I mean, that that took it to a whole nother place. And uh, the next day. It was kind of awkward. I mean, you see these people walking around. I talked to High and Bloom, and when he sat down, I sort of asked him, I'm like, tough tough crowd last night. He goes, yeah, well, we were no good last year. And I feel like that's sort of mm-hmm. what they're leaning on. Well, we weren't good last year, and that's why everyone was mad. It's not it. That's Do not the reason. Do you think he actually feels that way? No. I okay. think that that's sort of as what he was saying. As long as he's not lying to himself, because it seems like he's lying to everybody else, and that's I don't totally blame him. I actually am at the point where I feel bad for Heim. Oh, this is great. This is great. Everybody hates This is hates the me. company Everybody line. And, and by the way, it. kind of rude for Sam Kennedy when getting asked about Heim getting booed. Sam Kennedy says it's, quote, awesome. Yeah, that was awesome. That's awesome. Our fans are so great. So awesome. That's like, don't, awesome? Don't say it's awesome. <laughs> like, what are How you about talking no? about? How about just saying, uh, we hear them. I love getting was, booed off the stage. Yeah, so off awesome. Stage. Sweet. Like, that, was, that was awesome. That's one thing I've always dreamt of is going up there and having the fans of the team I own boo the hell out of me. I'd say, you know, every, boo the every guy little that boy you dreams hired. of that someday. It's so rough. And I know Sam Kennedy, like, John Henry spoke for the first time in, what, like four years. Mm-hmm. And Sam Kennedy just routinely steps in it because that's what he gets paid to do. Yep. And I don't know how he continues to all the time, but to say that you're, what is it, president of baseball operations, analytics, Chief master, baseball human, officer, yeah. yeah, whatever, calculator man, is getting booed. It's just great to have people together celebrating baseball, showing us the passion. Last night was awesome. Oh, Yeah. That's why you paused for 10 seconds before you said it. <laughs> Last night God. was so great. Last night was awesome. <laughs> I really enjoyed Unless he hates when time. they booed us. Unless he hates time. Like, yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. It's what it- you expect. When you have a last place finish. Yeah, okay, all right. But he, Sam, that's not that's not the reason Sam why they were Kennedy doing that. Sam Kennedy also, he can't get through a sentence without cracking himself up. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what you expect. <laughs> 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 
Yes. No, it's, I mean, oh, yeah. Oh, my God. You have a last place finish. Your fans aren't going to be happy. But that's not why they were doing it high and bloom. Maybe we were guilty of just being too open and honest about our love. And <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is that is that what he does when he lies? I'm hilarious. Is that, that, that his be. tell? That might so be his tell, He's like, yeah. this is such bull crap. I'm not even believing it. Honey, I wasn't out last week. Awesome. <laughs> it's what you expect. <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying this in public. Honey, I did the dishes. <laughs> like, what are you talking put about? Put this microphone in front of me. Please. Um, yeah, he talked Kennedy talked about being guilty of loving Xander Bogarts too much, and that's really <laughs> what this is about. That's what the booing was about. It wasn't just coming in last place. Love and <laughs> for for Xander Bogarts. Okay, that's it. But yeah, if you had just come in last place, you've done that before. You've had last place finishes before. The fans got over it. They didn't let you have it like this. This, this is different. This was a last place finish, highest ticket prices, and Xander Bogarts walking right out the door a couple years after Mookie Betts was traded away for nothing. And exactly. I mean, people are annoyed, people are upset, and people are voicing their uh, frustrations about it. I talked to Hyam Bloom the next day, and uh, I asked him about the Bogarts negotiations, and I asked him about that article in The Globe by Julian McWilliams, where he basically said that at the airport, everybody sort of found out at the same time that Bogarts was going to San Diego, and that Hyam Bloom looked totally shell-shocked, like he had no idea that that offer was coming and that they were totally caught off guard by it. I asked him about that, and here's what he said. We had a good sense, even from the night before, that you know this thing was probably going to go to a place that we were not going to go. And, you know, we got to own that. I've been pretty blunt about that. I think we all have. Good for Xander. We, we love him. We just did not think that that type of deal was something that was going to be good for the organization. And you go back to the comment that John made yesterday. You know, sometimes making what you think is the right decision for the organization is not going to be popular. And it's not even, you know, you, sometimes you've got to break your own heart because it's the right decision for the organization. So... Basically, he's saying, I knew that this was coming. I, I knew that there was going to be a bigger offer. We had a sense that the negotiations were going to a place that we weren't willing to go. I wasn't shocked. I wasn't surprised. And I still think there was something. You remember that day when Carabas and Sean McAdam and everybody was tweeting, oh, about to get some good news. It's momentum. Here we go. Here it is. Get ready for a big Xander Bogarts announcement. And then the announcement Lots was of traction. he's going to San Diego on a much bigger deal than anything the Red Sox were even considering offering. Sometimes you got to break your own heart. Yeah, and I know that they didn't just make that up out of nowhere. I know that there was someone in that office that thought, hey, he's Bogarts ours. is coming back. He's yeah. ours, and we just, we just locked it up, and we're all set. So I don't know if that came from... Bloom, I don't know if it came from somebody else, but whatever it was, I mean, talk about talk about missing the mark. I mean, if you're playing darts, you miss the whole board. So you know? it does sound like a little bit of rewriting history, mm. and I would have preferred if this was the truth. If the truth was they just never really wanted to pay up for Xander, at least that would make sense, and it wouldn't look like they were incompetent, you know? If the idea was we're going to see how Xander does this season and he still didn't show us enough and he's turned 30 and we just don't want to pay that much for that long of a contract. We're going to spread it elsewhere. But it really just reads like they misread the market. They offered him 90 for four years, which is not what you do when you love someone too much. Right. Like if you love a house too much, you don't put an offer in that is – Two hundred thousand dollars below the other offers, like you just don't. Yeah, no, That's you not wave inspection works. and you go way over, and you hope that that offer is going to do it. And I know this, and they, they did that with Raffi. They That's did that with Raffi, but and I'm not saying that they even had to do that. But you don't come in way under to the point where the realtor is looking at you like, "Are you freaking kidding me? Yeah. Why did you waste my time?" No with one's going to even consider this. They're not. Boris isn't going to consider which is this. what happened. Yeah. So the the changing narrative is pretty irritating from Heim here. Because if it was the case of they were just honest and they just said he's not really in the long term plans, it's heartbreaking for us too. But we feel like this is the smart baseball decision, and we promise you we have a plan that that there's going to be something that works out. This is Plan A. We're not just doing stuff by flying by the seat of our pants, right? Which is how it looks, and now they're trying to rewrite it, and that's what irks me. Yeah, and it's it should. I mean, there's no there's no reason that any uh, team like the Red Sox should be losing out on players that they really really want to keep if that's what they're saying. Now, it's an 11 year deal worth 25 million dollars per year. I don't think that that's outrageous money for Xander Bogarts. I don't. I don't think that that's the type of money that should have been prohibitive and uh, and should have made Hyam Bloom and John Henry and everybody look at it and say 25 million for Bogarts. That's too much. We're out. 
I, I don't. I just. I don't buy that. I'm sorry. Xander Bogarts was too productive last year. He was a top shortstop, a top hitting shortstop in all of baseball. And uh, just to sort of dismiss that and say, well, you know, twenty five million dollars. What are we supposed to do? Offer twenty six. You know, and if eleven years was too many years, then maybe cut down on the years a little bit and offer more money. You know, do do something like that. If you really love the guy so much, and not for nothing, but the guy you brought in to replace him is all banged up too. Now, over the uh, course of the weekend. We found out that Trevor Story does plan on playing this year. That's what he said. Yeah, I don't know if he I'm actually sure will. He does. He came out and said, "I'm planning to play this year. I will be playing this year." Chris Sale, another guy, he came out and said, "I'm okay. ready to go. Everything's good to go here." So someone posted one photo of Chris Sale, and I feel like he's one of us. And when I say us, I mean me, long limbed freaks. <laughs> he does not look good. Like, he, somebody posted a photo of him at during a scrum. He was just talking to a bunch of reporters. Didn't look good in what sense? He looked so thin. Well, he always, he's, he's always know, been that I know, way. but it was, it was, I felt like maybe some time off he would gain a little something. He's going to chub Is up. Is that crazy? <laughs> he looks so frail. What? So frail. Like, I look at that guy as a fellow early 30-something that's very frail, and I'm like, <laughs> I don't have any confidence. Put him on the job of Chamberlain diet. That's what he needs. I puff him up real good. Like I don't, I don't understand how he sustains this. Is his whole family like this? I don't know. I don't know his family. (laughs) Couldn't tell you. If you you met my family, you'd be like, "Yeah, this makes sense." You come from a long line of slender people. These people come from like a malnourished area of Ireland, and this is their this great great grandfather was a popsicle stick. Pretty much. I don't know. I just see you talk to him or Ken and Curtis. Talk to him about his bike accident, though, right? Yes, they did. Do we have this? Do we have uh, anything from, oh, the, from the bike accident? So this was this was interesting. Uh, he described what happened uh, when he was riding sketchy, around. It's sketchy, factually. Yeah, there was some questions that people had, and uh, Ken and Curtis, to their credit, sort of uh, pressed him a little bit on what exactly happened there. And I guess he was planning on just hanging out with his buddies, playing video games all day and eating Chipotle. And uh, while he was biking over to do that, well, he took a little tumble. How are you feeling? What happened on the bike? How are you looking forward to bouncing back this year? Good. I um, actually been started playing catch right around the same time. Uh, got off the mound before I got up here. Been playing long toss, so uh, everything's been going good. Uh, you were hoping to come back and pitch, right? If not for just a freak, freak thing that happened. Yeah, I mean, we. Uh, th- my thumb doesn't even feel like it ever broke. <laughs> I got basically full extension now. I mean, I can do all this, so it, it, it's fine. Um, you know. I, Hopefully the luck turns. You know, what, what can you do? Um, stop riding your bike around, maybe. You can stop doing that. What's he going to do? Make him a bubble boy? When you're seven feet tall and weigh 20 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> you're not allowed to ride bicycles? No, My I'd say feet? no. I'd say don't ride your bike anymore. You're too, it's, it's just not worth it. You're too gangly. Yes, he's and you're stay gonna, inside. He's too gangly fall. to yes, ride a bike. He's too gangly to ride a bike. Yes, he is. My favorite Even part like of a this? special bike for big, weird people like him. I still don't, I don't, I don't trust him to ride it. Okay. I don't. The bikes with the one giant wheel? Yeah, that's kind of what I was picturing. Uh, My favorite part of this was he was talking about how much he loves riding bikes with his kids around Florida. Mm -hmm. But he said, it's something we do quite a bit in Florida, quote, where we have flat paved roads. (laughs) It's fair. Once again, infrastructure in Boston has failed Boston athletes, just like Jalen Brown getting stuck in traffic for two hours when he was trying to go 15 minutes. Michelle Wu, why did you make him fall off his bike? Uh, I don't know about making him fall off his bike. I do admit there's hills and stuff, especially Although over where he was biking. He, he was up Chestnut by like Cleveland Hill, Circle, right? right? Or was it Chestnut Hill? I, I thought don't he was know. a Cleveland Circle. He when said he, fell. he was by BC. So well, I think we need to follow up with this okay. and find out whether he was in Boston or Newton or Brookline. And then because somebody's got to answer. <laughs> somebody's got to answer for that pothole. That's an expensive pothole. Yeah, it definitely was. And uh, let's see. We'll see what Sale looks like. He's an important factor in all of this. I mean, you talk about this pitching rotation. It looks a lot different if you have a healthy Chris Sale in it than if you don't. But I feel like we've been saying that for three years now. Uh, 617-779-7937. Right. At the trade deadline when Chris Sale comes back, that's right. like making a blockbuster trade. Sure. Why make a trade when we have Chris Sale coming back at the deadline? I mean, think about it. Uh, Matt is in Walpole who has a thought on Xander Bogart. Hi, Matt. Yeah, I just, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't let this slide. Did you just say that the San Diego Padres didn't overpay Z- Xander Bogart? I didn't you, think you $25 think that that million dollars was that much. I didn't think that that was a ridiculous, or the 11 years may have been a lot, and I think that's what scared him off, but I didn't think $25 million was that much of an overpay for Xander Bogarts. No, not at all. I, 
I think that the hundred and twenty five million that you're gonna be paying him from ages thirty six and on might be a little ridiculous. And I think that if the Red Sox can get away with trading for, for Kim from San Diego, who's only got point seven war less than Xander Bogarts, and I don't even know how much money less, but it's way less than that, then I, I don't know how you can really call it a, a failure. I get Xander Bogarts was beloved by Boston, but we're talking about a he guy who's still who very productive. Home runs. Who cares about his home runs? He is a first in shortstops and on base, and I think second in slugging percentage. OBP, like, led, I think, all shortstops and hits. He was very productive, Matt. And not only that, but that 25, hold on a second, Matt. That $25 million in six years isn't going to seem like that much money. It's a lot of money now. In six years, the market's going to go up. $25 million is not going to seem like that much. What, what's the point in keeping him if he doesn't have power, which is the one the one problem that the Red Sox really had? You can just get Kim, who's really not that worse. They got a lot more problems. They have a lot more problems than that, Matt. Matt. There, there's, there's a lot more problems than a power than problem. And Xander <laughs> Bogart, one issues. of the better hitting shortstops in all of baseball. Did he hit a lot of home runs last year? No, he didn't. Neither did J.D. Martinez, who you moved on from because he's a DH, and that's all you need from him. From Xander Bogarts, I'll take what you got from him last year. I don't care if he only had 15 home runs. He was one of the best hitting shortstops in all all, the whole league, not just the AL, the whole league. Add to the fact that he's asking for someone that just got a cup of coffee because Fernando Tatis Jr. got hurt. Like, he had a solid, like, Kim had a solid year this year in San Diego. I didn't even know who he was talking about. No, was, he's just some, just he's right just some like, <laughs> utility player. He's a Brock Holt. I love okay. Brock Holt, but he's a Brock Holt. And to expect that you're going to get power out of a Brock Holt, like, that's just insane. It, it, the fact of the matter, and, it, like, it traces its way all the way back to Heim Bloom saying, we want to secure someone that we can build around. Mm-hmm. He wasn't willing to do that with Mookie. He wasn't willing to do that with Xander. They did that with Devers now, but what do you have around Devers? Like you're just proving your point that this is a bridge year and you're just lying to every single like Red Sox fan right now. Yeah. It's insane. And I think that's what a part of the reason why the vitriol was as bad as it was. Like what d- does this team do we feel any better about this team? Hyam Bloom can come up there and say, "Hey, we got all the prospects we need now and we're feeling really good about the future, but is anyone is any fan feeling that way? Does any fan feel like they got better than they were last year when they were in last place? Like, no. It's, no one thinks that. And they were a last place team last year, and then you got worse. The only thing you did was keep your guy and sign Duvall, and that's basically it, Kenley Jansen. Like, really, there's not much else to even point to. So, I don't know. I mean, I think that the, the, the long and short of it here is that if you, if you don't try and dress this up and put a positive spin on it, people aren't going to show up. Right. Like if if High and Bloom went out there and said, yeah, we're still a couple of years into this and we're still not quite there yet, but we'll be there in a year or two when these prospects grow up. Then people are going to say, well, I'm not going to the games this year. I'm not going to waste my money on season tickets if this isn't even a realistic season to, you know, to to invest in. But if he comes out and says, you know, we got these great young players and now they're going to be surrounding our stars. Then at the very least, star. our star, true, the one star, then at the very least, you have something you can kind of beat the drum on you know well we got this we got this going you know we're excited about this we're optimistic about this but no fan really shares that optimism well i also think to the caller's point about it being overpaid because by the time he's 36 the back end of the contract is going to be nearly null and void because of his aging right i agree from a financial standpoint but that's how all of these contracts are right now and you just did the same thing with Rafi. so it's more that you can pick and choose and decide well this guy's 26 this guy's 30 and that's the difference between whether we're going to make the make a long-term investment on him knowing that the back half of the contract is always most likely gonna be kind of a waste that's that's the sandbox that everybody's playing in right now in terms of the contracts. And I think that's what's so alarming about the initial contract that they offered, that it was only four years, $90 million. That's just telling a player that you're not interested in investing them in them at all. So once again, like, don't go back now and try to rewrite history when everybody has that number at their fingertips. Yeah. I think it's just very frustrating. Yeah, Listen, Xander, we like you a lot, but I mean... Let's be real. You're going to be 37 in seven years, so we can't possibly pay you. I'm Sam Kennedy now. We can't possibly pay you <laughs> that money. I mean, I that argument makes me so crazy. Oh, he's got to – that's so much money for 36, 37, 38. Okay, great. What about 30 to 36? Do you think Xander is going to be good next year? Do you think Xander is going to be good the year after that? Yeah, probably. It's the cost of and playing in the sandbox. That's the thing is, I agree. The contracts are crazy. You know, good for them getting their money. Baseball players are expensive, mm-hmm. as we heard from John Henry. That's that's the nature of the business right it now. Is. Maybe it'll change. Maybe something will change 
five years, six years from now, and everybody will all look back on this era and go, oh, my God, I can't believe they were giving those contracts out. But unless they have some intel that that's coming down the pipeline, then I don't understand how you're picking and choosing some of these investments. Let's take one call here before the break. Richard is in Framingham. Hi, Richard. How's it going? It's going. What's up? Uh, so was that High Bloom that just called, by the way? I think it was. Uh, it, I mean, it, it's insanity, the fact that people don't understand. It, I pay a lot of money to go to a Red Sox game. I want them to put the best product on the field. Yeah, End fair enough, store. Richard. You're right about that. Thanks for the call. And I think that's ultimately what people are the most pissed off about. You know, you you preach all this stuff about how it's expensive to own a team, and that's why we have to charge the most money, and then Xander Bogart still leaves and go because uh, you didn't offer him enough. You know, so which is it? Is it too expensive to own the team? If it is, then maybe sell it to, like you said. You know, if it's if it's not financially working for you to put a, pr- a competitive product out there, if that costs too much for your liking, then sell the team to someone who's more uh, willing to do that. You know, that's really what it's about. It's about your willingness to go and spend. And I don't think that Hyam Bloom is the one who's making these decisions and overruling John Henry and Tom Warner He's and saying, some of the I, Hyam Bloom, am deciding not to sign Xander Bogarts, and I, Hyam Bloom, alone am deciding to trade Mookie Bet. Like, I just don't buy that. No, no, no. But I also think that he has a, played a hand in a lot of these miscalculations, sure. if you want to be generous. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. Uh, 617-779-7937. There's your phone number. Quick break. We'll come back and wrap it next. 93.7. love E-I-B. 93.7. W-E-E-I. Boston's Sports Original. Love Cumbie's Coffee? Share the warmth Wednesdays at Cumberland Farms means that every Wednesday through February, you can buy one coffee and get another one free. Share it with a buddy then remind them about it for the next 10 years. Ah, friendship. Plus applicable tax. Limited time only. Eversource wants your business to reach its sustainability goals. No matter the size, we offer every business the tools to reduce their carbon footprint. Optimizing your energy usage could mean swapping dated oil and propane systems for heat pumps. This leads to increased comfort, simpler heating and cooling in one unit, and reduced environmental impact. Learn how to make your business more sustainable at Eversource.com. If you own a business,
Sports Radio, WEEI, Christian Arkin, Megan Adelini. Before we get to the almost end of the show, we got a quick uh, Celtics update for you. Yeah, this is from Steve Hewitt of the Boston Herald, Celtics beat writer. Said Jason Tatum, this just published three minutes ago, Jason Tatum acknowledged Monday... Off-season surgery could be a possibility to repair his injured left wrist. That's the injury. Uh, well, he he was he missed Saturday with the Ra- against the Raptors due to soreness. But I right. also kind of wondered if that was in the cards after the way he played against the Warriors. Yeah, which was having played forty-eight minutes. Forty-eight minutes. He had a good game. I mean, obviously, he had a lot of bad turnovers at the end, but they still won, and they wouldn't have won without him. Um, his full quote here was, uh, is this going to require surgery? And he says, maybe I don't want to say yes. I don't want to say no. It's something we've got to look at when the season's over. So clearly not bothering him so much right now. He said, it's nothing that's going to make me cause me to miss significant time the rest of the season. Just making sure I'm all right. Okay. So, uh, Hewitt writes, it's possible that Tatum rests more games during the second half of the regular season. He's also dealing with discomfort in his thumb and ring finger on his left hand. Who isn't? Am I right, ladies? Hey. Hey. And in order to stay fresh for a long playoff run, uh, I hate myself. And when the season is over, surgery could be on the table for his wrist. Okay. Um, Well, on top of that, tonight, Robert Williams out. Marcus Smart also out. Uh, Williams had been questionable. He was just ruled out by, uh, I believe, Joe Mazzula said that uh, that's the uh, that's the deal there. So shorthanded tonight against Orlando, a team that randomly just owns them anyway. And I'll tell you what, not having Williams more so than Smart, I feel like that's problematic because for whatever reason, I don't know why they never like deploy this against any other team. But the Magic, it's all everybody on their team is like six <laughs> ten. They got all these like six ten guys. They're all really big and tall and skinny, and you know, kind of like uh, kind of like OKC. And they really present a lot of matchup problems for the Celtics offensively and defensively. And if Williams was playing, I'd say, well, at the very least, you got a big guy in there who can you know keep those guys off the rim and maybe clear out some space. But without him. <laughs> You know, you got a bunch of young, fast, tall guys who are not really good against anybody else, but for whatever reason, I'm still not sure what it is, always kick your ass. So it'll be interesting tonight, uh, the Celtics in Orlando to take on the Magic, and then they got a back-to-back tomorrow as they go over to uh, South Beach to take on the Heat. But right now, what's the time for, Ryan Garvin? It is time for the almost end of the show, which is sponsored by Cars for Kids, the easiest way to donate your car. Donate today, and your car can be picked up tomorrow. Call them right now, 877-CARS-4KIDS today, or online at cars4kids.org. Remember, that is Cars with AK. Now, I don't know how aware uh, Bruins fans are of what's going on uh, with the big old hockey teams on the other side of the country, but there's been some big uh, news for the Vancouver Canucks. Oh, yeah. They have fired their head coach, uh, Bruce Boudreau. I think they lost like, uh, yeah, 28 of 46 games this season. Uh, Jim Rutherford, their president, was saying, you know, this team needs surgery. Uh, I know Bo Bo Horvat has been a big part of a lot of trade rumors going on. And I can understand. Look, hockey names can be tough. Mario Lemuz. I totally understand. (laughs) But... If you're that's not one of the tough ones. Oh, Mario, you don't think Mario Lemieux is a tough one? I would agree with you. No. (laughs) Maybe if uh, hockey isn't part of your everyday lexicon, you might struggle with some stuff. I saw this on Twitter a little while ago. Uh, This is Fox 5 in Atlanta. I guess they're doing their one minute sports update, and they also just touched upon Bruce Boudreau. Uh, His his firing, uh, he was replaced with Rick Tuckett, who had been doing the TNT analyst stuff with uh, Paul Beast and Anson uh, Anson Carter. Uh, This is how it was handled on Fox 5 in Atlanta. Former Washington Capitals coach Bruce Boudreaux has been (laughs) fired by the Vancouver Canucks. The team announced the change Sunday, less than a week after president of hockey operations Jim Rutherford said major surgery was needed to fix the Canucks. (laughs) Rick Tukid was hired as Boudreaux's replacement. Oh, man. So wing two yeah, get hired. Well, she got Rutherford right. So <laughs> this is this is Atlanta, right? This is Atlanta. That's Yikes. producer's 
default 50%. Yeah. If I, you're writing out the prompter for her and you know that she's not super familiar with that lexicon, you put it, you, you put it phonetically. Former Washington Capitals coach Bruce Boudreaux has been Boudreaux. fired by the Vancouver Can- Canucks. I mean... It must have been a slow sports day in Atlanta. Right. That's what I thought. If as they're well. talking about the Vancouver Canucks, because yeah. you know that's not anything that Atlanta has to do. Atlanta doesn't have a hockey team anymore, right? That's no. true. Why the hell yeah, are the they talking about? The been long gone. <laughs> they're out of. They're out the of town. has been long gone. Well, so Bruce Beaudreau, Bo- Beaudreau. Bo- Bo- former coach of the Canucks, Bro Brodo, yeah, not having a great weekend. You know who else did not have a very good weekend? That would be Shannon Sharp. Shannon Sharp was at the Lakers game. I thought and, he had a great weekend. Oh, you thought he had a great weekend? <laughs> well, Shannon disagrees with you. Shannon, if you if you didn't see it, Shannon Sharp was at the Lakers game when they hosted the Memphis Grizzlies. He was courtside, and he got into a very large altercation with, uh, I think it was Dylan Brooks, uh, John Morant, John Morant's father, dad, I think, yeah. also as well. And now they've hugged it out, and uh, it seems like it's all water under the bridge. So, obviously, Skip Bayless didn't... Uh, do himself any favors with his DeMar Hamlin uh, tweet, and that was a big issue when Shannon Sharp came back that it wasn't really properly addressed. Shannon Sharp started Undisputed today with an apology for the ages. If you're ever struggling, if you ever have to do a big public uh, 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 apology like this, maybe take some notes. I actually need to trim this down. This is about three and a half minutes of him apologizing to people. Here's the best of it. I want to apologize for my behavior. Um, you know, guys, I've preached for the last six and a half years, responsibility and accountability. And I take full responsibility for what transpired. It does not matter what Dylan Brooks said or how many times he said it. Me being the responsible person, me having the platform that I have and having so many people look up to me, I was wrong. I should have lowered the temperature in the arena. Instead, I turned the temperature up and I let it get out of hand. And I want to apologize to a few people. First of all, I want to apologize to the Lakers organization. I want to apologize to the fans that were in attendance and the fans that watched on television. I want to apologize to the Memphis Grizzlies. More specifically, I want to apologize to Dylan Brooks. I also want to apologize to my stylist Hollywood. Like I also want to speech. apologize to LeBron James. I want to apologize to my family. I want to tell about my brother, my sister, my mom, my kids, and my grandson. And I'm never going to be too big to say I'm sorry. I'm never going to be too big.